Derita, derita, derita. Stop, stop, stop. Okay, okay. Hop, 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 hop. No le muevas. Hey guys, what's up? It's Stephanie and welcome back to my channel. So in the video today, I'm going to be doing an uh, end of rotation exam review for your family medicine rotation. So hopefully this video is helpful for you guys. I've had a lot of requests to do this topic. So this is the reason why I'm doing this video. And I've also had a lot of comments from nurse practitioner students really liking some of my other EOR reviews that I've done and also medical students. So I'm really, really happy that I'm not only able to reach PA students, but also other medical students and nurse practitioner students or fellow colleagues that we're going to be working with once we graduate as PA. So hopefully this video is helpful for you guys. Uh, as always, I really like to start my video with just stating how I studied for my exam. So for my program, rotations tend to be about five weeks. So what I did is at the first three weeks, I went through all the information. The things that I really like to use is pants prep pearls. I really like pants prep pearls. I use it a lot also for the pants. Um, I also use the PA end of rotation exam review book, which is really, really good. You can get it on Amazon. The prices tend to fluctuate though, so sometimes it can be a little pricey and sometimes it can be a little bit cheaper. So just keep that in mind. Another thing that I used a lot was osmosis. I love osmosis. If you're a visual person, I really, really recommend osmosis. And being that I am a visual person, I also recommend Picmonic because this exam really likes to test you on some pharmacology, especially when it comes down to medication street and hypertension, uh, some of your ACEs and ARBs, right? Side effects, contraindications, indications. Not only that, some of your beta blockers, right? Which ones are non-selective, which ones are selective. Diabetes is a big one that they like to test, right? Your insulin, so you have to be familiar with your regular insulin, which one's your, your long-lasting insulin, what are their peaks, etc. So I'll be reviewing most of this. And Picmonic really, really helped me with memorizing these medications and also kind of memorizing their contraindications or indications or side effects, etc. So I really, really recommend Picmonic for those of you who are visual individuals like myself. Highly recommend Picmonic. So osmosis, I also like those most a lot. The reason why I like those most is because aside from their videos, they have flashcards. And, you know, for those of you who are in PA school and even during your clinical rotations, you don't have time to sit down and actually make flashcards. So I'm a huge fan of just using already pre-made flashcards. And I use osmosis flashcards and I review them every day from day one of my rotation to the day before I took my end of rotation exam. And it really, really helped me out. And I've been doing that since I started didactic year up until I took my pants. And you can really tell a difference on how it affected my pants grade and also how it helped me with my end of rotation exam. So I really, really recommend flashcards. It's all about space repetition. Repetition is a key, whether you're quizzing yourself through flashcards or just practice questions, that's the key. So first three weeks, I read the information. These are the things that I use that I'm discussing right now. And then after that, the last two weeks, I tested myself. So I did a bunch of practice questions, practice, practice, practice questions, something that I highly, highly recommend. So I have Rush Review. I use Rush Review for practice questions, especially when it comes down to their exams that are specific for your EORs. I really recommend if you don't have that package to purchase it. So when I purchase my Rush Review, I purchase it with my program, which is another thing that I recommend. So if a lot of students in your class work together and they contact Rosh, they will actually give you a discount if a lot of students sign up, which was the case for my program. And so we got a discount and I ended up paying, um, of course, it's a significant amount of money, but I ended up having not only the regular question bank, but also extending that and having the, the question banks for each of your EORs. And I highly recommend that. So what I did is that on those two last weeks, I did a bunch of practice questions, whether I just made up the practice questions from Rush Review. And then that last week I took the like practice EOR for the family medicine on Rush. And then whatever I missed, I made sure that I focused on that. So for example, if cardiovascular was one of my weaknesses, then I made sure I did that. I focused on cardiovascular and I did a lot of practice questions on cardio. That way when I take my EOR, I do well. So I ended up doing really well in my EOR, thank goodness. And this study method has worked for me up until my pants. So I took my pants already. Thankfully, I passed. And so these study methods have helped me. So I'm going to be going through the review, the study guide that I have, and some extra notes that I also put on my study guide that I saw when I was studying for the pants. 
and also what I was studying for the EOR. So I'm using the same study guide that I used for the EOR and the same study guides that I, that I have, I also use for studying for the pants. Mm -hmm. So I'll be reviewing that and also be reviewing what were the common things that I saw. So when you're doing a lot of questions, especially like I finished all the Rosh Ruby questions on Rosh, you kind of see like things that are commonly asked. And so that's what I'm gonna be reviewing and just things that I remember that were on some of the practice exam that I took, etc. So hopefully this video is helpful for you guys. As always, if you have any feedback, make sure you comment below. Or if you have any cool mnemonics you can share with other students to help other students pass, greatly, greatly recommend if you can just leave a comment below that you can help other students that are watching this video. So let's go into cardio. Cardio, cardio, cardio. So cardio is going to be a big portion, once again, of this exam, just as your internal medicine, so ER, and just in general for your pants, it's going to be a huge portion. So it's really important that you know and are very familiar with your cardio. So another thing that I do want to say is that I'm going to be looking down a lot and the reason is because I have my notes in front on my phone and so I'm going to be referring back and forth. So if you looking have me if you see me looking down it's because I am looking at my notes. So let's start with angina. Angina. It's really important that you know the different types of angina. You have stable, unstable, right? Angina. So make sure that you know the different types of angina and how they present. And not only that, how to differentiate between an NSTEMI and a STEMI. Um, another website that I really went to a lot was Online Medit, so I really recommend it. For this one, you don't have to pay. Most of their videos are free, but like if you want to access some of their notes, if you want to have like the videos ad-free, then you have to pay, but usually I just watch their videos um, for free. They have free videos, which is pretty awesome. And the educator on there, I forgot his name, he does a great job in explaining the difference between stable angina, unstable angina, your and STEMI and STEMI. And so what is stable angina? So stable angina is characterized by a transient cardiac ischemia without cell death, which results in substernal chest pain. And the thing about these is that angina, whether it's stable or unstable, and STEMI and STEMI, they're all gonna present very similar with your chest pain. But it's really important that you differentiate between these, which ones are gonna have elevated troponins, which ones are gonna be present when the patient is at rest, which one is gonna be present with an SC elevation on your EKGs. And so those are the things that we're going to be discussing. So stable angina is the most common type and is caused by coronary artery atherosclerosis with luminal narrowing of more than 75%. So chest pain is usually brought on by increased cardiac demand, whether it's exertional, emotional, or stress-induced. And it's usually relieved by either the patient resting or nitroglycerin. So this is something that will differentiate stable angina from something like a STEMI, which is a full-blown heart attack, right? So there are four classes of angina pectoris. There's class one, two, three, and four. And these classes are going to be differentiated by whether the patient has symptoms at rest or not, or whether they have symptoms with either activity, normal activity, or strenuous activity. So that's how I differentiate these different classes in my mind. So class one is going to be patients that have angina only with unusually strenuous activity. So these patients have no limitations. I can probably say right that I have class one. <laughs> I'm joking. But usually it's going to be a patient that just has chest pain only whenever they do something strenuous, right? But they usually don't have limitations. It does not limit them from uh, walking, etc. So usually with these patients, right, ordinary physical activity is not going to cause fatigue, palpitations, dyspnea, or angina. So class two, now this one's going to be a little bit more and worse, right? This is going to be angina with prolonged or rigorous activities. Patients have slight limitation of physical activity. So this means that patients are comfortable at rest, right? But with ordinary physical, ordinary physical activity, they tend to start feeling fatigue. They tend to start having those palpitations, that chest pain, that trouble breathing. And then you have class three, which is going to be worse, right? So with these patients, you're going to have angina, so chest pain, with usual daily activities. And these patients have marked limitation of physical activity. So how, if you notice, right, we said class 2 was slight limitation. Well, you go into class 3, and these patients have marked limitation of physical activity. It's really important to note the differentiation in the wording, right? Because this is how they can trick you on the exam question. So once again, no limitations was class 1. Class two is going to be slight limitations and class three is going to be already like marked limitations. So what does this mean? 
It means that these patients are also comfortable at rest, but with less than ordinary physical activity, they tend to start having those symptoms like fatigue, palpitations, dyspnea, or, and or anginal pain. So class four, that one's like the top of the top, right? This one is going to be patients have angina at rest and often are unable to carry out any physical activity. So these patients are having angina, so that chest pain whenever they're resting, and they aren't able to do their regular physical activity. So symptoms of this is usually going to be, once again, present at rest. And if any physical activity is undertaken, then this increases their discomfort that the patient is complaining of. This is very commonly found in your patients that are diabetics, right? In your elderly patients also. So how is the patient going to present with angina? So patients are going to be presenting with substernal chest pain. And usually it's going to be this chest discomfort that's going to be coming in a uh, crescendo, decrescendo nature that usually lasts about two to three minutes. The pain is poorly localized, so they can't tell you where the pain is. And sometimes it can radiate to the shoulders, to the arm, to the back, to the neck, or to the jaw. It tends to rarely radiate below the umbilicus, so it's usually above the umbilicus with these patients. And it tends to not radiate above the mandible, so it's going to be from the mandible up to the umbilicus. So anywhere above the uh, mandible, no symptoms. Anywhere below the umbilicus, usually no symptoms with these patients. So usually with these patients, they also present with symptoms that are usually... Um, worsen whenever they exert themselves, right? Like we discussed. So usually even when they have sexual intercourse or when they're even stressed emotionally, usually this pain is going to be short in duration. So it's going to be lasting less than 30 minutes and tends to last only between usually majority of the time, one to five minutes with these patients. And the classic sign for your angina is going to be that Levine sign, right? It's going to be that clenched fist over the patient's chest, something that they really like to test on your end of rotation exams and your pants. Some of the symptoms are associated is that the patient can be complaining of dyspnea, so that trouble breathing, nausea, diaphoresis, numbness, and fatigue. And usually pain is relieved by either rest or nitrates. Another thing to keep in mind is that patients that are woman, uh, female, or patients that are diabetic tend to present with an atypical presentation. So what we discussed earlier, that typical divine sign, right, that pain radiating into your shoulder, um, this is usually your typical presentation and sometimes the common presentation that you'll see textbooks. Now, hospital-wise, you know, the clinic, sometimes you won't even see the symptoms, but textbook-wise and for your end of rotation exam, the typical signs is going to be that clenched fist. Well, your atypical signs, which we discussed, are very commonly found in your diabetics. This is something that's very highly tested, so make sure that you know this. And your woman also very commonly tested. Usually these patients do not present with these signs. Sometimes they'll just be presenting with like vague abdominal pain, diarrhea. I've had some questions that had diarrhea, which I don't know, it was indicative of a uh, heart attack. And then also these patients can also present with a prolonged dull ache in the left submammary area. They can also have a seasonal presentation that's more frequent in the winter. They can also have epigastric pain instead of that classic uh, chest pain. They'll present with nausea, fatigue, and faintness. So just make sure that you keep that in the back of your mind whenever you're reading a question stem. And it looks like it's possibly a heart attack, right? But the patient is not having those classical symptoms. See if there's in there that the patient has a history of diabetes or that the patient is a woman, does not present as your typical um, clinical signs of just angina or a heart attack. So what are some of the labs that you want to do in these patients? So labs to do in patients with um, angina in general. For unstable angina, we want to make sure that we evaluate for microalbuminuria, ketones, or protein. So we can do a UA. We can do a CBC also just to make sure that we are looking for anemia or anything that's bleeding, just to rule out other causes that can be causing that anginal pain. We can also do a CMP and a buning creatinine just to look to see how the kidneys are, look, are looking. Another thing you want to do is a lipid panel, right? Look at their triglyceride levels or LDL, the HDL. You want to look at their TSH, so their thyroid levels. Sometimes this can mimic something like hyperthyroidism, so that's something else that we want to make sure that we keep in mind. 
a chest x-ray X -ray to look at the heart, size, shape, and lungs to rule out things like CHF, right? EKG um, to rule out your STEMIs or your uh, non-STEMIs. And then we can also do a CRP, which is usually an inflammatory marker. And then also, of course, do our troponins for these patients. So other testes that we can do for these patients with angina is exercise trust testing. This is actually going to be the most specific one. Um, it has a specific specificity rate of 70%, and it's the most useful and cost-effective. So exercise stress test. Uh, another thing about your stress test, of course, is that we also want to make sure that we're looking at the patient and see whether they, they qualify for a possible exercise stress test where you put a patient, right, exercise them, and you physically stress their heart to see if you can reproduce that. Or either you can also do a pharmacological stress test where you give medications to the patient that physically stress the patient's heart, right? So it mimics that extra stress test. And a way to do that is just to look at the comorbidities of the patient. If it's a patient that has, for example, like your class four, right, of angina pectoris, where this patient has um, very, very restricted physical activity, then, of course, in these patients, we probably don't want to do an exercise stress test, right? In these patients, for example, I would do something more like a pharmaco pharmacological stress test. So going back, um, exercise stress test is going to be your most specific. You can also do other things like possibly like a stress echo. You can do a PET scan. But usually the most useful and the most cost effective is going to be your stress test, whether it's exercise or pharmacological stress test. So how do we treat stable angina? So stable angina, how do we treat these patients? So of course, um, we always want to make sure that we, usually for these questions, we want to make sure that you know the patient starts exercising if they can, make sure that they have a better diet. Um, because I've actually heard some podcasts, I'm a huge podcast fan, so I'll be adding a link below on podcasts, especially for those of you who work out and or like are cooking, that was a time that I used to lo love listening to these podcasts. Uh, sometimes there's been studies that have demonstrated that just for anything, for diabetes, for your hypertension, uh, that just exercising and improving your diet is a lot more beneficial than pharmacological therapy. So always just keep that in your mind is that usually also in your EORs and your PANS, they really like to always point you towards conservative treatment before you jump onto pharmacological treatment. So just keep that in mind. Unless, of course, the patient has already tried conservative treatment or they have a lot of high risk factors, then you would jump into pharmacological treatment. So let's go into our medic medications. So we're going to give these patients nitrates, right? Usually short or long acting. Usually the sublingual administration is going to be the most effective. And how do these nitrates work? So what they do is they facilitate venodilation and they increase that uh, nitric oxide release, which also exerts your anti-thrombotic anti activity with these patients. And it also increases that myocardial blood supply to increase oxygen and increase blood flow to the ischemic myocardium. So whenever we think about just um, angina in general, heart attack, right? We think about those vessels and we think about all that cholesterol that is just getting stuck on those vessels. So how I think about this is that you have those pipes, right? And you have a regular pipe. And if you get mud or anything that's stuck on that pipe, water going through that pipe is not going to be as smooth as if there was nothing stuck or adhered to that pipe. And that's how I think about it in regards to angina and just heart attacks is that you have your vessels, right, which are those pipes, and then you have that cholesterol that is adhering to that pipe, to that vessel. So it's decreasing blood flow to the heart. So medications like these, right, that cause that vasovenodilation um, that is causing that increase in myocardial supply, like nitrates, which is going to increase oxygen, right, to the heart, are really good medications to give um, in these patients. So another thing just to know is that long-acting nitrate should include one daily 8 to 10 hour treatment free interval to prevent any drug tolerance. So that was something that I had in my notes just bolded. Another thing that we want to make sure that we give these patients are going to be our beta blockers, right? So beta blockers are going to reduce that myocardial oxygen of men by reducing the heart rate, the arterial blood pressure, and myocardial contractility. 
And usually some of the medications that we can give is that you can give your cardioselective medications like your metoprolol or atenolol, or you can give your non-selective medications like propanolol or uh, nedolol. Sorry. So these are very, very beneficial, especially after a patient has had a myocardial infarction. And these are usually indicated as a first-line drug treatment for chronic management because it reduces mortality. It decreases symptoms and it prevents ischemic occurrences. This is another thing that they really like to test on is which medications decrease mortality in a patient that had a STEMI. And this is one of the medications. Your beta blockers actually decrease mortality. So just make sure that you know that beta blockers. They might give you a question stem, has different drugs. Uh, know that your beta blockers are one of the medications that decrease mortality in patients. Other medications you can give to these patients with your stable angina is things like your calcium channel blockers, which are vasodilators. These reduce myocardial oxygen demand, contractility, and arterial pressure. One thing to keep in mind is if the patient has a contraindication to a beta blocker or has tolerance to a beta blocker, then we can use a calcium channel blocker for these patients. So another medica medication that we also want to give is antiplatelet therapy like aspirin. So aspirin, like 81 milligrams, can reduce cardiovascular events. And the thing about aspirin is that what it does is that it prevents the progression from chronic stable angina to acute coronary syndrome, which is usually what happens, right? The first step in acute coronary syndrome is thrombosis after a plaque rupture. So usually what is the outpatient regimen for a patient with stable angina? So you've had a patient, right? You've diagnosed the patient with stable angina, you did your stress test, and then now you need to treat them. So the best treatment is going to be your aspirin, right, once daily, sublingual nitroglycerin as needed, your beta blocker once daily, and then also a statin. So a statin is also very, very important with these patients. And what is going to be your definitive management? So definitive management is going to be something like your percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty. So that's another thing that you want to look into the question stem. It's really important that whenever you're reading the question stems, you're reading to see what it's asking you. Is it asking you what's the next treatment line, what's the best pharmacological treatment, or what is a definitive management, right? If it's asking you what is a definitive management, then in these cases, you're going to do something like percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty. This is usually indicated in one or two vessel disease that does not involve the left main coronary artery and in whom the ventricle function is normal or near normal. So that's something that's really important to know is that this is only used in one or two vessel disease that does not involve the left main coronary artery. Okay, and why? Because if you think about just the anatomy in general of the left main coronary artery, right, you have a lot of vessels that come off the left main coronary artery. So that's why it's only one or two vessel disease that does not involve the left main coronary artery. So with these patients, another thing that's going to be a definitive management is going to be your cabbage, right? Your coronary artery bypass graft. This one's usually indicating a patient that has left main coronary artery disease because like we discussed the anatomy, right? You have a lot of vessels that come off that left main coronary artery disease. If the patient is symptomatic or critically stenotic, so that means if they have more than 70% stenosis in their vessels, or if they have a three-vessel disease or decreased left ventricular ejection fraction that's less than 40%, then in these patients, we want to consider cabbage. So once again, when you're reading these questions, if it tells you what outpatient treatment is, is the best for a patient that has, um, for example, our stable angina, right? It's going to be our beta blockers. It's going to be our nitrates. It's going to be our aspirin. It's going to be our statins, right? And then our nitroglycerin also, like we discussed. If it tells you what's going to be the definitive management, now it just depends on how the patient is presenting. Do they have one or two vessels that are involved? Then you can do something like your percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty, right? What about patient has left main coronary artery disease, has more than three vessels that are involved, or has an ejection fraction that's less than 40%, then we can do something like a cabbage coronary artery bypass graft. So make sure that you know that. So let's go into the next one, unstable angina. So what is an unstable angina? Unstable angina is characterized by angina of new onset, angina at rest, or with minimal exertion or crescendo pattern of angina with episodes of increasing frequency, severity, or dur duration. Usually in patients that have unstable angina, 
the pain is not as responsive to nitroglycerin versus like you have a patient that's coming in with that stable angina, right? They have that chest pain, um, but you give them nitroglycerin, it gets better, stable angina. With unstable angina, it's not as responsive to nitroglycerin. Also, this pain tends to last longer. It occurs at rest, right? Or it occurs with less exertion. How do we diagnose these patients? We can do, once again, our EKGs, our stress tests, right? But what's going to be the gold standard? The gold standard is going to be your angiography. So this is going to assess the severity of the coronary artery lesions when considering whether you want to do a percutaneous intervention or cabbage like we discussed earlier. So treatment for these patients are going to be our antiplatelets, beta blockers, nitroglycerin, calcium channel blockers, ACEs, statins, and then of course if needed, revascularization. So once again, make sure you know the difference between stable and unstable angina. Just how it sounds, stable, these patients will rest, they'll have chest pain, but they rest and they get better. Unstable, this chest pain will not go away even when the patient is resting. And these patients have limited or have very few physical activity. And also another thing about unstable angina that you need to know is that usually nitroglycerins are not as effective in reducing that pain, okay? And the thing about unstable angina is that, of course, some are prone to going into STEMI, right? Your STEMI and STEMIs. So another one that's very highly tested is going to be your Prince Metal Angina. So Prince Metal Angina is going to be usually on your question stem. It's going to be like a 30-year-old female or 30-year-old male. They're very, very young, and they're presenting with symptoms that sound like a heart attack, right? Whenever we think about a heart attack, we think of our diabetics, patients that have cholesterol, the cucanary syndrome, et cetera, those are older patients, right? It's going to be a male, smokers. They have a lot of risk factors. Well, for your Prince Metal Angina, it's going to be a younger individual. They're going to be healthy. Sometimes they might tell you that they're cocaine abusers. So just make sure that you have that clinical scenario in your mind, and that's how you can differentiate between Prince Metal and your STEMIs and your end STEMIs. So Prince Metal Angina is going to be that transient coronary artery vasospasm with normal coronary anatomy or site of atherosclerotic plaque. So these patients have normal vessels, right? They have no plaque whatsoever in their vessels. It's just that vessel is just spasming randomly that's causing that chest pain in these patients. So usually with these patients, smoking is going to be the number one risk factor that's going to be associated with Prince Metal Angina. Also, like we discussed, it can be induced with cocaine. How are you going to diagnose these patients? They're going to present with symptoms of a possible heart attack. So we want to make sure that we rule that out. So we're going to do, of course, CK, CKMB, right, or troponins. Um, another thing um, we're going to do is going to be an EKG. Troponins are going to be normal. EKG, though, you may see transient ST elevations versus your regular heart attack, right? Your STEMI, you're going to see ST elevations, but they're not going to be all over the place. In your Prince of angina, they're going to be all over the place, right? When we think about like your STEMIs, your ST elevated myocardial infarction, your heart attacks, you'll see ST elevations like on two, right? Lead two, lead three, the AVF, and you're thinking maybe like of an inferior myocardial infarction or involving like your um, anterior coronary artery, right? With these, with Prince of Angina, your EKG is going to have just ST elevations everywhere. And ST elevations, how do they look like? They look like those tombstones, right? Tombstones literally on the EKG, and they're peaked. So usually with these patients, the gold standard, once again, is going to be your coronary angiography. And that's what's usually going to help you differentiate whether uh, it's a true heart attack or not. So if it tells you what is the um, what is the gold standard, it's going to be coronary angiography. So that was our stable angina, unstable angina. Um, so just to go through them, right? So we have stable angina is going to be that chest pain, but it relieves whenever the patient is at rest. Right? Usually these patients, I would say, have about 70% of their vessel occluded. And then you go into unstable angina. So unstable angina is going to be a chest pain, but that chest pain is going to be present even at rest. So this patient is going to be moving, they're going to be walking, walking around, and then they sit down and that chest pain does not go away. So unstable angina, chest pain is going to be present at rest. You do an EKG on these patients, these patients will not have ST elevations, okay? You do your troponins on these patients, on both unstable and stable angina, these patients will have negative troponins. Okay, so we, knew, we move on to the next step, which is going to be your end STEMI. So your end STEMI, just how it sounds, it's going to be your non-ST elevated myocardial infarction. So this patient's going to be presenting with chest pain, right? Uh, you do this chest pain at rest, chest pain with even moving. 
And so it's a lot more severe than your unstable angina. With these patients, you do troponins and they come back positive. But then you do an EKG and it's not going to be your elevated, right? That's why it's called NSTEMI. So non-ST elevated myocardial infarct. You're going to see an ST depression, okay? Troponins are going to be positive, ST depression, and NSTEMI. Okay, we go into our next one, which is going to be your STEMI, your full-blown heart attack, right? These patients have more than 90% of their vessels occluded with that plaque. So STEMI, ST elevated myocardial infarction, more than 90% of that vessel is going to be occluded. This patient is going to be presenting with that chest pain, right, at rest, with activity, chest pain radiant to the, to the shoulder, to the jaw, that Levine sign, right? And of course, unless it's a diabetic patient like we discussed, or it's a woman where they can present differently, it's going to be a patient that you're wanting to rule out heart attack. It's a full-blown heart attack, right, for your STEMI. Troponins, right? Troponin is going to be elevated. These patients, you do an S, you do an EKG, and you're going to see those tombstones, those ST elevations. So that's how you can differentiate all these. Once again, stable angina is going to be pain. That's going to be that chest pain relieved at rest. That's why it's called stable, right? Because it's stable. And then you go on to unstable angina. Unstable angina is going to be that pain that is usually not relieved by rest. Sometimes it's not even relieved by nitroglycerin. But you do troponins, they're going to be negative, okay? Next one's going to be your NSTEMI. It's going to be that pain, right? Chest pain, uh, not relieved by rest, uh, worsened by physical activity. When, physical activity, whenever they exert themselves, it gets worsened. These patients, also, you do an EKG, they're going to have those ST depressions, but they're going to have positive troponins. Now you move on to your full-blown heart attack, right? More than 90% of your vessel occluded, your STEMI, ST elevated myocardial infarction. This patient is going to have, once again, all those symptoms that we discussed, that Levine sign, and they're going to be presenting with a full-blown heart attack, positive troponins, okay? Another thing that is going to happen with these patients is that they're going to have, you're going to do an EKG, and you're going to see those tombstones, right? And they're not going to be transient, meaning that they're all over the place. No, they're going to be usually on the leads that are associated with the vessels, and of course, unless they have multiple vessels that are involved, but usually it's not going to be transient or like all over the place. So that's how you can differentiate these patients on how they are going to present in regards to how to differentiate between unstable, stable, and and STEMIs and your STEMI patients. Okay. So another thing that they really like to ask is, you know, which one of these cardiac micro, uh, markers is the best one? Obviously, it's going to be troponin, right? Troponin is going to be the one that usually stays up the longest, and this is why it's the best one to be. Um, best one for heart attacks, and this is why it's the one that we use. So if it tells you what's the most specific, it's going to be your um, troponin. So next one uh, we're going to go into is going to be your arrhythmias, okay? So before we go into our arrhythmias, a concept that we need to understand is whether we need or what is like your cardioversion versus your defibrillation. So let's go and discuss each one of these. So what is a cardiac pacemaker? This one is cardiac pacemaker. What it does is that it delivers direct electrical stimulation to the heart when the heart's natural pacemaker is unable to do so. So usually you think about pacemakers and putting them in patients like your third degree AV blocks, right? Where they have a complete block. Uh, there's second degree type two AV blocks also. Something like a cardiac pacemaker where the heart is being stimulated directly by a pacemaker is something that's going to be best for these patients. Usually it's going to be permanent, okay? And like we said, some of the things that you use these are going to be your Mobitz type, um, your heart block type 2, Mobitz type 2, uh, second degree heart block, sorry, type 2, and your third degree heart block. Also, patients that have symptomatic bradyarrhythmias, tachyarrhythmias, and then also if they have sinus node dysfunction like sick sinus syndrome, which is actually one of the most common ones where we do cardiac pacemakers. Now, let's move on to our next one, which is going to be cardioversion. This is going to be a delivery of shock that is in sync with the QRS complex. The purpose of cardioversion is that you want to terminate dysrhythmias like ventricular tachycardia and paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. What is it used for? So indications for cardioversion is going to be your AFib, your A flutter, your VTAC with pulse, and then your supraventricular tachycardia. So what about defibrillation? Defibrillation is delivery of shock that is not in sync with the QRS. 
versus your cardioversion, right? Cardioversion is you're delivering the shock that it's going to be in sync with the QRS complex. Well, defibrillation is not in sync with the QRS complex. What is the purpose of defibrillation? It's to convert dysrhythmias to a normal sinus rhythm. This is usually used in patients that have VTAC without pulse or ventricular fibrillation. Another one's gonna be your automatic implantable defibrillator. This is a device that's surgically placed. And what happens is that when it detects a lethal dysrhythmia, it delivers a shock to defibrillate the patient. Uh, usually used for patients with ventricular fibrillation or VTAC that's not controlled by medical therapy. And then you have your pharmacological cardioversion, right? Things like uh, ibutilide, uh, procainamide, flecainide, sotalol, amiodarone, okay? So these medications are usually used if electrocardioversion fails. So now that we're done with cardioversion versus defibrillation, uh, let's go into our arrhythmias themselves. It's something that they really like to test, so make sure that you look up EKGs for this. So premature atrial contractions. What are some of the causes of premature atrial contractions? So the causes of this is usually stress in general, drugs, alcohol, tobacco, some type of electrolyte disturbance. So make sure that we're looking at the medications that the patient's taken. If they're taking like thiazides or certain medications that can cause like some of your diuretics that cause electrolyte imbalances. Ischemia infection also with these patients. So what happens on a premature atrial complex, it's not something really we need to con be concerned about in comparison to all the other arrhythmias. But usually what you'll see is that you're going to see an atrial premature beat, right? There's going to be a P wave that is inverted that indicates the ectopic focus is located distally in the atria. So how do we treat these patients or how are these patients going to present? They're going to be asymptomatic. Sometimes they'll only be saying that they have palpitations. And diagnosis is that we're going to do a routine EKG. Um, usually they'll have a normal QRS. They're just going to have that early P wave, right? That's why it's called your premature atrial contraction. And usually we can also do a Holter monitor if the EKG does not show anything. And treatment for these patients is just going to be observation if the patient is asymptomatic or we can give them beta blockers. It's not something very concerning with these patients, of, of course, unless it starts changing, but not very something, something that's not very um, concerning. So next one's going to be your supraventricular arrhythmia. So supraventricular arrhythmias. So with your supraventricular arrhythmias, these patients are going to be presenting with palpitations, anginas, fatigue, heart failure symptoms. If it's the patient's unstable, they're going to have chest pain, dyspnea, they might be even altered. Uh, they're going to be presenting with hypotension. And then diagnosis, of course, is going to be your routine EKG. Now, the treatment for a, vin su a supraventricular arrhythmia is going to depend on whether the patient's stable or unstable. If the patient's stable, you can do something like amiodarone or lidocaine. But if the patient is unstable, we're going to do synchronized cardioversion for these arrhythmias. So next one's going to be your paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. What happens in these patients is that they have, they have AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. So there's two pathways in the AV node. So reentrant circuit is happening within that AV node. Um, with these patients, what are some of the causes? It's going to be your digoxin toxicity, uh, ischemic heart disease, excessive caffeine can cause also your paroxysmal superventricular tachycardia, alcohol intake. How is this patient going to present on the EKG? What are you going to say? See, sometimes it'll, you won't even be able to see the P waves. Uh, usually the atrial rate is going to be between 100 to 200 beats per minute, but the rhythm is going to be regular. And that's the thing about uh, just EKGs in general is that whenever you are looking at EKG, the first thing I always do is look and see whether the rhythm is regular or irregular. If it's regular, then you can rule out a lot of things. Is it narrow or is it wide, right? Um, and that's another way you can rule out. Whenever I think about narrow, I think about our tachycardias, right? So, for example, in this one, it's going to be a regular rhythm. So if you place your fingers in between your intervals, it's going to be normal, right? Versus something like AFib, these intervals are not going to be normal. It's not going to be the same size every single time. So QRS complexes are usually going to be narrow. So that's, remember, we discussed, we want to look and see whether it's a narrow or a wide tachycardia. This one's going to be a narrow one with a regular rhythm. There's not going to be any extra beats with these patients. And usually if these patients do have symptoms, they'll just be complaining that they have a heart that's going super duper fast, right? 
diagnosis is going to be our EKG. And once again, that EKG is going to show that narrow QRS tachycardia. And you'll be able to see P waves, okay? So once again, that narrow complex um, tachycardia, narrow QRS tachycardia with these patients. And it's going to have a regular rhythm, right? Treatment, if the patient's stable, you can do something like a Valsalva maneuver. You can also give them adenosine um, with these patients. So uh, now, why don't we go into our next one? So one that's really commonly tested is also sometimes your digoxin. Okay, so our next one's going to be atrial fibrillation. This one, they really, really like to test, so make sure that you are familiar with this one. Um, they also really like to describe it. On the pants, I've had descriptions of the EKG. So atrial fibrillation, when we think about it, right, it's going to be that irregular irregular pattern. So it's going to be very irregular. Uh, whenever we think on whether the QRS is wide or narrow, usually with AFib, it's going to be your narrow QRS, right? So atrial fibrillation, this one's going to be the most common cause of chronic arrhythmias. And usually the prevalence and incidence of atrial fibrillation tends to increase as the patient gets older. And Sometimes you can also have atrial fibrillation after a patient drinks alcohol or is withdrawing from alcohol. So just make sure that you keep that in mind. This is usually called the holiday heart. So also when you're reading the question stems, look at the person that's coming in, what's their history. Um, that way you can rule out things like holiday heart. So once again, irregular, irregular rhythm, the atrial rate is going to be greater than 400 beats per minute. And these patients are usually at risk for venous thromboembolism, right? Because that atria is just quivering. So that makes sense why these patients are very high risk for venous thromboembolism. So they're at high risk for having a heart attack also. They're at high risk for getting a stroke with these patients. So what are some of the most common causes of atrial fibrillation? Some of the most common causes of atrial fibrillation are also going to be things like hyperthyroidism. So just make sure that you have that also in the back of your mind in regards to atrial fibrillation. So how is this patient going to present? They're going to have fatigue, they're going to have exertional dyspnea. Um, diagnosis, we're going to do our routine EKG. It's going to show those irregular, irregular rhythms. So I keep repeating this for a reason because it's very highly tested. So irregular, irregular rhythm. They're going to have irregular R to R intervals. That's another thing that they might say on the question stem. Um, they'll have no discernible P waves. And that's the thing whenever I'm looking at a, a EKG, right? You always want to look right at the rhythm. You want to look at the rate. Okay. Is it narrow or complex? if it's a tachycardia, and is there P waves? If there's no P waves, then you can think about atrial fibrillation. Treatment for these patients, if the patient's stable, we tend to prefer rate control over rhythm control. So rate control with beta blockers is gonna be preferred. Other things you can do are calcium channel blockers, especially your, your non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, right? Because there's different types of calcium channel blockers, so make sure you know that. Sometimes it'll just say uh, dihydropyridine Calcium channel blockers or non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, it's going to be your non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. So it seems like your verapamol, right? But of course, uh, you want to make sure that you're also reading the question stem. If it's a patient that has asthma, right? We obviously don't want to give beta blockers. So it's a patient that's coming in, they have atrial fibrillation, they have a history of asthma, and obviously, something you do not want to give this patient is a beta blocker, okay? Uh, you can possibly give in something like a calcium channel blocker. So another thing that you can do is cardioversion. Uh, this is only indicated if the patient is like unstable, right? Or if they're if the if they are getting worse, if they're not getting better with the medication that you give them. Another thing that's very commonly tested is anticoagulation. So like we discussed, these patients with atrial fibrillation are very prone to clotting. So it's really important that we uh, risk stratify these patients and see whether we need to give them anticoagulation or not. And usually anticoagulation to prevent like your coronary, uh, like your CVA is usually indicated, sorry, cerebrovascular accident, CVA uh, strokes is indicated if present more than 48 hours. So if the AFib has been present more than 48 hours, or if the patient was using warfarin for three weeks before and four weeks after cardioversion. It's really important in these patients that we do anticoagulate, that we maintain an INR between two and three. That's something that they really, really like to test. And what do we use for anticoagulation? So we usually use things like heparin, right? Because warfarin has a longer half-life than heparin. 
heparin has a shorter half-life. Heparin kicks in quicker than warfarin, so that's why we prefer heparin over warfarin. Of course, then you can bridge them from heparin to warfarin later if needed to do so with these patients. If the patient's unstable, like we discussed, we're going to do cardioversion with these patients. So once again, in general, with your atrial fibrillation, right, no P waves, irregular, irregular with these patients. Management, if the patient's unstable, we're going to do cardioversion. If the patient's stable, we usually do rate control with something like your beta blockers or sometime, something like your calcium channel blockers like diltiazem. Okay. So a thing that I wanted to go to, over to is also your CHADS VAS2 score, stroke stratification. So these are some of the things that you take into consideration in a patient on whether you need to anticoagulate them or not, depending on the risk factors that they have. So if you have a patient that presents with the following, and even how I memorize it is that if you just think of CHADS2 score, right? I mean, that's a mnemonic for you there. So you have C, which is going to be your congestive heart failure. That gives you one point. H is going to be for your hypertension. That's give you another point. H greater than 75 is going to give you two points, right? Diabetes is going to give you one point. Stroke, history of stroke is going to give you two points. Vascular disease is going to give you one point. And age between 65 to 74 is going to give you one point. If the woman is a female, which is going to be your S, sex category, that's going to give you another point. So once again, age greater than 75 is two points. Age between 65 to 74 is going to be one point. So you add all those points depending on the risk factor on what the question stem tells you. And you are going to analyze what is the risk of stroke. So if they have a score of zero, their risk is really low and you really do not require anticoagulation. What if they have one risk factor? So they tend to have a low or moderate risk factor. With these patients, you can consider anticoagulation, but it's not usually necessary. What if they have a score of two or more? In these patients, usually they are indicated for anticoagulation or they are a candidate for anticoagulation. So just make sure that you keep that in the back of your mind in regards to atrial fibrillation on whether you need to anticoagulate these patients or not. Okay, the CHADS VAS2 score. I saw these a lot of practice questions, especially on your rash review questions. Um, so just make sure that you have that in the back of your mind. So next one's going to be our atrial flutter. So atrial flutter is going to be that sawtooth pattern, right? That sawtooth pattern that literally looks like a saw if you turn the saw upside down, see so the saw up, it looks like that sawtooth pattern. Usually with these patients, they're going to have an organized electrical activity. So it's going to be usually regular versus AFib, right? We said it's usually disorganized or irregular with these patients. An atrial fibro, fibro, flutter, sorry, they're going to have an atrial rate between 250 to 300 beats per minute. They'll have an AV node that conducts every two to three atrial impulses. And then it's going to be that sawtooth pattern like we discussed with these patients. Uh, some of the causes of a flutter and some of the things that we wanted to think about that they really like to test is that some of the causes is, and the most common cause, is going to be a heart failure. So heart failure is going to be the most common cause of a flutter. Other causes are things like COPD, rheumatic fever, atrial septal defect, if patients obese, obstructive sleep apnea. But the most common cause is usually going to be a heart failure. How is this patient going to present palpitations, lightheadedness, fatigue, shortness of breath, um, chest pain, anxiety? They'll have syncope or presyncope signs. They're going to be hypotension, tachycardia, evidence, evidence of congestive heart failure, right? So that fluid retention, like that edema, that shortness of breath. So with these patients, how are we going to diagnose them? We're going to do an EKG, right? Um, we can also do a transesophageal echocardiogram, which are usually preferred over your TTEs. So TEE is usually preferred echo. That's going to help us also evaluate what's the size of the atria, uh, size and function of the ventricles. It's going to help us also rule out things like peri pericarditis or any type of valvular disease, right? We can also do labs to look at their electrolytes, um, exercise testing, holter monitor. Well, how are we going to treat these patients? So if the patient's stable, usually it's going to be rate control. So remember, rate control over rhythm control always is better. So rate control with calcium channel blockers or beta blockers. If the patient's unstable, you can do something like your synchronized cardioversion. Uh, what's going to be the definitive treatment? Usually it's going to be a radio frequency catheter ablation. So you're going to go there and ablate it. So next one that we're going to talk about is going to be our 
uh, premature ventricular contractions or your PVCs. Whenever you look at that EKG, right, it's going to be that deep like V wave. And sometimes it's single. Sometimes it can be in two or in three. That's where you think about your bigeminy or your trigeminy, right? So usually it's just going to be a single, it looks like a V. Uh, this is usually benign. It tends to occur with patients that have ischemia or electrolyte imbalances. So once again, make sure that we're looking at the medications that the patient is taking, like some of your diuretics that are known for causing electrolyte imbalances. It also occurs in patients that are taking like stimulants, caffeine, uh, certain medications can also cause this, like we discussed. So how is this patient going to present? Sometimes it's asymptomatic. Sometimes you'll just do an EKG and you catch it. Um, if they do have symptoms, they might complain of palpitations. How are we going to diagnose this patient? We're going to do an EKG. It's going to show that wide, bizarre QRS that is followed by a compensatory pause. Usually the P wave is not seen because it's buried within the QRS. We can also diagnose the patient with a whole trauma monitor. And treatment usually is observation of the patient's asymptomatic. If the patient is having symptoms, then we can do a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker. A thing that we also want to take into account is if the patient's having like repetitive PVCs and they have some type of like underlying cardiac problem, these patients are at risk of having sudden death due to ventricular fibrillation. So it's important that we work these patients up. So the next one's going to be our ventricular tachycardia. So ventricular tachycardia is defined as three or more consecutive ventricular premature beats, okay? So remember we talked about those PVCs, it's gonna be like those Vs, but it's gonna be more than three of those. The rate is usually gonna be between 100 to 250 with these patients, and they're gonna have a wide QRS tachycardia. So remember when we discussed, you're looking at EKG, right? You're gonna look on whether it's regular or irregular. You're gonna look at the rhythm, um, the rate, and then we're also going to look at if it's a tachycardia, is it a wide or a narrowed? If it's a narrow, we're thinking, we're thinking about like our um, SVTs, right? PSVT. If it's a wide, then we're thinking about ventricular uh, tachycardia. So it's going to be a wide QRS tachycardia. So with this patient, they're going to be presenting with palpitations, dyspnea, lightheadedness, angina, so that chest pain. They can also be presenting with syncope or near syncope. Sudden cardiac death is a huge uh, cause of VTAC. How are we going to diagnose them? We're going to do that routine EKG. You're going to see that wide, bizarre QRS. And treatment usually with these patients is that um, with SVT, we need to know that it usually does not respond to vagal maneuvers or adenosine. So usually in a patient that's stable, we want to give them something like IV amiodarone. If the patient is, an, is unstable, then in these patients, we're going to cardiovert them, right? So... Next one we're going to go into is going to be ventricular fibrillation. This is the most common cause, and it's most commonly found in patients that have ischemic heart disease. So a patient that had like a prior um, heart attack, right, or if they had multiple like heart attacks, it's very commonly for us to find ventricular fibrillation in these patients. Of course, there's other causes like QT prolonging agents also, right? Um, with these patients, what are you going to see? on your EKG, it's going to be completely disorganized. I mean, you're not going to be able to see P waves, nothing. It's going to be all over the place with these patients. There's no usually pulse in these patients. There's immediate cessation of that cardiac output. You won't be able to say P waves, like we said, those QRS complex will not be there or T waves. It's going to be all over the place with these patients. These patients are usually going to present unconscious or sometimes even dead. Um, sometimes you can't even measure their blood pressure. They're not going to have heart sounds. They're going to have an absent pulse, and diagnosis is usually going to be with your EKG, right? That's when we said we're not going to see any of our T waves, any of our QRS complexes, no P waves, and nothing like that. Usually with these patients, how we treat them, um, if they're hypotensive or loss of consciousness, it's going to be synchronized cardioversion. But usually if they present with pulseless VTAC, which is the majority of the time you're going to see it on the question stems, it's going to be usually your immediate defibrillation and CPR in these patients. So um, just make sure that you know that for that, for ventricular fibrillation. So the next topic is going to be prolonged QT syndrome. So prolonged QT syndrome is just like it sounds, right? That QT interval is going to be prolonged. It's going to be greater than 550 milliseconds. And these patients are at very high risk of sudden death. So normally uh, QT syndrome tends to depend on whether 
a man, if they're a man or a woman, but usually it's going to be less than 430 milliseconds if you're a man and less than 450 milliseconds if you're a woman. So anything greater than 550, which is completely different than 430, right? And 450, it's almost 100 more, is considered your prolonged QT syndrome in these patients. Um, now, with these patients, the reason why these patients can, and it's it's so it's really important for us to diagnose, diagnose and why it can be so deadly is that it can turn into torsades of points or torsades of points, right? Which is that ribbon string, right? Whenever we look at that EKG, it looks like a ribbon string. That's when the QRS axis is swinging from positive to negative direction in a single lead. And usually with these patients, it can become very deadly. So how, is these patient, how are these patients going to present? Usually it'll say every question stems of like, it can be even a child that just keeps having these syncopes, right? So they keep having, they keep fainting over and over again. And um, you do an EKG and you see this prolonged QT interval in these patients. So diagnosis is going to be that routine EKG. It's going to show that prolonged QT, right? And we want to make sure that we treat these patients. Uh, we treat if they have any type of electrolyte abnormal abnormality. And then also another cause of your uh, QT, prolonged QT syndrome is going to be your medications, right? Your medications that tend to prolong your QT interval. So I'm going to discuss that right now in a few moments. So what are some of the medications that prolonged your um, QT? So some of the medications that are associated with QT prolongation are going to be some, some of your antiarrhythmics, right? So things like amiodarone, that's actually one of the big ones that prolongs your QT uh, things like sotalol, which is also within that same class of your um, antiarrhythmics, right? Because we have our class one, two, three, four. Um, class three is going to be both your amiodarone and your sotalol. Uh, quinidine is another one that prolongs your QT prolongation. That's from class one, right? Procainamide, once again, class one. Uh, Dofetilide, class one, and ibutilide, class one. So um, these are some of your antiarrhythmic medications that can actually prolong your QT interval. What are some of the antimicrobials? So the big ones are going to be your fluoroquinolones. So make sure that you know that it's things like your level floxacin, Cipro. Uh, another medication very commonly associated with QT prolongation that's in antibiotics is going to be your erythromycin, right? That macrolide, ketoconazole, which is one of your antifungals, and itraconazole also. Uh, some of your antidepressants are also very commonly known for causing QT prolongation. I actually had a question on some of my practice questions for this. I really like to test that. So just make sure you know that. So some of your TCAs like amitriptyline, um, imipramine, doxepin, fluoxetine, so your SSRI, sertraline, and then venlafaxine, so SNRIs. And then your antipsychotics, of course, right? So your um, haloperidol, ketiapine, so your atypicals and typicals, ciprazidone, and then of course, there's other medications like sumatriptan, um, methadone also can cause that QT prolongation. So just make sure that you have that in the back of your mind. So next one's going to be your torsades of points. So torsades of points, that's going to be the one that looks like we discussed briefly earlier, right? It looks like a ribbon. Uh, literally, the QRS is swinging. It goes from positive to negative in that single lead. It's going to be very rapid, very fast and it's gonna be polymorphic, polymorphic VTAC. So usually the QRS complexes are gonna be twisting around that baseline. It's very dangerous because it can go into VFib with these patients. What are some of the risk factors that can um, cause for size of points? So TCAs are gonna be one of the big ones, right? Uh, TCAs are just like, they have so many side effects, but TCAs, anticholinergics, also any type of electrolyte abnormalities. So if the patient has Hypomagnesemia, right? They're very prone to getting your torsades of points, ischemia. And with these patients, we're going to diagnose them. We're going to do an EKG. We can also do a CBC. We're going to see that hypokalemia and that hypomagnesemia. Treatment with these patients is going to be IV magnesium. And then, of course, correct any other type of electrolyte abnormalities also. If the patient is taking these medications that are causing torsades of points, then, of course, we want to make sure that we are removing these medications. So sinus bradycardia and sinus tachycardia. So in a normal heart rate, it's gonna be usually 60 to 100, right? Anything less than 60 is gonna be your bradycardia. Anything greater than 100 is gonna be your tachycardia. With sinus bradycardia, it's gonna be a heart rate less than 60. Usually these patients are asymptomatic. Sometimes 
you have those really well conditioned athletes, which is something that they really like to ask you and hint on your exams is a patient that's coming in and they are just a runner and they're presenting with like 50 or 40 heartbeat. Usually with these patients, you really don't need to do anything, just observe them. Um, but if they do have symptoms, they can have fatigue, angina, syncope. Uh, diagnosis is going to be that EKG, right? Like we said, usually if it's an athlete, don't really require treatment. There's people that just in general have a very slow heart rate, so you really don't have to re treat them at all. If the patient, of course, is severely symptomatic, then we can do something like atropine, right? So atropine, if it asks you what's best pharmacological treatment, it's going to be atropine for bradycardia. Another thing that we want to take into consideration is going to be any type of medication that's slowing down the heart rate. So sometimes a patient can be on a beta blocker. Sinus tachycardia, it's going to be a heart rate greater than 100. I have to say that I have sinus tachycardia, so my heart rate is always greater than 100, even if I'm sitting down. And honestly, I don't think I've ever had symptoms. If a patient does present with symptoms, they can present with palpitations. Uh, diagnosis, once again, it's going to be your EKG. It's going to be that super fast heart rate. And if there's any type of underlying cause that is causing this, right, if maybe something like hyperthyroidism is causing tachycardia, then of course, treat the underlying cause. But usually you can give them something like beta blockers, which is what I am taking. I'm taking beta blocker for my uh, tachycardia. I don't like it because just beta blockers have so many side effects. And one of them is just they make you very woozy, right? So that's why in, a, in your patients that are taking beta, beta blockers, it's really important that you instruct them on, especially elderly patients, right, to get up out of the bed slowly. Because I've had moments where I just feel like I'm going to pass out if I don't do that. Just because, you know, your the beta blocker is just reducing your heart rate. So next one's going to be your sick sinus syndrome. So sick sinus syndrome, what is this? How is it going to present? Uh, it's usually because there's some type of disease going on in the SA node. So it's usually an abnormality of the cardiac impulse formation that can be caused by an intrinsic disease of the sinus node that makes it unable to pacemake or by any type of extrinsic causes. So any type of scarring to the heart conduct conduction system, right? You think about the SA node, AV node. Um, can cause your sick sinus syndrome. And with these patients, how you look at it in the EKG, it's going to be that tachybrady. So it's like super fast, and then it'll go to like bradycardia. So that's how I recognize. I'm looking at the EKG, and I'm like, whoa, that was like really fast, and then it went to really slow. It's your tachybrady syndrome usually with these patients. Sometimes you can go from fast to slow, and then back again. Uh, sometimes these patients present with like syncope, uh, very commonly found in your elderly patients, also in your patients that have any type of heart problems. The thing to keep in mind is that sick sinus syndrome can get worsened by certain medications. So medications like your beta blockers, which makes sense, right? Because these patients are going from Brady to tachy. Calcium channel blockers, uh, digitalis also, any type of antiarrhythmic drug can actually worsen your sick sinus syndrome. So how is this patient going to present? Sometimes they'll have symptoms that are just all over the place. They say that they're tired, they're irritable, they have loss of memory, lightheadedness, palpitations, syncope, like I said. Most of them are even asymptomatic. So how are we going to diagnose these patients? We're going to do that EKG, right? We're going to see that sinus brady, sinus tachy. Um, sometimes there won't be any P waves. We can also do a whole trim monitor in these patients um, and then an exercise stress, stress test also. Now, if the patient is symptomatic, usually the permanent, a permanent pacemaker is going to be what's going to treat these patients. And that's usually the answer, permanent pacemaker for sick sinus syndrome, right? So what about Wolf-Parkinson-White -Par syndrome? Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome is very, very highly tested, so make sure that you know that. And I'm going to hit the key points that I kept missing over and over again on my practice questions, and then I kept seeing asked whether it was on the Ross review questions or an exam master, Smarty Pants, Kaplan, etc. So Wolf-Parkinson-White Wolf syndrome. What is this? This usually is happens from an accessory pathway that directly connects the atria and the ventricles. So there's this type of, there's this accessory pathway that is occurring in these patients. This patient, what are you going to see on EKG? You're going to see a narrow complex supraventricular tachycardia. You're going to see that short PR interval. They really like to test this, so make sure you know that. Short PR interval. You're going to see those delta waves, right? Literally looks like a wave. You're going to see that wide QRS complex. 
once again, short PR interval, short PR interval. They like to usually confuse you and put other words, which I'm not going to say because it's confusing you more. Short PR interval, wide QRS complex, and that delta wave in these patients. How is this patient going to present? They can have chest pain, so they're going to have that sudden onset of chest pain, palpitations, trouble breathing, uh, lightheadedness. They might even faint. Diagnosis, we're going to do our CBCs, right? CMPs, of course, our EKGs, thyroid, TSH, uh, drug screen, and our EKG, right? Uh, treatment for these patients, we want to m make sure that we're terminating these acute episodes. So you can do something like vagal maneuvers. Uh, also, you can do something like IV adenosine, right? Procainamide also. And in these patients, it's really important that we avoid calcium channel blockers. So avoid, avoid calcium channel blocks or, or digoxins, because what happens is that this increases the ventricular rate. Okay, so those were all the arrhythmias. Now we're going to go on to disorders of the AV node. So disorders of the AV node, those are going to be our AV blocks, which I'm going to discuss in a few minutes. So what happens in these disorders is that the SA node is not functioning normally. So in these patients, you usually see multiple P waves that can present with, with or without QRS complexes. Um, this happens because conduction across that AV node is compromised. So that's going to be essentially our second, first, second, and third degree blocks, right? Because there's a block, it allows for ventricular escape rhythms to manifest. And usually what happens with these rates is that they are unable to maintain adequate perfusion to the vital organs, especially like your organs, like your brain, your kidneys, and liver. And that's why it's really important that we treat these patients and also that we diagnose these patients correctly. So patients can also prevent, can present with transient AV conduction blocks. These are very commonly found in your young, like your first degree blocks, right? And usually are a cause of result of increased vagal tone, but usually very commonly found in um, settings of myocardial infarction, especially like your worst ones, like your second and third degree, aging, fibrosis, and any type of cardiac infiltrative disease in these patients. The definitive treatment usually involves the implantation of pacemaker, especially for those high degree AV blocks, right? Like your second degree Mobitz type 2, like we discussed earlier, and your third degree AV blocks with these patients. And the reason why we worry about our second degree type 2 is because it can go and develop into a third degree AV block, right? So let's go into each one. First degree AV block. This is where you have a fixed prolonged AV um, block. So what happens is that it prolongs the AV node conduction, and your PR interval is usually going to be prolonged more than one large square, so either five small squares or one large square, or more than 0.2 seconds or more than 200 milliseconds. So it's going to be that fixed prolonged PR interval. It's going to be usually greater than 200 milliseconds or more than 0.2 seconds. Now, like we said, usually with our type 1 in uh, Mobitz, type 2 Mobitz, second degree, type 1 Mobitz, um, your winky box. Usually with these patients, we really don't need to do anything. Treatment is just observed. But like we said, second degree AV block type 2, and then your third degree blocks with these patients, uh, we usually do need to give them a pacemaker. So let's go on to our second one, second degree AV block. What happens with second degree AV block is that you have some atrial depolarizations to conduct intervals. So you do have some P waves, um, but sometimes some of these are completely blocked. So let's go with our winky block type 1. So second degree AV block, winky block type 1. What happens is that you're going to see that longer and longer and longer, uh, usually QRS interval, and then you're going to see a drop. Okay? So long, 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 drop. Uh, each series has a consistent of P to QRS ratio of 3 to 2, 4 to 3, etc., until you have one of those P waves that's going to be dropping. Now we have Mobitz type 2. So with Mobitz type 2, um, what happens is that in these patients, you're going to see identical PR intervals before and after the dropped QRS complex in these patients. So these patients are usually going to have a series of cycles consisting of one normal P to QRS to T cycle, and then it's going to be preceded by a series of paced P waves that fail to conduct through the AV node, so you won't see any QRSs in these patients. And like we said, second degree type 2, it's always going to be your uh, treatment that was going to be your pacemaker, right? 
And then we have third degree AB block. So third degree AB block, there's no communication whatsoever between the P waves and the QRS complex. Like they're doing their own thing. They're not even communicating with each other, right? So usually with these patients, um, what happens is that you have conduction of the supraventricular depolarization, so the ventricles that are completely blocked. So that's why it's called third-degree AV block, completely blocked. So usually another thing that you'll see in these patients is that out of all the degree blocks, the third-degree AV block is going to be the only heart block that has a P wave that's going to be buried. So that's another thing how I differentiate it because I always confuse type 2 second degree type two and third degree is that in your third degree, usually you'll see your P waves that are buried in these patients. So now we're done with that. Let's go into congestive heart failure. This is something that's very commonly tested, especially on the pants also. They love to test it. Um, I saw this a lot during one of my rotations, um, my burn rotation, and very interesting. So we'll, let's get into it. So what is congestive heart failure? It's usually decompensated heart failure. Usually you're able to see this on either physical exam or chest x-ray. It's really important. I was listening to a podcast the other day, and the doctor said that it's really important that we always look for jugular venous distension. So we always look for that JVD, right? And we always measure it because it can tell you so much on whether the patient is fluid up or fluid down, right? And during my nephrology rotation, that was one thing my doctor went and, and would go see on every patient that he was seeing with CHF also. Um, and... For those of you who are in clinic rotations, and after I listen to that podcast, what I try to do now is to look at all the JVDs on patients because I want to see the difference between a normal uh, jugular venous distension and then abnormal, right? So make sure that you know that. So physical exam. You can also hear an audible S3, right? So you'll be hearing that heart sound, S3. Uh, increased jugular venous pressure. You'll see pulmonary edema on the x-ray. And the thing about congestive heart failure is that you need to know on whether it is left or right heart failure, which we're going to get into in a few minutes. Another thing that you want to know, of course, is whether it is systolic or diastolic, which we are going to get it also. So whenever we think about left ventricular failure, I always think about any type of symptom that is, is related to the lungs, right? So left heart failure, these patients are usually going to present with low cardiac output and congestion, and usually shortness of breath is going to be something that's going to be very pr prominent in these patients that have um, left ventricular heart failure. You'll also hear those crackles, right, on your um, physical exam because they just are so fluid up, so fluid overloaded. Now, right ventricular heart failure Right, that's usually going to involve more systemic symptoms. So you might see something like hepatomegaly, so an enlarged liver. You'll see peripheral edema, right, um, in these patients. So what is the most common cause of usually, like, heart failure? So you have two types, right? You have your systolic and diastolic. Um, systolic is the most common type that you'll see. And the thing about systolic heart failure is that it's most commonly associated with ischemic cardiomyopathy. This one's very highly tested, so make sure that you know that. They might ask you, what's the most common cause of systolic heart failure? It's going to be ischemic cardiomyopathy. So if the patient has coronary artery disease, um, myocardial infarction, and why? It's because they're losing functioning of that myocardium. It's not working like it used to because you have that tissue there. And usually treatment for systolic heart failure is usually want to make sure that we're reducing death and the patient being hospitalized because the definitive treatment for heart failure in general is just going to be a heart transplant, right? Um, you can give them symptomatic treatment that's going to decrease the symptoms, but usually the definitive treatment is going to be that heart, that heart transplant. So... What, what is systolic dysfunction? Usually with these patients, you have difficulty with ventricular contraction. Now, systolic function, dysfunction, we think about the ejection fraction, right? Ejection fraction, how much blood is being pushed out by the heart to the rest of the body. So an ejection fraction, I, I read multiple textbooks, some say 35% less, less than 40% is considered abnormal. Systolic Heart failure is usually going to be accompanied with a systolic ejection fraction less than, or ejection fraction in general, less than 40%. Versus diastolic, heart dysfunction, that's going to be a dysfunction of the heart, but your ejection fraction is going to be normal. So another way I've heard this also discussed, 
or whenever they say it in rounds, it's going to be heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, e ejection fraction, which is going to be your diastolic heart failure, or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, which is going to be your uh, systolic heart failure. So a patient with diastolic dysfunction, usually what happens is that in systolic function, dysfunction, right, your S3, right, systolic, S3, diastolic, S4, that's how I think about the heart sound, because it's something that they really like to test, is that in your um, systolic heart failure with these patients, <clears throat> is that these patients have difficulty with ventricular contraction. Why? Because you have that floppy ventricle. So you have this enlarged floppy ventricle that is just like super floppy, and it's not able to push blood out to the rest of the body. It's just large and floppy. How I think about it, you blow out a balloon, right, with air, and if you blow, you keep blowing it out, or if you've left it for a few days, you take it out, out all the air, right, you have this, like, the rest of the balloon, once the air is all out, like, that LaTeX is just, like, really floppy, right? Well, that's what your heart is. It's very, very floppy in your systolic heart failure versus your diastolic heart failure. It's this heart that's just, like, stiff. It's restricted. And it's so stiff that when you're feeling it, it can't relax. So you're feeling it and it's just stiff. The heart just cannot relax. And that's how I differentiate between one of them. So systolic, right? That's why they have um, reduced ejection fraction because that heart is just, that ventricle is just super floppy. It can't contract like it used to. It doesn't have that enough pump, right? Uh, versus your diastolic, diastolic, so your S4, what's written here on auscultation, these hearts are going to be restricted. They're going to be super, super stiff. So they are not able to relax. So when the blood, when the heart is filling, they can't relax. They can pump perfectly fine because they're strong enough to do that, but they just cannot relax. They're super stiff. So that's how you can differentiate between those two. And the thing about diastolic dysfunction is that usually it results from hypertension. It's usually associated with aging. Um, we said it's going to be that myocardial muscle stiffening, also left ventricular hypertrophy, right? That enlarged left ventricle. You're going to hear that S4. And treatment just in general for these type of dysfunction is we want to make sure that we're improving the symptoms, right? And we're treating the comorbidities. Once again, the definitive treatment is going to be a heart transplant because that heart is just not working like it used to. Another thing that you want to think about if it asks you, this patient's developing um, right-sided heart failure. So they're having those symptoms of your jugular venous ascension, they're having that hepatomegaly, that peripheral edema, right? Um, what is the most common cause of right heart failure? It's going to be left-sided heart failure. So that's another thing that they really like to test on. So in general, for congestive heart failure, like we discussed, and I keep saying this because it's very commonly tested, the most common cause is going to be coronary artery disease, a patient that has a history of a heart attack. Other causes are going to be hypertension and diabetes. Um, another thing that you need to know about CHF is the most common cause of transudative pleural fusion. So remember in pleural fusions, we have our exudative, right, which is usually like your bacteria, your malignancies like cancer. And then you have your transudative, which is usually going to be your your, um, your fusions that are usually like clear, right? They don't have a lot of protein. The most common cause of transudative pleural fusions, so you, do, you see a pleural fusion, transudative, think about CHF. CHF is going to be the most common cause, which makes sense, right, because they're fluid up. Um, very commonly found in your patients that are older than 65 in these patients. So how is this patient going to present with CHF in general? So this patient usually is going to present with your dyspion exertion. They'll have a chronic non-productive cough. Sometimes it'll say like it's even like tinged pink. Um, I've had questions when I'm like, hmm, that sounds like, uh, it sounds like maybe chronic, uh, COPD, right? Um, but no, it's CHF. They have that like pink stinged mu uh, cough mucus. Um, usually they also have, they feel like they're more shortness of breath whenever they're laying down, which makes sense, right? Because they're so fluid overload overloaded. These patients, sometimes they have trouble breathing. Um, they're going to be fatigued. They're going to have orthopnea, like we discussed, which is usually better by sitting up or sleeping with additional pillows. They're going to have that paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, which is, means that they have like these attacks of severe shortness of breath and coughing that occurs at night. Once again, why? Because they're fluid overloaded. Signs, they're going to have that chain stokes breathing, which is going to be that periodic cyclic respiration. Edema is one of the big ones. So whenever I think I read a question and I see edema, I think of either kidney problems or heart problems. 
So usually you're going to have that edema in the ankles and the pretibial areas. And it's going to be the usually that pain edema, right? So you're going to pit and it goes all the way. Rouse and crackles is another thing you're going to hear on your pulmonary exam. Right? Usually rouse and crackles, we think about maybe like your left side of heart failure versus your edema. Your peripheral edema, we think about our right side of heart failure. Heart sounds you're going to hear, S3 and S4, like we discussed. Uh, repetition, I keep repeating because that's a key. Systolic, right? Systolic, S3 heart sounds, diastolic. It's going to be usually your um, S4 heart sounds. We said that diastolic has preserved ejection fraction, right? So the ejection fraction is going to be normal versus systolic. It's going to have a reduced ejection fraction, usually less than 40% or 35%, depending on what textbook you're reading. Um, they're going to have jugular venous pressure that's going to be usually greater than 8 centimeters. Um, cold extremity, cyanosis, hepatomegaly, like we discussed. So they can also have ascites, jaundice, peripheral edema. So how are we going to diagnose this patient? If the patient's coming in with a new onset, or whether it's a chronic or acute deep compensation, we want to make sure that we do a CBC, CMP, measures of lipids, or TSH, because um, mixed edema heart, mixed edema heart can also present very similar to CHF, so that's another thing that you want to keep in mind. Mixed edema heart, right? Um, you also want to make sure that you measure serum BMP. Now, this is textbook-wise, of course. Usually, I was listening to a podcast the other day that uh, now they really don't recommend that in clinic or in the hospital because it's not very specific because BMP is increased in not only CHF, but it's increased in a lot of other patients. Usually it increases in pages, increases in patients that have, that are older or if they have problems with their kidneys, it can be increased. But in regards to textbook wise, certain BMP, you can measure that. Usually what happens is that the BMP tends to increase whenever the, the ventricular filling pressures are high. So that's why uh, we tend to measure also BNP. Um, and like I discussed, BNP is not very specific because it can be low in obese patients. So the reason why we do a BNP is because it helps us differentiate whether the shortness of breath is because of a cardiac problem like heart failure or whether it's coming from some type of a pulmonary problem, right? Or even renal issues. So that's the reason why we also do a BNP because it differentiates shortness of breath from heart failure from non-cardiac issues. We can also do an EKG, a chest x-ray. We're going to look for those curly B lines, right, which is going to be that vascularization in the lungs because you have so much increased fluid and pressure. You can also do an echo. The echo is going to help you differentiate on whether uh, the heart failure is having preserved or reduced ejection fraction. And management for these patients, so acute management, always, 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 these patients are fluid up. Right, So you want to decrease their fluid. What's the best way to do that is just by giving them diuretics. So things like LASIK, um, giving them patients LASIK is going to help them pee out and get rid of all that extra fluid that they have in their bodies. I remember I had a patient that um, he had CHF and he would have like acute exacerbations of CHF. And we would just give him like he was already on a dose, like a stable dose of LASIK. But sometimes he just needed like an extra like push of extra dose of Lasix. And sometimes we would just give him an extra dose. And he was perfectly fine by the following, that following afternoon. So Lasix can do wonders. Um, so acute management, right? That acute exacerbation, uh, you want to think about Lasix. The mnemonic we have is going to be your L-M-N-O-P. So Lasix, L for Lasix, M for morphine, because morphine reduces your prelib, So it reduces that work on the heart. Nitrates also, nitrates reduces that preload on the heart, oxygen, and then of course positioning the patient. Another thing you can give them is ACEs, ACE inhibitors and diuretics, um, calcium channel blockers also, especially for your patients that have your diastolic heart failure, right, that rigid heart in these patients. Another thing you can give them, um, not for acute, but just in general for congestive heart failure is going to be digoxin, right? So digoxin helps like that heart pump, right, that heart pump, because you have that floppy heart that is just not working, especially in your patients that have, like, your systolic heart failure, so it's going to help that patient, like, pump out blood, so it's going to help them, the, the heart be a little bit stronger. So another thing you can also tell them is to decrease their sodium, right, so sodium restriction is another way with these patients. Usually these patients have a very poor prognosis, especially if they have, like, other comorbidities, like, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, which is usually what 
most of these patients have, so they have a very poor prognosis for these patients. So once again, right, definitive treatment for just in general for heart failure is going to be your um, cardiac transplant. So it's just something that you need to know in these patients. So what is the criteria for cardiac transplant? So cardiac transplant has a criteria that if a patient has a history of repeated hospitalizations for heart failure, um, if you've had to increase their intensity of medical therapy or add more medications to their um medical therapy. Uh, if they have a reproducible VO2 max of less than 14 ml per kilogram per minute, that's also an indication for a cardiac transplant. Other ones are refractory cardiogenic shock, dependence on IV ionotropes to maintain that adequate organ perfusion, severe symptoms of ischemia that are not amenable to revascularization or recurrent unstable angina, and recurrent symptomatic ventricular arrhythmias that are refractory to all therapies these are all the criteria that are um, basically tell you that a patient is candidate for cardiac transplant. So next thing that we want to discuss is whether you have a patient that comes in with CHF, right? Are you going to admit them or are you going to refer them? So a patient that is going to be referred is going to be a patient that presents with new symptoms of heart failure or if the patient has continued symptoms and they have a reduced left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 35% or 40%, depending on what textbook you're reading. Now, a patient that you're going to admit with CHF is going to be a patient that presents with new or worsening symptoms, or if they have positive biomarkers that are, in the, that are indicating an acute myocardial infarction. Also, if the patient is presenting with hypoxia, fluid overload, pulmonary edema, that has not resolved with your treatment for outpatient, the medications that you're giving, then these patients meet criteria for being admitted. So just keep that in the back of your mind. All right, guys, so the next one we're going to go into is going to be coronary artery disease. It's really important that with coronary artery disease, we know the medications, right? So um, with coronary artery disease, right, it's going to be your um, atherosclerosis, right? Disease, these patients are prone to getting those heart attacks. And what they really like to test on this is just the treatment, the medication treatment that we're going to do for these patients. So we have a lot of lipid-lowering drugs, and just in general for cholesterol, right, we have our bad and good cholesterol. So our good cholesterol is going to be our HDL. That's the one that we want high. Specifically, I would say higher than 60, right? That's the one that we want high. So how I memorize it, H, high, HDL. The ones that we want low are going to be our LDL, our triglycerides, and just in general, our total cholesterol, okay? So it's really important that we want these low because these are the bad ones. So a way you can get your good cholesterol is through like fish oil, right? Your omegas, etc. So just keeping that in mind, sometimes they'll give you a question stem that it gives you a patient that they have like triglyceride levels like a 400 or 500. Um, what do you want to do? What's the best medication for these patients? So in these patients, you want to give them a medication that decreases their triglycerides, right? what is the best medication for decreasing triglycerides in general? So when I think about medications that are the best at decreasing your triglycerides, then I think about maybe like some of your fibric acid medications, right? Like phenofibrate, genfibrazole, because those are really, really good at decreasing your, your um, triglycerides. Another thing with triglycerides, right, is that if a patient usually has them very, very high, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800, these are patients that are very prone to de uh, developing pancreatitis. It's a common cause of acute pancreatitis. So that's another thing that we want to keep in mind with our triglyceride levels. Well, what if a patient has an LDL level that is extremely high? What's the best treatment? So in these patients, we want to think about statins, right? Uh, these are very, very good at decreasing your LDL levels. So that's how I think about it in regards to answering these questions. In general, statins, statins are like probably one of the best medications uh, just for, uh, in general, lowering, lowering the patient's cholesterol and just for preventing uh, coronary artery disease. So coronary artery disease. Uh, another thing that we need to know with these patients is you have a patient that comes in and they have, they're this age and they have these type of comorbidities. What is the best, what's the next thing or what's the best treatment? Do you want to put them, we said statins are always like first line they're really, really good in general for these patients, um, especially if they have like an LDL. They're really good at lowering LDL levels. So are you going to put them on a moderate, low, 
high intensity statin or can they just can you just put them on conservative measures right tell the patient to make sure that they are um, having a good diet that they're increasing their exercise so let's go into that so does a patient have known atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease so if the answer for that is no okay so the patient does not have coronary vascular disease, right? CVD. Is a patient older than 21 and their LDL is greater than 190? Yes. Then in these patients, you want to start them on the high intensity statin. Or what if the patient is between 40 to 75 years old and they have diabetes, but they have no history of coronary vascular disease? What do you want to do? Well, you're going to measure their 10-year ASCVD risk. Um, is it greater than 7.5%? Yes. Then you're going to start them on high intensity statin. If it's not, then you're going to put them on a moderate intensity statin. What if the patient has a known history of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and they're older than 75? In these patients, you want to go straight to our high-intensity statins. So what are some of your examples of your high-intensity statins? These are going to be atorvastatin, 40 to 80 milligrams per day, or rosuvastatin, 20 to 40 milligrams per day. Some of your moderate-intensity statins are going to be something like atorvastatin, 10 to 20 milligrams, or fluvastatin. Um, make sure that you know that. So usually, once again, rosuvastatin is going to be one of your high-intensity statins. Um, so is atorvastatin, but rosuvastatin is dosed a little bit less, 20 to 40 milligrams in your high, versus atorvastatin is going to be 40 to 60 milligrams in high. Your moderate ones are going to be atorvastatin, but 10 to 20 milligrams, um, and fluvastatin also, 40 milligrams twice a day. Something that they really like to ask. So let's go back to our lipid-lowering drugs. So statins, these include your atorvastatin, right? fluvastatin, lovastatin, pravastatin, rosuvastatin, simvastatin, anything that ends in statin. These drugs are very good at lowering your LDL levels, right? But these patients, these medications do have major side effects. One of the main ones is going to be your myositis and rhabdomyolysis. So these patients can complain of muscle pain. Uh, just make sure that you know that. These patients, these, this medication can also cause elevations in hepatocellular enzymes, so it may be known for hepatotoxicity. That's something that they really like to test. So once again, statins is going to be your myositis and rhabdomyolysis and your hepatotoxicity. So the reason why I'm going over these medications, once again, like I started the video, medications is something that they really like to test on the family medicine, especially your, uh, your lipid lowering medications, your high blood pressure medications, your ACEs, ARBs, etc. Um, and your diabetes medications, which we're going to go through. So that's why I'm going through these. So the next ones are going to be your PCSK9 inhibitors. These are going to be your um, evolucumab and your alirocumab. Um, some of the major side effects for these medications is that they cause injection site reaction. So these are come whenever like your new medications for cholesterol lowering medications. So these are like kind of like the newer kids of the block, right? Other ones are going to be fibric acid derivatives. So things like phenofibrate, genfibrazole. Um, with these medications, right, your phenofibrate and your gemfibrozole, these medications are really good for just uh, lowering your triglyceride levels. So just make sure that you have that in the back of your mind. So they're very good at triglyceride levels. Uh, the thing about these medications, especially like phenofibrate, they're very commonly associated with skin rash, um, GI symptoms also. So next one's going to be your niacin. Uh, niacin is very commonly associated with your cutaneous flushing and myositis. So in patients, you want to make sure that you don't give statins and niacin together, right? Because they both cause myositis, so just keep that in the back of your mind. Since niacin, niacin is known for causing myositis. And the big one is going to be your prostaglandin mediated cutaneous flushing, right? That uh, flushing of the skin. They can also present with hyperpigmentation, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea but myositis and your flushing is going to be the big ones. Now we have bioacid sequestrants, so things like your cholestyramine, cholestipol, colcivilum. Um, with these medications, these medications are very commonly associated with elevations in hepatic transaminase and alkaline phos, so very commonly associated with hepatotoxicity. Another thing is that patients don't really like taking these because they cause a lot of GI symptoms like nausea, constipation, cramping, bloating. So just also, also keep that in the back of your mind. You also have your chol cholesterol absorption inhibitor, something like your isitimib. isitimib sorry. Um, with this one, it can increase transaminases, especially when you give them with statins. So once again, this is another one that you don't want to give with statins. 
So these were some of the medications that we were discussing in regards to um, treatment for um, lipid lowering drugs. So your coronary artery disease. I wanted to discuss a few more medications. So other medications that we tend to recommend for patients that have coronary artery disease that ha help with the anti-anginal and then they also help with hypertension. So the patient that has hypertension and on top of that, they also have coronary artery disease. You maybe want to think about maybe giving them something like an ACE inhibitor, right? Especially if they have like a lot of comorbidities like we discussed, right? Your hypertension, uh, coronary artery disease, uh, diabetes is a huge one, right? Um, the thing about ACE inhibitors that you need to know is like we discussed earlier for CHF, they decrease mortality rate. These are very good at decreasing mortality rate. And with these medications, it's really important that um, we not these patients, these medications can cause angioedema. So, you know, that inflamed lip. So make sure that we know that. Also, it can ca cause that chronic cough, right? Um, that's something that's also very commonly asked in questions. It's going to be a patient that comes in and they're having this cough and you ruled out asthma and like COPD and everything. And you have to ask them, well, what medications are they taking? ACE inhibitors is going to be one of the big culprits for causing your um, cough. Also, hyperkalemia is a big one that is commonly associated with ACE inhibitors. So what about your angiotensin receptor blockers. Usually we use these medications in patients that, of course, do not tolerate ACE inhibitors. So maybe um, that patient's having a cough, right? Maybe you can switch to something like your ARB with these patients. And then, of course, we want to make sure that we're careful with patients that are pregnant. These are very commonly associated with your angioedemia and hyperkalemia also. And then we have our beta blockers. These are usually first line in patients that have a history of type of myocardial infarction, right? Acute coronary syndrome. Um, AFib, a flutter, like we discussed, and these medications decrease mortality rates. So we said ACE inhibitors decrease mortality rate, so does beta blockers. And once again, like we discussed earlier, we want to make sure that we educate these patients about your um, orthostatic hypotension, right? Um, so just educate these patients on how to take these medications. Other medications we can use are going to be calcium channel blockers. We can consider this in patients that cannot tolerate beta blockers, right? Or patients that have concurrent like Raynaud's syndrome, right? Which is that vessel vasoconstriction that causes like the, the, the blueness, right? Of the fingers. And with these medications, we just want to make sure that um, we use them carefully in patients that have second or th third degree heart blocks. And then you have your nitrates. Uh, this is usually used in patients that have symptoms that are not controlled with beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. They can use something like nitrates. And then of course for antiplatelet therapy, all patients with uh, coronary artery disease get aspirin. Why? Because this decreases the rate of them having a stroke or a heart attack. But it's really important with aspirin that we're careful because especially in your patients that have like ulcers, right? Or a history of GI bleeding. Uh, we want to make care be careful because um, it can cause GI bleeding. All right, guys, so those were the medications that they really like to test in your coronary artery disease, right? It's going to be those patients that um, just have high cholesterol, right? You They go in and you do um, cholesterol, you do LDL, HDL, you look at their total cholesterol level, your triglycerides, and then we said that we want to make sure that the HDL is going to be the only one that we want to keep high. So we want to usually keep that higher than 60, right? Um, and then, of course, we want to make sure that we keep our LDL less than 100, total cholesterol less than 200, and then usually for our triglyceride levels less than 150. So anything that's greater than that is going to be considered abnormal, right? Um, and that's where we can use these medications. Statins are usually going to be your first line for everything, usually. Triglycerides, right? We usually said that the best medications for triglycerides are going to be your... Um, Fibric acid derivatives like your phenofibrate and your gemfibrozole. And we also want to make sure that we know the side effects. So statins is always going to be your hepatotoxicity, right? And then your um, bone pain, your myositis, muscle pain, rhabdomyolysis. So make sure that you know that. All right, guys. So next one's going to be your endocarditis. So endocarditis. Um, endocarditis is usually caused by vegetations which is usually like these masses of like microorganisms, fibrin platelets that seed on the valves of the heart. Um, 
usually with these patients, the mitral valve is usually the most commonly one involved. So in endocarditis, if it asks you which valve, valve is the most commonly one involved, it's always going to be your mitral valve, except for IV drug abusers. And IV drug abusers, the most common valve involved is going to be your tricuspid valve. So make sure you know that they really like to test this. So once again, most common cause, most common valve involved in endocarditis is going to be your mitral valve, except for IV drug users, it's going to be your tricuspid valve. So the thing about endocarditis is that it can either follow two courses, either the acute course or the subacute course. And also it involves two different bacteria in each acute and subacute. So make sure that you know that they really like to test that. So the acute course with these patients, they're going to be having febrile illness. They have these massive, massive vegetations that are going to damage your valves, right? Um, usually these tend to metastasize to the extra cardiac sites, and they will progress to death within weeks if it's not treated. So you have this bacteria, right? They like to um, settle on the valves, and usually with your acute course, it's a lot more severe than your subacute course. And it's really important that we, def we treat these patients. And the most common organism in acute endocarditis is going to be MRSA. Make sure you know that. MRSA, most common organism associated with your acute course. Now, the subacute course is more slower, right? So it causes damage to the valve, structural damage, but it's a lot slower and it rarely metastasizes. That's something that you, we really need to know to differentiate between these. Um, it can be complicated though by an embolic event. This is where there's an emboli that forms because you have these vegetations that are breaking off, right? And they start entering the circulation and then it travels to the lungs, brain, arteries, and other organs, and even to your extremities. And that's what can cause your thromboembolism. So with the subacute course of your endocarditis, the most common organism is going to be your streptococcus variadens. So that's something you need to know. Once again, MRSA, staph, it's going to be your acute course versus your subacute. It's going to be your streptococcus variadens. Um... Usually oral flora is usually the most common cause, right? Because we find strep all over our mouth. So usually it'll say a patient that had like a root canal the other day and they were not giving any type of prophylaxis and now they're coming in with like full-blown endocarditis. And you're thinking about, okay, this is probably streptococcus viridens. So once again, endocarditis and IV drug users is usually commonly associated with MRSA. That's usually going to be the big one. Other ones can be Pseudomonas, also Candida, but the big one's going to be MRSA. Now, what about your prosthetic valve endocarditis? This usually happens within 60 days of a patient receiving a prosthetic valve, and usually Staphylococcus epidermidis is going to be the most common. So once again, make sure you know these, right? We said that uh, strep viridens is going to be in subacute versus your MRSA and Staph is going to be usually in your acute course of endocarditis, these patients. Um, other things that we need to know is that there's other organisms like enterococci. This is very common, especially in your men that are older than 50 that have any history of GI or GU procedures. This can also cause your endocarditis in these patients. Other organisms that can cause endocarditis is going to be some of your gram negatives. So the mnemonic for this is going to be HACEK, H-A-C-E-K. So H is going to be for your hemophilus. A is going to be for your actinobacillus, C is going to be for your cardiobacterium, E is going to be for your eichinella, and K is going to be for your king kingella. Correct me if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Uh, these are usually gram-negative organisms, and they're usually associated with development of large vegetations and are often hard to culture. So if in the question says that, says that it's a gram-negative and the culture is inconclusive, you're possibly thinking about these HACIC, these any of these bacteria, because like we discussed, these are usually hard to culture. They're usually and they are gram-negative organisms. So how is this patient going to present? They're going to have a fever. That's going to be a big one. It's going to be usually a low-grade fever. Um, usually low-grade fever is going to be associated with subacute infection. Now, if a patient presents with a high fever, then in these patients, you're thinking about acute endocarditis. So once again, low-grade subacute endocarditis, right? We said subacute is usually associated with what type of bacteria? Streptococcus. And then high fever is usually associated with your acute endocarditis, which is usually associated with MRSA. So 
<clears throat> Another thing that you're here and usually in the question stem, if it's a patient that presents with a new onset of a murmur, you're thinking about endocarditis. So that's something also to keep in mind. It's going to be a new murmur. It's usually going to be new regurgitation murmurs that usually develop because you have damage to that valve because of those vegetations on that valve. Or usually there's rupture of the chordae tendinae that can cause these murmurs. These patients can also present with congestive heart failure. Why? Because you have that valve that's ruptured, that valvular dysfunction. They're going to be presenting with emboli, like we discussed. Janeway lesions is a big one. Uh, make sure that you know this, which we'll discuss in a few minutes. They really like to ask you questions on, is this a Janeway lesion? Or is this this or that? Oster nodes, et cetera. So Janeway lesions are usually going to be non-tender subcutaneous nodules on the palms or soles of the feet. So it's going to be these nodules, but they're going to be non-tender. Janeway, non-tender. Versus your oster nodes, these are painful Erythematous lesions are usually found on the palms and the soles. How I memorize it is that you have O is ouch, right? O, ouch, oster nodes, painful nodes, uh, painful erythematous lesions on the palms and soles versus Janeway, they're going to be non-painful. Other things that you can see is subungual or splinter hemorrhages. There's going to be dark red linear lesions seen on the nail beds, right? Because you're having, you have so many tiny vessels and you have that bacteria just traveling all over your body and it just gets caught there and embolizes. The patient can present with bone or joint pain, anorexia, weight loss, fatigue. Raw spots is another one. It's going to be your retinal hemorrhages with white spots. Diagnosis is that we always want to make sure that we do blood cultures, and we want to do blood cultures before we give the patient antibiotics. Usually we want to get three sets. So once again, blood cultures before we give the patient antibiotics. Why? Because if we give the patient antibiotics, it's going to be really difficult to culture or have a specific bacteria organism that's going to be cultured or separated, right? You can also do EKGs, uh, since usually patients that have endocarditis are very prone to getting any type of arrhythmia. And also, you want to make sure that you obtain a transthoracic echo. Usually, you obtain a transthoracic echo first before you go to TEE. And that's even in real life, that's what you always do. Even though transthoracic echoes are not very conclusive they're not very specific especially if the patient's like very obese and they have like a lot of like tissue right you won't be able to see a lot but you know whenever you call for a cardio consult you always want to make sure they always ask you like did you do a TTE and you're like yes you have to do always a TTE before you go into a TEE so transthoracic echo before you go into a transesophageal echo and that's going to be the same thing for your diagnosis always make sure you do a TTE echo first and then if the TTE of course is not diagnostic, which is usually the majority of the time, um, then you go into your TEA. So that's another way they can ask you questions. It's what's the best like um, diagnostic imaging test. It's always going to be, of course, uh, what's the first one? The best one's usually going to be your TEE. What's the first one? It's going to be your um, TTE. Labs, also you can do a CBC. You're going to see the patient's going to be anemic. They're going to have leukocytosis. They're going to have an elevated ESR, right? Because there's a lot of inflammation going on. Another thing that they really like to test is going to be the Duke's criteria. So we're just going to discuss that real quick. So the Duke's criteria is usually a criteria that tells, helps you diagnose the patient with um, infective endocarditis. And they have major and minor criteria. So major is going to be if the patient has sustained bacteremia. So that means that they have two positive blood cultures by an organism known to cause endocarditis. So your organisms like strep that we, that we discussed, right, your MRSA. And they have also and or they have endocardial involvement that is documented either by having a positive echocardiogram. So you did a positive echocardiogram and you saw some type of vegetation, abscess, valve perforation, and they have a new valvular regurgitation, like whether it's aortic or mitral valve regurgitation. Now, these are going to be your major. What about your minor criteria? Minor criteria is going to be any type of predisposing condition. So if the patient has abnormal valves, if they're IV drug abusers, if they have catheters, um, fever also greater than 38 degrees Celsius, vascular and embolic phenomena. So if they have any of your Janeway lesions, right, um, pulmonary emboli, in increased cranial hemorrhage, um, intracranial hemorrhage, sorry. Immunological phenomena is going to be the other one. So oster nodes, rot spots, if they have that positive rheumatoid factor, a positive blood culture also that is not meeting any of the major criteria is also a minor criteria. And if they have a positive echocardiogram, that did not meet the major criteria. 
So these patients have to have either two major that we discussed or one major plus three minor or five minor, okay? For us to say it can be infected endocarditis. So they really like to test this. How I've seen it asked is that which one of these are part of the major criteria and which one of these are part of the minor criteria. So just make sure that you know these. So now we're gonna go into treatment. So treatment for these patients, usually we wanna give them antimicrobial therapy, right? It's usually gonna be IV. If the patient has acute, we wanna make sure that we're giving medications that cover your staph and your MRSA. So things like Nestlein and Gentamicin for four to six weeks, or you can give them vancomycin plus gentamicin if MRSA is suspected, or if the patient is allergic to penicillin, right? Subacute, we wanna give medications that are covering for your strep, right? So penicillin or ampicillin plus gentamicin. Uh, prosthetic valves, vancomycin and gentamicin plus rifampin to cover staph or aries. Fungal, we wanna give things like amphotericin B for six to eight weeks. And the thing about fungal, though, is that mostly patients need surgical intervention for fungal cases. Make sure that you know that. So anything that's fungal, um, say you do the culture, it came back fungal, we give them amphotericin B, right? You're amphoterrible. This one's really good at killing any type of systemic fungal. And usually these patients need surgical intervention. So make sure you know that. Now, surgical treatment is sometimes needed, especially if the patient develops CHF. Um, this is usually going to be one of the indications for surgery. Other indications for surgery, like we discussed, fungal infections. Um, if the patient has uh, staph aureus endocarditis, or if they have uncontrolled infection with staph aureus, it's another um, another way that we another thing that we want to think about. This patient has to go into surgery. Um, now, <clears throat> in regards to antibiotic prophylaxis, which is something that they really like to ask, is that it's only recommended for patients that are very high risk for severe morbidity or death. So sometimes some of your patients that have IV drug use, uh, some patients that have congenital heart defects, or if they have a history of infective endocarditis, then we want to think about antibiotic prophylaxis. And it's usually recommended for dental procedures um, that have to do with either the gingival tissue or the periapical region of the tooth, like your root canals, right, or any type of perforation of the oral mucosa. Patients that are at high risk in which prophylaxis is indicated before any type of dental procedures are going to be the following. Any patient that has prosthetic heart valve, any patient that has a history of prior endocarditis, if a patient has unrepaired cyanotic congenital heart disease, if they have completely repaired congenital heart defects, if the dental procedure will be done during the six months after the repair, so six months after the repair, um, if they have vavulopathy that's developing after cardiac transplantation, now, what is going to be the medications that we're going to use? It's going to be usually amoxicillin, 2 grams, uh, 30 to 60 minutes before any of the procedures that we do. If the patient's allergic to penicillin, then we can do something like clindamycin. Uh, one thing that has been updated is that usually prophylaxis is not recommended for any type of GI or GU procedures. So just keep that in the back of your mind. All right, so that is endocarditis. Now... <clears throat> I know I briefly discussed, discussed coronary vascular disease, but let's go into hyperlipidemia and hypertriglyceridemia. So <clears throat> in general, why don't we discuss each one? I know I briefly discussed it, and I know when I was discussing it, I'm like, I know I have it somewhere else on here where I discussed it more into detail. So we have different types of lipoproteins. These are substances that usually transport lipids in the form of soluble, soluble complexes of lipids and proteins. So we have our chylomicrons, we have our LDL and our HDL, we have VLDL and IDL also. Chylomicrons have high fat and triglyceride content. So these are probably like one of the worst ones, right? They have very low cholesterol and protein content. Um, they are the largest and they're the least dense because they're so big. And then we have our LDL. These are the main carrier of cholesterol. They're synthesized by the liver to take cholesterol to the peripheral tissues, and they're usually removed by the liver. Usually these are small, they're dense, um, and they're more atherogenic than the larger LDL particles. So small, dense LDLs are more atherogenic than your large LDL particles. The thing about small LDLs is that these can damage the endothelial lining of the blood vessels. And what happens is that you have all these macrophages, right? Like parts of your immune system, your macrophages, your monocytes, your T lymphocytes. They go down into the intima, which is like part of your vessel. 
and they start building up under the endothelial cell. This is where they start producing those foam cells, right? And they can cause formation of platelet thrombosis in these patients. What about HDL? This one carries cholesterol from the tissues back to the liver. This is going to be the one that's going to be the smallest in diameter, but it's going to be the most dense because it has the highest amount of protein and the least amount of triglycerides and fat. These are usually produced by the liver, intestine, and peripheral tissues. And the thing about this one, why HDL is so good, is because it inhibits the atherosclerotic process by inhibiting oxidation of LDL and promoting removal of cholesterol from foam cells. So how is total cholesterol calculated? Total cholesterol is going to be your LDL plus HDL plus VLDL. So what is athro? Genesis, right? It's going to be development of plaque within the walls of the blood vessels due to a complex interaction with elements, vessel wall abnormalities, and alterations in the blood flow. So, what are other what are some secondary causes of hyperlipidemia that are very commonly found in practice, right? So, diet is one of the big ones. Usually, um, if a patient has a bad diet, right, we're going to see an elevated LDL, um, especially in patients that have anorexia nervosa, right? That was something that I was very confused about. Like, you're assuming that the patient doesn't eat, so why do they have an elevated LDL? But yes, anorexia nervosa is associated with elevated LDLs, especially hypercholesterolemia, right? Um, another thing that's associated with elevated LDL is going to be weight gain, saturated trans fats, Elevated triglycerides are associated with weight gain, very low fat diets, high intake of refined carbohydrates, and also excessive alcohol. Certain diseases are also associated with elevated LDL. You have things like your biliary obstruction, nephrotic syndrome, um, <clears throat> hypothyroidism, obesity. If the patient is pregnant and that's not a disease, but um, that's also one of the um, alterations of metabolism that is associated with elevated LDL. Now, elevated triglycerides, things like uh, nephrotic syndrome, chronic renal failure, lipidostrophies, uh, diabetes mellitus, especially poorly controlled diabetes mellitus is associated with elevated triglycerides, hypothyroidism, obesity, and once again, pregnancy also. So another thing that we want to keep in mind is fam familiar dyslipidemia. So these are going to be any type of your... Um, inherited disorders where they have some type of genetic mutation of one or several genes that does not allow them to break down cholesterol in general like most of us do. And there's different types. Um, usually these familiar dyslipidemias can either be autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive. And these patients usually present with xanthomas, which is going to be the cholesterol on the elbow, right? They can present with xanthelasma, which is going to be that triglyceride under the eye. They can have that corneal arcus, which is going to be cholesterol and cornea. But, you know, corneal arcus, xanthelasma, and xanthomas don't only present in these patients that have familiar dyslipidemias. They also present in patients that just have uncontrolled um, hyperlipidemia. So it's something that I keep in mind. I remember when I had a patient during my one of my rotations, um, he had, like, neurocephalus. And so he had really bad um, – he just – you know, he wasn't there. He wasn't all there, unfortunately. And of course, he didn't follow up with his doctors. He was like 67. We went to go see them and he had that corneal arcus. If you've ever seen, it's really interesting. So screening is really important for your hyperlipidemia. It's something that they really like to test. So make sure you know that they'll say, according to the USPSTF, screening guidelines for hyperlipidemia start at when? Um, so we want to make sure that we screen all adults over 21 years old and any patient that has a history or has active diabetes mellitus or coronary vascular disease. We also screen all men greater than 35 and women greater than 45 should also be screened. You also want to make sure that you screen any first degree relative with any with hyperlipidemia. Another thing that you want to do is um, if a patient has diabetes mellitus and you see dyslipidemia, you want to make sure that we start the screening these patients at diagnosis, and then we proceed to monitor them annually. This is something that they really like to ask. So make sure you know that. Once again, for a patient that has diabetes mellitus, we want to make sure that we, um, if we see dyslipidemia, we want to screen them at diagnosis and then proceed to monitor them annually, so yearly. So what's going to be the management for just in general hyperlipidemia? 
always the number one management is going to be your lifestyle modification. So it's going to be the patients, right? Reducing their weight if they're overweight, controlling their diabetes, um, changing their diet. So increasing their fibers, uh, increasing their vegetables and fruits, low carb diet, low fat diet, reducing calorie intake, salt intake, and then of course, in, uh, increasing their exercise, which is also going to increase their HDL. If they're smokers, stop smoking. That's one of the big ones. Control their hypertension, avoid any alcohol. So pharmacological therapy, our goal always with these patients is that we want to lower their total, um, we want to make sure that we lower their total and LDL cholesterol with these patients. But first line right is always going to be control with diet and lifestyle modifications that we discussed, which is going to be the same thing for everything, including with hypertension. And then second line is going to be a pharmacological intervention. So we went over these statins earlier, right? Um, high intensity, moderate intensity, and low intensity statins. Everyone should be put on a high intensity statin unless they're older than 75. They have some type of statin intolerance. They have a drug interaction. So one of the drugs that they're taking is can interact with statins or they have liver or renal disease. Because remember we discussed statins are known for hepatotoxicity. Then in these cases, we do not put a patient on, on a statin, but usually, all patients get a high intensity statin. If patients do not meet the above criteria, then we can start them on a moderate intensity statin so they don't develop intolerance and then we titrate up. So I know we discussed the drugs earlier, but just real quick to discuss them again. So statins, right? Um, what do they do? They inhibit 3-hydroxy 3-methylbutyro coenzyme. So your HCMGOA and they decrease cholesterol levels and they also decrease your LDL levels. So these are really, really good for decreasing your LDL levels. Usually it's recommended for all patients, right? Because they lower morbidity and mortality. And we said that one of the huge side effects is going to be myopathy and then elevated LFTs. And it's really important that with these patients, before we prescribe a statin, we want to make sure that we get their lipid levels, their A1C, creatinine, chitinins, and LFTs, right? We want to make sure that their liver enzymes are okay, that they're working fine before we prescribe these medications. So the next one's going to be your bioacid binding resins, like your cholestyramine, your cholestibulum, and your cholestipyl. What these medications do is that they bind bioacids in the intestine. That's really big. Make sure you know that. Bind bioacids in the intestine to form insoluble, non-absorbable complex that is, that is excreted in feces along with the unchanged resin. Uh, usually these medications, it's really important that they should be taken with e uh, each meal. And once again, side effects for this one is usually going to be your myalgia. We have fibric acid derivatives like your phenofibrate, phenofibric acid, gemfibrozil. These are agonists at the PPAR nuclear receptor. Okay. That's a big one. So make sure you know that. Uh, they are very commonly associated for for treatment or use for treatment of hypertriglyceridemia. So they're very good at decreasing triglycerides. Adverse effects, right? It's going to be your elevated LFTs, transaminases, and myalgias and myositis. That's why fibric acid derivatives, we don't use them with statins. We also have omega-3. This reduces hepatic triglyceride synthesis. Uh, we have azetamib, which we discussed earlier. This one's really good because it decreases total cholesterol, LDL, ApoB, and triglycerides while increasing HDL. So this one's really good at increasing your HDL. How does it work? It inhibits the absorption of cholesterol at the brush border of the small intestine via the sterile transporter. And side effects, it's gonna be diarrhea. It's gonna be one of the big ones, right? And also increased LFTs. And then we have our new ones, the new kids in the block, your PCSK9 inhibitors. So your alarocumab and nivolucumab. Uh, these are monoclonal antibodies that inhibit PCSK9 binding to the LDL receptors, causing decreased LDL receptor degradation and increased LDL clearance with these medications. These are very commonly associated with patients that have familiar hypercholesteremia, like we discussed, or patients that have cardiovascular disease that require additional lowering of LDL cholesterol. So usually these are not first line. Next one's going to be your niacin. These are really good at increasing your HDL, right? That's one of the big ones. And they also decrease LDL and triglycerides, but also very, very good at in increasing your HDL. 
these are usually used as an adjunct, right? So it's not usually first line, it's usually adjunct in the treatment of dyslipidemias. And the number one side effect with this one, remember we said it was your flushing, also your generalized pruritus. So with generalized pruritus, I've seen this question asked, they ask you how can you prevent, prevent this? And it's usually reduced by taking it after meals or taking aspirin uh, 30 minutes prior to each dose. It can decrease this generalized pruritus or that flushing like we discussed. So <clears throat> now let's talk about our optimal lipoprotein cholesterol levels, right? So we said that earlier total cholesterol less than 200, LDL less than 100, but usually preferably it's going to be less than 70. HDL, like we discussed earlier, right, less greater than 60, and then triglycerides should be less than 150. Uh, make sure that you know that. They may or may not give it to you on the question stem. Sometimes I'll put it in parentheses, but if not, it's really important to just memorize them in general because it'll help you go quicker through the question stems and then also when you're studying for the PAMS. So let's go into our next one, which is going to be acute arterial occlusion. This is going to be an embolic event uh, where the emboli usually originates from the coronary arteries, aorta, and the large artery arteries. It's usually caused by a sudden occlusion of those arteries. Very commonly seen in your patients that have any type of hypercoagulable state, ischemic heart disease, rheumatic heart disease, AFib, which is actually one of the most common causes, right? Acute myocardial infarction, atrial myxomas. Um, and usually how this patient is going to present, that's where you hear those five Ps, right? It's going to be your pain, your pallor, your paresthesias, your pulselessness, your paralysis in these patients. Um, usually the pain is going to be like that pistol shot pain. It's going to be usually sudden onset. How I think about it, this is like a heart attack, but of the limbs, right? You have like a vessel that's just completely occluded by some type of um, embolic event. So you're not having blood flow to that limb at all whatsoever. So this is an emergency. And with these patients, what we need to do when we're looking at them is that we want to make sure that we look at their extremities. We want to look at the color the size and the symmetry. We want to palpate for the pulses and assess blood flow with an arterial Doppler. And what we're going to see is we're going to see that decreased or absent pulses, decreased capillary refill, which makes sense, right? Because you have a clot there that's just not allowing blood to go to that limb. We can also do an MRA, MRA or CTA or arteriography. This is usually going to help us confirm the diagnosis. It's going to show us the location and extent of the arterial occlusion. What's going to be the treatment for these patients? is usually you want to start with anticoagulation, so something like heparin IV with these patients. Um, it's really important because the limb is, we want to make sure that we vitalize the limb, right? Because the limb is at jeopardy right now, the patient can lose their limb. Other things that we can do is that we can do a catheter for director thrombolysis or thrombectomy, surgical thrombo. And bolectomy also, we can do a, an arterial bypass, but usually like these patients are going to be presenting then and now, we're going to give them IV heparin because these are a little bit more invasive, right? Now, what is the treatment for long-term? So long-term treatment is usually going to be with anticoagulation with these patients uh, with new factor 10A inhibitors for about three to six months. Uh, the reason why these factor 10 inhibitors are preferred is because their anticoagulation properties kick in within a few hours and they don't have this food to drug interactions like those seen with warfarin, plus warfarin has a lot of side effects. Um, now, if the patient has a prosthetic valve, we wanna make sure that we always wait for warfarin though. So that was acute arterial occlusion. It's gonna be your five Ps, right? Pain, pallor, palestesias, pulsenses, and paralysis. So let's go into our next one, which is gonna be our peripheral artery disease. So peripheral artery disease. This is usually caused by atherosclerosis where the process is usually the same as coronary artery disease and CVA, right? You're having like gradual deposits of uh, cholesterol in those vessels, but they're going to the periphery to your extremities. Patients usually that have PAD have a higher risk of either having some type of myocardial infect infarction or CVA. With these patients, it's very commonly found, in, once again, in the vasculature of the lower extremities and very commonly found in your men. Uh, smoking is actually one of the big factors that contributes to the progression and severity of PAD. So it's a big 
thing that you need to know. I've seen this question asked, or what is the next question you want to ask this patient that's presenting with peripheral artery disease? Do they smoke? Are they still smoking? How much do they smoke? Because smoking is going to be the one of the big factors on whether this patient um, gets better or not, or what's going to be the progression of this disease. And then also diabetes mellitus. If the patient has concurrent diabetes mellitus, um, it's it actually worsens the disease also. How is this patient going to present? So I always had trouble between peripheral vascular disease and then PAD, but PAD is going to present with your intermittent claudication. And this is usually going to be their most common presentation. So this patient is going to be presented with pain in the lower extremities with walking, but it gets better whenever they rest. So walking and it gets rest. The calf is usually going to be the area that's going to be the most painful with these patients. Other areas, though, can be the thigh or buttock, depending on what artery is involved. That's something that they really like to ask also. So um, make sure that you know that, like whether it's the deep femoral artery, the iliac artery, right? If it's the iliac artery, since, artery, since it's more superior, it's usually going to be that buttock pain, right? So once again, it's going to be that intermittent claudication. They're going to be presenting with peripheral vascular ulcers. They're going to have decreased pulses. They'll have these cool, shiny extremities with decreased hair. That's a big one. Cool, shiny extremities with decreased hair. And usually uh, rest pain is also found, but that's usually like once it's like prolonged or it's usually like a late finding. It's not going to be a finding that is very commonly found in like your new diagnosis with these patients. Um, if pain does occur at rest, though, we want to think about ischemia, right? Because that means that they just have complete blockage of, of blood to their extremities. They can also present with prestigious or weakness with these patients. Um, so once again, right, the signs is going to be that shiny skin, thickened nails, hair loss, muscle loss or atrophy, coolness to the extremity, weak or absent pulses, poor capillary refill. They'll have that ruber, dependent ruber, which is redness to leg in dependent position. They can also develop gangrene or ulcers. And then remember that the ulcers are always going to be lateral. So you have your malleolus, the ulcers are usually going to be lateral. That's another way that you can differentiate between PAD and peripheral vascular disease. And how I memorize it is that venous has an E in the middle and medial has an E in the middle. So venous Ulcers are usually going to be associated with ulcers that are going to be medial to the malleolus, malleolus, malleolus versus PAD is going to be ulcers that are going to be lateral to your malleolus. So with these patients, another thing that we need to know is that usually these patients do not have edema. Whenever we think about edema, we're thinking about peripheral vascular disease. Now, how are we going to diagnose these patients? We usually do an ABI. So we usually do an ankle brachial index. This is usually going to help us detect stenosis of the leg. We also want to make sure that we measure the solid blood pressure and we get those pedal pulses. I remember I always got in trouble because in these patients that I saw with uh, PAD, I always forgot to check the pedal pulses. So pedal pulses. And then also know your ABI. So normal ABI is begin, going to be between 0 0.90 and 1.30. So normal 0 0.9 to 1.3. If the ABI is between 0 0.4 or 0 0.9, this is usually mild to moderate disease. So any, anything less than 9, you're thinking about PAD. 0 0.4 to 0 0.9 is mild to moderate. Now, anything less than 0.4, like 0 0.0 to 0 0.4, that's going to be severe disease with like critical stenosis. These patients are at risk for like losing their limb. What if the ABI is high? So if it's greater than 1.50, usually it indicates a non-compressible vessel because there's some type of calcification occurring. Uh, usually this gives us a false reading. So another way that we can diagnose these patients is doing an arterial Doppler, but usually your first line is going to be your ankle brachial index. You can also do an MRA or CTA, but usually your arteriography is going to be the gold standard because it's going to show us the length, the location, and the degree of the occlusion. So once again, uh, first thing you're going to do is an ABI. The gold standard is going to be arteriography. This is both diag diagnostic and therapeutic, but it's usually the last thing that we do. Management for these patients is that we want to make sure that we decrease cardiovascular risk like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes. If they're smokers, tell them to stop smoking, right? If they have bad diets, tell them to change their diet with these patients because diet's a huge one. Um... 
Statins can also be prescribed in these patients that have like hyperlipidemia. And then we want to make sure that we also treat their hypertension aggressively. So this is also what we do by decreasing any type of risk factors that they have. Hypertension, diabetes, right? Uh, we also want to make sure we tell these patients to stop smoking. And medications, we're going to start them with aspirin, right? If they have moderate to severe PAD, then we want to make sure them, we give them aspirin and or clopidogrel, statins. The big one, though, that's usually tested is going to be your vasodilator, like psilocizole. Um, This is usually the mainstay of treatment, and it's very helpful for treating symptoms like intermittent claudication. So once again, aspirin, clopidogrel, but your big one's going to be your psilocizole. But usually first line is always going to be um, telling the patient to stop smoking. It's going to be the big one. If they're overweight, lose weight, start eating healthy, treat any type of underlying disorder that is basically worsening this condition. So hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia. All right, so what if the patient has severe PAD and has limiting, limit, uh, has limb-threatening PAD? So with these patients, usually we want to do surgical intervention, right? So we'll do something like invasive angioplasty and stent placement, surgical bypass, right, and darterectomy. So that was PAD. So let's go into venous insufficiency. So venous insufficiency, varicose veins, right? Uh, usually, commonly, some of the risk factors are going to be like age, family history, obesity, long periods of standing, like surgeons, PAs like us, right, that are usually standing a lot. Nurses, teachers, very commonly found in females. And usually it's because you have some type of vascular incompetence of either vascular incompetence of either the deep and or superficial veins. Most commonly occurs after superficial thrombophlebitis, after DVT, or after trauma to the affected leg. How is this patient going to present with venous insufficiency? So they're going to have this brownish hyperpigmentation, and that's because you have hemosiderin deposition in the skin from the damaged vessels. You have edema that's really big that is not found in your PAD, edema that resolves at night when they're lying flat, They'll have um, pain in the lower extremities after a long period of standing. They'll say that the pain is like burning, aching, throbbing, cramping, muscle fatigue. The pain and color usually improves with a leg elevation and walking, right, versus PAD it worsened. And these patients also can develop something like stasis dermatitis, right? This is an eczematous rash. rash. It's itching, scaling, weeping, erosions as crusting, um, usually with this patient with stasis dermatitis, we treat them with topical steroids and topical antibiotics like mupirocin. These patients can also develop venous stasis ulcers with uneven margins, especially where we said venous, V-E, at the medial malleolus. Usually they'll have this atrophic hypopigmented area with telangiectasias and punctate red dots. Diagnosis, usually it's going to be a duplex ultrasound. Uh, with these patients, we can also do something like MR or CT or conventional venography, but usually we do a duplex ultrasound. Treatment for these patients, usually the first line treatment is going to be your your um, your stockings, right? We can also do injection sclerotherapy. So, right, we always tell you, especially those patients that have those varicose wounds, we always tell them to put on the stockings. That's usually first line. I did my rotation with a general surgeon who also specialized in like uh, veins. <clears throat> and so we saw a lot of these patients that had uh, this, these disorders and they also had varicose veins. And always he, we always, the first thing he did before he can go into surgery was those stockings. So the patient needed to wear those stockings. Um, so it's usually first line and then injection scope therapy is another thing you can do. Another thing also is, of course, make sure that you educate the patients to exercise regularly to make sure that they're getting that blood flow going. Avoid prolonged standing or sitting if they can. And then also make sure we're managing those ulcers, um, either with uh, wet to dry dressings, una boots, which was a big thing that we did during my rotation. And of course, um, weight loss is another thing we want to make sure we tell these patients. All right, so next one's going to be our DVT, deep vein thrombosis. This is usually a thrombus in a vein. Thrombosis can either be super, superficial or deep. 
and usually occurs in the veins of the lower extremities, especially the calf. The thing about DVTs and why it's so important that we treat these is that they can develop into pulmonary embolisms. So it's really important that we treat these. Risk factors that you really need to know is going to be your mnemonic SHE. So S is going to be stasis, right? So if the patient has been sitting for a prolonged time, if they just got out of a history, uh, out of surgery, especially like your hip surgeries, any type of orthopedic surgery where the patient really cannot move. Um, also, any type of patient ever questions them where like they took a 14 hour flight, right? So traveling where they're just sitting or immobilized. Um, H from the SHE mnemonic is going to be hypercoagulability. So do they have a history of hypercoagulability? Do they have a family member that suffered from a DVT? Uh, do they have fac factor five Leiden um, deficiency? Um, factor five Leiden, right? That's actually one of the most common co common causes of hypercoagulability. Lupus is another one, right? Um, uh, what about E? E is going to be your any type of endothelial damage. So, do they have any trauma to that area? That's going to be some of your risk factors for these patients. Also, smoking is another risk factor. Is the patient also on oral contraceptives? Um, do they have a history of CHF? How is this patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with pain, especially in that calf pain that occurs in, patient, in about 50% patients. They can present with a positive Holman sign, although this is not very sensitive or specific. Uh, what is a Holman sign? They're going to have <clears throat> calf pain with dorsiflexion with the flexed knee. It's not very reliable, like we said. They'll have phlebitis, warmth, erythema. Sometimes you can feel palpable cord. Deep muscle tenderness, so we're going to have unilateral edema. It's going to be greater than three centimeters. And this is actually going to be the most specific sign and symptom of DVT. It's going to be that edema. You also see like redness to that area. And how do we diagnose these patients? So we can do a D-dimer. Um, it's not very specific, but it's if it's elevated, then it's going to um, basically help us guide us for further testing for these patients. We can also do a CT of the chest, um, but usually we usually start with a Doppler, right? So we're going to do a venous Doppler of the extremity. That's usually first line. It's not evasive, and that's why it's the best. It's first one. Now, what's the gold standard specific one? It's going to be your venography, right? This is going to be your gold standard, so make sure that you keep that in mind. Um, now, in regards to treatment for these patients, the main goal is to prevent a pulmonary embolism, right, when we're treating these patients. So with these patients, the first thing that we want to do is put them on anticoagulation therapy, right? We're going to start with low molecular weight heparin because as it's short-acting. This is usually the initial treatment for a few days, and then you go and you bridge on to warfarin because remember we said that warfarin takes a lot longer to kick in versus heparin, it's more like it's quicker. So that's why we start with our low molecular weight heparin or Robinux, and then we bridge on to warfarin and we start this for long term, so three to six months, okay? All right, so another thing that they really like to test is about the Wells criteria for pulmonary embolism. So just make sure that you are familiar with the um, Wells criteria. Basically, what is the probability of developing a pulmonary embolism? So the criteria is a clinical signs and symptoms of a DVT that's gonna give you three points. Alternative diagnosis, less likely than a pulmonary embolism, that's going to give you three points. If they are tachycardic, which is one of the big factors and arrhythmias that is usually associated with pulmonary embolism. So if their heart rate is greater than 100, that is usually going to give uh, 1.5 points. Uh, what about if they've been immobilized for, for at least three days or surgery in the previous four weeks? That's going to be another 1.5 points. If they have a previous diagnosis of a pulmonary embolism or DVT, that's going to be 1.5 points. If they have hemoptysis, so that bleeding of coughing, that's going to be one point. If they have any type of malignancy with treatment within six months, that's going to be one point also. So the patient is at low risk if they have zero to two points. They're at moderate risk if they have three to six points. And they're at high risk if they have more than six points. So that's also another way that we can see whether this patient needs to be anticoagulated or not. So now that we're done with that, let's go into our valvular diseases. It's really important that you know this because it's something that's very highly tested. They really like to test their murmurs. So we're going to go through them. First one's going to be aortic stenosis. This one by far is the most common one you're going to be asked on. I can guarantee you you're going to get asked on a question. They really like to test this one. Uh, aortic stenosis, you're reading the question stem. It's always commonly found in your elderly patient. And they're going to be presenting with the mnemonic of SAD, syncope, 
angina, and dyspnea. Usually those three symptoms and an elderly patient, you're thinking about aortic stenosis. And what is the most common symptom out of these three? We said S, right, syncope, A, angina, D is usually going to be dyspnea. D, dyspnea on exertion is going to be the most common symptom these patients are going to be presenting with. And what happens usually with these patients is just that they're getting old, right, so that valve is not as good as it used to be. So with these patients, um, what you're going to see is, of course, it's going to be a murmur on exam. You're going to have a systolic thrill over the right sternal border when the patient is sitting and learning for, leaning forward. On EKG, you're going to see left ventricular hypertrophy with strain pattern. So the best initial diagnostic test is going to be your EKG, and that's where you're going to see the left ventricular hypertrophy. You can also do a chest x-ray. You'll see left ventricle enlargement. You might see some pulmonary congestion, especially if it's severe. But the best diagnostic test is going to be your echo because that's going to show you the calcification of and the thickening of that aortic valve. So once again, best initial is going to be EKG, but your best diagnostic is going to be your echo. But your definitive diagnosis is usually going to be your cardiac cath. But of course, of course, really don't do this because this is usually invasive, right? But it's going to be your definitive diagnosis. Treatment for these patients are going to be beta blockers and ACE inhibitors for hypertension, nitrates for angina, um, statins, especially if they have coronary artery disease. It's really important that patients that have severe aortic stenosis that we tell these patients to avoid exertion. But usually the only effective treatment, right, for these patients and like the best treatment, the definitive treatment is usually going to be an aortic valve placement. And this is usually only indicated um, when the ejection fraction is less than 50%, regardless if they're symptomatic. So regardless if they're symptomatic or not, they always get surgery if the ejection fraction is less than 50% with these patients. And basically what we do is that um, just put a valve in there, right? Or you can also do an intra aortic balloon pump, but usually this is just stabilization, but valve replacement is usually the definitive treatment. So once again, aortic stenosis, right? Um, that's gonna be your systolic thrill over the right sternal border. That's gonna be found when the patient is sitting and leaning forward with these patients. So systolic thrill, systolic murmur, right sternal border, best when the patient's sitting and leaning forward. Uh, very commonly found in your patients that are older. It's going to be an older patient on the question stem, the mnemonic, SAD, syncope, angina, and dyspnea. So let's go into aortic regurgitation with these patients. So with these patients, you're going to be presenting with tachycardia, palpitations, they can have orthopnea. Um, they can also present with that Austin Flint murmur, which is a low-pitched, soft, rumbling, mid to late diastolic murmur. They're going to have that head bobbing, that water hammer pulse, capillary pulsation. Uh, you'll see a widened pulse pressure in these patients. And once again, we want to do an EKG, right? We're going to see left ventricular hypertrophy with strain. You can do a chest x-ray also, where you'll see the apex is downward and displaced to the left. In your AP view, you can do an echo, which is going to show you the left ventricular size is increased. And once again, the cardiac cath is going to be your definitive diagnosis with these patients. So aortic regurgitation, usually a diastolic murmur, right? Um, you're going to have a widened, widened pulse pressure with these patients. And um, treatment for this patient is usually going to be uh, usually... If they have acute severe aortic regurgitation, you want to do urgent surgery, which is going to be the treatment of choice. If they have chronic regurgitation, then we can treat them with diuretics, right, vasodilators like ACE inhibitors, calcium channel blockers, or hydralazine. And then surgery, we usually do, once again, in patients that have a left ventricular ejection fraction less than 50, regardless of whether it's symptomatic or not. So let's go into our mitral valve diseases. So let's go into mitral stenosis. Dyspnea is going to be by far also the most common symptom you're going to see in these patients. They can present with pulmonary edema, hemoptysis, pulmonary hypertension, atrial fibrillation is also very commonly associated with uh, mitral stenosis. Uh, you'll also have right heart failure symptoms like JVD, right upper quadrant pain, marked pedal edema. With these patients, you're going to also see that these patients are going to have a light diastolic murmur and an opening snap. That's usually how it presents. It's going to be that late diastolic murmur and that opening snap for mitral stenosis. So late diastolic murmur, opening snap, it's usually enhanced by expiration, right? 
Why? Because the mitral valve is on the um, left side. So anything that's on the right side, the murmurs are increased with inspiration. How I memorize it is that right has an I, I for inspiration. So right side increased with inspiration versus left side, it's not. So that makes sense why this one's actually um, going to be enhanced by expiration because it's on, it's on the left side, right, the mitral valve. They're going to have that low-pitched rumbling. Um, EKG is going to be the first sign. We're going to see bilateral atrial enlargement. We might see right atrial dilation and right ventricular hypertrophy, hypertrophy, especially when the patient has severe pulmonary hypertension. Chest x-ray also we're going to do. We're going to see curly beelines. We can do an echo and then once again um, cardiac cath usually. It's going to be a definitive diagnosis. Usually with these patients, we want to make sure that we put them on antibiotic uh, prophylaxis. Why? Because these patients are very prone and are at risk to getting rheumatic mitral stenosis and endocarditis. So the medical management for these patients are going to be diuretics and sodium restrictions. Um, these usually alleviate the symptoms of the right heart failure. You can do also beta blockers and non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers like diltiazem and verapamil, which is going to help control that heart rate, right? Because we want to make sure that we're controlling that AFib. And then warfarin therapy also in these patients um, to have a high CHAD2 VAS score like we had discussed earlier. And then once again, uh, we can also give do surgery with these patients that are going to we go in there and repair the valve or just replace the valve. So mitral regurgitation, mitral regurgitation. The thing about mitral regurgitation that we want to think about is that there are major causes of mitral regurgitation like infective endocarditis, papillary muscle rupture, status post-myocardial infarction, which is one of the big ones. So mitral regurgitation, that's usually going to, how it's going to present on a question stem. It's going to be a patient that just had a heart attack um, so they ruptured their papillary muscle rupture, chordal rupture, or leaflet fail, like from mitral valve prolapse. So the most common cause of mitral, mitral valve prolapse is very commonly associated with mitral regurg. So mitral valve prolapse can go into mitral regurg. So once again, if it has a question stem, it says that the patient has a history of mitral valve prolapse. Um, think about mitral regurg. The patient has a history that they just had a heart attack. Think about mitral regurg because these patients can actually rupture that muscle after having a heart attack. How is this patient going to present? They're going to have fatigue, dyspnea on exertion, orthopnea. Um, they can also have rheumatic heart fever, pulmonary edema, AFib. Some of the signs we're going to see in S3, the patient's going to be hypotensive. They're going to have that narrow pulse pressure, elevated jugular venous pressure. Uh, EKG, you're going to see left atrial enlargement, AFib, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, X-ray. You're going to see that left atrial enlargement and left ventricular enlargement. Uh, we can also do an echo with these patients. And usually the murmur for your for this patient for with mitral regurg, it's going to be a murmur that's going to be louder with squatting in your hand grip. And it's going to be heard loudest at the apex and it's going to radiate to the axilla. Okay, so louder with squatting and hand grip. The murmur is going to be heard loudest at the apex and it's going to radiate to the axilla. And you're going to have a blowing hollow systolic murmur with these patients. What's gonna be the treatment for these patients? Urgent stabilization and surgery, um, especially in acute settings. If it's chronic, then in these patients, we can treat them with uh, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, or diuretics. And always surgical repair is always re uh, preferred over your diuretics, right? Okay, next one's gonna be your mitral valve prolapse. Like we said, mitral valve prolapse is the most common cause of mitral regurgitation, and usually it's idiopathic. We don't know the cause of that. Mitral valve prolapse is usually going to present in your young woman. It's going to be a young woman in her 30s. Um, usually the patient is asymptomatic. And like we said, it's going to be a young female between 15 to 30 years old. They're going to say that they have chest pain whenever they exercise or they have palpitations. Uh, the murmur is usually going to be a systolic click. Sometimes it'll say that it has a honking quality, but usually it's going to be your click. What gives, what gives me that it's mitral valve prolapse in these patients. Uh, EKG is usually what we're going to do. Usually it's normal. It, you can see some biphasic or inverted T waves, but usually it's normal. We also want to make sure that we do an echo for these patients. And treatment for these patients are usually going to be beta blockers, um, especially in your patients that are like symptomatic, uh, but usually it's going to be your beta blockers in these patients. If they are like severely symptomatic and they have severe mitral prolapse, then you can do surgery. 
So next one's under your pulmonary valve disorders. So pulmonary stenosis, that one we need to know it's primary a congenital disorder um, with these patients. And usually these patients can have it. They don't even know they have it. Um, if it is severe, patients can get dyspnea, decreased exercise capacity, angina, syncope, and white heart failure. It's going to be a murmur that increases with inspiration. You might hear an S4 on your physical exam, and they're going to have a prominent jug jugular venous um, pressure. Uh, you're going to do an EKG. You're going to see right, right atrial distension, right ventricular hypertrophy, and right atrial enlargement if it's severe. You can also do a chest x-ray and a, a echo. Usually a cardiac catheter is not necessary for these patients. Treatment for these patients is usually diuretics, um, especially if they have right-sided heart failure. Um, another thing that we can do is, of course, balloon valvuloplasty. That's usually going to be the preferred treatment for these patients. Okay, what about pulmonary regurgitation? This one's going to be... Patients are presenting with fatigue, dyspnea on exertion, and symptoms of right heart failure with these patients. They're going to have that gram steel murmur, murmur that's going to be louder with inspiration. On EKG, you'll see right ventricular hypertrophy and right atrial enlargement. On chest x-ray, you'll see right ventricular hypertrophy and right atrial enlargement. You can also do an, an echo. And once again, a cardiac cath is not really necessary in these patients. And treatment with these patients is that you can go surgery, um, but usually replacement is rarely done. And then diuretics if the patient has right heart failure symptoms. So last one's going to be our tricuspid valvular diseases. Uh, tricuspid stenosis. These patients are going to be presenting with pulmonary congestion, fatigue, um, and they'll have right heart failure <clears throat> symptoms also. Usually you'll hear the murmur over the xiphoid process with these patients. And on EKG, you're going to see right atrial enlargement, right ventricular hypertrophy, chest x-ray. You can do an echo. You'll see thickened leaflets that are domed in diastole. And then once again, a cath is usually not necessary for these patients. Uh, we can give them diuretics and sodium restriction to alleviate any symptoms that they have a right heart failure. And usually if surgery is done, it's done in conjunction with mitral valve surgery. If surgical repair is indicated, if they have severe symptoms. And then we have tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, tricuspid regurgitation, these patients are presenting with fatigue and dyspnea on exertion. They'll have right uh, heart failure. They'll have elevated jugular venous pressure. They'll have this Carvalho sign, which basically where the murmur increases in intensity with inspiration, because once again, it's on the right side, right? Due to increased right-sided blood flow during inspiration, this what helps you distinguish it between mitral regurg, because um, tricuspid regurg also presents with a hollow systolic murmur, right? It's going to be the blowing murmur also. Uh, this one's going to radiate to the sternal border and it's going to be enhanced by inspiration. Workout for these patients, EKG, uh, chest x-ray, we'll see right heart enlargement. Echo is usually going to be the definitive for these patients. Treatment, once again, diuretics and sodium restriction. And surgery is usually indicated if patient is undergoing any type of left side valve surgery. And once again, um, with these patients, um, surgery only necessary if it is severe. All right, guys, so we have finished all of cardio. Once again, with this one, make sure that you know your medications well, uh, your hypertensive medications, um, ACEs and ARBs, right? We said that ACEs are very known for causing your cough, right? Um, if the patient has a cough and they have an ACE, maybe you can switch them to an ARB. Another thing about ACEs inhibitors that you never use ACE inhibitors and ARBs together ACEs are also known in ARBs for causing hyperkalemia, so also make sure that we know that. Um, they're both also very known for causing like that angioedema. And then we also discuss the medications for cholesterol in general. We almost always put patients on statins. Statins are probably like the first line treatment for any type of hypercholesterolemia, right? Usually it's going to be your statins, so those are the best one. These are your HMCOG reductase inhibitors. And these medications, remember, they're very good at decreasing your LDL. And the thing about these medications that we need to know is that they have the side effect of hepatotoxicity. And they have the side effect of also causing um, your muscle aches, right? Your myositis. So it's really important that we don't use these medications with other medications that can cause myositis. Okay, so make sure that you know that. Um, Statin's going to be one of the big ones that they're going to ask. And then 
We said to decrease triglycerides, right? It's going to be any of your fibric acid derivatives. They're very good at dec decreasing triglyceride levels. And the reason why we're really aggressive about treating triglyceride levels is that if they're too high, they can cause pancreatitis. So also make sure that you know that. Um, in regards to angina in general, we're always giving them our beta blockers, right? Beta blockers can actually reduce mortality in these patients. ACE inhibitors are also very important for reducing mortality also in heart failure patients, right? Same with beta blockers, something that's also very commonly asked. And then also make sure that you know your EKGs, right? AFib is one of the big ones that they really like to ask, atrial fibrillation. It's going to be that irregularly, irregular um, rhythm is usually going to be really fast, and you're not going to see any P waves in these patients. And remember, usually we prefer rate control over rhythm control, so treatment's going to be with your beta blockers or calcium channel blockers if for some reason the patient cannot take a beta blocker. So make sure that you know that. And then another thing that's also very important in regards to your murmurs, right? The one that's very commonly tested is going to be your aortic stenosis. So aortic stenosis is going to be your older patient, elderly. They're going to be presenting with this, the sad mnemonic, syncope, angina, and dyspnea on exertion, which is going to be one of the most common symptoms. Uh, this is going to be a systolic murmur. Sometimes I've heard it say it's crescendo, decrescendo murmur also. Um, so make sure that you know that with these patients. Mitral valve prolapse, right, very commonly found in your younger woman between 50 to 30. Usually on the question stems, I've seen uh, women that are in their 30s for these. And usually with these patients, you just give them beta blockers, really not much that you do. Hey guys, before we finish cardio, let's go over hypertension and then we'll go on to POM. So hypertension, like I mentioned, is something that's very highly tested. So it's really important that we're familiar with it, okay? So in regards to hypertension, just in general, right, we're measuring the systolic blood pressure over the diastolic blood pressure. What is the systolic blood pressure? So the systolic blood pressure is the arterial pressure when the heart is contracting. And the diastolic blood pressure is the arterial pressure when the heart is relaxing or refilling. This is an important point to know. So an elevated blood pressure is usually a single one. So a single reading of an elevated blood pressure is not enough for you to diagnose hypertension. So it's really important that with these patients we get another reading because an, a single elevated blood pressure is not going to give you a diagnosis of hypertension. So if the patient does come in and then you do a blood, pr blood pressure reading on the patient and you know, note that it is initially elevated, then in these patients it's important that we recheck it after the visit has completed. Sometimes these patients can have things like white coat hypertension, which is where a patient gets nervous, right, whenever they go to the doctor. I know for sure this is one of the things for me. For some reason, my blood pressure is always super high, and I do get nervous whenever I am in the hospital, in the clinic. I don't know why, but this is something that's very common among patients. So it's something to keep in mind, and one of the reasons why we do not diagnose blood pressure on one single event of a high blood pressure. It's really important that you know that because some of the question stems and practice question stems I've been doing, it basically will have a patient that had one single diagnosed or one single high reading of blood pressure, whether it's in the ER and the patient is in pain because they just have like a huge laceration on their forehead. That's not enough to say, hey, this patient has high blood pressure, right? Hypertension, we're going to diagnose them. No, they have to make sure that they have multiple readings. And then on top of that, also what clinical situation are they in? In this example, the patient with the laceration across her forehead, right, with the high blood pressure, it's possibly due because the patient's in pain. So that's another thing to keep in mind with these patients. So if the blood pressure is still elevated, so say we do an initial one, and then we did a second one in the clinic, then with these patients, we can make sure that we monitor their blood pressure at home or have them follow up for subsequent measurements. So when I did my family medicine rotation, and for those of you who are currently in your family medicine rotation, my doctor did is that he would send them home with like a little chart and then they would note their blood pressure every single day and then he would follow up with them in a week and then see how that blood pressure was and to see whether that single event that they had in the clinic was just because they had that white coat syndrome or if they truly did have high blood pressure. So just also keep that in mind. It's another way to make sure that you are um, ensuring that this patient has truly, you know, hypertension. So what is a patho of hypertension? 
Hypertension develops because of increased sympathetic activity, increased angiotensin II activity, or increased mineral corticoid activity like sodium and water retention with these patients, right? So it's due to the renin angiotensin system. What happens is that there's usually a drop in blood pressure or a drop in fluid volume, and this causes the kidney to release renin. And then renin acts on angiotensinogen to form angiotensin 1. Then what happens from there is that ACE, your angiotensin converting enzyme, is released from the lungs, right? And it acts on angiotensin 1 to form angiotensin 2. So that's why we have those ACE inhibitors, right? Like those ACE inhibitors, like the Sinopril, this is where they act. They inhibit that ACE, the angiotensin converting enzyme that is released from the lungs. So we said ACE acts on angiotensin 1 to form angiotensin 2. Then what happens is that angiotensin 2 also acts directly on the blood vessels that stimulates that phasoconstriction or that narrowing, right? Another thing is that angiotensin II can act on the adrenal gland to stimulate release of aldosterone. Then aldosterone acts on the kidneys to stimulate reabsorption of salt and water. So that's kind of just like the, how the renin angiotensin system works and you know how our ACE inhibitors actually work also, right? They're inhibiting that angiotensin converting enzyme that is released from the lungs. So hypertension is usually a really bad problem for bl blood vessels because what, what happens is it causes wear and tear on the endothelial cells that line the inside of the blood vessels, right? So long-term hypertension that is not controlled can cause tiny tears in the endothelial cells, which can ultimately lead to myocardial infarctions, right? Aneurysms and CVA, so cerebrovascular accidents. How I explain this to my patients when I'm in clinic, like especially during my family medicine rotation, I would sit down and explain hypertension and why it's really important for them to, to be taking their blood pressure medications and also just taking their blood pressure in general and seeing how the blood pressure is and following up with the doctor is that hypertension, for me, how I understand it is that you have a water hose, right? You have a water hose and you have so much water running through that water hose. You have so much pressure, right? So in the long term, if you have all this pressure, this pressurized water going through that water hose, that water hose, the plastic that surrounds it, or eventually is going to start tearing, right? Which is what we described earlier. It's going to start tearing and bursting, and then eventually the water is just going to go out, right, of that hose because of all the damage it's been causing to the plastic that is surrounding it, and it's going to go everywhere. And that's what happens with hypertension, right? Long-standing hypertension, right? And why it's so important that we treat long-standing hypertension, because it can also lead to multiple things, right? You know, it can affect the eye. So long, chronic hypertension is going to cause these tears on those blood vessels, make these uh, blood vessels more easily to tear and cause myocardial infarctions, like we said, aneurysms, CVAs. So what is blood pressure classification? So what is classified as high blood pressure? So normal blood pressure should be less than 120 systolic over less than 180, um, less than 80 diastolic. So less than 120 systolic over less than 80 diastolic. Now there's prehypertension, there's stage one, stage two, and depending on what the blood pressure of the patient is, is depending on where they fall according to these. So prehypertension is classified as 120 to 139 systolic or 80 to 89 diastolic, right? Versus stage one hypertension. Stage one hypertension is classified as 140 to 149 systolic or 90 to 99 diastolic. Stage two hypertension is classified as greater than 160 systolic or greater than 100 diastolic. So a patient may have isolated systolic or diastolic blood pressure. With systolic hypertension, their blood pressure is usually greater than 140. And with diastolic blood pressure, usually their blood pressure is usually going to be um, greater than 120. So when the systolic blood pressure is elevated, like we said, you're at increase for CVA. And when your diastolic blood pressure is elevated, you're at increased risk for M and MI. So that's an important point, right? Increased systolic blood pressure increases your risk for CVA. 
versus increased diastolic blood pressure, so that bottom number, makes you at increased risk for a myocardial infarction. Isola isolated systolic blood pressure also shows greater risk for cardiovascular disease than an isolated diastolic blood pressure in patients greater than 50 years old. So this is really important. So once again, isolated systolic blood pressure is a greater risk for cardiovascular disease than isolated diastolic blood pressure in patients that are older than 50 years old. So there's different types of hypertension. The most common one we're going to see, right, is going to be our primary essential hypertension or idiopathic hypertension. We don't know what the cause is of hypertension. Usually these patients just have a family history of hypertension. Their mother suffers from hypertension. They have a sibling that suffers from hypertension. And it's idiopathic. We don't know the cause. Although, you know, um, studies have possibly shown that maybe it's associated to the intake of salt in our diet, but that's usually controversial, right? So Primary essential hypertension, this is the most common and it's often attributed to issues with our kidneys. Uh, it's defined as hypertension where no cause is found like we discussed and it tends to occur between the ages of 25 to 55 years old usually. And like we discussed, patients usually have a family history of hypertension. And then we have our secondary cause. So secondary hypertension usually has a cause, right? It's usually due to something else that is causing that hypertension. So usually these causes or conditions are usually treatable or correctable. And if we treat whatever is causing the hypertension, then we're going to treat the hypertension. So some of the causes are usually renal, neurogenic, endocrine. Um, usually we suspect secondary hypertension in a young patient. If it's a 20-something year old that presents with hypertension, we're thinking about possibly secondary hypertension because they're really young, right? So it's usually going to be patients that are uh, younger than 30. Patients who are over the age of 50 with new onset of hypertension, or if your patient has a sudden increase in blood pressure, or if the patient is just not responding to medications in general, right? So say that you've treated a patient with one, you started with a thiazide, right? Which is usually what we start with our patients. You started with a thiazide diuretic. And then after that, you added a ACE medication, and then a third blood pressure medication, and you've maxed those medication on their doses and the patient is still not responding, then you can possibly think about maybe this might be had be due to secondary hypertension, right? This is possibly not primary hypertension in these patients. So usually in patients that are younger, like in their teens and their 20s, uh, hypertension is usually linked to an underlying endocrine disorder. While in patients that are older than 50 that have sudden onset of hypertension, um, usually we think about atherosclerosis, right, of the renal arteries or some type of hyperplasia. So atherosclerosis of the renal arteries, right, those arteries can get um, basically fat, right, on it, which is going to cause um hypertension, secondary hypertension for these patients. So causes of secondary hypertension, renal vascular is usually the most common cause of secondary hypertension. Things like renal artery stenosis, uh, fibromuscular dysplasia is the most common cause actually in young patients and is caused by atherosclerosis in the elderly. So think about this, right? We have a patient that comes in, they're younger than 30, they're like in their 20s, maybe it's a female, she's coming in with like all of a sudden like acute onset of hypertension, then we want to think about maybe fibromuscular dysplasia, since we said this is very commonly found in our younger patients. While like atherosclerosis of the renal arteries, we want to think about elderly patients, right? And then fibromuscular dysplasia is another one. This one actually affects young women and causes the walls of the large and medium-sized arteries to thicken. So once again, this is another differential diagnosis we want to have for younger patients. And then Renal causes, you know, parenchymal disease, renal cysts, renal tumors also. We want to make sure that we're ruling that out. Or obstructive uropathy. Things for adrenal glands. Primary aldosteronism is a huge one, right? So if a patient is not responding to medications, we want to think about maybe primary aldosterone, checking that renin level, right? Cushing syndrome is another one. Pheochromocytoma, right? Uh, that really weird tumor pheochromocytoma, they really like to test on it, and it's very rare. Aortic correctation, this is where the patient has increased blood pressure in the upper extremities in comparison to the lower extremities, so it's really important that you keep that in the back of your mind. Other causes can be obstructive sleep apnea also, uh, preeclampsia or eclampsia in a pregnant woman, right? Alcohol use, oral contraceptives, 
or COX-2 inhibitor medications, neurogenic causes or psychogenic, diencephalic syndrome, uh, polyneuritis, acute perforia, lead poisoning, acute increased intracranial pressure, acute spinal cord section. Endocrine causes can be hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism, right? Hypercalcemia, acromegaly is a big one also. And then of course your medications like high dose estrogens, adrenal esteroids, steroids, decongestions, appetite stimulants, cyclosporin, tricyclic antidepressants, MAOIs, uh, NSAIDs, erythropoietin, cocaine is a big one that's also commonly associated with secondary hypertension. So how is a patient in general going to present that has hypertension, right? So most of these patients usually are asymptomatic. They don't even know they have high blood pressure until they come in to their doctor, they get their blood pressure checked, and boom, they are hypertensive. So this is why it's usually known as a silent killer, right? Uh, symptoms are usually nonspecific, though, if they do have symptoms. Sometimes they may present with a headache that's usually oh, very bad in the morning. It's usually localized to the occipital region. Dizziness, palpitations, they feel fatigue, and men may present with impotence, also symptoms. So how are we going to work these patients up? We can do basic laboratory tests for initial evaluation, right? So we can make sure that we do a UA. We want to measure their protein and albumin excretion just to make sure that kidneys are working fine. We can do a serum BUN and creatinine. For endocrine, if we think that it might be something due to endocrine, we can do sodium, potassium, calcium, and TSH levels, right? Just to rule out those things that we discussed, like hypercalcemia, uh, hyper or hypothyroidism. Uh, if we suspect that it might be something like metabolic, right? Fasting blood glucose is usually to rule out diabetes, and sometimes these patients have diabetes and hypertension also. Uh, total cholesterol, we can measure their HDL and LDL, triglycerides. And then, of course, we can do a hemoglobin and hematocrit to rule out anemia as another cause. So another thing that we can do is an EKG and chest x-ray. EKG is going to tell us whether there's any type of damage to the heart because of uncontrolled hypertension. Usually in these patients, we see left ventricular hypertrophy, right, because of that increased pressure going through the blood vessels. And what is the treatment with these patients? So very interestingly, if you treat these patients, you can treat and reduce the risk of getting heart failure. So usually if we treat these patients, there's a 50% decrease in heart failure, 40% decrease in strokes, and 20 or 25% decrease in myocardial infarctions with these patients. But usually the first line treatment for all these patients is going to be your lifestyle modification. So you're going to tell these patients to make sure that if they're overweight, right, lose weight. Um, if they can, try to maintain a BMI of less than 25. Make sure that they're decreasing their salt reduction, possibly six, less than six grams uh, per day of salt if they can. The DASH diet is a big one, right? Uh, this one usually is a diet that just tells the patient to make sure that they're eating a lot of fruits, veggies, low-fat dairy products with reduced content of saturated and total fat. Make sure that they're decreasing their alcohol consumption, right? Less than two drinks a day in men and less than one drink a day in women. Make sure they're exercising at least with week, uh, daily if they can, like a brisk walk 20-30 minutes a day. And then the big one's also going to be stop smoking. If, you, if they can stop smoking is a really big one for these patients. So say that they've done that, right? And the patient is still coming and their hypertension is not controlled. Then you want to think about adding medications. So usually the medications that we think about, right, are thiazides or ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers or beta blockers with these patients. So... Treatment for these patients is going to depend, of course, on their ethnicity. Um, so in a patient that has, for example, and then also what other comorbidities do they have? If the patient has chronic kidney disease or diabetes mellitus and they're coming in with hypertension, with these patients, we want to think about maybe, you know, adding like an uh, ACE or starting with an ACE inhibitor because that is usually renal protective, that medication. And usually with these patients, we want to make sure that we have a goal of reducing their blood pressure to less than 140 over 90 in patients that have chronic kidney disease or diabetes. And your general, general African-American population, 
if those patients have also diabetes, um, we can do an ACE, but if they don't, usually we, we want to make sure that we do a thiazide type diuretic or a calcium channel blocker for these patients. And then in adults that have chronic kidney disease and hypertension, like we discussed, um, regardless of their race or, or diabetic status, usually with these patients, we want to make sure that we do an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker to improve kidney outcomes. You never do an ACE and an ARP together. Never. So if that's an answer choice on a question, you never do an ACE and an ARP together. Never, ever, ever. You can do an ACE with a thiazide or another combination of any of your antihypertensive medications, but we never, ever do an ACE and an ARP together. Another thing that's really commonly tested is usually like your JNC recommend eight recommendations of how or what is the initial therapy for hypertension. So let's just go into those. So for a general non-African American, usually we start with our thiazides. Um, we can do calcium channel blockers or ACEs or ARBs. If the patient is an African American individual, then we can do thiazides or calcium channel blockers. And if the patient has chronic kidney disease, then we can make sure that we include in our treatment plan an ACE or an ARB for these patients. Also, we want to make sure that we're up treating or adding therapy after one month if the blood pressure goal is not achieved. So if the patient comes back and say that they're on a thiazide diuretic and it's not working, then we want to make sure that we increase their dose or we can add another medication from the ones that we just discussed. And like I said, do not use ACEs and ARBs together. I've seen these answer choices on question stems. If there's an ACE and an ARB together, do not choose those. So if it tells you what's the next step, never an ACE and an ARB. Now, say that we have a patient, we have them already on three drugs. Say we have them on a thiazide, an ACE, a calcium channel blocker, right? And they're all like maxed out on the doses and we cannot control their hypertension. Then usually in these patients, we might want to refer them to a hypertension specialist. I did a nephrology rotation. So most of these patients would be referred to a nephrologist like him and he would take care of these patients. So there's different strategies on how to dose antihypertensive drugs. So let's go into each one. So strategy one, or strategy A, is you start with one drug, right? So you start with, for example, chlorothaladone, right? A thiazide diuretics. We try titrate that to the maximum dose and then add a second one if the goal, the goal blood pressure is not achieved like we discussed. And then you have strategy B. You start with one drug and then add a second drug before achieving the maximum recommended dose of the initial drug. And then you try titrate them both up to the maximum recommended doses to achieve target blood pressure. And if the target blood pressure is still not reached, then you select a third drug. And then we have strategy C. This is where you initiate therapy with two drugs simultaneously, either as two separate drugs or as a single combo for these patients. So there's also resistant hypertension. Uh, this is defined as failure to achieve target blood pressure despite more than three antihypertensive agents like we discussed earlier, right? You've given them three from different classes. They're all, all titrated up and you still cannot control that blood pressure. Then in these patients, usually we want to refer them out. And we also want to think maybe about a secondary cause of hypertension, right? Like we discussed, maybe they might have hyperaldosteronism and maybe they might have renal artery stenosis. So these are one of the things that we want to make sure that we are checking. Um, another thing is that according to the JNC8 recommendations is that there is a target blood pressure in certain patient subgroups. So I wanted to discuss this also. I've seen this asked on practice questions, so it's something really important to know. So if the patient is older than 60, we want to make sure that their target systolic blood pressure is less than 150 and their target diastolic blood pressure is less than 90. If a patient is less than 60 year old, years old, then in these patients, we want to make sure that their target systolic blood pressure is less than 140 and their target diastolic blood pressure is less than 90. If a patient is older than 18 years and they have diabetes, then their target systolic blood pressure is going to be less than 140 and their target diastolic blood pressure is less than 90. So in general, right, in patients less than 60, if they have, um, if they have no comorbidities, it's going to be less than 140 and less than 190, less than 90. And patients that are older than 18 with diabetes, it's going to be less than 140 and less than, than 90 diastolic. But in patients that are older than 60, that's when it changes, right? You want to make sure that we have their systolic blood pressure less than 150 
and their dive stock less than 90. So I just wanted to make sure that I mentioned that point also. All right, so that is hypertension. Um, make sure that you are familiar with the medications, right, on how to treat them, primary and secondary. Primary is usually the most common one you're gonna see in clinic. It's gonna be your essential idiopathic hypertension. We don't know the causes in general. The first line treatment for these patients is going to be conservative management. Make sure that they are changing their diet. If they're overweight, losing weight, exercising, decreasing the soil that they're putting in their foods. Um, and then once they, you've done that, say the patient comes back and they've tried everything, they work out every day and they're still not be, being able to get their blood pressure under control, then that's when we start thinking about our medications like our thiazides, our calcium channel blocker, our ACEs and ARBs. If the patient is diabetic and they have hypertension or they have uh, kidney problems and they have hypertension, then we think about those renal protective medications, right? Our ACEs and ARBs. If a patient's coming in with fruit in and they have this chronic cough, they're on an ACE and maybe take away the ACE, switch it maybe to an ARB, right? Or switch it to another class of medication that's within the medications that are going to decrease their hypertension. Okay, so pulmonology. So in pulmonology, let's start with the asthma. Um, asthma is very commonly asked, so make sure that you know your asthma, make sure that you know your medications on how to treat your asthma, which we're gonna go through, um, how to step up and add, for example, steroid, when to go from a short acting to a long acting, when to go from an inhaled to an oral steroid. So we're gonna go through all that. And this is very commonly tested. I actually had a few questions even on the pants. I just took the pants. And why don't we just go through these, okay? So asthma, the thing about asthma is that there's many type of syndromes that have been identified associated with asthma. So you have extrinsic allergic, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, intrinsic asthma, extrinsic, extrinsic non-allergic, aspirin sensitivity, right? Exercise induced and asthma associated with COPD. Another thing that you wanna keep in mind is that asthma is usually not, when we think about asthma, we think about children, right? But asthma is not, always found in children, you can also diagnose it in adults. So if you're reading the question stem and it sounds like asthma, but it's an adult, think about asthma because it's not always associated with children, even in clinic, right? I had a patient that we had just newly diagnosed with asthma. She was like in her mid forties and she couldn't believe it because she said she never really suffered from asthma as a child. Anyways, so asthma. What is a pathophysiology or etiology? So asthma is going to be your type of obstruction of airflow, right? We have our obstructive disorders, and then we have our restrictives. Um, obstructive is going to be asthma. So the patient can not get air in, but they can get air out. That's how I, how I, I think about it. Versus restrictive, the patient cannot get air in, but they're able to get air out. So obstruction of airflow is going to be the one of them. Uh, they're going to have bronchial hyperreactivity, and they're going to have inflammation of those airways. So that's why they cannot get air or oxygen inside their lungs. So another thing that we want to think about is that the strongest predisposition factor to asthma is going to be your ATP. So your atopic triad is going to be really important in these patients. And sometimes in the question stem, you're reading it and they have something from this atopic triad or they have any of these from the atopic triad, then we want to think about asthma, right? So that's going to be your wheezing, your eczema, your seasonal rhinitis, um, usually associated with asthma. And like we said, this is a strong predisposition factor to asthma. There's also other triggers, for example, pollen, house dust, molds, cockroaches, gross, right? Cats, dogs, cold air, viral infections, tobacco, smoking, medications are good beta blockers, right? Because those beta blockers are usually like constricting those bronchioles, aspirin, and even a patient that exercises, like we discussed, exercise induced can cause asthma. So there's different types of asthma. We have our mild, um, intermittent, right, moderate and severe, which we're gonna discuss in a few moments. So how is a patient in general going to present with asthma? So they're gonna have that chest tightness, right? Breathlessness, <laughs> wheezing. I don't know if you've heard this during your pediatric rotation, but you can hear the <gasps> wheezing. Sometimes I've only heard it during auscultations. Sometimes you can just hear it without even auscultating the patient. Usually they're going to have a cough also that occurs in 30 minutes to exposure to any type of trigger. For example, um, like we said, right, our pollen. And usually this cough is going to be worse at night. And that's how our patient presented uh, the mid-40-year-old that I told you. She had this chronic cough that nobody could diagnose her with. 
and she said it was worse at night, but she noticed that it was worse whenever she went outside. So we want to think about environmental factors also. And also another thing that we want to think about is that wheezing is not usually always associated with asthma. It's not usually found with asthma. So about one to three kids, uh, one out of three kids usually do not present with wheezing. And another thing is that usually these patients will be asymptomatic between their asthma attacks. And asthma is usually going to be classified like we discussed, right? And your different intermittent, mild, moderate, and severe. And it's usually going to be classified according to the frequency of the symptoms that they're having and also their pul pulmonary function test. So pulmonary function test is how we're going to diagnose these patients. It's usually what's required to diagnose these patients. So any type of airflow obstruction is indicated by an FEV1 over FVC ratio of less than 75%. That's really important that you know. A more than 12% increase in FEV1 after a bronchodilator therapy is also supportive of diagnosis, right? So you give a patient a bronchodilator, dilates those bronchioles, and the patient has an increase in their forced expirational volume, their FEV1, of more than 12%, then this can be diagnostic, diagnostic of asthma. We can also do an ABG. Usually if the patient has like mild cases of asthma, it's usually going to be normal. But if the patient has is having like a severe asthma attack, then usually in these patients, their ABG is going to have hypoxemia, right? They're going to be hypercapnic because when we're thinking about it, these patients cannot get air out, right? So they're going to be keeping all that carbon dioxide inside. And then we can also do a chest x-ray. Usually the chest x-ray is normal. That's usually how it's going to be on the exam. Um, it might show some hyperinflation, but it's usually normal in these patients. And any first time Weezer, we want to make sure that we, we get a chest x-ray for these patients. Another test that we can do is a metacoline challenge test, which is a bronchial prov provocation test. This is going to help us establish the diagnosis when spirometry is non-diagnostic. So with these patients, we basically make them worse, right? So we give, we give them metacoline and it's going to decrease their forced expirational value of more than 20%. Usually it's going to be diagnosis, diagnostic. So it's going to further uh, restrict those, um, that, those breath, that breath way. So how are these patients treated? Um, so of course, with these patients, we usually always start them on a saw, but right, or short acting, beta agonists. The big one's gonna be your albuterol. All patients get sabas. And then depending on that, you know, is it mild, is it intermittent, is it moderate, it's severe, then that's where we're gonna add the medications, which we're gonna discuss. And we also wanna make sure that we educate these patients, right, to just avoid anything that's causing it. Um, allergens, you know, if there's, if it's exercise induced, um, usually GERD is sometimes associated with it. Also, if they're on certain medications like beta blockers, that's another thing, right? If a patient is, has asthma and they're coming in for like tachycardia or something, we want to make sure that we don't use beta blockers. We can possibly use another medication from that class, from that class, another medication from, um, a different class, like possibly calcium channel blockers, right? But not beta blockers. So treatment, um, why don't we go into the different types of medications that we can give for these patients and why don't we discuss first the classification of asthma, right? So intermittent is going to be symptoms less than two days per week. So it's gonna be a patient that's presenting, they only have asthma exacerbations less than two days a week per week. Maybe they have it on Monday and then on Thursday, less than two days per week. And they use a rescue medication, right? Their inhaler less than two days per week. And their nighttime symptoms are gonna be less than two times per month, right? Less than two times per month, those coughing, those nighttime symptoms. And their FEV1 is gonna be greater than 80% predictive. And their FEV1 over FEC is going to be normal. That's a big key, right? Their spirometry. What about mild? So mild persistent asthma it's going to be the patient has symptoms more than two days per week, right? So they're going to have it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, they're going to use a rescue medication more than two days per week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, nighttime symptoms more than, well, about three to four times a month, right? So they're going to have more than three times a month. Three to four times per month, they're going to have symptoms. 
and their FEV1 is going to be greater than 80% predicted, and their FEV1 over FVC is going to be normal. It's going to be your mild persistent asthma. What about your moderate persistent asthma? So your moderate persistent, persistent asthma, this patient is going to have daily symptoms. So they're going to have symptoms sun, uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, every day. They're going to have be using the rescue medication daily. So they're going to be using that inhaler every day. Uh, they're going to have nighttime symptoms more than one time per week. And their FEV1 is going to be greater than 60%, but less than 80%. So it's going to be between that range, right? Uh, and their FEV over FEC value is going to be reduced. And it's going to be reduced uh, by 5%. And then we have our severe persistent asthma. This patient is going to have symptoms every day, multiple times throughout the day. So it's going to be continuous symptoms. These patients are really sick. Usually in these patients, uh, they use the rescue medication several times throughout the day. They have nighttime symptoms often more than seven times per week. So they have nighttime symptoms almost every day throughout the week, if not multiple times throughout the night. And their FEV1 value is going to be less than 60%. And their FEV1 over FVC is going to be reduced greater than 5%. So that's going to be your severe asthma. So it's really important that you know these, right? Intermittent, mild, persistent, moderate, persistent, and our severe persistent. And depending how they present on the question stem is how you're going to treat these patients. So say this patient comes in, right? And they have intermittent asthma. What do we do with these patients? We usually start them on a short acting beta agonist, right? It's going to be your albuterol. So what if the patient is coming in and they have your mild persistent asthma. So in mild persistent asthma, we wanna think about possibly adding a low dose and held corticosteroid. We can also add something like Montelukast, which is a leukotriene receptor antagonist, right? So it's gonna basically antagonize those, um, uh, the leukotrienes that are going to be released by the body, right? That's causing that allergic, that, that uh, restriction of air flow. And then we can also use chromalin, like, and this chromalin is a mast cell stabilizer, and we can also use theophylline. So once again, it's going to be your short-acting beta agonist plus a low-dose inhaled corticosteroid for persistent mild asthma. Other things that you can use are Montelukas, chromalin, theophylline. Do we use them? Not really. Usually you add, on top of the short-acting beta agonist, a low-dose inhaled corticosteroid. What about your persistent moderate asthma? So in these patients, we want to make sure that we add a long-acting beta agonist, right, and held beta agonist. We can do a low to medium dose and held corticosteroid. We can also possibly add Zylutin, right? That's an alternative you can do. What about persistent severe asthma? Usually in these patients, it's going to be a LABA, right, long-acting beta agonist, like cell metaril, plus a high dose and held corticosteroid for these patients. Um, so, Another thing that you can do for these patients is that you can also add uh, oral steroids. So high dose in health corticosteroids plus LABA plus oral corticosteroids. And then another thing you want to consider is that if the patient has allergies, and you consider something like amalizumab, amalizumab for uh, patients who have allergies. So that is usually going to be the treatment for these patients. Um Another thing that we want to do is if the patient is not well controlled, for example, they have no changes to medications, they're not getting better, then we want to make sure that we follow up with these patients every one to six months and also consider stepping down therapy if the patient has controlled asthma for more than three months, right? So say that they're on a short acting beta agonist and then on top of that, they're on a corticosteroid. If the patient is getting better, then maybe you can step down that therapy, right? All right, so that was asthma. I know it's a mouthful. It's really important that you know the difference between your intermittent, mild, moderate, and severe, and also on how to treat each one and when to add things. For example, like we said, right, um, with our intermittent, it's usually short-acting beta agonists like albuterol. If it's uh, mild, then we want to think about possibly adding like a low-dose and held corticosteroid. You can have alternatives like the ones that we discussed, right? And then if we have our... Um, mild, we have our moderate persistent asthma, then we want to think about adding a long-acting beta agonist. We can add a low to medium dose in health corticosteroid, right? And then if it's severe, then in these patients, it's going to be usually 
your um, high dose inhaled corticosteroids, oral corticosteroids, and then along with the beta agonists, right? And if it's related to asthma, then we can think something about omalizumab. All right, so what about acute asthma exacerbation? So acute asthma exacerbation, how is this patient going to present? They're going to have asthma, right, but it's going to be very, very severe. They're going to be sweating and wheezing. They can't even complete their sentences because they're just so out of breath. Uh, they're going to have tachypnea, so <laughs> breathing really, really quickly. They're going to have that paradoxical movement of the abdomen because they're really using those lungs, those um, those muscles to make sure that to get air, breathe to breathe air and in. So you're going to see that um, paradoxical movement of the abdomen and diaphragm and inspiration. They're going to have that accessory muscle use, right? And work up for these patients. Uh, we, we can do a peak expiratory flow. It's usually going to be very low, especially if it's less than 60. One thing about this being a very severe case of an acute asthma exacerbation, these patients can die. So it's really important that we treat these patients quickly. We can do an ABG also, and then we can do a chest x-ray just to make sure that we're ruling out something like pneumonia. So how are we gonna treat these patients? Usually an inhaled beta two agonist we can do uh, via nebulizer, or we can even do a metered dose inhaler. Uh, we can either even do corticosteroids IV or oral, depending on how the patient's presenting, right? And then also IV magnesium, this is gonna help with their bronchospasm. Some of the complications if we do not treat these acute asthma exacerbations is that these patients can develop status asthmaticus. Um, they can go also into acute respiratory distress syndrome, right? The respiratory muscle fatigue. They can develop atelectasis. Um, so it's really important that we treat these patients. All right, guys. So bronchitis is going to be the next one. I got bronchitis. Bronchitis. So bronchitis. Let's go into acute bronchitis, which is possibly the ones that we see a little bit more commonly, right? Uh, the most common cause of acute bronchitis is going to be a virus. It's really important that you know, right? So viruses are going to be the most common causes of bronchitis. Why do we need to know that? Because usually, how do we treat a virus? We usually don't give antibiotics, right, for viruses. It's usually just symptomatic treatment. And so acute bronchitis, usually with these patients, we don't give them antibiotics, right? Because the most common cause is going to be viruses. And how is this patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with a cough that's been going on for more than five days with or without sputum that lasts about two to three weeks. They're going to have that chest discomfort, right? That shortness of breath. They may or may not present with a fever. And how are we going to diagnose these patients? Usually we don't really do labs. It's usually just a clinical diagnosis, right? These patients are going to be tachycardic. Um, they're going to have fever. They're going to be tachypneic, right? They're going to have rels whenever you auscultate them. And if they do, if they look like they're very, very sick, like they're confused or hypoxemic, then we, then we can't get a chest x-ray. Usually it is a clinical diagnosis for these patients. So how do we treat them? Once again, since the most common cause is viral, we do not give any type of antibiotic whatsoever. So it's usually going to be symptomatic treatment like your NSAIDs, aspirin, Tylenol, um, you can even do ipratropian, right, those anti-muscarinics, and you can even do uh, albuterol or like a bronchodilator, but no antibiotics because we said the most common cause there is virus for bronchitis. So COPD, COPD. So COPD, right, is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It's an obstructive type of pulmonary disease where the patient cannot get air in, right, but they can get air out. So with... COPD with these patients, we want to know that there's two flavors, right? We have our chronic bronchitis and then we have our emphysema and these patients present very differently and that's usually what they like to test on. So we're going to go through each one. But in general, COPD is the fourth leading cause of death in the U.S. for these patients. And there's risk factors and causes. So the huge risk factor is going to be smoking, right? Um, other risk factors are going to be alpha antitrypsin deficiency. Um, that usually is worsened with smoking. Environmental factors like secondhand smoke. Where is the patient employed, right? What do they do for a living? Chronic asthma. And usually for these patients in general for COPD, we do serial monitoring with FEV1 measurements. We do pulse ox and also we can do an exercise tolerance testing. Uh, for acute exacerbation, so if a patient is having an acute exacerbation, then we want to think about possibly like the most common causes like infection, um, cardiac problems also, 
These patients can also develop secondary polycythemia, and then pulmonary hypertension and core pulmonal can also occur in acute exacerbations, especially if they have severe long-standing COPD, right? So usually the mainstay therapy, so the treatment in general, usually for these patients for stable COPD is going to be inhaled bronchodilators. So like your beta agonists and your anticholinergics, you can use them alone or in combination with inhaled corticosteroids. And <clears throat> maintenance therapy for these patients, like we said, um, you want to make sure that usually we use the long-acting agents. We can also use theophylline, especially for your refractory stages. But in general, for these patients, our initial acting agent, depending on how many exacerbations that they have, according to the gold combined assessment of the COPD. But in general, right, if this patient has like less than one exacerbation per year, then we can do something like a short acting anticholinergic or a short acting beta agonist, right? If they um, have like more than two exacerbations per year, then we can do a long acting anticholinergic or we can do a LABA and a long-acting anticholinergic. And then if they have like really, really severe symptoms, then we can do a LABA and a long-acting anticholinergic or a long-acting long -acting anticholinergic. So in general, right, guys, we do our anticholinergics or our um, bronchodilators. So those antimuscarinics for these patients. All right, guys. So... Let's go into chronic bronchitis. So chronic bronchitis is going to fall under that umbrella of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So how do you differentiate between chronic bronchitis and our emphysema in these patients? So chronic bronchitis, let's start with that one. Usually these patients have excessive mucus production that narrows the airway. So that's usually the patho. And this causes this productive cough. They have this scarring and inflammation of that causes enlargement of the glands, that causes smooth muscle hyperplasia, and then causes further obstruction. How is this patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with a cough, sputum production, and then dyspnea also. Um, on exam, you're going to see that the patient's going to be cyanotic, right? They're going to be blue. It's also known, they are also called the blue bloaters. They're going to be tachypnic tachycardic, they're gonna, you're going to see that they're usually going to be using that accessory muscle use. If you do like a, an examination on them, you're going to see hyperresonance on percussion, which makes sense, right? Because we said that this is a type of obstructive pulmonary disorder where the patient can, cannot get air out. So they're keeping all that air inside. So that makes sense why they have so much air, right? When we think of how I think about it is that you have a drum and you, you whenever you percuss a drum, right, you hear that resonance. That's usually going to be on these patient hyperresonance on percussion because they have so much air. Um, they can't get that air out. And then on um, clinical diagnosis, it's important that these patients have to fulfill this book-wise, right? In real life, do they know? But book-wise, they have to have a chronic cough that's productive for more than three months for at least two consecutive years. So that chronic cough that's productive for more than three months for at least two consecutive years that's usually going to be diagnostic for your patients that have chronic bronchitis. Um, we can also do a chest x-ray, but it's not very sensitive, but it's useful if a patient comes in that has an acute exacerbation like we discussed. We want to make sure that we rule out things like pneumonia or a pneumothorax. We can also do alpha antitrypsin levels, especially if the patient has a family history of premature emphysema, because whenever we think about emphysema, it's usually going to be your older folks, right? They have like a history of, of smoking, but if you have a patient and they're younger and they're not smokers and they're presenting with like signs and symptoms of COPD, then we want to think about alpha antitrypsin levels um, deficiency. So we want to make sure that we get these levels. We can also do an EBG. We're going to see chronic PCO2 retention and decreased PO2. And treatment for these patients, we want to make sure that we tell them to stop smoking. That's actually going to be the most important thing that in general for all COPD patients, chronic bronchitis, emphysema, smoking is a big, big factor. So make sure that you know that this is something that's very highly testable. So make sure that you tell them to stop smoking. And like we discussed, you can do uh, beta agonist for these patients, or you can do, you do an anti-muscarinic. So you can do an inhaled short-acting beta agonist like albuterol. This is going to give them really good symptomatic relief. And you can also do long-term agents 
uh, like cell mineral also. You can also do a combo like we discussed of a beta agonist and an anticholinergic. We can also do inhaled corticosteroids like budesonide or fluticasone. And then oxygen therapy also for these patients we can do. And it's really important that we vaccinate all these patients, right, with our chronic bronchitis because these patients are prone to getting like, uh, strep infections, um, influenza. So we want to make sure that we vaccinate them against influenza annually and then streptococcus pneumonia every five to six years, especially if they're older than 65, right? And what's going to be like the definitive treatment for this? It's going to be surgery. So surgery, we get a new lung or we just um, resect that lung. All right, guys, so next one's going to be emphysema. So emphysema, what is a patho of emphysema? They really like to test this. So with emphysema, these patients, they have elastase, protease, or protease excess, and overinflation because once again, this is an obstructive, right? They can get air in, but they cannot get air out of their lungs. And so elastase is usually released from your uh, neutrophils and macrophages. And what happens is that elastase ingests that lung tissue. And <clears throat> usually what happens in patients that have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is that alpha-1 antitrypsin helps by inhibiting elastase. So if you are lacking alpha-1 antitrypsin, then you have all this elastase that is not going to be inhibited. Another thing is that smoke in general increases your uh, neutrophils and macrophages. So this is going to inhibit that elastase and it's going to, I'm, I'm sorry, it's going to inhibit that antitrypsin, which inhibits elastase, right? And it's going to increase oxidative stress on the lung. So we, whenever we think about our emphysema patients, we think about our pink puffers, right? We said chronic bronchitis is going to be those blue bloaters. On For emphysema, we want to think about your pink puffers. They're going to have that barrel chest. They're going to have those uh, pursed lips. Like they look like they're breathing through, through straws. And types of these, right? There's two types. They like to test on this. You have your centrilob centrilobular. This one's actually going to be the most common one. And this is usually seen in your smokers. And it's going to be usually destruction limited to the bronchioles, usually in the upper lungs. Versus your panlobular. This is usually associated with our alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And this is usually going to be found um, in the lung bases. So how is this patient going to present? They're going to have that productive cough or acute chest tightness that's going to be worse in the morning. They're going to have this clear to white sputum, and it's usually going to be your older folks, right? Patients in their 50s. Um, they're going to have dyspnea, wheezing, tachypnea, cyanosis. They're going to have the jugular venous uh, distension, right, that you can measure here that you can see. Um, they're going to have peripheral edema. That barrel chest is going to be a big one. On physical exam, what do you expect to see since it's a type of obstructive disorder where they have all this oxygen that, can, that they cannot get out. You're going to have hyperresonance to percussion. You're going to have diminished breath sounds whenever you auscultate. And then they can present with diffuse or focal wheezing. So once again, right, these patients, they just have like very damaged alveoli, right? Um, they have this permanent enlargement and destruction of air spaces that are distal to the terminal bronchioles. And Usually with these patients, how are we going to diagnose them? We can do a pulmonary function test. It's usually diagnostic. We're going to see their FEV1 over FEC. That's going to be less than 0.75. Their FEV1 is going to be decreased. Their uh, total lung capacity, residual volume, and FRC are going to be increased, which makes sense, right? Because it's an obstructive disorder. They're air trapping. They're not able to get that air out. And their vital capacity is going to be decreased. We can also do a chest x-ray for these patients. Treatment, once again, like chronic bronchitis, stop smoking, smoking cessation. Um, we can also do home oxygen. And actually smoking and home, home oxygen are only are the known, the only known interventions shown to decrease mortality. So make sure that you know that. So which type of intervention can you do in these patients to decrease mortality? Tell them to stop smoking and home oxygen. But smoking, stop it, is the number one. So how are we going to treat these patients? Right? We're going to treat them very similar to how we discussed with our chronic bronchitis. Um, we want to make sure that we give steroids and antibiotic for, antibiotics for any type of patient that has your acute exacerbations Right, uh, for emphysema. So that acute exacerbation is going to be your increased sputum production. Um, they're going to have worsening shortness of breath. 
Um, you can give them something like IV methylprednisolone, especially in the hospital. You can give them something like azithromycin or levofloxacin also. Uh, we can give them like oxygen BiPAP or CPAP for these patients. So those were two of them. So make sure that you know them, right? Chronic bronchitis, blue bloaters, emphysema is going to be your uh, pink puffers, right? They're going to be looking like they're breathing through a straw. They're going to be very thin. Um, barrel chest, although honestly, barrel chest is just associated with COPD in general. So on x-ray, just make sure you look for that hyperinflation with those the flattened diaphragm for these patients. Alrighty, so let's go into lung cancer, pulmonary neoplasms. So what are some of the risk factors for just lung cancer in general? Smoking is going to be the big one, especially their risk increases with how many pack years or ha they have. Um, also, if they have passive smoke, right, if they live in an environment where they just have exposure to secondhand smoke, asbestos, when we think about asbestos, we think about our patients that work in shipbuilding and construction, painting, and especially if a patient is has any of these jobs and then they're smoking on top of that, their risk is even higher for getting developing uh, lung cancer. Radon also, um, COPD is very commonly associated with and is a risk factor for cancer. Any type of metastatic disease that like to go to the lung, there's lots, a lot of cancers like brain, bone, adrenal glands, the liver. And screening is also really important that we screen patients. This is something you're going to get tested on, so make sure you know that. So according to the USPSTF, so your US Preventative Services, they recommend annual screening for lung cancer with low dose, right? Low dose annual screening with low dose uh, CT in adults between the ages of 55 to 80 who have a 30 pack year smoking history and currently smoke or have quit within the past 15 years. This is something that you need to know, so I'm going to repeat it. So the USPSTF recommends annual screening for lung cancer with a low dose CT in adults between 55 to 80 who have a 30 pack year smoking history and currently smoke or have quit within the past 15 years. So make sure you know that I've had so many questions on these. So also, um, we want to make sure that screening, um, make sure that we discourage this or discontinue it if a patient has not smoked for more than 15 years, or if they have any type of health problem that can limit their life expectancy or the ability of the patient to have a curative lung surgery, right? So let's go into different the different types of lung cancer because lung cancer is a big umbrella, right? And then we have different lung cancers that fall underneath that. So let's go with small cell lung cancers. This is about 25% of the causes of lung cancer in general. So it's not very common in comparison to your non-small cell lung cancer, which is about 75%. But let's start with small cell lung cancer. So how is this picture you're going to present? It's going to be your red flags, right? That weight loss, that anorexia, that weakness, that cough. Um, there's syndromes that are usually associated with small cell lung cancer that you need to know that are going to differentiate it from your non-small cell lung cancer, like your adenocarcinoma. So superior vena cava syndrome, this is usually an obstruction of the superior vena cava syndrome by a mediastinal tumor, right? So this patient's going to present with that facial fullness, uh, the facial and arm edema, they're going to have dilated veins over their anterior chest, arms, and face. They're going to have that jugular venous extension. They can also have phrenic nerve palsy, like your hemodiaphragmatic paralysis. Another way that these patients can present with is hoarseness, right? Especially like I sound right now because I've been talking for the past few minutes. So they're going to have that hoarseness because that tumor is usually just pressing on the recurrent laryngeal nerve. These patients can present with Horner syndrome also, which is going to be invasion of the cervical sympathetic chain by the apical tumor, right? So any tumor in your apex that are just pressing on that cervical sympathetic chain, it's going to cause your unilateral facial anhydrosis, ptosis, and meiosis. So it sounds like Horner syndrome, right? Well, it is Horner syndrome. And then they can also present with a malignant pleural fusion. So whenever we Think about pleural fusions, which we'll probably discuss. We think of our exudative and then our transudative. So this is one of the common causes of these pleural effusions, especially when we think about possibly like your exudative, right? Usually exudative, exudative pleural fusions 
are associated with your infections, your malignancies like lung cancer. Um, Eaton Lambert syndrome, this is very, very commonly associated with small cell lung cancer, right? It looks like it's myasthenia gravis, but it's not. So these patients have proximal muscle weakness or fatigue. They have diminished deep tendon reflexes and they have paresthesias. Um, but usually, and they can present with like that uh, ptosis, but with these patients in comparison to myasthenia gravis, the symptoms are usually going to get better with use versus myasthenia gravis, right? The symptoms usually get worse with use. So how are we going to work these patients up? So we're going to do a chest x-ray. This is really important for diagnosis, but we don't use this for screening like we discussed, right? We do use low-dose CT scans, but we start with a chest x-ray. We're going to do a CT chest with contrast. It's going to help us stage the cancer. And the most definitive one is going to be your tissue biopsy because it's going to tell us what type of cancer this is, okay? We can also do a cytological exam of the sputum. This is going to help us diagnose central tumors, but not peripheral tumors, so make sure that you know that. So cytologic, cytologic exam is usually for central tumors, so not peripheral. So small cell lung cancer, usually these are central, right? How I memorize it is that S, I know C is not the same as S, but how I memorize it is that S, um, small cell, central. So these tumors are going to be central, right? Small cell, central. So we said any type of central tumor, we can do a cytological exam of the sputum versus a peripheral. Um, we do a different type of test. So with these patients, what's going to be the treatment? Um, usually it's if it's limited, right, we can do chemo and radiation. If it's already extended, then we can do chemo usually only. Um, and then um, if these patients have limited, they usually have like a 10 to 13% survival rate or five-year survival rate. If it's extended, um, they have about a 1 to 3% survival rate. And usually staging with these patients, we want to make sure that uh, we also look at this superclavicular nodes, right, to see if it's been extended anywhere else with these patients. So let's go into non-small cell lung cancer. Like we said, this is the more common type, about 75% of uh, the lung cancers. So there's different types of cancers that fall under the non-small cell lung cancer. So it's going to be your squamous cell carcinoma, your adenocarcinoma, which is one of the more common ones from this category, or your large cell carcinoma, and then your bronchoalveolar cell carcinoma. So with these patients, um, they're going to be presenting with cough, hemoptysis, obstruction, wheezing. They can present with your Pankos syndrome, especially with your small cell, um, I'm sorry, your squamous cell carcinoma. So your squamous cell carcinoma is usually going to be presenting with your Pankos syndrome. Uh, we want to think about the patients going to be presenting with a shoulder pain, that radiates down the arm, pain and upper extremity weakness because they have this brachial plexus invasion. And usually also they can present with SIADH, especially with your squamous cell carcinoma. So you're going to see hyponatremia on labs. It's something that you really need to know. So SIADH is usually associated with your non-small cell lung carcinomas, especially your squamous cell carcinoma. You can also have ectopic ACTH which will cause hypercortisolism in your squamous cell carcinoma. You can also have parathyroid hormone-like uh, secretion associated with squamous cell carcinoma. So you'll have things like hypercalcemia, low phosphate, low PTH. And also you can have hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy, usually in your adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. So the big one is squamous cell carcinoma present, can have SIADH, they can have hypercortisolism, and then they'll have that hypercalcemia. That's really important that you need to know that's associated with squamous cell carcinoma. So usually with these patients, how do we diagnose them in general for our non-small cell lung carcinomas? It's going to be our chest x-ray. Once again, right, we don't use this for screening, but it's it's going to help us with the diagnosis. It's going to show us whether there's like a pleural fusion or not. Uh, we're going to do a CT chest once again to stage, and then tissue biopsy to determine the type, right? And with these patients, um, like we discussed, right, cytological exam of the sputum is going to help us diagnose any type of central tumor. So how I memorize it, like I said, anything that starts with an S, it's going to be central. So small cell lung carcinoma is central. 
squamous cell carcinoma central adenocarcinoma starts with an A, so it's not central, it's actually going to be peripheral. So this is going to be the ones that you need to know where they're located. So adenocarcinoma is going to be peripheral, small, and squamous. They start with S, it sounds like C, they're going to be central in the lung located. And how do we diagnose our peripheral tumors? So like adenocarcinoma, how are we going to diagnose that? So usually we're going to do a transthoracic needle biopsy. This is going to be very accurate for our peripheral lesions versus our cytological exam of sputum, right? And fiber optic bronchoscope, these are going to help us diagnose central, but not very helpful for our peripheral tumors like adenocarcinoma. So what's the best treatment for non-small cell lung carcinoma? So in general, the best treatment is going to be surgery, right? Surgery is going to be the best option versus, right, our small cell lung carcinoma. We usually do chemo radiation with these patients because it's just very um, deadly and it just metastasizes super quickly. Uh, versus our non-small carcinoma, we can actually do surgery. So make sure that you know that. Uh, we can do radiation also for these patients. Another thing that you need to know is that small cell lung carcinoma, right, in squamous are usually associated with smoking versus adenocarcinoma, it's not associated with smoking. So if it's a patient that comes in, it's a woman, um, she's young, she says she's never smoked, we wanna think about adenocarcinoma, right? Versus our S's, right? Think about small cells, squamous, they start with S, smoking. They are located centrally, right? Um, smokers, when I think about smoker in these small and squamous cell carcinoma. Okay, so another one they really like to test on is your solitary pulmonary nodule. So you go in there, you do a CT scan, or you're doing an x-ray, and you see all of a sudden like a pulmonary nodule, and you're like, I don't know if it's cancer or not. So they really like to test this. So we're going to go and um, go into this. So a solitary pulmonary nodule, usually majority of these are benign, but it's really important that we don't miss one that can be a cancer, right? So usually it's going to be a single isolated less than three centimeters, so it's not going to be enlarged, right? less than three centimeters, it's gonna be well circumcised. It's not gonna be abnormal. Anything that we feel abnormal, just in general, right? Or we see abnormal, we think about cancer, but usually these are gonna be benign, less than three centimeters, it's gonna be a single one, well circumcised nodule or coin lesion with no associated mediastinal or hyalur lymph node involvement, right? If they have any of these, then it's positive, then they might be malignant, but usually these are benign, they're not gonna have any of these. But what increases our suspicion for a patient that may have a malignancy are going to be any of these risk factors. The patient's older than 30. They're a smoker. Um, they, have, they smoke a lot of cigarettes, right, per day. Uh, they had a previous malignancy. And usually these patients are asymptomatic, like we said. We usually just find them on a chest x-ray or a CT scan that we did. And it's really important that to work these patients up, we first step we're always going to do is going to review an old image to compare and estimate whether it, the size is increasing or not. We can also do a CT chest scan. That's going to be our second step. And we can do a flexible bronchoscopy, especially for our central lesions like we discussed, right? That's going to be our third one. And then we can do a transthoracic fine needle aspiration to help us see if it's malignant or not. It's going to be a fourth step. And then five step, we can do a, a PET scan, right? But usually a first one is going to be for review old imaging to compare and estimate whether there's any type of doubling time, if there is an old image. So like we said, treatment for these, the majority of them are benign, um, especially if the patient's younger, right? Um, if the size is less than one centimeter, if the borders are smooth and discreet, um, if, they're, if the calcification is dense, central, or laminated, if the chest x-ray has been stable, so that means that the size has not increased for more than two years, usually these patients, we follow them up every three months. Versus a patient that has a malignant one that we think that they're malignant, these are some of the things that we might think that it's malignant. If the patient's older than 50, if the size is greater than two centimeters, if they have thick walls, so greater than 16 millimeters, if they have irregular borders, um, eccentric or asymmetric, asymmetric calcification, the size is getting bigger, they have some type of lobular appearance, if the patient is a smoker, right? Um, on CT scan, you can see speculative margins, peripheral halo, then in these patients, we wanna make sure that we biopsy and we resect it. So why don't we go through some examples? So say we have a patient that's less than 30, uh, you've seen that there's lesions that are stable for more than two years, and the characteristics, right? They have the size is less than one centimeter, the borders are smooth and discreet. Then in this patient, we want to think about maybe it's benign, right? 
And then we can just do watchful waiting for these patients because they have a very low probability that's going to be a malignancy. So if it's intermediate probability, right, for these patients, like we discussed, then um, we're going to do a diagnostic biopsy. Um, you can do a PET scan also if they have a high probability, right, if they have multiple of these factors that we discussed, it's speculated, they're older than 50 years old uh, or 30, uh, 50 years old, and they are um, smokers, then in these patients, we want to make sure that we resect it. We usually don't want to biopsy because you can have a risk of seeding. So once again, intermediate diagnostic biopsy, PET scan. If it's high probability staging, we're just going to go and resect it. All right, guys, so let's go into pneumonia. So pneumonia is something that's very commonly tested. So make sure that you know your pneumonias, also the different types and how to treat each one. So pneumonia, we have different types, right? Um, let's go into each one. So we want to think about our community acquired pneumonias. So these are going to be something like Klebsiella. So Klebsiella is very commonly found in your alcoholics. So you want to think about that current jelly sputum, right? Those bulging fissures. Uh, Staph aureus is another one of your community-acquired pneumonia. This is very commonly found in your IV drug abusers. On your gram say, you're going to see that gram-positive cocci in clusters, commonly found in your elderly patients, also in post-influenza. And also um, for staph aureus, they really like to cause like abscesses like on the, on the chest x-ray. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Haemophilus influenza, we want to think about your COPDers, right? Um, usually this is going to be a gram-negative pleomorphic rod on your gram stain. Pseudomonas, usually you want to think about cystic fibrosis. These patients are usually going to present cyanotic. Nursing home residents also. And then another one that's important to go over is going to be your prophylaxis for these patients. So what's going to be the prophylaxis? So Pneumovax 23 and Prevnar 13, right? So in patients that are older than 65 years old, then they're immunocompromised or they have any type of chronic illness that increases the risk of community-acquired pneumonia, then we want to make sure that we give both Pneumovax 23 and Prevnar 13. If there's a patient that are immunocompromised and they're at high risk, then they should get single revaccination of 23, and then six years later, um, after first dose, get again, regardless of their age. If the patient is immunocompetent and they are 65 and older, then they get a second dose of your Pneumovax 23, if they received the vaccine six years ago, like if they're before the age of 65. So what are other indications for a pneumococcal vaccine? Who else gets pneumococcal vaccine? So patients that have sickle cell disease, right? Because most of these patients have sickle cell disease, they've already like auto-infarcted the spleen. So most of these patients don't have a spleen that's functional. So these patients are more prone to getting those encapsulated type of bacterias. So it's really important that these patients, we prophylax them with um, our pneumococcal vaccines. Other patients are congenital or acquired asplenia. So if they don't have a spleen, once again, if they have any type of splenectomy, or even if they have like any type of, like say they got stabbed and they got stabbed with their spleen once, they just don't have a spleen in general. We want to think about these patients getting pneumococcal vaccine. If they have congenital acquired immunodeficiencies, right? Uh, HIV, nephrotic syndrome, leukemia, lymphoma, Hodgkin disease, multiple myeloma, any type of transplant, organ transplant, then we want to think about giving them possibly the pneumococcal vaccine for these patients. So in general, for all pneumonias, right, this usually happens when there's a defect in one of the primary pulmonary defense mechanisms like our cough, reflex, um, mucosary clearance, immune response. So if these patients are intubated, right, they're very prone to getting these um, pneumonias, if a patient's intoxicated. So the most common cause just overall of pneumonia is going to be streptococcus pneumonia. That's going to be the most common cause. But there's other causes of pneumonia, right? Um, they fall into the categories of community acquired, um, etc. But other causes are going to be haemophilus influenza, mycoplasma pneumonia, staph aureus, Neisseria meningitidis, mycoplasma cateralis, um, Klebsiella pneumonia, and then also gram-negative, other gram-negative rods are also causes of pneumonias. Viruses are also causes of pneumonias. Um, the common ones are going to be influenza, RSV, adenovirus, parainfluenza virus. And usually, um, 
with these patients, how are they gonna present? They're gonna present with acute or subacute onset of fever. They can have a gradual onset of cough with or without sputum, right? Whenever we think about our atyp atypical pneumonias like mycoplasma, um, we wanna think about usually these patients, they usually present with out sputum, but like things like our um, like streptococcus, which is like the common one, usually these patients present with sputum. So that's another way to differentiate both of them. And another way these patients can present is shortness of breath with exertion. They can present with sweats, chills, rigors, right? Chest discomfort, um, hemoptysis, fatigue, myalgias, anorexia, headaches, abdominal pain. Uh, the signs that they can present with is tachypnea, right? They're breathing really, really quickly. Tachycardia, oxygen desaturation. They can present with fever. And then on physical exam, you're going to hear those crackles on inspiration. They're going to have these bronchial breath sounds and then dullness to percussion over the area of consolidation. That's a big one, right? They really like to test that. So on physical exam, dullness to percussion because you have like junk stuck there in the lung. That's why you're having that dullness to percussion over the area. So how are we going to diagnose these patients? Usually we're going to do a chest x-ray. Uh, we are usually going to see a lower consolidation, especially like in your... Uh, in streptococcus pneumonia, for example, uh, we can also see like uh, diffuse alveolar or interstitial opacity. This is usually with your atypical pneumonias like your um, your mycoplasma pneumonia, right? Your walking pneumonia. We can also do a CT chest. CT chest. Uh, it's more sensitive and specific, but usually we start with the chest X-ray, right? And labs, we do a sputum gram stain sensitivity. Um, this is going to help us see what type of bacteria the patient has. Also, you can do a urinary antigen test for streptococcus pneumonia and Legionella. This is actually very sensitive and specific. Um, it's as sensitive and specific as a gram stain and it's, you know, easily available. So we can also do that, which I thought was very, very interesting. And also with these patients, we can do a CBC, CMP, um, ABG also, and then we can do a procalcitonin, although, you know, there's a lot of um, debate on whether it's helpful or not, but procalcitonin can basically tell you whether it's a viral or bacterial infection. So how are we going to treat these patients? Now, this is where it comes a little bit, like, difficult on whether the patient is being treated as an outpatient or the patient is being treated as an inpatient or are they in the ACU? Um, do they just take medication? Like in the previous days, we'll just go through each one, Okay. So in general, for outpatient, we usually want to give them medications um, like uh, clarithromycin um, or azithromycin. So any of your macrolides, we can also give them doxy. And this usually helps us cover for like streptococcus pneumonia, mycoplasma pneumonia, which are like the common ones that we tend to see. Now, this is usually going to be giving a patient that has been healthy with no recent antibiotic use. So what if the patient has had antibiotic use in the last 90 days or older than 65, they have all these comorbidities, right? They're immunosuppressed. Then in these patients, we're going to go with their big guns, like our fluoroquinolones. So we'll do something like moxifloxacin um, or levofloxacin. Levofloxacin is like the, one of the good ones for good fluoroquinolones for um, just pneumonia in general. So they really like to test this and how I memorize it as the L for lungs, right? Levofloxacin. So if I ask you which one of these fluoroquinolones lungs is good, uh, levofloxacin. Um, uh, another thing that you can do is macrolide plus like a beta-lactam you can do. Now, what if the patient's a smoker? What treatment do you want to do? You can do a septonere for these patients, like as an outpatient. Now, what if the patient is an inpatient, but they're not an ICU? Then we want to make sure that we cover for streptococcus pneumonia, right? Legionella, Haemophilus influenza, Enterobacter, uh, Staph aureus, and Pseudomonas, since these are the ones that are commonly found in the hospital. And usually, if a patient is healthy, right, they have not done used any type of recent antibiotic in the past 90 days, then first light is going to be our fluoroquinolone. So we can do something like IV Leviquin or IV Ciprofloxacin. Now, what if the patient is at risk for drug resistance? So like we discussed, the patient that used antibiotics in the last 90 days, they're older than 65, they're immunocompromised, they have comorbid um, illness also. Then in these patients, we want to think about maybe covering something for pseudomonas because they're at risk for pseudomonas. So we can give them something like an IV macrolide plus an IV beta-lactam, or we can give them cefotaxime also, or rocephin, like ceftrioxone. 
So what if the patient is hospitalized or they're in ICU? So for these patients, we want to cover for streptococcus pneumonia, Legionella, Haemophilus influenza, Intrabacter, Staph aureus, and Pseudomonas. So in a patient that's healthy, once again, has not received any type of antibiotic in the past 90 days, we can do azithromycin or respiratory fluoroquinolone, like levofloxacin, like we discussed, plus an anti-pneumococcal beta-lactam, so something like your ceftriaxin, uh, cefotaxime. And if a patient is at high risk for resistance, so once again, if they had um, antibiotic exposure in the last 90 days, if they have comorbid illness or immunocompromised, then in these patients, we want to make sure that we are using an anti-pneumococcal or ant and anti-pseudomonal beta-lactam. So we can do cefepime, emipenem, or meropenem, plus something like ciprofloxacin or levofloxacin. So sorry, that was a mouthful. So just in general for our outpatients, though, which is going to be the common one you might be asked, is usually with these, with these patients, we usually just give them lights, right? If you want to take our, our big guns, uh, we can do something like uh, your fluoroquinolones, usually, um, if these patients are inpatient, right? So it's really important that you knew the difference between your um, atypical and your typical, right? The most common cause in general for pneumonia is going to be your streptococcus pneumonia. This is going to be your typical, right? Streptococcus pneumonia. Usually these patients in any type of typical pneumonia, they're going to be presenting with your cough sputum. It's usually going to be that cough that is usually purulent, right? They're going to see stuff in their cough. Um, that's usually for your typical pneumonias. And then on x-ray, you're going to see that lower consolidation. That's usually very commonly associated with your typical pneumonia on exams. Now for your atypical pneumonias, we think we're, we're thinking about mycoplasma, right? Legionella. The mnemonic is my clamoring lesion. Um, so mycoplasma, Legionella, uh, your chlamydia. These are going to be your atypical, usually going to be found in your younger patients, right? Your college students, it's going to be your walking pneumonia. They feel like they're perfectly fine. They can be walking around. They have this cough that is non-productive, so it's not going to be productive in comparison to your typical like streptococcus pneumonia, right? And your atypical, it's going to be non-productive. Um, on exam, on your chest x-rays, you're going to see usually like interstitial, um, interstitial versus your Typical, right? We said it's usually a lower consolidation, so you see interstitial infiltrates for these patients. And just make sure that you know the different types, like we had discussed, right? So Klebsiella, you want to think of our alcoholics, that current jelly sputum. Um, Streptococcus pneumonia is going to be your common one. Staph aureus, usually post-influenza, right? Um, IV drug abusers, uh, pseudomonas, cystic fibrosis. Um, for these patients, mycoplasma pneumonia is usually going to be your younger patients, right? Um, Legionella, your hot tubbers, or usually like anyone that it can go through the air vents. So those are coming, some of the common buzzwords that are associated with these. So just make sure that you know these. Okay. Another one is uh, chlamydia sataki, birds. So anyone that's been around birds, chlamydia sataki or parrots in general. All right. So what about Immunocompromise. What do you want to think about immunocompromise? So immunocompromise, um, we want to think about our PCP, right? Our um, um, PCP or PJP. So immunocompromise is usually going to be a patient, right? It's usually very commonly found in your patients that are um, that have AIDS, right? If they or even like, um, yeah, they have HIV or AIDS. So pneumocystis jurovici, it's usually caused by a fungus. It's interesting because they used to think, if you read about the history, they used to think it was a parasite. Now they confirmed it's a, a fungus. It's usually caused by a fungus that's found in the lungs of animals. It's a uh, most common opportunistic infection in HIV and AIDS. Uh, this patient's going to be presenting with fever, shortness of breath, a non-productive cough. And usually how it says on the, on the exam, it's that, Examination findings are disproportionate to imaging. So, like, you look at the image and you're like, oh my gosh, like, what is this? It looks so bad. And the patient doesn't look that bad. So, that's what it means. The patient's going to be presenting with fatigue, weakness, weight loss. On your exam, like on the x ray, you're going to see diffuse interstitial infiltrates. And that's usually going to be the definitive diagnosis, it's going to be a chest x ray. So, it's going to be diffuse or perihilar infiltrates, reticular interstitial pneumonia. 
Um, you'll see that bat wing pattern. It looks like a bat wing on chest x-ray. They may or may not give you a chest x-ray. Another way you can diagnose this is with a sputum right GMT stain or a direct fluorescent antibody. And usually this, this pneumonia is very commonly found in your patients that have a CD4 le count less than 200. So CD4 count less than 200, usually these patients have AIDS, right? You're, um, you want to think about your um, PAP or PCP. And usually the wire blood cell count is also going to be low in these patients. And LDH is also usually going to be increased. That's another thing that they like to test on, but it's not very specific. So treatment for these patients is going to be Bactrim. So Bactrim is going to be the treatment, and it's also the preventative treatment for these patients. So if a prophylactic patient has a CD4 count less than 200, then we can give prophylactic Bactrim to avoid PCP. So pneumocystic carini pneumonia. And... Another thing is that we want to make sure that we also add steroids, um, especially if their PaO2 is less than 70. Um, what if the patient has a sofa allergy? Then we can do something like Dapsone also. So once again, Bactrim is going to be the treatment. We want to make sure that we add steroids if the patient is like really, really sick also. And Dapsone if the patient's allergic. Uh, PCP is usually in your patients that have a CD4 count less than 200, right? Bactrim is also prophylactic for... In patients that have, AIDS, that have a CD4 in less than 200, your, your patients with AIDS, you're going to see that bat wing pattern on your chest x-ray for these patients. So what about nosocomial pneumonia? So some of the pathogens that are commonly associated with nosocomial pneumonia is going to be your Staph aureus, right? Klebsiella pneumonia, E. coli, Pseudomonas, some of your gram-negative rods also. Usually with these patients, you're going to present with either two of the following, fever, leukocytosis, or that purulent sputum. It tends to occur 48 hours after the patient has been admitted to a hospital or any other type of healthcare facility. And usually on, for these patients, we're going to diagnose them with a chest x-ray. We're going to see either a new or progressive parenchymal opacity. We're going to do two blood cultures, a CBC and CMP. Uh, we're going to do a sputum culture and gram stain also, and then a procalcitonin, even though, like I said, it's some people can debate. It's not very specific. Um, for these patients, what, how are we going to treat them? Uh, we're going to treat them with either ceftrioxin, we can do some moxifloxacin or levofloxacin, Cipro. What if they're at high risk for and pseudomonas? So for that, we're going to cover pseudomonas with cefepine, right? Or ceftazidime. You can also do emipenem or meropenem. And then for MRSA, if we want to cover MRSA, then we want to do IV vancomycin or lin linozolid. Sorry, linozolid. So what about ventilator-associated pneumonia? This tends to develop more than 48 hours after endotracheal intubation and mechanical ventilation. So once again, ventilator-associated pneumonia, just how it sounds, right? Um, it's going to be your patient's going to be intubated that develops more than 48 hours. Some of the most common pathogens that are associated with our ventilator-associated pneumonia is going to be your actinobacter bacteria. I've seen this a lot, especially like during my COVID, uh, during COVID-19, since we're COVID-19 right now, right? So during my rotation with my nephrologist, we would go up and do rounds. And we saw that a lot of the patients that were intubated, a lot of the majority of them had actinobacter uh, bacteria. So this is very commonly associated with that. Other bacteria are like maltophilia also, but the most common one is going to be your actinobacter that I've seen. Um, so just make sure that you keep that in mind. All right, guys, so let's go into our next one, sleep disorders. Uh, I can guarantee you that you're going to get a question on this one, so make sure that you know this and you're familiar with this. So sleep disorder, we have our obesity hypoventilation syndrome, which is also known as your Pickwickian syndrome. This is a condition where severely over over overweight people fail to breathe rapidly or de deeply enough, right? So these patients have low, low blood oxygen and high CO2 levels. Um, it can result in obstructive sleep apnea. So these patients usually will have partial awakenings at night with obstructive sleep apnea and sleep sleepiness during the day, which can lead to heart failure symptoms like leg swelling. So let's go into obstructive sleep apnea, right? So what happens with these patients is that they have a loss of pharyngeal muscle tone. So um, they have that loss of pharyngeal muscle tone that collapses whenever they're inspirating. 
Some of the risk factors for these patients are going to be micrognathia, which is where the lower jaw is just like really small. Macroglossia, it's going to be that enlarged tongue, right? If they're obese, tonsillar hypertrophy, so those enlarged tonsils, hypothyroidism, and smoking. The things that aggravate obstructive sleep apnea is going to be alcohol or any type of sedative that the patient can take before sleeping. If they have also any type of nasal obstruction, like with an illness also, even like those enlarged like nasal polyps in patients. And usually most of these patients are going to be like obese patients, very commonly found in your men, also middle-aged individuals. How is this patient going to present? Usually in the question stem, it's going to say that the wife hears their significant other, they're complaining that they just snore super duper loud. So they're going to have a history of loud snoring. They're going to have that cyclical snoring, restlessness, thrashing of the extremities during sleeping. They're going to have apnea. So they go, they're, they're like breathing and then they go, <gasps> they're like gasping for air and then they keep breathing. Um, they're going to be very, very sleepy during the day. They're going to be fatigued. They can have also personality changes, right? Because they're not getting enough rest. Their brain is not resting at night. They'll have poor judgment, memory impairment. They won't be able to concentrate. They can also be depressed. They can have hypertension. They can present with headaches that are worse in the morning. That's actually one of the key points also. And then impotence is also very commonly associated with these patients. Some of the signs is that the patient's going to appear sleepy. They can have a narrow oropharynx, excessive soft tissue folds, large tonsils, pendulous uvula, large tongue. They're going to have a deviated nasal septum on your physical exam. They can have that bull neck appearance. Work up for these patients. The definitive one is going to be your polysomnography, right? So you're going to do those sleeping tests. And these patients are going to have five more, five or more episodes of apnea, right? So that's where they're just like not breathing. Hypopnea or respiratory related arousals per hour during sleep. Their CBC can also show erythrocytosis. And what's going to be the treatment? So like we've discussed for everything, right? It seems like like uh, the NCCPA exams always like to say that conservative treatment is going to be the first line. So just make sure that you're not, and it is in real life, but test-wise, weight loss and avoiding any type of hypnotic medications is going to be the first line treatment. The second line treatment is going to be your CPAP, and this is usually curative in these patients. But the definitive is going to be a tracheostomy, right? All right, so next one's gonna be our obesity hypoventilation syndrome. I know I went to it, I went into it like a little quickly. Let's go into it more into depth. So this is gonna be an alveolar hypoventilation that results from blunted vent ventilatory drive and increased mechanical load imposed by obesity. So this patient's gonna have voluntary hyperventilation that returns the PCO2 and POT levels towards normal values. So these patients are gonna have rise of CO2 by 10. Um, millimeters of mercury after sleep compared to awake measurements with overnight drops in oxygen levels without apnea or hypopnea. How are we going to diagnose this? We're going to do a polysomnography, this is similar to obstructive sleep apnea, right? And EEG, EKG, and pulse ox also. Treatment, once again, weight loss, right? Um, it's going to be the big one. We can also do medications like acetazolamide, diophylline. This is going to help reduce those bicarb levels in these patients. And then we want to make sure that we treat the underlying obstructive sleep apnea, right? So we're done with those. I can guarantee you're going to get a question on obstructive sleep apnea, so make sure that you know that. So next one's going to be our tobacco use or dependence. So how do we treat these patients, right? So one thing to keep in mind is that one pack of cigarettes has 20 cigarettes, right? And one carton has 10 packs, which equals 200 cigarettes. So just make sure that you keep that in mind. So what are the first line therapies for a patient that wants to stop smoking? So we can do something like bupropion, right? Um, this is very effective and it's actually one of the most effective medications, especially when it's combined with behavioral therapy. Uh, what is going to be like the characteristics of this medication? It's a norepinephrine and dopamine reuptake inhibitor. It's taken orally and has an onset of action of one to two weeks. We want to make sure that we um, avoid th this medication in any patient that has a history of seizure disorders, which is a big one, right? Any history of eating disorders also. And also we want to make sure that we advise them of the black box warnings of bupropion 
that has suicidality, especially in the first one to two months. They can also have dry mouth, but suicidality is going to be the big one. And with these patients on bupropion, we want to make sure that we monitor the kidney and liver functions, their behavioral changes, their body weight, and their blood pressure, since this medication is also associated with weight loss for bupropion. The next one's going to be nicotine gum. This one can be used for up to 12 weeks. They chew at least one piece every one to two hours while awake. They basically chew it and they park it. So they chew it and bite down for 30 minutes and then they place it in the mucosal, buccal mucosa, right? And this is usually adjunct therapy. Um, it's usually sold over the counter. It's taken orally. And the mode of action is it's an agonist to nicotinic receptors at the autonomic ganglia, adrenal medulla, neuromuscular junction, and at the brain. There's usually no contraindications for this medication or black box warning, but some of the adverse effects is that the patient can present with uh, mouth soreness or, ul or ulcers, right? Sore jaw. We really don't need to monitor this one, which is nice. Another one you can do is nicotine patch. You wear it for four weeks, then two weeks, then two weeks, and then eight weeks. So this one's usually over the counter. It's applied topically, right? Um... The mode of action is going to be an agonist to nicotinic receptors at the autonomic ganglia, adrenal medulla, neuromuscular junction, and the brain. This one has no contraindications or black box warnings, but some of the adverse effects is going to be insomnia and local skin reaction. We usually don't need to monitor this one. The other one's going to be Chantix. So this one's used for 12 to 24 weeks, um, only given by prescription. And we want to make sure that usually these patients are going to have side effects. We tell them that they're going to have side effects when they start it. So we want to give the side effects at least two weeks to resolve before they start going away, okay? Um, another thing that we want to keep in mind is that with Chantix or varin varinacycline, these patients, can it can impair the capacity to drive. So if it's a patient that is a driver, then we want to make sure that we don't prescribe this medication. And usually it's only taken with bupropion. So this one's taken orally, right? Some of the contraindication contraindications for this one's going to be congestive heart failure, mood disorders, some of the black box warnings, it's going to be suicide. It can also cause psychosis. That's a big one. And also it can cause vivid dreams. And we want to make sure that patients on this medication, we monitor for kidney function and behavioral changes. So these are just some of the ones that you want to consider for smoking cessation. Um, so <clears throat> there's also second line therapies. We went over the first lines that we discussed. These are some of the second lines like clonidine and nortriptyline are other ones that you can take into consideration. All right, guys, let's go into TB, tuberculosis, right? So tuberculosis, just real quick, some quick hits that we need to know, right, is that only active tuberculosis is contagious, right? So if a cough, patient is coughing and sneezing versus like uh, primary tuberculosis is usually not contagious. So what are some of the risk factors for tuberculosis? So HIV is going to be a big one. If the patient is an immigrant, right? Prisoners, healthcare workers like us, uh, close contact, individuals that have close contact with anybody with TB, your alcoholics, diabetics, steroid users, blood malignancies, IV drug abusers also. So the most common cause or the bacteria, the most common cause of tuberculosis is going to be mycobacterium tuberculosis. This is an acid fast bacilli. It's very slow growing. It's transmitted through inhalation of aerosolized droplets. And some of the clinical manifestations for this is going to be fatigue, uh, weight loss, fever, night sweats. They're going to have that productive cough with these patients. And sometimes they may be asymptomatic. Sometimes they don't even know they have it, especially if they're like in your primary tuberculosis, right, stage. Um, this patient's, how are we going to diagnose them? We're usually going to diagnose them with a sputum stain. So we're going to see the acid fast bacilli on smear. We can also do a sputum culture for mycobacterium tuberculosis. Or we can do a PPD, although this is not diagnostic, right? A chest x-ray, we're going to see caseating granuloma formation. Once again, it's caseating, right? Caseating granuloma formation. Um, usually, we'll see pulmonary opacity. is very commonly found in the apex of the lung. Why? Because this is where the bacteria likes to go, because this is the area that has the most oxygen. So treatment's going to be with your ripe therapy, right? Your rifampin, isoniazide, your perzinamide, and then your ethambutol. And we want to make sure that we treat these patients according to what tuberculosis they have, right? Are they in the active stage? Are they in the latent stage? Are they immunocompromised? So let's go into each one. 
So primary tuberculosis, this is where the bacilli is inhaled, right? And it's deposited into the lung. Then the, macro, the alveolar macrophages go and then they inhale it. So then what happens is that the organisms that survive, they multiply, they disseminate via the lymphatics and blood, and then granulomas form and they wall off the mycobacteria. And then it remains there dormant. That's why our immune system is just amazing because um, uh, our macrophages are just amazing because they go in there to just like wall off that mycobacteria. And that's what we see on x-ray, right? So what happens in these patients is if they, anything happens to the immune system, they get sick, uh, they're immunocompromised, then that's when it can reactivate. But usually these patients with primary tuberculosis are usually asymptomatic um, and usually clinically and radiographically silent also. Now for secondary tuberculosis, this is going to be your reactivation. Usually this is where the, the patient's or the individual's immune system has been weakened, right? Either by an infection, did they get HIV, AIDS, um, malignancy, are they on steroids or medications that decrease your immune system? Are they using substance abuse? Are they just not eating? Your diabetics, um, silicosis is a big one. And usually in your secondary tuberculosis, this is something that's very testable. It's going to present on the apex of the lungs, right? Because this is the area, like we said, that has the most oxygen. And this is where the bacteria wants to survive. It's the best area where they can survive and live and multiply. So these patients are going to be symptomatic versus primary tuberculosis. Usually these patients are not symptomatic. And secondary tuberculosis, when it's reactivated because they had any type of insult to their immune system, the patient is going to be symptomatic. So they're going to present with fever or night sweats, weight loss, malaise. Um, they're going to have a chronic cough that's progressive, dry, and then it starts becoming productive. So then they have, they're going to have this blood struck sputum, like your hemoptysis, right? Signs are going to look very ill, malnourished. Um, and then we have our extra tr pulmonary tuberculosis. Where this is where like our immune system can just cannot cont contain the bacteria. So the bacteria start spreading everywhere. It's very commonly seen in your patients who are immunocompromised, like your HIV or AIDS patients, right? So this is where it affects a bunch of organs. So it can affect the lymph nodes, the GU tract, the pleura of the lung, right? The spine, also known as POTS disease, right? Intestines, meninges. And then we want to think about miliary tuberculosis when there's like a hemo hematogenous spread of the tuberculosis of the bacteria. Very commonly seen in your patients with the HIV, like I said. Uh, you're going to see organomegaly. Um, you'll see choroid tubercles also in the eye. And treatment for your for this, for miliary TB, is usually going to be nine months of therapy with um, nine months of therapy with your right, right? Um, so sometimes you might need to do surgical drainage and debridement of necrotic bone, especially if it involves a skeletal skeleton, right? All right, so now since we discussed all of these, how do we treat each one? So, active tuberculosis. Um, on these patients, we wanna make sure that we put them in droplet precautions, right? Because these patients are infective. We wanna make sure that we isolate them until the sputum has been negative for, for acid-fast bacillus. So with these patients, we're gonna treat them with two months of RIPE and then four months with isoniazide and rifampin. We want to make sure that we discontinue ethambitol when the isolate has been determined to be INH sensitive. Okay. And then what if the patient's pregnant? Then in these patients, we're going to do rifampin, isoniazide, and ethambitol for two months. And then we're going to do isoniazide and rifampin, rifampin for seven months. Okay. We also make sure that we're giving pyridoxine B6 for these patients, right? because we want to make sure that we prevent uh, peripheral neuropathy, especially with isoniazide. And then um, we want to make sure that we educate these patients that, that breastfeeding is not contraindicated. All right, guys. So that is how we treat them. First line treatment, right? Right, rifampin, isoniazide, perzinamide, and ethambutol is going to be our medications for these patients. And... Um, also know, like we discussed, right, that you always want to make sure that you are giving vitamin B6 with isoniazide because this is something that's very commonly associated with um, your peripheral neuropathy. So, and it can cause peripheral neuropathy. So make sure that, you know, that's something that's very highly tested. So isoniazide, right, 
can cause uh, neuropathy. It can cause also um, hepatitis also. So make sure that you know that rifampin is going to cause those like those colored tears, like your red, orange colored peels, tears. Um, so make sure that you know that also. All right, guys. So that is it. Just make sure that we have gone over everything. Um, yes, we have. So that is it. Uh, make sure that you know, like I said, our, your asthma, that's something that's very highly tested. Sleep apnea, I can guarantee you're going to get a question on um, uh, sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea. Also, your COPD is right. Differentiate between your chronic bronchitis and then also your emphysema. And in regards to emphysema from that umbrella, make sure that you know the difference between centras centrasinar and uh, penesinar. So we said that Usually with penesinar, it's usually associated with your patients that have anti-trypsin anti deficiency. So make sure that you know that also. Alpha, alpha anti-trypsin deficiency, sorry. Make sure that you know that's something that's very, very highly tested. And then, of course, your pneumonia is right. Cryptococcus pneumonia is going to be the most common one. When we think about atypical non-productive cough, interstitial infiltrates versus your Typical pneumonia, streptococcus pneumonia is going to be the most common one. We think about that productive cough, those lower infiltrates, right? So we are done with that, and let's go on to our next subject. All right, guys, so our next one is going to be GI. This is actually a big one that they like to test, so this one might take us a while because it's a lot of material that we like that we are going to go over, okay? And just, just in general, also for the pants, it's a lot. So GI, let's start with our anal fissures. So what's an anal fissure? This is where you have irritation that's caused by trauma to the anal canal. You have an increased resting pressure of the internal sphincter that causes ischemia in the region of the fissure and poor healing of injury. Very commonly found in your patients that are between 30 to 50 years old. Um, the most common site for this one is going to be the posterior anal midline below or distal to the dentate line. Now, a chronic anal fissure, you want to think, is going to be a fissure that's been ongoing for more than six weeks. So make sure that we know that. So how is the patient going to present? So like anal fissure is just like a cut right near the, the rectum. The patient's going to be presenting if it's acute. They're going to have tearing pain with defecation. The patient may also avoid going to the restroom because it's just so painful whenever they go to the restroom. And that's how they're going to usually present on the question stem. They're also going to be presenting with perianal pruritus and or skin irritation, bright red bleeding on the toilet paper. And they can also have like a superficial laceration, like a paper cut like that you're going to see on your physical exam. If the patient has a chronic anal fissure, then usually the laceration is going to have raised edges. They're going to have um, anal spasm also. You're going to see also some external skin tags on your chronic anal fissures. And diagnosis for this patient is usually going to be a clinical diagnosis, right? We're just going to go in there and look at it. Um, you can do an endoscopy, especially if the patient has a rectal bleeding that's been going on for more than two months. Um, you can also do a colonoscopy if you suspect like Crohn's disease, right? But treatment in general for these patients is usually, once again, conservative, right? So if it's acute, it's usually going to get better in six weeks. So we can just make sure that we tell the patient that they eat a lot of fiber, right? That it's going to decrease them from becoming constipated. It's going to help them increase their bowel movements, that motility. So it's going to avoid them from further like um, placing more strain on that cut. Also, we can tell them to make sure that they're drinking a lot of water, right? It's going to help once again with that um, bulk, the bulk of the stool to make sure it passes smoothly. Um, sit spas, topical anesthetics we can do in vasodilators like nitroglycerin and nifedipine. We can also do stool softeners or laxatives, so anything that is just preventing them from straining, right, and just further increasing that cut. So what if the patient has failed therapy, right? They've done all this and it's not getting better. It's just a chronic. Then in these patients, we want to make sure that we do something like botulinum toxin A injection. We can also do a lateral sphincterotomy. This is actually going to be the gold standard. But this is going to be last resort because it can cause fecal incontinence. So how are these patients, uh, what education do we want to tell them to prevent them from, what can you do to prevent from getting an anal fissure? So proper anal hygiene, make sure that they keep dry and wipe with soft cotton or moistened cloth. Make sure that they're increasing their diet, taking adequate fluids, avoid straining during defecation, avoid any type of trauma to the anus. So next one is going to be appendicitis. 
Um, this one's also very commonly tested, so make sure that you know that. This one's very commonly found between the ages of 10 to 30, and sometimes it's very difficult to, to diagnose because there's atypical presentations, right? Especially if the patient's like very young and or if the patient's like very old, or if they it took them a while to go and seek help or see a doctor for it. So there's numerous causes. 60% um, of the causes is due to hyperplasia. And then 35% of causes are due to like a fecalith. That's where like poop gets stuck there. So usually when I think in children, like the most common cause is going to be your hyperplasia. Your adults is usually going to be your fecalith. There's a bunch of other causes like foreign bodies, parasites, right? That's kind of gross or any type of carcinoid tumor. And so what happens is that they have obstruction to that appendix, right? That leads to stasis. So any type of stasis, it's like my pathophysiology professor used to say, any stasis leads to bacterial infection. So bacteria likes to go to area that is just stasis. So this causes stasis and this promotes bacterial growth, right? And then what happens is that there's extension of the appendix that can cause um, compromised blood supply that is usually going to become ischemic. So that area is going to become ischemic. And then also what happens is that since you have so much pressure, so much inflammation, the area can perforate. And that's why we want to make sure on these patients, they have to get treatment acute, take them to the surgery quick, because if it perforates, then, you know, it perforates, it rips then you can get something like peritonitis, the patient can become septic. So all that bacteria, right, is just going to be all over like the abdominal area and the patient can become very septic really quickly. So it's really important that we treat these patients staff and this is an emergency. So this patient is usually going to present with the abdominal pain, right? It's usually going to start in the epigastrium. That's usually how it says. And then it's going to move towards the umbilicus and then it's going to move to the right lower quadrant, right? right lower quadrant, we think about appendicitis, because what happens is that the appendix is just becoming, it's so inflamed and distended that it starts to irritate like those nerves that are like running there. And that's why you get that right lower quadrant sign, pain. And that's why you have all these signs, which we're going to go over. This patient is also going to be presenting with anorexia. They may present with like guarding also, right, on physical exam. They're going to have nausea and vomiting also, especially like after the pain. Um, they're going to have the McBurney point. So McBurney's point is your right lower quadrant pain. Make sure that you know that. Make sure that you don't confuse that with your Murphy sign. So Murphy sign is usually your right upper quadrant that is usually associated with cholecystitis. Right lower quadrant is your McBurney's point. So make sure that you know that's going to be associated with appendicitis. So another way that they can dis dis describe this is going to be be um, maximal tenderness at the McBurney's point, about two thirds of the distance from the umbilicus to the right anterior superior iliac spine, if they want to be fancy, right? So the patient's also going to have diminished bowel sounds. They're going to have a fever. It's usually going to be low grade, but if it perforates, right, then the patient's going to have a high fever. So some of the signs that you need to know, it's going to be a Rothstein sign. So your Rothstein sign is when you have deep palpation. So basically you palpate very deeply on the left lower quadrant and the patient's going to say that they have pain on the right lower quadrant. So that's going to be your raw scene. So left lower quadrant pain, you palpate there and then they're going to have pain in the right lower quadrant pain. And then you also have your psoas sign. This is where the patient has right lower quadrant pain when the right thigh is extended as the patient lies on the left side. So the patient lies on the left side, you extend that right thigh, then the patient's going to have pain. And what happens is that you're basically, um, pulling the muscles that is just touching those nerves that are running through that area. And that's why the patient is having pain. There's also your obturator sign. This is where the patient has pain in the right lower quadrant area when you flex the right thigh and you internally rotate it when the patient's supine. So make sure that you know these. These are very commonly tested signs. So make sure that you know these for sure. So what's going to be the diagnosis for these patients? Usually acute appendicitis is just a clinical diagnosis. You have these patients presenting with all these symptoms. You're like, you know what? It's acute appendicitis. You can also do labs. These are usually supportive. So you'll see something like mild leukocytosis. Um, you can also do CT scans or an ultrasound. But as always, right, we want to make sure that we use the least amount of radiation. If it's a child, then we can start with an ultrasound. Um, of course, I've, I've had cases where it's an obese child and usually an ultrasound will not help you diagnose it because you have so much uh, um, tissue there, right, and fat. 
So then in that case, we would do something like a CT scan for these patients. Treatment for these patients, right, it's going to be appendectomy. You want to make sure that you take them to the surgery ASAP. All right. So <clears throat> with these patients, how do we know if it's perforated? So if it's perforated, these patients, um, they're going to present with, they're going to look sick, right? Sick as F. So they're going to have high fever, tachycardia. They're going to have leukocytosis, peritoneal signs. They're going to be looking very toxic appearance with these patients. And it's really important with these patients that we may give them um, antibiotics, right? They go to surgery, give them antibiotics. All right, so let's go into bowel obstruction. So we have two types of bowel obstructions, and they present very differently. So it's really important that we know the difference between them. So we have small bowel and then we have large bowel. So for small bowel obstruction, how are these patients going to present? Is that um, the thing we need to consider first with small bowel obstruction is that there's three main points of differentiation, right? Versus it's partial or complete obstruction. With a partial obstruction, patients are usually able to pass gas, right? And they're able to have bowel movements because it's not completely obstructed. Versus a patient with a complete obstruction, they're going to present saying that they aren't able to pass any gas or stool because they have usually residual stool or gas in the colon. And usually these patients have severe obstipation. So like they're not having any of those bowel movements with these patients. Another way is to differentiate whether it's a proximal or distal small bowel obstruction. So if it's a distal obstruction, we want to think about distension of proximal bowel ligament segments. Um, this is usually going to help us make the diagnosis easier and quicker on an x-ray. And then usually this still presents with more like abdominal distension and less vomiting, which makes sense, right? Because the more proximal it is, if we think about our anatomy, this patient's going to have like a lot of vomiting. The more distal it is, the more uh, distension they're going to have and less vomiting the patient's going to have. So how is the patient going to present with the small bowel obstruction? So they're going to be very dehydrated, right? They're going to have intestinal distension also. They're going to be hypochloremic, hypokalemic, and metabolic alkalotic, which makes sense, right? Because they're vomiting, right? We said that vomiting is usually high metabolic alkalosis. Diarrhea is going to be metabolic acidosis. Um, they're going to have signs of hypovolemia because they're going to be very dehydrated because they're going to be vomiting so much. So they're going to have usually hypotension, tachypnea, they might have altermental status and also oliguria, so they have very minimal urine output. And the most common cause in adults of small bowel obstruction that you need to know this is very highly tested is going to be adhesions from a previous abdominal surgery. So any patient that had a previous type of abdominal surgery while they were, when they were a child, etc., they're more prone to getting small bowel obstruction and it's the most common cause of small bowel obstruction in adults. Now, the second most common cause is going to be incarcerated hernias, right? There's other causes like malignancies, intussusception, Crohn's disease, right? So how is this patient going to present? They're going to have cramping, abdominal pain, um, nausea and vomiting. Sometimes it's going to be bilious, especially if it's a proximal, right, um, type of small bowel obstruction. MS is usually going to be feculent if it's distal, so that's how usually you're going to differentiate these, right? Bilious vomiting if it's a proximal bowel obstruction, feculent if it's a distal bowel obstruction. Nausea and vomiting, obstipation, which is going to be that absence of stool and flatus. Uh, this is usually a late finding. Diarrhea is usually going to be an early finding. You're going to see abdominal distension. So the more distal the obstruction, like we discussed, the more prominent you're going to see the abdominal distension. And then on physical exam, you're going to see hyperactive bowel sense. It's, if it's an early obstruction, right? If it's a late obstruction, then you're going to see those hypoactive bowel sounds. Diagnosis, we're going to do an abdominal plane film. We're going to see those dilated loops of small bowel. And this is actually going to be the first line imaging. We can also do a barium enema just to rule out any type of obstruction in the colon, right? if like x-rays do not help us distinguish whether this is a bowel obstruction or not. And then another thing we're going to see is a string of pearl signs also. This is usually like diagnostic of a small bowel obstruction. So you'll see these obliquely or horizontally oriented row of small gas bubbles in the abdomen.
So treatment for this is usually, uh, we want to make sure that we do non-operative management if the obstruction is not complete, right? And if the patient doesn't look sick, like if they're, they're not feverish, if they're not tachycardic, they're not having any these like peritoneal signs or leukocytosis. So in these patients, we want to make sure that we give them IV fluids, right? Because these patients, like we said, they're very going to be severely dehydrated. Make sure that we're adding potassium to the fluids to correct for hypokalemia, which is very commonly present in these patients. Another thing we want to do is an NG tube to empty the stomach. We can also do antibiotics and then nothing by mouth to make sure that we're allowing the stomach and the bowels to rest. Sorry, the bowels to rest. Surgery is usually indicated only if the patient has a complete obstruction or if the patient has like a partial obstruction that's persistent or it's associated with strangulation or constant pain. So usually with these patients, so non-operative management, right? Nothing by mouth, give them IV fluids, um, NG tube to make sure that we empty the stomach. So large bowel obstruction, what are some of the causes of this? Usually volvulus, adhesions, hernias, but the most common cause is going to be colon cancer, right? A malignancy. So we said small bowel obstruction, adhesions, most common cause. Colon cancer is going to be the most common cause of your large bowel obstruction. Another thing to take into consideration is that large bowel obstructions are usually um, not very commonly associated with fluid loss or electrolyte disorders. These are usually more commonly associated with your small bowel obstruction, which makes sense, right? Because small bowel obstructions, these patients are usually like vomiting. They're going to be very dehydrated. Um, vomiting is not very common associated in your low, uh, large bowel obstruction. All right, guys, so let's go into our cholecystitis and cholelithiasis. So cholecystitis, right? Um, why don't we go into just like describing what each one is, right? So cholelithiasis just means stones, gallstones in your gallbladder. That's all it means. You can have gallstones in your gallbladder and you don't have any symptoms. Cholecystitis is when you have those gallstones in the gallbladder and they start causing inflammation because maybe they started going down and they got stuck in the cystic right, duct, right? And it's causing an inflammation, bacteria, et cetera. So that's how you differentiate between both of them. Usually, cholelithiasis is asymptomatic. It can be symptomatic, but usually with these patients, we really don't do anything. Cholecystitis, usually these patients have to go and get surgery, right? Get that gallbladder removed. So how is the patient going to present with acute cholecystitis? They're going to have that right upper quadrant pain, right? That Murphy sign, fever, and leukocytosis. What happens is like we discussed, right? They have an obstruction of the cystic duct that causes an acute inflammation of the gallbladder wall. And then an infection can occur also. Usually the most common bacteria associated is going to be your E. coli, because when I think about E. coli, E. coli in general is found in the stomach, right? It likes to look, live in the, not stomach, in your abdominal area, right? It's very abundant there. And it's, and it, when it starts becoming malignant or aggregating, increasing in numbers and it can cause infections, right? Stasis, stasis, stasis. And uh, with these patients, they're going to present with that right upper quadrant pain, right? It can radiate to the right shoulder or scapula. Pain is usually going to be constant. It's going to be la lasting for more than six hours. And usually they say that pain, the patient's going to say that pain is usually precipitated by fatty foods or large meals. The patient's going to be presenting with nausea and vomiting. They're going to be anorexic. They're going to have right upper quadrant tenderness with rebound uh, tenderness hypoactive bowel sounds, they might have a low-grade fever, leukocytosis, you might feel an enlarged palpable uh, gallbladder. So the Murphy's sign is usually pathognomonic, right? It's going to be that inspiratory arrest with the depalpation of the right upper quadrant. You can also have a positive BOAS sign. So you're going to have referred pain to the right shoulder and subscapular area due to phrenic nerve irritation. We want to make sure that we don't confuse this with Kerr sign, right? Because Kerr sign is pain that refer pain to the left subscapular area because you have phrenic irritation, usually associated with splenic er rupture, right? So not Kerr sign, but Boas sign referred pain to the right shoulder or subscapular area due to phrenic nerve irritation. So diagnosis, we want to make sure that we do an upper right upper quadrant ultrasound. This is usually going to be the test of choice. We're going to see a thickened gallbladder that's going to be greater than three millimeters a distended gallbladder, pericholecystic fluid, and presence of stones usually with these patients. We can also do a CT scan also. 
especially if we think we want to look for any complications of acute cholecystitis, like if it's perforated, pancreatitis, right? Because usually cholecystitis or gallstones in general are a common cause of pancreatitis. We can also do a HIDIS scan. This is usually used whenever the ultrasound is not giving us, um, it's inconclusive, right? Um, and then some of the complications, right? Gangrenous cholecystitis, if it's not treated, perforation of the gallbladder. Treatment for these patients, we wanna make sure that we admit him. We give him IV fluids, nothing by mouth. Give him IV antibiotics covering for that E. coli, right? So ceftriaxin plus metronidazole. Metronidazole is great at covering those anaerobes. Um, we also want to make sure we give the patient analgesics, correct her, their electrolyte abnormalities because they're going to be vomiting a lot. And then, of course, the definitive treatment is going to be a cholecystectomy. All right, guys, and then we have chronic cholecystitis. This is characterized by repeated attacks of biliary colic. Usually what happens is that the gallbladder is just so damaged because it's having these repeated attacks of acute inflammation. And it's usually due to those gallstones that the gallbladder becomes like really thick walled, scarred, and small. Usually it's called like a strawberry gallbladder because like the inside, like the inferior part of the gallbladder just looks like, like a strawberry because you have all this cholesterol submucosal aggregation. Um, another thing is that chronic cholecystitis can develop into porcelain gallbladder, which is like pre-malignant condition, right? Um, and then we have a calculus cholecystitis. This is going to be acute cholecystitis without stones that obstruct the cystic duct. So once again, a calculus, just like it sounds, right? It's going to be acute cholecystitis without stones obstructing the cystic duct. So there's just no, nothing there that is obstructing the stones, but they still have inflammation. So usually the cause, we don't know what the cause is, but usually this is very commonly seen in your patients that have underlying illnesses that are just like very ill. Um, it's also very commonly associated with dehydration, ischemia, burns, any type of trauma and post-op. So if the patient just has surgery, very commonly associated with that. And it usually occurs because there's gallbladder sludge. So not stones, but gallbladder sludge. The patient's going to present like they have cholecystitis, right? And usually a cholecystectomy is going to be the treatment for these patients. And if they're too ill, because sometimes most of these patients are ill, like you can't take them to surgery, then you can do percutaneous drainage of the gallbladder and cholecystectomy. So next one's going to be cholelithiasis. This usually refers to gallstones in the gallbladder. There's three types of stones. You have your cholesterol stones, which are going to be your yellow to green, right? This is usually the more common ones you're going to see. It's usually associated with obesity, diabetics, hyperlipidemia, very commonly found in your patients that are Native American also. Um, you also have your pigment stones that are black or brown stones. So these are usually black stones that are usually associated with either hemolysis, right? So like the blood that's just like hemolysizing. Um, so sickle cell thalassemia, hereditary spherocytosis, or alcoholic cirrhosis. And then you have your brown stones. These are usually in bile ducts that are associated with biliary tract infections. And also, brownstones are very commonly associated with parasitic and bacterial infections also, which is really gross, right? And then you have mixed stones. These are very commonly associated with these. Mixed stones is just both cholesterol stones, right? And then also um, cholesterol stones and pigment stones. So cholelithiasis, like we said, patient just has gallstones in their gallbladder. That's it. They may be symptomatic. Sometimes they don't even know they have them. So... Whenever we think about cholelithiasis, we think about our five Fs, right? Female, fat, 40, fertile, and fair. I know it's a really bad mnemonic, but that's how we think about it. That's how it's taught in PA school and most textbooks. So fat, 40, female, fertile. Usually most of these patients are going to be premenopausal, right? Uh, they think that estrogen, since we have so much estrogen in women, they're premenopausal, that increases cholesterol levels and it decreases the gallbladder contractions. Patient's going to be fair, right? Very commonly found in your Caucasians. So how is this patient going to present? Sometimes they won't be having symptoms, so they'll be asymptomatic. They, If they do have symptoms, they're going to have biliary colic, right? Why? Because there's temporary obstruction of the cystic duct by a gallstone, so any type of movement causes the, uh, the gallstone from the gallbladder just to, like, come down the cystic duct, and then, like, 
and that's what's causing pain. And then also pain can occur whenever the gallbladder contracts against this obstruction. So this patient's gonna have right upper quadrant pain or epigastric pain that lasts for 30 minutes to like hours. The pain usually is gonna get worse after eating, especially if they eat any type of fatty foods or eat large meals. And at night, it can be associated with nausea. The patient can also present with a BOA sign, which is where they have referred pain to the right subscapular region. And some of the complications of these can be cholecystitis, right? Well, the stone, the gallbladder, the gallstone just comes out, gets stuck and gets stuck in that uh, cystic duct. Cholecystitis is going to be another cause, right? Cholecystitis, that's where that uh, gallstone gets stuck in the bile duct, right? Because when we think about anatomy, we have our gallbladder, we have the cystic duct, and then up here we have the liver, right? And we have the hepatic duct, they both come together and they form the common bile duct, right? And you keep going down and then you have the pancreas here. Sometimes you might have a gallstone that can lodge in the common bile duct. And when it lodges in that common bile duct before it gets to the pancreas, right? It's a cystic duct and the hepatic duct will come together. They drain into the common bile duct. And that's when you can get something like cholecystitis. You can also get gallstone ileus as a complication and then malignancy. Another cause can be also uh, pancreatitis is actually a common cause of pancreatitis, right? For gallstones. Another cause can be cholangitis. That's where you have that, um, that, that stone stuck in the common bile duct, right? It's stuck there. Stasis, bacteria gets there. And then you start having those symptoms of like, jaundice right you'll have that right upper quadrant pain fever and if it's like really severe ultramental status hypotension and so those are some of the complications also um diagnosis usually with these patients ultrasound is going to be the best one for these patients and treatment usually we don't do anything right um especially if the patient's asymptomatic and we just find them incidentally um we can also do something like urso deoxycholic acid this is going to help dissolve the gallstones and then you can also do elective cholecystectomy if the patient is just having like recurrent bouts of this like biliary, biliary colic. All right, guys. So let's go into our next one, which is going to be cirrhosis. So this one's going to be a really large topic. It's really important that we know it. So cirrhosis is going to be chronic liver disease that is characterized by fibrosis, disruption of the liver architecture, and widespread nodules in the liver. What happens is that the fibrous tissue right, replaces damaged or dead hepatocytes, and these nodules cause increased portal pressure. And usually this is very irreversible. So you have damage to the liver, right? Those hepatocytes, they start just like dying off and the liver's not working like it used to, and it's not reversible with these patients. So, <clears throat> Usually what happens is that there's distortion of the liver anatomy, right? You have decreased blood flow through the liver that causes portal hypertension. This causes widespread manifestations, which causes ascites, right? Peripheral edema, splenomegaly, so that enlarged spleen. You have these varicosity of veins in circulation, which, which can cause like your hemorrhoids. It can cause gastric or esophageal varices. And then the liver just stops working, right? You have hepatocellular failure. And the liver is important for making a lot of things. The liver cleans our entire body. So if you're having failure of the liver, you're going to have impairment of biochemical functions like decreased albumin synthesis, right? And usually albumin helps, albumin helps us not clotting in, yeah, not creating clots. So if you have decreased albumin, you're prone to developing DVTs, prone to clotting, you have decreased clotting factor synthesis, right? So these patients are very prone to bleeding because they're not creating those clotting synthesis that our liver is responsible for creating. Usually, how do we assess their, whether they're, well, how do we assess their hepatic functional reserve? Um, we usually do the child Pew score. This estimates the hepatic reserve in and liver failure, and it's usually used to measure the disease severity and it's a predictor of the morbidity and mortality of patients. And there's usually a lot of factors for this, so we'll go into it real quick. So there's points, right? And the child pew classification to assess severity of liver disease, we use these factors. We use ascites, 
the bilirubin level, encephalopathy, their INR ratio, right? Because like we said, the patient that starts, that develops cirrhosis, they have decreased platelets, um, albumin level also. And depending on how many points they get, then that's going to be depending on what class they're in. So class A is going to be five to six points. Um, this is usually the least severe liver disease. They have about an 85% of two-year survival. You have class B, which is seven to nine total points. This usually indicates moderate to severe liver disease. It's about 57% has a two-year survival. And then you have class C, which is 10 to 15 points total. It indicates severe liver disease. Um, these patients tend to have about 35% uh, of two-year survival. So let's go into each one. It's, it's, point, it's graded on a point of one, two, three. So if the patient has no ascites, they get one point. If the patient has mild to moderate ascites, they get two points. If the patient has severe ascites, they get three points. Bilirubin, right? Milligram, milligrams per deciliter. If they have less than 2.0, they get one. If they have 2.0 to 3.0, they get two. Greater than three, they get three points. Encephalopathy. If they have no encephalopathy, they get one point. If they have mild to moderate encephalopathy, they get two points. If they have severe encephalopathy, they get three points. INR ratio. If it's less than 1.7, they get one point. If it's 1.7 to 2.3, they get two points. If it's greater than 2.3, they get three points. Albumin. If it's greater than 3.5, they get one point. If it's 2.8 to 3.5, they get two points. And if is it is less than 2.8, get three points. All right, guys. So now we've gone through that. What are some of the causes of cirrhosis? So the most common cause is going to be your alcoholic liver disease, right? Um, alcoholic liver disease is going to be the most common cause. Um, there's other causes like chronic hepatitis B and C. This is going to be the second most common cause. Um, also, non-alcoholic non fatty liver disease, which the cases are just increasing. And this is actually a new, like fairly new diagnosis. Um, I did my rotation in the valley and we saw a lot of these patients. It was really, really sad. Uh, very commonly associated with your patients that are obese, diabetic, hypertriglyceridemia, right? because your liver is having to um, work so hard to get rid of all of those fatty acids, right? All those triglycerides, um, your HDL, LDL, all those. And if you have increased levels for a long time, then there's one at one point where your liver is just going to be saturated. And that's what happens with these patients. Uh, drugs like Tylenol, methotrexate, autoimmune hepatitis, primary and secondary biliary cirrhosis, Wilson's disease, hemochromatosis, or other causes. Um, other causes are going to be hepatic congestion, especially if they have right heart failure. That's usually secondary to right heart failure or constrictive pericarditis. Alpha-1 anti antitrypsin deficiency is one that I got tested on that I didn't know. So um, after I got tested on that one, I'm like, oh, okay, now I know. So alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Also, uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, so NASH, right? How is this patient going to present? Usually, if it's early in the disease, the patient has no symptoms, right, or no findings. And usually, when they do start having symptoms, they'll have fatigue, weight loss, weakness, muscle weakness, anorexia. Some of the classic signs are going to be uricides, varices, gynecomastia. Also, this tends to occur because the liver is just not able to metabolize estrogen. Uh, testicular atrophy also, right, testicular atrophy Palmar erythema, spider angiomas, especially like in the upper body, hemorrhoids, caput medusae, right? That's when you see like all those like uh, veins like in the abdominal area, the tummy and the belly. And then signs of acute liver failure, it's going to be something like coagulopathy, right? Jaundice, hypoglycemia, because the liver stores glycogen, right? And the liver isn't working, it's not able to stir, stir glycogen anymore, so you get hypoglycemia. Hepatic encephalopathy infections. You'll see those elevated LFTs. Um, and also complications that are associated with cirrhosis. So you'll see portal hypertension. Some of the complications of uh, portal hypertension, you'll see melina, hematemesis, right? Hematochoesia. And usually why? Because of the es esophagastric varices. And this is actually the most life threatening complication of portal hypertension. And with these patients, like with portal, portal hypertension, like how do we treat this? Usually it can be diagnosed clinically. Um, usually paracentesis is going to help us aid the diagnosis. And we want to make sure that we're treating the complications. So we're going to use something like TIPS 
or transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt that's going to help us lower the pressure, right? It's usually done by a radiologist. They, they place like a small wire mesh coil stent into the lower vein. And then the stent is expanded with a small inflatable balloon like angioplasty. And then the stent helps by bypassing the liver. In doing so, the shunt lowers the pressure in the portal vein. It reduces portal hypertension. So then it decreases all these complications of portal hypertension, like your varices, right? Uh, bleeding. Also, the use of tips will also help with ascites and hepatic hydrothorax. So that's the fluid between the lungs and the chest wall. These are usually common complications of portal hypertension. So usually these will improve or resolve with tips. So that's why it's really, tips is such a good procedure in general because it's going to make sure it lowers all these portal pressures. Um, in regards to varices, right, that's another complication of cirrhosis. This actually has a very high mortality rate, especially if it hemorrhages. So usually most of these patients with cirrhosis are screened for these and they're started on prophylactic therape therapeutics. So uh, beta blockers like your propranolol can be used for these patients. And then also another thing is that for these patients, um, initial treatment involves for a patient with esophageal varices, right? They present um, and it's hemorrhaging. We want to make sure that we stabilize this patient either with IV fluids to make sure that we're maintaining that blood pressure. We can stabilize the patient with two large bore IVs. We may or may not give them blood transfusion. If coagulopathy is present, then we can give them fresh frozen plasma and then vitamin K if the PT is high. We can also give IV antibiotics prophylactically and then IV octreotide also is initiated and it's usually continued for three to five days for these patients. So once this patient has been stabilized, right, that's coming in for an esophageal um, varus hemorrhage, then we can perform an upper GI endoscopy to diagnose and treat the hemorrhage with varicel ligation or sclerotherapy. So once again, this is something that's very highly tested. So your varices, your variceal hemorrhages, the first thing that we want to do is you want to stabilize the patient, right? You want to give them fluids. You want to make sure that we're maintaining that blood pressure. And then if they have any type of coagulopathy, give them fresh fluid and plasma, vitamin K if their PT is high, and then uh, make sure that we get blood transfusions also in case the patient needs it. Give IV antibiotic prophylaxis also like fluoroquinolones, right, or ceftrioxone to make sure that we prevent any type of infectious complication. And then once the patient has been stabilized, then that's when we can go in there and do an upper diet endoscopy for the diagnosis, and then treat the hemorrhage with our varicel ligation or sclerotherapy. Uh, like we discussed, this patient has to be started on a non-selective beta blocker like a propanolol, timolol, nadolol, as long therapy to make long-term ther therapy to prevent re-bleeding, right, with these patients. So once again, right, this is something that's very highly tested, so just make sure that you know this. Another complication is going to be ascites, right? This is usually when there's accumulation of fluid in the peritoneal cavity because of the portal hypertension and hypoalbuminemia, which reduces oncotic pressure. This is actually the most common complication of cirrhosis is going to be your ascites. So usually with these patients, uh, we're going to diagnose it with an abdominal ultrasound, right? Um, and then a diagnostic paracentesis is usually determined to to see whether the ascites is due to portal hypertension or some other process that is causing the ascites. So if we have a patient that presents with new onset ascites, they have worsening ascites, we want to suspect things like possibly like uh, SBP, right? And then we want to make sure that once we do the paracentesis, we want to do the blood count. We want to Examine the cell count, sorry, the ascites, albumin, the gram stain, and the culture to rule out any type of infection. We want to make sure that we measure the serum ascites albumin gradient with these patients. And treatment for ascites is going to be bed rest, right, low sodium diet and diuretics like furosemide or, and spironolactone. We can do therapeutic paracentesis, especially if there's a tense ascites, if the patient has shortness of breath, right? Um... And then another complication is going to be hepatic encephalopathy, right? This is where toxic metabolites like ammonia, especially ammonia, 
they are usually detoxified, right? And they're removed by our liver, but since our liver is not working anymore, it's going to start accumulating and it can go and reach the brain. And this tends to occur in patients that have in about 50% of patients with cirrhosis. So with these patients, how are they going to present? They're going to have altered mental status, confusion, poor concentration. They can also present with stupor or coma. You're going to have the asterisks, right? The, the hand flapping, tremor. Um, usually we assess it by telling the patient to extend their arms, right? And dorsiflex their hands and you're going to see that asterisk. They're going to have rigidity, hyperreflexia. They can also have feeder hepaticus, which is like this musty odor of breath. And treatment with these patients is usually going to be lactulose. This is going to help prevent absorption of ammonia. Uh, neomycin is usually second line. And then another, so I'm listing all the complications. I know this is just extra information. You may or may not see this on your exam. So feel free to skip through this. The next one's going to be your hepatorenal syndrome. This indicates end-stage liver disease, especially when a patient presents with these. It's defined as progressive renal failure secondary to renal hyperperfusion that causes vasoconstriction of the renal vessels. It's usually precipitated by an infection or diuretics. And this is usually functional renal failure where the kidneys are normal with respect to their morphology and no specific causes of renal dysfunction are apparent. And usually with hepatorenal syndrome, well, it will not respond to volume expansion. So how is this patient going to present? They're going to have azotemia, right? Oliguria, which is very little urine, hyponatremia, hypotension. They're going to have a low urine sodium, less than 10 usually. Um, treatment for this is usually liver transplant because this is fatal if the patient does not have a liver transplant. And then we have spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. This is defined as infected acidic fluid. With these patients, this is, has a very high mortality rate and recurrence rate. And the most common bacteria that's usually isolated is going to be E. coli. This patient is going to present with abdominal pain, fever, vomiting, rebound tenderness, and sepsis. And we diagnose this by doing a paracentesis and examining the acidic fluid for white blood cells, which is usually going to be greater than 500, especially your PMNs, which are going to be greater than 250. We're going to do a gram stain with culture. And this patient, usually we want to make sure that we also culture the ascites. And they're going to have a serum ascites albumin greater, grading, gradient greater than 1.1 grams per deciliter. And this usually indicates portal hypertension causing the spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Treatment for this is usually broad spectrum antibiotics, right? And then once we've diagnosed or have gotten the organism that's causing it, then we're going to use a specific antibiotics to treat that organism. Usually these patients get better between 24 to 48 hours. And it's important that we repeat paracentesis in two to three days to document a decrease in acidic fluid PMN. So hopefully they're less than 250 once we've treated the patient. Another complication of cirrhosis is going to be hyperestrogenism. This usually occurs because there's decreased hepatic catabolism of the estrogens, right? So that's why these patients start presenting with uh, gynecomastia, right? A testicular atrophy, so like these like female characteristics with gynecomastia. They can also present with palmar erythema, spider angiomas. Um, another complication of cirrhosis is going to be coagulopathy, right? Because like we discussed, they have decreased synthesis of clotting factors, so they're going to have an elevated PT, and then PTT can also be prolonged, especially in severe disease. And usually these patients, we treat them with fresh frozen plasma. We do not treat them with vitamin K. Why don't we treat them with vitamin K? Because it's not going to be effective because it's used, usually vitamin K is used by the liver. If the liver is not working, then vitamin K is not going to be effective. So in these patients, we treat them with fresh frozen plasma for their coagulopathy. And then another complication is also hepatocellular carcinoma. So <clears throat> these patients can also present with pruritus. So they're going to say that they're very, very itchy. If you want to treat the pruritus, we can treat it with cholestyramine. This usually is going to help bind the so bile salts, and it's going to act like um, antipruritic for these patients. So now that we've gone through all the complications, I know cirrhosis is very, very complicated. How do we diagnose in general, cirrhosis. So an ultrasound is going to help us 
determine the size of the liver and a value for hepatocellular carcinoma. So if it asks you what's the next step or what's your initial, it's going to be for cirrhosis and ultrasound. Now, what's going to be the gold standard? It's going to be a liver biopsy, okay, for diagnostics. Treatment, we want to make sure that we're treating the underlying cause, whatever is causing it. If it's due to, for example, some type of medication that the patient's taking, then we want to make sure that we take the patient off that medication. We want to make sure that we aim at treatment at managing the complications like we discussed, right? Especially variceal bleeding, which is going to be very, very um, deadly. Ascites, that hepatic encephalopathy, right, with the laxulose. And the only cure for this patient is usually going to be a liver transplant, right? That's going to be the only cure for these patients. So just real quick, some pearls. Once a patient has complications of cirrhosis, they usually have decompensated disease and they have very high morbidity and mortality. So all the complications that we discussed, right, once these patients are presenting these, then it's usually like very end stage for these patients and they usually need a liver transplant. And like we discussed, for bleeding esophageal varices, usually with these patients, right, we want to make sure that we stabilize the patient we treat them with IV octreotide plus endoscopic treatment like sclerotherapy and varicel ligation. And usually the ascites that patients present with, we can manage this by salt restriction and diuretics. We want to make sure that in any patient that has cirrhosis and that they have ascites, we want to look for fevers, any change in mental status also um, to make sure that we're ruling out uh, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, because spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is very deadly if we do not catch it or treat it early. So it's really important that with these patients that we are looking for these red flags and we're doing our paracentesis. All right, guys, so next, let's go on to our next one, which is going to be colorectal cancer, right? Or just in general, also our uh, colonic polyps. So in general, colorectal cancer is the third most common cancer in the U.S. in both women and men. And usually all colorectal tumors arise from adenomas, right? Adenoma. So in a question, Sam, um, if it says, I had a question, I think it was on a practice pants, and it said that it did a colonoscopy and which one of these, like if you found on an exam, would you think that would be specific possibly like you want to think about colorectal cancer, like adenomas, right? So the majority of these are endoluminal adenocarcinomas that arise from the mucosa from these patients. And the patho is usually a progression of an adenomatous polyp that turns into malignancy, which is your adenocarcinoma. And it turns, it usually tends to occur within 10 to 20 years. So screening, this is something that they really like to test, so make sure that you know this, right? Colon cancer screening begins at age 50. If a family member has colon cancer, then we begin screening at age 40 or 10 years before the age and onset of a family member. So for example, if it's a patient that's presenting with, uh, they're coming in to you and they're 35, right? And they say, well, I want to get screening for colorectal cancer, but I don't know when to get screening but I have a brother that, or my father that died from colorectal cancer when he was 30, then you would do at that time, right, colorectal cancer screening for him right now. Um, if you have a patient that comes in, right, and they said that they have no history of colorectal cancer screening or no family history, then it would be at age 50. So what is the screening methods in general for colorectal cancer? So we have fecal cold blood testing. This has a very poor sensitivity and specificity. For these patients um, and usually there's another one which is also DRE this also has like it's not very specific also only about 10% of tumors are palpable by rectal examination and then just screening and surveillance recommendations right average so patient as average risk for colorectal cancer we screen these patients between the ages of 50 to 75 years old. It's going to be a colonoscopy every 10 years and a flexible sigmoidoscopy every five years with a fecal copula test every three years. So make sure that you know that this is very highly tested. Once again, average risk patients that have no family history or personal history of like polyps or colorectal cancer, then it's going to be 
50 to 75 years old, coronoscopy every 10 years, flexible sigmoidoscopy every five years with a fecal copula test every three years. And then what about your moderate risk patients? So these are going to be patients with single or multiple polyps or if they have a personal history of colorectal cancer. The, with these patients, we're going to do an initial colonoscopy and then we're going to repeat at three years. If it's normal, then it's going to be a colonoscopy every five years. What about if it's a patient that has moderate risk risk factors and they have a family history of colorectal cancer or adenomatous polyps in first degree relatives, then it's gonna be a colonoscopy at age 40 or 10 years younger than the youngest case in the family. Whichever age is the youngest is when they should start being screened. If normal, then you repeat in three to five years. What about our high risk patients? It's a patient that has a family with familial adenomatous polyposis. It's gonna be genetic testing at age 10. And then we want to consider colectomy if it's if they are positive for the genetic testing or polyposis is confirmed. If it's negative, then colonoscopy is going to be done every one to two years beginning at puberty. What about families with hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer? Then in these patients, we're going to do genetic testing at 21. If it's positive, it's going to be a colonoscopy every two years until they're 40, then every year thereafter. What about if it's a patient with high risk and they have ulcerative colitis? Then it's going to be colonoscopy eight years after the disease onset, then every year thereafter. So that's a mouthful, right? The most common one that's going to be tested is going to be either your average or your moderate. So make sure that you know. So your average risk factors and your moderate risk factors. So screening methods, we said the best one is going to be colonoscopy. That's the most sensitive and specific test, and it is the diagnostic study of choice for patients with a positive fecal cold blood test. So that's going to be the best one for screening method for colorectal cancer. There's also flexible sigmoidoscopy. This can also be used, but it doesn't reach the entire area. Um, and it can be used to reach the area where approximately 50 to 70 percent of polyps and cancers occur. And it can be diagnosed diagnostic in about two to three two-third cases of all colorectal cancer. So it's not as specific as colonoscopy, but something is better than nothing, right? You can also do a barium enema. This is going to evaluate the entire colon, and it's complementary to flexible sigmoidoscopy. Usually, if it is positive for colorectal cancer, you're going to see an apple core lesion. That's usually like pathognomonic for colorectal cancer on your barium enema. The disadvantage is that any abnormal finding needs to be evaluated evaluated by colonoscopy, right? So regardless, the patient will have a colonoscopy. Uh, you can also do carcino embryonic antigen, CEA. This is not useful at all for screening, um, but it is useful for establishing a baseline or monitoring like a cancer or recurrent surveillance. And the reason why it's not useful is that CEA in general is just increased in a lot of things, a lot of um, other cancers also. And one thing that you do need to know is that CEA does not have a prognostic significance, right? So make sure that you know that. Um, another thing you can do is uh, you can do the fecal or cold blood test also, but not as specific. But the best one, like we said, it's going to be a colonoscopy. So make sure that you know that. So what are some of the risk factors for colorectal cancer? So everyone over the age of 50 is at increased risk. That's why we start doing colonoscopies at that age. And colonoscopy, uh, colorectal cancer is just like a very preventable cancer if the patient is having follow-ups, if they are getting screened. So it's a very, very preventable cancer. All right, so risk peaks at age 65 for colorectal cancer. Um, another risk factor is going to be adenomatous polyps because these are very pre-malignant lesions, although not all of them develop into cancer though, but they are pre-malignant. So like I said, I had a, uh, practice question test, so just make sure that they do colonoscopy right and they saw some adenomas or adenomatous polyps. These are pre-malignant. So there's different types of polyps and the worst one and the one that has a higher malignancy potential is going to be your villus adenomas and how i memorize it is that villain sounds like villus villain right bad guy that's how i memorize it so villus adenomas are going to have the higher malignant potential than like other adenomas like your tubular adenomas also the larger the size and the greater the number of polyps the greater the risk of 
cancer for these patients. Also another risk factor, if they have a personal history of colorectal cancer, or like we discussed, any type of adenomatous polyps, if they have a history of irritable bowel disease, both either uh, ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, but in general, out of both of them, ulcerative colitis has a greater risk than Crohn's disease for a patient developing colorectal cancer. Also, if they have a family history of colorectal cancer, if they have multiple first degree relatives with colorectal cancer, especially if they are under the age of 60, uh, any of those family members were under the age of 60, they have a, that patient has an increased risk of colorectal cancer. Dietary factors also, how is your diet? High fat diet, low fiber are usually increased with colorectal cancer. If they eat a lot of red or processed meats or animal fat, smoking, alcohol, also very commonly found in African Americans. Also, if the patient has any type of major polyposis syndrome, so these were the ones that we discussed earlier for screening. We have familiar adenomatous polyposis. This is usually autosomal dominant disease where the patient, these patients have a mutation, a hereditary mutation in the APC tumor suppressor gene. And these patients have like hundreds of adenomatous polyps in the colon. And usually the colon is the one that's always involved. The duodenum can be involved also, but usually the colon. And the risk for colorectal cancer in these patients is about 100%. That's really sad. By the third or fourth decade of life and 100% um, usually for all cases in general. So usually these patients need prophylactic colectomy um, for your familiar adenomatous polyposis. There's also Gardner syndrome. This is usually, uh, this is autosomal dominant. These patients are going to have polyps plus osteomas or have dental abnormalities, benign soft tissue tumors, desmoid tumors, and sebaceous cysts. And usually the risk for these patients is 100% by age 40. So there's a bunch of other ones like Turcotte syndrome, putz jugger syndrome also, familial juvenile polyposis. And you also have Lynch syndrome. So just make sure that you know these also. The common one I've seen tested is familial adenomatous polyposis. So that's why I went into a little more detail in regards to that one. So how is the patient going to present that has colorectal cancer? So they're going to present with usually when they have symptoms, it's usually symptoms that are a manifestation of an advanced disease. And sometimes these patients may have cancer. They don't even know they have it until they start presenting with like all these symptoms of just when it's already metastasized. So if they do have symptoms, they're going to have melina, hematochoesia, right? So hematochoesia, that bright red blood in the stool. Melina is going to be that darker blood. Uh, they're going to present with abdominal pain, change in bowel habits, right? Constipation, diarrhea. Also, iron deficiency anemia. So whenever we do a CBC and in any older person and they have iron deficiency anemia, we want to think about a malignancy. And this is one of the ones that is usually commonly associated with iron deficiency anemia is going to be our colorectal cancer. So make sure that you know that. Also, with these patients, their signs and symptoms are going to present also on where the tumor is located, which we'll go into in a few moments right now. And the most common presenting symptom the patient's going to present with is going to be abdominal pain. Why? Because they might be presenting with a possible bowel obstruction. So remember how we were discussing earlier and differentiating between our small and large bowel obstructions? Usually our large bowel obstructions, we're thinking about a malignancy, right, for these patients. So that's why with these patients, we said um, colorectal cancer, right, is the most common cause of large bowel obstruction in adults, so they'll be presenting with these symptoms. Also, colonic perforation can occur, so usually these patients can present with peritonitis, and this is actually a very life-threatening complication. Another symptom is going to be weight loss, blood and stool. So, now in regards to where the tumor is located, we have a right-sided tumor and a left-sided tumor. So, if the tumor in, for colorectal cancer is located on the right-sided, then usually with these patients, we want to think about the symptoms of occult blood in the stool, right? Iron deficiency anemia and melina. Um, also, they're going to be presenting with anemia, weakness, right lower quadrant mass occasionally also versus our left-sided tumors. Since the left-sided tumor, when we think about just our anatomy, right? Since the left-sided colon has a small luminal diameter, that means that 
that area is more likely to be obstructed, right? So these patients are usually going to be presenting with signs of obstruction. They are going to have change in bowel habits. This is actually more common than in right-sided tumors. So they will have alternating constipation and diarrhea and narrowing of stools. So you'll see those pencil stools in these patients. And also they'll have hematoclesia, which is going to be more common in these patients. So make sure that you know left-sided versus right-sided. It's something that's very commonly tested. Also, another thing I wanted to discuss is that about 20 to 30 percent of the colorectal cancers are rectal cancers. And hematoclesis is going to be a very common symptom of a rectal cancer. And rectal cancers are going to present with tenesmus also, right? Like they feel like they have to go, but they can't go. It's like rectal heaving. And then they're going to be presenting with re a rectal mass. So this is going to be for your rectal cancers. So in general, what is going to be the treatment for colorectal cancer? Surgery is on, the only curative treatment, right, for colorectal cancer. We want to make sure that we go in there and resect the tumor-containing bowel and also resect any of the lymphatics that are around the regional. And CEA level, we usually obtain that before surgery for these patients because it's going to tell us how the patient is progressing with or how the cancer is. And also... Follow-up is really important with these patients. So say that they've gone, we've resected the, the colon. Follow-up is important. So how can we follow up with these patients? There's several ways we can follow up with them. We can do a stool guaiac test. We can do an annual CT and chest x-ray for up to two years. We can do a colonoscopy, colonoscopy at one year and then at every three years. And then we can do CEA levels um, periodically, like every three to six months usually. And the thing is, like, if we see a very high CEA level, then we want to think about maybe, like, the liver is also involved. Like, it's possibly, like, metastasized. So, once again, um, stage 1 to 3, it's going to be surgical resection. If it's stage 4, it's already metastasized. Usually, these patients get chemo with, like, 5-FU, and that's usually going to be the mainstay of treatment. So where are colonic polyps more commonly found? So these polyps are usually more commonly found in the rectosigmoid region. Um, for polyps in general, some patients may be symptomatic, some patients may be asymptomatic. If the patient has symptoms, they're going to be presenting with rectal bleeding. That's the most common symptom. And usually treatment for this is going to be removal of the polyp. All right, guys, so that's colorectal cancer. I know it's like a huge mouthful. Um, I just want to go into a little bit more detail, okay? So let's go into our next topic, which is going to be diarrhea and constipation. So diarrhea and constipation. So acute diarrhea. What we need to know about acute diarrhea is that most cases of a diarrhea are acute, benign, and self-limited. Usually acute diarrhea lasts between two to three weeks. It does not last longer than that. And usually infection is going to be the most common cause. And viruses are usually going to be the most common cause of acute diarrhea. So we want to think about a rotavirus or Norwalk virus, right? There's other causes of acute diarrhea, um, things like bacteria like Shigella, E. coli, Salmonella, Campylobacter, Clostridium perfrigens, or C. difficile. Um, but usually these patients present with like more severe, severe forms of the diarrhea. Usually the most common one are going to be viruses. But just for completion, right, other causes can be bacteria like I discussed other ones can be your parasites like Giardia lamnia, right? Into amoeba histolytica, which are your amoebas, and then Cryptosporidium, which is usually found in your immunocompromise. So another cause of diarrhea, acute diarrhea, can be medications. So it's really important that we ask our patients if they're taking any type of medications. Um, not only that, like have they taken any like recent antibiotics, right? Because we're thinking about maybe C. diff, like antibiotics like clindamycin that can cause C. difficile. In patients. Also, other causes of diarrhea can be malabsorption. Do they have any type of malabsorption disorder? Um, and in elderly patients, we want to think about possibly ischemic bowel. So we want to make sure that we have that in our differential diagnosis, especially if they have like a history of peripheral artery disease and they're complaining of bloody diarrhea and abdominal pain. Um, make sure that we think about ischemic bowel with these patients. So what it's going to be the workup for the diarrhea. So usually we really don't need to do a lot of workup for these patients um, since, like we said, the most common cause is usually going to be viral. Now, what are some of the indications so that we want to make sure that we do further studies? 
So if the patient has severe illness or fever, if they have profuse diarrhea, or if the diarrhea has been going on for more than 48 hours, if they have blood or stool in their diarrhea, then we're thinking about maybe something like irritable bowel disease, right? If they're immunodeficient, if they have severe abdominal pain, if they're children or elderly patients, okay? And then also just if they're very dehydrated, this is usually a vital sign that's going to be really good for us. We can do a CBC and CMP if we want to further like see what is the cause of this, if we're thinking about maybe like of a bacteria. We can do stool samples for uh, fecal leukocytes for these patients. We can do a stool sample for O and P if we're suspecting something like Giardia, right? Uh, we can do a bacterial culture, stool culture. This is usually not ordered routinely. Why? Because it's not very sensitive and it's expensive. So we only use this if we are really looking for like Shigella, Salmonella, and Campylobacter, we can also test it for C. diff, um, especially if the patient has taken like antibiotics recently, like we said, with these patients. And then we can also do a stool guayac, uh, colonoscopy or flexible sigmoidoscopy. This is usually done for like patients that have chronic diarrhea. So what's going to be the treatment in general for diarrhea? It's usually just fluid repletion, right? Uh, make sure that the patient is drinking a lot of fluids. Oral is preferred. You can also tell the patients to drink sport drinks, broths, Pedialyte, right? Ceralite, any of those um, supplements, drink supplements that have like your electrolytes. And if the patient just cannot to tolerate oral, then you can do something like IV. We want to make sure that we talk to them about the bread diet, right? Bread, rice, apples, and toast. And... Also, we want to make sure that we avoid um, uh, anti-motility agents, especially if it's some type of infectious cause, okay? Because that can actually worsen it. So acute diarrhea usually is self-limited, right? It's not usually, we usually don't have to do anything unless the patient is very dehydrated, they can't tolerate fluids, they have bloody diarrhea, they have a very high fever, and they're toxic appearing than these patients that we would admit these patients, right? But usually, we just want to make sure that we hydrate them, we, we monitor and replace any type of electrolytes um, for these patients. If we want to use antibiotics, because we are suspecting something like a bacterial cause, then we can use antibiotics. They've been shown to decrease the duration of the illness by 24 hours, regardless of whatever the cause is. And usually, we use Cipro for five days in these patients. Um, we can also use loperamide, right? If, the, if we don't think it's an infectious cause, this is usually an anti-diarrheal anti that's usually given for mild to moderate diarrhea. Like we said, it's not recommended in patients that have like a fever or bloody stool because you can make them worse. But in general, it's going to be conservative treatment, right? Oral hydration, Pedialyte, Brat, diet. So what is chronic diarrhea? So chronic diarrhea is going to be a diarrhea that's present for more than four weeks, right? We said acute was about two to three weeks. We said chronic is going to be more than four weeks. Now, some of the causes of chronic, it's going to be irritable bowel syndrome. That's usually going to be the most common cause. We have also irritable bowel disease, like your ulcerative colitis and your Crohn's, certain medications, infections like bacteria, like Shigella, Salmonella, Campylobacter, intra-invasive E. coli, E. colon cancer, like we discussed, right? Because these patients have changes in their bowel. Diverticulitis, malabsorption syndromes like pancreatic insufficiency, celiac, short bowel syndrome, ischemic bowel. Um, also post-surgical, if the patient had any type of gastrectomy or vagotomy. Endocrine causes like hyperthyroidism, Addison's, diabetes, gastronoma, vipoma, fecal impaction, like liquid stool passes that uh, around the impaction, right? That's why these patients can present with that diarrhea, laxative abuse, if the patient is immunocompromised. So now that we've gone through all that, I know, I'm sorry, it was a huge mouthful. I wanted to go and discuss the different types of diarrhea. So we have inflammatory, we have osmotic, and we have secretary. And I actually wanted to discuss each one. So going into each one of these, let's start with the inflammatory. Inflammatory usually has an underlying cause of chronic inflammatory disease that is not very well understood. These include Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. So usually this patient is going to be presenting with chronic diarrhea, cramping, and bloody stools, right? With these patients. 
And then we have osmotic. This usually occurs because of presence of unabsorbable or poorly absorbable solute that exerts an osmotic pressure effect across the intestinal mucosa they that causes excessive water output. So with these patients, some of the causes is going to be malabsorption, right? Like celiac disease, pancreatic insufficiency. Um, if they have also rapid transit of GI content is another cause. So laxatives is a patient taking any type of laxative like sodium phosphate, magnesium, any type of antacids that contain magnesium. Other causes of osmotic can be bacterial overgrowth like Whipple's disease, trop topical, tropical sprui. Now, what is secretary? Secretary diarrhea is usually characterized by large volumes of watery diarrhea. Usually little pain is associated and diarrhea continues even in the absence of food intake. So chronic secretary diarrhea is usually seen with celiac um, vipoma, which is a type of like islet cell tumor that secretes like these vasoactive intestinal peptides that just makes you go to the restroom like crazy. Carcino tumor, why this usually secretes serotonin, so it increases everything. Hyperthyroidism, stimulant laxatives like um, senna and vesicodal are usually causes of secretary diarrhea. Another type of diarrhea is going to be altered motility. So anything that enhances your motility results in rapid gut transit and decreased contact time between the luminal contents and the absorptive epithelial cells. This is usually seen in carcinoid syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome, post-gastrectomy and post-vigotomy, hyperthyroidism. Also, if the patient has any type of slow motility, they can have diarrhea. So things like scleroderma, scleroderma, right? Um, also, another cause can be dysmotility-induced diarrhea. This is usually a diagnosis of exclusion, though. So the next category from that, I know it's a lot, right? I'm sorry, lactose intolerance. This is where the patient just cannot digest significant amounts of lactose. Usually this patient's going to present with nausea, cramps, bloating, gas, and diarrhea that begins 30 minutes to 20 out to two hours after the patient has eaten or drank something that has lactose. About 75% of all Americans um, have this, and about 90% of Asian Americans are usually lactose intolerant. And we diagnose this with the lactose tolerance test. And then last one's going to be the factitious one. This one's usually going to be self-induced by addition of water or urine to stool or self-medicating with laxatives. It's very commonly found in women with psychiatric disorders. So I'm sorry, I know that was a mouthful. It's something that they really like to test. So just make sure that you know these, right? We had the inflammatory. We're thinking about our inflammatory disorders like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, right? We had a asthmatic. This is usually something with malabsorption like celiac, right? Whipples. We have secretary. This is usually something with vipoma carcinoid tumors, hyperthyroidism, ultra motility, right? Hyperthyroidism, once again, irritable bowel syndrome, if they have post-gastrectomy and post-vagotomy. Lactose intolerance is another one. And then factitious, which is usually self-induced, right? The patient's just um, self-medicating with laxatives. All right, guys, so I know that was a mouthful. So now that we're done with that, I actually wanted to go into our invasive our invasive, and then our infectious diarrheas. It's something that's very commonly tested and they really like to ask about. So why don't we get into it, okay? So let's go into our infections. So like we discussed, there's different types. There's viruses, uh, bacteria, parasites. So why don't we start with our pearls just in general? So... The thing about infectious diarrhea is that usually the most common electrolyte acid-base abnormality seen with severe diarrhea is usually going to be what? Metabolic acidosis and hypokalemia. This is something that's very commonly tested. So remember we said vomiting is going to be metabolic alkalosis. Well, in diarrhea, metabolic acidosis is going to be the most common type of electrolyte abnormality you're going to see and also hypokalemia. So viral causes of infectious diarrhea or gastroenteritis. How are these patients going to present? So they're going to present with fever, nausea, watery diarrhea, right? Duration is usually of three to seven days. And the most common ones are going to be rotavirus and norovirus. And these are both transmitted fecal oral. So nor norovirus or norwalk virus, we usually think about the cruise ships, right? This is usually going to be the, the, the buzzword for these patients um, for norovirus. It's very commonly found um, in both adults and children, and 
nausea and vomiting is going to be the most common symptom in children versus diarrhea is going to be the most common symptom in adults. These patients are usually going to present with fever, myalgias, abdominal cramps, and it's associated with shellfish and other contaminated foods. This is usually a clinical diagnosis, and usually the treatment is supportive care. It tends to last between 12 to 60 hours. So once again, norovirus, norwalk virus, we're thinking about cruise ships, right? Fecal oral. The next one's going to be rotavirus. This is very commonly found in your children. So when we're thinking about uh, rotavirus, I think about pediatric daycare. These patients have like a yellow-green diarrhea. And usually they're going to present with acute onset of vomiting, water diarrhea that lasts just 48 days. They may or may not present with a fever. If it is, it's a low-grade fever. And it's very common in your pediatric uh, population. Treatment's usually supportive. And then we have our next one, which is going to be our bacterial causes. So bacterial is usually a lot more severe than viral. They're going to present with severe intestinal inflammation, abdominal pain and cramping, and fever. They can also present with peritoneal signs, and they're going to have a watery diarrhea that's usually fall within hours or days by bloody diarrhea. So viral, right, watery, if it starts getting bloody, we're thinking about our bacterial causes. So staphylococcus. So staphylococcus, some of the buzzwords for this one's going to be your picnic, right, egg and potato salad. This one's transmitted via food, and it produces an enterotoxin. The patient's going to present with an acute onset of intense nausea and vomiting for up to 24 hours, recovery in 24 to 48 hours. Usually these patients have no fever, and it's usually associated with foods that have, that include clam, ham, 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 poultry, potato salad, any food that has mayonnaise and bakery products. Usually it's a clinical diagnosis and treatment's usually supportive. We can test the stool also and food for the toxin. Next one's going to be clostridium perfringens. So buzzwords for this one's going to be poorly canned home foods. This one's transmitted via the food. The patient's going to present with an abrupt onset of diarrhea, abdominal cramping, nausea, and vomiting. They usually recover without treatment, uh, usually within 24 to 48 hours, and these patients have no fever. Clostridia really likes to grow in rewarmed meat and poultry dishes that produces an enterotoxin. For these patients, we can test the stool for the enterotoxin or culture it for diagnosis, and treatment is usually supported. We don't need antibiotics. The next one's going to be Shigella. Shigella. So incubation period for this one's going to be between 24 to 48 hours. This one's transmitted fecal oral. This patient's going to be presenting with diarrhea, and usually, in comparison to the other two ones that we discussed, right, this one's going to have blood and pus in the stools. The patient's going to be complaining of cramping tenesmus, right, that rectal heaving, and lethargy, fever, and this one is associated with food or water that's contaminated with human feces, and it's transmitted from person to person. We diagnose with fecal leukocytes, routine stool culture, and treatment tends to depend on the sensitivity testing, but usually if we do give treatment, we usually give fluoroquinolones, but usually if it's mild, it goes away by itself. Next one's going to be salmonella. So when we think about salmonella, the buzzwords for this one's going to be poultry or pork. It's transmitted through food, right? Like we discussed, um, usually by domestic fowls and their eggs. Uh, and fecal oral is going to be transmitted. That's how it's going to be transmitted. This patient is going to present with a gradual or abrupt onset of diarrhea and low-grade fever. And like we just discussed, right, eggs, poultry, Unpasteurized um, milk, cheese, juices, raw fruits, and vegetables are what it's associated with salmonella. This is usually diagnosed by fecal leukocytes, and we usually do a routine stool culture for these patients. Treatment, we don't want to give antibiotics unless it's disseminated, right? If it's disseminated, then in these patients, we want to give them a fluoroquinolone. Next one's going to be our Vibrio cholera. The buzzword for this one's going to be your rice water stools. I've also seen it described like flex you see flex in the stools. Um, this is usually commonly associated with shellfish, Vibrio cholera. This is like the really famous one, right? In the 18, was it in the late 1800s, that was diagnosed that was killing a lot of people. And the thing about Vibrio cholera is that it, what it does is that the patient just has acute, so much diarrhea that they're just so overly dehydrated. And that's what they die, for, die from. They're just very hypovolemic. 
So this is new, not very common in the U.S. Um, because most of our water is clean, right? But in, patient, in areas where the water is not very clean, this is very commonly um, found there. So usually it's going to be a patient that just traveled somewhere overseas. This patient is going to be presenting with abrupt onset of liquid diarrhea, an endemic area, those rice water stools like we discussed. And we usually diagnose this with stool culture on a special medium. These patients, we want to make sure, like, we just, like I discussed earlier, we are treating that dehydration. So we're treating them with IV or oral replacement of fluids and electrolytes. And then we can also give them antibiotics like tetracyclines and azithromycin. It's usually going to shorten the excretion of the bibrial cholera. But in general, these patients, we want to make sure that the first thing that we want to do is rehydrate these patients because they are usually very hypovolemic. So they're very volume down. Okay, so the next one's going to be our enterotoxic E. coli, also known as your traveler's diarrhea. So the buzzword for this one's going to be traveling. Um, it's going to be transmitting contaminated food and water. The patient's going to be presenting with watery diarrhea and abdominal cramps that last about three to seven days, but no fever. Usually with these patients, um, we can give them fluoroquinolone. So it's usually going to shorten the disease, but usually it tends to go away by itself. Now the next one, which is going to be the bad one, I usually I used to tend to confuse both of these. So enterotoxic E. coli is a benign one versus your E. coli 0157 or your enterohemorrhagic E. coli, um, including shigatoxin producing E. coli strains. This is going to be the big bad one. This one's like the bad one. This one's really bad. So the buzzword for this one, it's commonly associated with hemolytic uremic syndrome and thrombocytopenia. So make sure that you know that. This one's transmitted via food. It's associated with undercooked beef. So think about those hamburgers that were not cooked fully. And unpasteurized milk and juice, raw fruits and veggies. And with these patients, you're going to present with diarrhea. It's usually going to be very bloody. They're going to have abdominal pain, fever. And in adults, it tends to go sometimes, it's usually self-limited in 5 to 10 days. But in children, it's associated with like your really bad symptoms like hemolytic uremic syndrome. It can also cause TTP, so thrombocytic, uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura. And we diagnose the fecal leukocytes. The thing about this is that if we give these patients antibiotics, it can actually increase the risk of hemolytic uremic syndrome. So we want to be sure that we're are care careful. If a patient has hemolytic uremic syndrome and it's due to uh, this enterohemorrhagic E. coli, then we can give these patients plasma exchange. It can help them. So what happens with enterohemorrhagic E. coli is that it releases this shiga-like toxins that attach and damage the mucosal lining of the intestines that causes this like bloody diarrhea, right? And that's why it causes like your hemolytic uremic syndrome, which is a hemolytic anemia, right? It's that triad of hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, and renal failure. It's very commonly found in your young children, and it's the most common cause of acute renal failure in children. The other one that we discussed, right, it can cause thrombo thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. This is usually by that pentad. It's um, usually thrombocytopenia, renal failure, fever, and neurological manifestations. Um, the mnemonic I have, and I apologize, but this is just a mnemonic I learned was fat RN, right? So fever, anemia, thrombocytopenia, uh, renal um, failure, and then N is going to be for neurological symptoms. And this is very, very severe form. So this is what enterohemorrhagic um, E. coli can cause. So our next one is going to be Campylobacter. So this one's usually transmitted via food and animals. You want to think about puppies and our kittens. Um, these patients are going to present with fever, diarrhea that can be bloody. They're going to have cramps usually self-limited in about two to 10 days, and it's associated with raw or undercooked poultry, unpasteurized milk, and water. Um, treatment is usually with azithromycin or fluoroquinolones for severe disease. The thing about Campylobacter that we want to know is that it's usually associated with Guillain-Barre syndrome. So that's something that's very highly tested. Make sure you know that. So next one's going to be C. difficile. The words, buzzwords for this one's going to be any patient that had a history of antibiotic use especially like your bad antibiotics, right? You're thinking about clindamycin or, or beta-lactams. With these patients, it tends to occur about 7 to 10 days after antibiotics and occurs after a single dose or several weeks after completion of antibiotics. These patients, um, like we said, like I said, 
They're going to be on the clindamycin and beta-lactam medications. Also, fluoroquinolones can cause this. And these patients are going to be presenting with an abrupt onset of diarrhea that can be bloody. They may or not present, may or may not present with fever. And the thing about C. diff is that it can cause toxic megacolon, which is a really bad complication of this. I'm not sure if you've ever seen toxic megacolon on an x-ray, but it literally looks like a really enlarged balloon. It's scary. So with these patients, we treat with oral flagell for mild to moderate cases and then oral vancomycin for more severe disease. So once again, how do we treat these? It's going to be oral vanco, right? When we think about MRSA and the, et cetera, we think about IV vanco. No, in this case, C. difficile is going to be oral vancomycin, okay, or oral metronidazole. All right, guys, so it's going to be bacterial. We finished bacterial causes of gastroenteritis or your diarrhea. Viral, we finished. Now let's go into a parasitic. I love parasites. All right, parasitic causes. Um, the common ones you're going to be tested on is going to be Giardia lamnia and Cryptosporidium, which I'm going to discuss. And usually what these cause is just some mild abdominal discomfort. So they're not as crazy looking like our bacterial ones that we discussed. Usually um, when we think about like giardiasis, right, Giardia lamnia, the buzzwords for this one's going to be drinking out of like stream water, right? So they went or they drink from like a river, water from a river, or they were just like out and about hiking and they drank water from outside. So it's usually going to be a, a river, a stream, um, mountain water. The key about this one is going to be that foul smelling diarrhea. They're going to have like this abdominal bloating. And usually these patients don't have fever. And another way I've also seen described is just going to see like this like very fatty diarrhea. It's just very fatty and it floats up. It's really gross and it's very, very smelly also. Um, we're going to diagnose these patients with a stool for ova and parasites and treatment's usually going to be with flagell for these patients. The next one's going to be entamoeba histolytica. So entamoeba histolytica is going to be the other one. Um, entamoeba histolytica with these patients, usually with these patients... Uh, how are they going to present? Symptoms can usually be mild and they usually have loose feces, stomach pain, and stomach cramping. We diagnose this with a stool analysis and treatment is usually going to be flagell. Uh, the thing is that this can develop into amoebic dysentery. This is a very severe form of amoebiasis and usually these patients have stomach pain, blood, bloody stools, and fever. And then the thing about intermediate which is crazy, is that it can actually go to your liver and form an abscess which is like really gross. And then in some other cases, it can also travel to like other parts of your body, like the lungs or brain, but it's not very common. Okay, guys, so other infectious diarrhea, right? Um, we want to think about elderly and immunocompromised are very prone to getting like these infectious causes. So especially like in your patients with HIV, cryptosporidium is a big one. So if we have a patient that has HIV and they have like this diarrhea, we're thinking about cryptosporidium. Other one's going to be Mycobacterium avium intracellular um, and Cyclospora or even CMV. And just in general, like the most common cause of like infective diarrhea in, in chronic diarrhea in patients that have AIDS, it's going to be Cryptosporidium. So just make sure that you know that. So we finished finally all of that, thank goodness, of diarrhea. So let's go into constipation. So constipation. Constipation is defined as infrequent bowel movements less than two per week. Um, I've heard some doctors say less than three per week, but according to this textbook, less than two per week. The patient's going to be straining to form stools. They're going to have these hard stools. They're going to feel like this feeling of incomplete evacuation. And we have just primary constipation and secondary constipation. So primary constipation is usually constipation that has no cause, right? We cannot find a cause. And usually this is the most common constipation we're going to encounter in our family practice. The other type is going to be secondary constipation. This one is usually caused by systemic disorders like medications or any type of obstructing colonic lesion. And just in general, the most common cause of like constipation is usually decreased fiber intake or they're just not drinking water or they have very poor bowel habits like they're holding whenever they have to go to the restroom number two. Other causes can be systemic diseases, like if it's endocrine, we don't want to think about hypothyroidism, hyperparathyroidism, right? If you're hypercalcemia, Crohn's, stones, and psychiatric overtones. 
Um, diabetics also metabolic causes of constipation can be hypokalemia, hypercalcemia, uremia, and porphyria. There's also neuro causes like if they have sacral nerve damage right from a pelvic surgery or a tumor, paraplegia, certain medications like opioids, diuretics, calcium channel blockers, anticholinergics, right? Um, and then structural abnormalities like do they have rectal prolapse? Uh, do they have a colonic mass that's obstructing it, like adenocarcinoma, right? Colorectal cancer, like we discussed earlier. Do they have any type of colonic stricture? Hirschsprung's disease, very commonly found in your children. Um, also, do they have irritable bowel syndrome? So there's different causes of constipation. And it's really important that we keep all these differential diagnoses in our mind. So how are we going to examine these patients? We're usually going to be, um, we can do a DRE. We want to make sure that there's not any type of anatomical abnormalities. There's not a tumor there. We want to make sure that we assess the pelvic floor motion during simulated defecation. And then other tests, if you want to do further tests, these are the individuals that we're going to do further tests on. If the patient's older than 50, if the patient has severe constipation, if the patient has any signs of an organic disorder, red flags that are associated with constipation is something like hematopoiesia, weight loss, a positive fecal a, a cold blood test, rectal bleeding or prolapse, obstructive symptoms, iron deficiency anemia, right? Previous surgery before for constipation, um, family history of colon cancer or irritable bowel disease. We want to make sure we have to do a CBC, CMP, um, a colonoscopy or flexible, flexible sigmoidoscopy if we see any of these red flags or the patient presents with any of these red flags. And what are some of the complications of just constipation in general? So fecal impaction, anal fissures, rectal prolapse, or external or internal hemorrhoids, right? Because that patient is having to like mm, push or strain whenever they go to the restroom. So treatment for this is usually diet. So increase the water intake, increase the fiber in your diet, change your diet. Behavioral modifications also stop, especially for children, right? Stop. If you have to go number two, go. Don't refrain yourself from going. Um, make sure that also if you start medications with these patients, we can do laxatives. Usually bulk laxatives are usually preferred over osmotic laxatives in patients that don't respond to like diet or lifestyle changes. Enemas can also be relief, can be used for like temporary relief in these patients. And then if obstruction is present, we want to make sure that we get urgent surgery consult if we've like, um, for example, if we can't take it out ourselves. So that is going to be constipation. Finally, we're done with diarrhea and constipation. So let's go into our next one, which is going to be esophagitis. So esophagitis. So esophagitis, the most common cause is going to be GERS or gastric esophageal reflux disease. And then after that, the second most common cause are going to be your infections like candidiasis, right? The, the, the fungal infection, CMV or herpes simplex virus. But these are usually commonly found in immunocompromised patients. Other causes are going to be radiation therapy, medication, or corrosive infections. Also, eosinophilic like allergies and atopic diseases can be associated with esophagitis. And it's usually categorized as either an infectious cause or a non-infectious cause. So let's go into each one. So an infectious cause, like we discussed, is very commonly found in immunocompromised patients patients that have AIDS, patients that have any type of organ transplant, patients that have lymphomas or taking immunosuppressives. Um, I know I had a patient that had was taking like steroids and he presented with like candidiasis, oral candidiasis, and I, it was just awesome to look into, not for the patient, but it was interesting just to see that in the patient. Um, another thing with these patients is that it can also be found in patients that are have uncontrolled diabetic mellitus, and usually the most common pathogens are going to be Candida albicans, right? Herpes simplex and CMV. How are these patients going to present? So they're going to have odynophagia, they're going to have trouble swallowing or painful swallowing, right? Dysphagia, trouble swallowing, odynophagia, it hurts whenever I swallow. Chest pain. These patients can sometimes present asymptomatic. Um, if they do present asymptomatic, we usually do that exam, and it's usually due to like candidiasis. And oral ulcers also, so whenever a patient presents with oral ulcers, we're thinking about maybe herpes simplex virus, right? And with these patients, um, what we usually do is that, of course, 
to make sure that we are diagnosing and we have like a diagnostic certainty, then we usually do an endoscopy with biopsy and brushings for both microbiological and histopathological analysis. Why? Because this gives us a very high diagnostic accuracy for these patients. And how you differentiate between candidiasis, herpes, and CMV? Well, with candidiasis, the endoscopy is going to show the whitish, well-circumscribed lesion in this confluent creamy plaque within the mid-esophagus. Versus herpes, usually you'll see ulcers that are typically seen in the mid to distal esophagus, and these ulcers are usually whitish that are umbilicated, right? Umbilicated with areas of a central clearing. So that's how you differentiate that from your candidiasis is that with herpes, there are going to be whitish lesions that are umbilicated with areas of a central clearing. And then CMV. CMV, you're going to see these large superficial shallow ulcers. So what's going to be the treatment? Since usually the most common one that you're going to see from these is going to be candidiasis. So usually the treatment with this is going to be a nice statin swish and swallow. You can also do clotrimazole or fluconazole in these patients. Herpes is going to be the second most common one. And with these patients, we do acyclovir, valcyclovir, or famcyclovir, especially if the patient is um, immunocompromised. But usually acyclovir is going to be the first line. And in CMV, we usually do IV uh, gangcyclovir in these patients. So what are going to be some of the non-infectious causes? So like we said, reflux esophagitis. It can be medication-induced. Um, and that's why we tell our patients to make sure that they're drinking like a full glass of water with the medications. Uh, isenophilic esophagitis is another one. So reflux esophagitis like GERD, if GERD is not treated with these patients, then they can lead to re reflux esophagitis for these patients. They usually have like mucosal inflammation. It can cause stricter formation, Barrett's esophagus, Schatzky's ring. And usually in these patients are going to be presenting with heartburn, um, cough, and chest pain. And with these patients, we really don't need to do an upper endoscopy. We can do an upper endoscopy um, with these patients. Like if we want to make sure that we rule out like uh, Barrett's esophagus, right? But we usually don't do it. Um, and uh, with these patients, treatment's usually going to be the, with the protein pump inhibitor, right? Because we want to make sure that we are suppressing that acid that's just like refluxing back in the stomach and it's just uh, damaging that esophagus. Okay, the next non-infectious cause is going to be your caustic or corrosive esophagitis. So this is usually going to be a patient that ingested some type of substance, like um, alkali substance or the common ones like drink cleaner, bleach, lye, or even acids, right? This patient's usually going to be presenting with odenophagia, so painful swelling, dysphagia, hematemesis, so that um, vomiting or blood, dyspnea. Diagnosis is usually with an EGD. It's going to help us see like how much damage is done in the esophagus because the esophagus tissue is like very, very sensitive. You want to make sure that the patient didn't like perforate, right? The esophagus, um, they don't have any type of strictures or fistulas. And treatment for this one's going to be supportive pain medications and IV fluids. And then we have medication or pill induced. So there's certain medications that can injure the esophagus. So that's why it's really important. Like I said, we tell these patients to make sure they're drinking a lot of water when they take their medications. Some of the medications that are the culprits are going to be NSAIDs, biphosphonates by far, it's going to be the big one. But with biphosphonates, we tell these patients to make sure that they drink a full glass of water and they remain upright for at least 30 minutes when they're taking these medications. Other ones can be potassium chloride, iron pills, vitamin C, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. I saw a picture the other day of a child also that had taken like a tetracycline, a doxycycline, and they had like pelosophagitis. Um, so symptoms include severe retrosternal chest pain, odinophagia, dysphagia, and usually the symptoms occur several hours after taking a pill. Usually you can do an endoscopy for these patients. You'll see like these discrete ulcers that may be shallow or deep, and it's usually like one to several of these ulcers. And usually healing tends to go get, healing occurs once you've like eliminated whatever was causing it. So the next one's going to be eosinophilic esophagitis. This is a disorder where environmental antigens stimulate an inflammatory response. This occurs because of allergies, inflammatory eosinophilic infiltration of the esophageal epithelium. So in essence, it's an allergic reaction, right? 
you have these eosinophils that are going and they're just damaging that tissue. So with these patients, um, usually it's very commonly seen in, seen in men, about 75% of them are seen in men. Usually the patient's going to have a history of allergies or atopic conditions. Remember when we were discussing pulmonology, that triad of eczema, asthma, um, the patient can also present with fever. And signs and symptoms, usually dysphagia, it's going to be the most common one, especially with solids, food impaction, central chest pain, um, GERD symptoms, so like that refractory heartburn, they'll have an upper abdominal pain. Uh, they may or not may not present with reflux also, especially like in your little ones and your little babies. So evaluation, we can do an endoscopy with biopsy and histological evaluation because we want to make sure that we're establishing the diagnosis with these patients. And usually on, in, on the endoscopy, we're going to see multiple corrugated rings on the esophagus with or without white exudates. In treatment, just remove whatever is causing it, right? If it's a food, remove that food that's causing those allergies. We can do a protein pump inhibitor, but usually we do an inhaled topical glucocorticoid like butycinide or fluticasone uh, without a spacer. All right, so that was all your esophagitis. I know there's several types. So let's go into our next one. The next one's going to be gastritis. So gastritis is defined as a superficial inflammation or irritation of the stomach mucosa with mucosal injury. So with these patients, um, what are some of the causes? What happens is that there's an imbalance between too much aggressive and too little protective mechanisms of the gastric mucosa. It's usually due for an infection from H. pylori, and this is usually the most common cause of gastritis. H. pylori is the most common cause of gastritis. It's the most common cause of GERD, most common cause of peptic ulcers. In general, H. pylori, that bacteria is going to be the culprit for everything. Other causes can be um, inflammation from like chronic NSAID use or alcohol use, physiological stress like sepsis, burns, hepatic or renal failure, or mechanical ventilation, especially found in your chronically ill patients. Sometimes it's also autoimmune or due to hypersensitivity with these patients. So how is this patient going to present? Sometimes they're asymptomatic and that's usually the most common cause. If they do have symptoms, they have dyspepsia anorexia, epigastric pain, nausea and vomiting. They can present with the GI bleed also. Hematemesis, melina, but usually the bleeding is very, very minimal. So how do we diagnose these patients? It's usually based on the patient's history and physical exam, right? We can do labs like CBC, CMP, amylase, and lipase. Um, we can do an H. pylori test also, but usually like an EGD is going to be the gold standard for these patients. Treatment is usually symptomatic treatment, like our antiemetics, right? If they feel nauseous, like something like ondansetron, we can do H2 blockers or protein pump inhibitors, fluid hydration, um, and then lifestyle modifications, right? That's usually like our first line. Remember I said lifestyle modifications is usually the first line for everything. So tell the patient if their patient's taking like NSAIDs, stop the NSAIDs because that's damaging your mucosal tissue of your stomach. Avoid alcohol, change your diet, Treat the infection also. Like we said, H. pylori is usually the culprit for everything. So we're going to treat for H. pylori. All right, guys. And then about gastritis, we just have two causes, two types. We have acute gastritis and chronic. So for acute, we want to think about NSAIDs, right? Aspirin, H. pylori, alcohol and heavy cigarette smoking or caffeine. Um, usually, like I said, usually these patients are asymptomatic. They can present with epigastric pain, and usually the best one's going to be an upper GI endoscopy like we discussed, right? It's the best diagnostic. Now, for chronic, the most common cause is H. pylori, and with these patients, um, once again, an upper GI endoscopy is going to be the test of choice. All right, guys. So, I'm sorry. I know that was a lot, so let's just keep going. So... GERD is going to be the next one, GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, also known as your heartburn. What happens is that you have an appropriate relaxation of the lower extremity sphincter, um, sorry, lower esophageal sphincter, and this is due to decreased lower esophageal tone. This is usually the primary mechanism. What happens is that it leads to retrograde flow of stomach contents into the esophagus, and you have 
what occurs is that you have this like this the lower esophageal sphincter is just relaxed more relaxed than it should be because what happens is that you have your esophagus right it goes into the stomach before it goes into the stomach there's like a little door and the door closes and opens and this allows acid from the stomach not to go up and damage that esophagus because the esophageal tissue is a lot more different than the tissue in the stomach right the tissue in the stomach it's prepared for that acid it's built for that acid that like really acidic acid that it produces that ph that low ph but the esophagus is not and so what happens is that you have like relaxation of that little door it's not working like it should be and so that acid is just coming up and hitting the esophagus and i actually have gerd it's terrible I have to say I have PA school to blame anyways um but it's terrible you get this heartburn and it usually happens right after I eat spicy foods like fatty foods anything like that's like citric I love orange juice but I have to stay away from that tomatoes etc so um with these patients now that I've said that is that there's other things that can also cause GERD but the most common one's usually going to be what? It's going to be H. pylori, right? That infection. But there's other causes like a hiatal hernia, um, dietary factors like there's a patient, like I discussed, alcohol, tobacco, chocolate, high fat foods, coffee. I love coffee and it sucks because I had to stay away from it. I made sure I took a lot of PPIs before I drink a large coffee, especially when I was sitting for my exams. So usually these patients have increased gastric acid, like we discussed. And how's this patient going to present? They're going to have that heartburn. And it's a really bad heartburn, guys. Dyspepsia. Their retrosternal pain or burning shortly after eating, especially if they've had a large meal. It's usually worse by lying down. So it's, that's why it's really important that we tell our patients to not eat before they go to sleep, at least three to four hours before they go to sleep or not like lay down immediately after they've eaten a meal. Um, regurgitation, water brash, right? That's when they have like the salivary hypersecretion or sour taste in the mouth. Cough. So if there's a patient that comes in with a chronic cough, we want to make sure that we have GERD in our diagnostic um, differential. And why do we have a cough? So it's because you have either aspiration or reflux material um, that triggers this. Uh, dysphagia, so painful swallowing, hoarseness. I've had this actually, sore throat. I remember I, I thought I had COVID once and it was just my GERD. Um, sometimes you might feel like a lump, which is true. I felt that before in the throat. Um, this patient can also present with a weight loss, early satiety, and postprandial nausea and vomiting. Now, what are some of the alarm signs, right? Some of the red flags that we're thinking about something more severe in a patient that presents with GERD. Dysphagia, odynophagia, weight loss, and bleeding. Usually you want to suspect a malignancy or a complication. So usually what is the diagnosis with these patients? It's usually a clinical diagnosis. We really don't need to do any further testing. If we do want to do further testing, like in a patient that has these red flags that like I discussed, then we do like an EGD, and then an EGD with biopsy is going to be the test of choice. But the most sensitive and specific test for GERD is going to be a 24-hour pH monitoring. Make sure that you know that. And this is usually the gold standard, but it's not necessary because GERD is GERD is a diagnosis, clinical diagnosis. But if it asks you what's the gold standard, it's going to be the 24-hour pH monitoring. So the reason why we treat, and it's really important to aggressively treat uh, GERD and why I'm so scared of GERD, is that it has a lot of complications, right? The patients can develop erosive esophagitis. They can develop peptic strictures, esophageal ulcers. Barrett's esophagus is one of the bad ones, right? This is where the normal stratified squamous epithelium of the distal esophagus is replaced by columnar epithelium. And these dysplastic changes, right, can cause adenocarcinoma, esophageal adenocarcinoma. Because when we think about our cancers, right, we have two types. We have a squamous cell. And then we have our adenocarcinoma. Squamous cell is usually found on the two upper two thirds of the esophagus. And when we think about causes of squamous cell, we think about smoking. We think about alcohol use, right? Uh, when we think about adenocarcinoma, which is going to be the lower third of the esophagus, we think about GERD, gastric esophageal reflux disease, H. pylori. These are the common causes. So that's why in these patients, 
these patients are more prone with GERD to developing what type of cancer? Adenocarcinoma. And usually the precursor to that, it's going to be your Barrett's esophagus. Because like I discussed earlier, right, you have two different types of tissue in the esophagus and in the stomach. If that acid is repeatedly just like corrosing that tissue on the esophagus with time, especially in a patient that has like a 10-year history of GERD, they're going to be more prone to getting cancer. Those cells are going to start growing uncontrollably. You get Barrett's esophagus, it can lead to adenocarcinoma. So that's one of the big ones that we want to think about. Other causes can be recurrent pneumonia, especially since the patient can be aspirating, right? Um, that, uh, that acid, um, pitting of dental anema, dental erosion, enamel, uh, dental erosion, and gingivitis. I remember I had a patient during my family medicine rotation that came in and she actually needed to get all her teeth removed. And she actually had like veneers because her acid reflux was so bad and she was really young that it had just eroded all her teeth and that's something that scares me because every morning I wake up with like very sensitive teeth like I have really bad tooth sensitivity and I know for sure it's because of GERD that acid reflux. Other causes complications can be laryngitis and pharyngitis. So what's going to be the treatment for GERD? So like we've discussed right for gastritis for everything else it's usually going to be your lifestyle modifications. Don't eat before you go to sleep. Avoid eating before three to four hours before you go to sleep. Um, don't lace a pine immediately after you eat, right? Gravity. Make sure that you raise the bed up whenever you go to sleep, right? Avoid large meals. Avoid your fatty foods. Avoid anything that can incite that GERD, the, um, the acid reflux, anything that's citric, smoking, alcohol intake, caffeine, like coffee. Lose weight if the patient's overweight. And then once the patient's done that, then the next thing we're going to do is H2 blockers. Now, I know that in clinic that we usually don't do that. In clinic, you go straight to a protein pump inhibitor. And to be honest with you, I go straight. I've been taking protein pump inhibitors. But for textbook wise, this is going to be how you're going to treat the patient. It's going to be conservative management, right? Lifestyle modifications. And then after that, you're going to do an H2 blocker usually for your mild symptoms, and then after that, you're going to add a PPI. Now, what if in the question stem it's a patient and they have moderate to severe symptoms, then you go straight to a PPI. So just make sure that you know that protein pump inhibitors, your PPIs. Now, last line is going to be your surgery. So your nissen fundoplication can be done, and this is usually the procedure of choice with patients um, that have like failed everything else that we discussed. All right, so now that we've gone to that, Let's go to GI bleed. So GI bleeds, gastrointestinal bleeds, are usually separate on whether it's an upper GI bleed or if it's a lower GI bleed. And that kind of helps us narrow our diagnosis. Now, what there is a point of anatomy that's going to help you differentiate between your upper and your lower GI bleed. And this is something that they really like to test, so make sure that you know that. That's going to be the ligament of trite. So anything that is going to be above the ligament of trite, it's going to be an upper GI bleed. Anything that's below the ligament of trite, it's going to be a lower GI bleed. So once again, upper GI bleeds are usually bleeding. It's defined as bleeding that's above the ligament of trite and the duodenum, duodenum. Okay. So what are some of the causes of your upper GI bleed? Peptic ulcer disease, like your duodenal ulcers, right? These ulcers will perforate gastric ulcers, gastritis, reflux esophagitis, esophageal varices, like we discussed, right? This is something that's very deadly complications for your cirrhotic patients. Gastric varices, gastric erosions, duodenitis, Mallory Weiss hair, which is usually found in your patients that had too much fun drinking the previous night and now they're like vomiting so much. The next day, so they cause a tear in their esophagus. Um, other causes can be aortoenteric fistula. This one actually is very rare. And I was listening to a podcast the other day about a physician that actually missed this. So this one's very, very rare. This usually occurs after an aortic surgery. And it's really important that we ask the patient about any prior aortic aneurysm or graft. Other causes can be uh, neoplasms. So what about the causes for lower GI bleeds. Diverticulosis is usually going to be the most common cause of lower GI bleed in patients that are going to be older than 60. 
So this is where you're going to see the age difference. If it's a patient coming in with a lower GI bleed, the most common cause in patients older than 60, it's going to be diverticulosis. And it's usually going to be painless, okay? Other causes are going to be angiodysplasia, irritable bowel disease, right? Um, when we think about irritable bowel disease, we think about our um, ulcerative colitis. And this is usually going to be in your younger patients, right? So usually less than 60, less than 50, we want to think about irritable bowel disease. Other causes can be colorectal carcinoma, like we discussed earlier, right? Colorectal adenomatous polyps, ischemic colitis, hemorrhoids, and anal fissures. So how is this patient going to present? So the symptoms that they're going to present with will help you guide you on whether it's an upper or lower GI bleed. So hematemesis, which is going to be your bright red emesis, right? Bright red bl um, bloody vomiting, usually tells us that it's an upper GI bleed, okay? Which makes sense, right? Because it's upper. Um, coffee ground emesis also is usually going to tell us that it's an upper bleed for these patients. And then melina, which is going to be a black, tarry, liquid, foul-smelling stool. With these patients, usually about 90% of the time, it tells us that it's an upper GI bleed, right? But the thing about these is that dark stools are not always... We see a dark stool, we don't always want to think melina. Dark stools, you want to think about maybe medication-induced. The big ones are going to be things like Pepto-Bismol, right? Or bismuth salicylate. So we want to make sure that we tell these patients to expect that as a adverse effect of bismuth salicylate, but um, it's not usually a red flag. Other causes of like dark stools that are benign, like if the patient ate spinach, um, if they took iron, licorice. So the next one's going to be hematochoesia. This one's going to be very bright red blood from the rectum. Usually this will tell us it's a lower GI source, and we want to think about the left colon, right? Or the rectum. Also with hematochoesia, we possibly want to think about diverticulosis, right? Hemorrhoids, colon cancer. Um, now, what if we see a cold blood stool, cold blood in the stool? So with this one, this can be anywhere in the GI tract, so it's not very specific. So in general, these patients with GI bleeds, you're going to be presenting with fatigue, pallor, exertional dyspnea, dizziness, fainting with these patients. How are we going to diagnose them? We're going to do labs, right? We're going to do a stool guaiac. We want to do a hemoglobin and hematocrit for these patients. Um, if they have a low MCV, then usually this tells us that it's iron deficiency anemia, right? And this usually tells us that it's a chronic blood loss because usually patients that have acute bleeds are going to have normal acidic red blood cells. So just make sure that we keep that in mind. And then another thing to keep in mind is that BUN and creatinine ratio labels are usually elevated in upper GI bleeds. And this is usually going to tell us that there is an upper GI bleed with these patients. And then the higher the ratio, the more liking, likely the bleeding is from an upper GI source for the BUN and creatinine uh, upper GI bleeds. So imaging, we can do an EGD, and this is actually going to be the most accurate diagnostic test in evaluating an upper GI bleed. We can also do an NG tube. This is usually the initial procedure for determining the source of bleed, whether it's upper or lower. If we're thinking about a lower GI bleed, we can do an anoscopy or proctosigmoidoscopy, just to exclude that it's not to, to like anal fissure, right, or rectal source. We can also do a colonoscopy. This is going to help us for the lower GI bleeds, especially um, since it can be both diagnostic and therapeutic, right? And we can also do explorative, exploratory laparotomy. This is usually going to be our last resort for these patients. So in general, what are going to be our initial steps? So say we have a patient that comes in, they have a GI bleed. What are we going to do? So this patient is going to be presenting with... Um, Symptoms of volume down, right? So they're going to be hypotensive, tachycardic. They're going to have orthostatic hypotension also. The first thing we want to do is give them IV fluids, resuscitation, right? Transfusion if needed, okay? Now, treatment is going to depend on whether the patient is unstable or stable. So if the patient is unstable, like I said, resuscitation is going to be our top priority, we're going to give them, we're going to put some, we're going to put two large bore IV lines, give fluids or blood 
Uh, we want to make sure that we draw blood for hemoglobin and hematocrit, PT, PDT, and INR and platelets. We want to make sure that we're monitoring the patient's hemoglobin and do a type and cross match for the blood and transfuge as necessary. And treatment is going to depend on the cause or the source of the GI bleed. So if it's an upper GI bleed and with these patients, and like I said, the first thing we're going to do is an endoscopy, right? Just to rule out like, um, is it something like esophageal varices? So if it is, we're going to ligate the bleeding vessel, right? Um, lower GI bleed, we'll do a colonoscopy. If it's just polyps there, we're going to make sure that we excise the polyps. So that is upper and GI, lower GI bleeds. So like I said, the ligament trites is going to be the anatomy portion that's going to help you differentiate between an upper and lower GI bleed. All right, guys, so next one's going to be hemorrhoids. So hemorrhoids are characterized by varicose veins of the anus and rectum. Now, the thing about hemorrhoids is that we need to differentiate between our internal and our external hemorrhoids. So internal hemorrhoids are not painful, but external hemorrhoids are. And that's why treatment is going to be different between each one. So let's go into each one. External hemorrhoids. This is usually going to be an engorgement of the venous plexus that originates from inferior hemorrhoidal plexus veins that are distal to the dentate line. So that's, that anatomy is going to tell you whether it's an internal or external hemorrhoid. It's going to be that dentate line, right? If it's above the dentate line, it's going to be internal. If it's below the dentate line, it's going to be external. And treatment usually for these patients with um, external hemorrhoids is usually going to be with a short course of a topical steroid cream, hydrocortisone, or suppositories. Usually twice daily um, will help improve and diminish swelling with external hemorrhoids. So what about our internal hemorrhoids? This is an engorgement of the venous plexus that is originating from a superior hemorrhoidal vein, submucosal veins of superior rectal plexus proximal to the dentate line. So once again, these are going to be painless, right? Some of the risk factors in general for these hemorrhoids are going to be constipation, straining, pregnancy, portal hypertension, obesity, prolonged sitting, especially like your truck drivers and pilots, or prolonged standing, and then anal intercourse. So some of these clinical features are going to be the main symptoms are going to be bleeding and rectal prolapse. They're going to have this bright red blood per rectum. And usually the bleeding is uh, painless, right, for our internal hemorrhoids. I'm, I'm sorry, for, yeah, for internal hemorrhoids versus our external hemorrhoids. These are usually going to be um, <clears throat> uh, sometimes they are asymptomatic. So another way these patients can present with internal hemorrhoids is that, um, like I said, mucus discharge, right? That intermittent, intermittent rectal bleeding is very common. Sometimes I'll have a mass that's present whenever they prolapse. And usually the rectal prolapse can be elicited um, by telling the patient just to do a, a vasovic maneuver, right? So diagnosis for these is going to be usually visual inspection. We can do a DRE. Uh, we can do fecal cold blood testing. We can also do proctosigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy if we are thinking about maybe a malignancy that might be associated with this. And treatment... For these, is usually like I discussed, it's going to be always conservative management. So it's going to be your sits bath, your ice packs and bed rest, stool softeners to reduce straining, high fiber and high fluid diet. You can also do topical steroids and analgesics for these patients and say that they failed all of this, then we can do our procedures. So they failed conservative management. They have like pain that is just so severe that they just cannot continue on with their life. Uh, it's strangulated, or they have a stage four hemorrhoids because there's different stages of hemorrhoids. Then in these patients, we can do rubber band ligation, especially for our internal hemorrhoids. We can do sclerotherapy or infrared coagulation. And say, um, if it's like very severe, another thing that we can do is a hemorrhoidectomy also in these patients. So let's go into our next one, which is going to be a hiatal hernia. So a hiatal hernia. This occurs because there's a protrusion of the upper portion of the stomach into the chest cavity due to a diaphragm tear or weakness. So you have the diaphragm, right? And you have a weakness of that diaphragm that is causing the stomach to herniate. And it's going where the esophagus shape is. So there's two types of hiatal hernias or sliding and parasophageal. Sliding, which is type 1, is going to be the most common type of hernia in a 
and it accounts for more than 90% of cases. So with our sliding hernias, what happens is that both the gastroesophageal junction and a portion of the stomach herniates into the thorax through the esophageal hiatus so that the gastroesophageal function junction is above the diaphragm. This is very common. It's usually benign. It's associated with GERD. So with GERD, aside from H. pylori and all the other things that we discussed, right, we also want to think about hernias that can be a cause of this. Type 2 is not as common. It accounts about less than 2% of the cases. Usually what happens is that the fundus of the stomach herniates into the thorax through the esophageal hiatus, but the gastroesophageal junction does not. It remains below the diaphragm in its anatomic location. Uh, this is a very uncommon hernia, but if it you do find it, this has a lot of complications because it can actually strangulate, and usually these are repaired surgically. So how is this patient going to present? Sometimes they don't even know they have it, right? It's asymptomatic, and you just find it incidentally. If they do have symptoms, you're going to have those symptoms of GERD, right? Your heartburn, your chest pain, dysphagia. And diagnosis is going to be with an barium upper GI series and an EGD. And treatment for type 1, usually these are treated medically, right, with antacids, small meals, especially if they have those symptoms of GERD with elevation of the head after meals. Um, about 15% of cases do require surgery, like our Nissen fund application. That's if the patient has not responded to conservative management and also medical treatment. Type 2 hernias, usually these are treated with elective surgery because, like we discussed, right, these have a very high risk of complications. All right, guys, so let's go into inflammatory bowel disease. This includes Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So let's go into each one. So just in general for irritable bowel disease, it's more commonly found in Caucasians, um, especially your Jewish populations, and the mean age is between 15 to 35 years old. So it's very common in your young individuals. So we have Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, and it's really important that you know the difference between these two. So Crohn's disease is also known as regional enteritis. Why? Because this can happen, it's an inflammation that can happen anywhere in the GI. So from the mouth to the anus, it can happen anywhere, okay? That's why it's called regional. And what happens is that it's a chronic transmural inflammatory disease. So it goes through the entire lumen of the stomach, anywhere, anywhere in the GI, everything. That's why it's called transmural. So like I said, it, infect, it can affect everywhere, but the most common area that it affects is gonna be the small bowel, especially the terminal ileum. So how is this patient going to present? They can present with right lower quadrant pain with these patients. And usually the pathology, like we discussed, the terminal ileum is going to be the most common area where it's going to be located. Um, you're going to see skip lesions, right? And that's another one where you can differentiate from ulcerative colitis, right? Transmural inflammation, anywhere in the GI tract, more common in the terminal ileum. You're going to see those skip lesions. These are very prone to to causing fistulas. Why? Because you have that transmural inflammation, right? Inflammation going through the entire tissue, entire lumen. This patient is going to have non-caseating granulomas. And then also they have mesenteric fat creeping onto the anti-mesenteric border of the small bowel. That's usually pathognomonic for Crohn's disease. And how is this patient going to present? So they're going to present with diarrhea, but it's usually going to be diarrhea with no blood. If it's a bloody diarrhea, we think about ulcerative colitis. But this one, Crohn's, no bloody diarrhea, just diarrhea. Malabsorption and weight loss, they're going to have this cramping abdominal pain, especially in the right lower quadrant pain area, nausea and vomiting, fever and malaise. They can also present with extra intestinal manifestations like anterior uveitis, episcleritis, arthritis. This is actually the most common extra intestinal manifestation of irritable bowel disease ankylosing spondylitis, erythema nodosum, and pyoderma gangrenosum, gangrenosum also. Although pyoderma gangrenosa is more commonly found in your ulcerative colitis, right? Aptus oral ulcers, cholelithiasis, nephrolithiasis, thromboembolic hypercoagulable states, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, osteoporosis. So how are we going to diagnose these patients? So we usually are going to do an EGD, so um, an endoscopy with biopsy. This is usually the gold standard. 
We can also do a sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy because like I said, it's found anywhere from the mouth to the anus. And usually what we're going to see on our exams is going to be those aphthous ulcers. Cobblestone appearance is another buzzword for your Crohn's disease, pseudopolyps also, and patchy and skip lesions. So you'll see normals of, you'll see areas of normal bowel, and then all of a sudden it's inflamed and like normal. So it's like skipped. It's not continuous like ulcerative colitis. Another thing that we can do is a barium enema. We're usually going to see a string sign, which is usually pathognomonic for Crohn's. We can also do a CT enterography. We can do an upper GI with small bowel follow through also. And we can do an irritable bowel disease panel plus, um, plus a test for S cervicate IgG antibody. Um, positive ASCA is usually gonna, what we're gonna see with these patients. So remember positive ASCA is associated with our Crohn's disease while P ANCA is associated with ulcerative colitis. So that's another thing that can be tested for these. And that's another thing that you need to know. So the thing why it's really important to treat Crohn's is that there's a lot of complications, right? Fistulas can happen between the colon and other segments of the intestine, um, even the bladder, the vagina, and skin. That's gross, right? Because you have transmural inflammation. So it's really important. It's really, um, that's why with these patients, they can have these complications. Uh, they can also develop small bowel obstructions. Malignancy is also associated with an increased risk of colonic and small bowel tumors. Malabsorption of vitamin B12 also. Cholelithiasis, um, nephrolithiasis, aphthous ulcers like we discussed, toxic colon, growth retardation. And some of these patients, like they have usually narcotic abuse because they're just in a lot of pain, right? Um, psychosocial issues usually also. So treatment for this for immediate remission, usually steroids are going to be the first line, so steroids. We can also do sulfazalazine for these patients. Um, other things that we can do is systemic corticosteroids like prednisone, which are usually used, like we discussed, in acute exacerbations. And then another thing that we can do is immunosuppressants, right, like az azathoprine or 6 mercaptopurine. This is usually used in, adjunct in adjunction with steroids. If the patient is not responding to steroids, then we can think about immunosuppressants. We can also do anti-TNF agents like Humira or Remicade, right? But with these, we want to make sure that we, before we start any type of anti-TNF, um, we want to make sure that we test the patients for hepatitis B and TB tests, right? Because this is usually going to be immunosuppressing the patient a lot. And usually we can do surgery also, but it's surgery is not curative, right? Because it's found everywhere versus ulcerative colitis surgery is usually curative for these patients because in ulcerative colitis, it's usually just limited to the colon and the rectum. All right, guys. So now that we've done that one, let's go into ulcerative colitis. So ulcerative colitis is a chronic inflammatory disease of the colon or rectal mucosa. So remember I said that for Crohn's, it's from the mouth to the anus. For ulcerative colitis, it's usually from the colon to the rectum. With these patients, um, it can occur at any age, but it usually starts in adolescence or young adulthood. And it usually involves, like I said, the most common one is going to be the colon and the rectum, but it usually involves the rectum in all cases in these patients. The pathology is that they're going to have uninterrupted involvement of the rectum, so they're not going to have skip lesions. It's just going to be continuous inflammation for ulcerative colitis versus Crohn's. It's going to be skipped, right? And inflammation with these patients is not transmural, right? So these patients only have inflammation that's limited to the mucosa and some mucosa, and that's another thing that will differentiate it from your Crohn's disease. You'll also see polymorphonuclear neutrophils, in the crypts of the colon, you'll see crypt abscesses also. Some of the clinical features are going to be hematoquiesia, so it's going to be your bloody diarrhea. Bloody diarrhea, right, ulcerative colitis, not as common in Crohn's disease. Abdominal pain usually is going to be the left lower quadrant for ulcerative colitis. Bowel movements are frequent but small. This patient can present with fever, anorexia, and weight loss if they have very severe cases. 
they'll have tenesmus, so that rectal dry heaving, right? Or that urgency that they have to go number two, but they don't have to go. Um, also, with these patients, they can present with extra intestinal symptoms, like the ones that we discussed that were very similar to Crohn's, like uveitis, right? Arthritis, sk uh, skin lesions, jaundice. Pyoderma gangrenosum is one that's very commonly found in ulcerative colitis. Diagnosis for these patients is that usually we want to do a colonoscopy, right? It's going to show us the extent of the disease and the presence of any complications. And what we'll see on the colonoscopy is that it's going to be uniform inflammation, right? No skip lesions. And we'll see, we may or may not see ulceration in the rectum and colon. We'll see sodal polyps. And, um, we can also do a barium study. Usually it's going to show us a stovepipe sign, right? They're going to have that loss of hostile markings. But if the patient comes in and they have acute colitis and toxic med colon, then we don't want to do this, right? We don't want to put anything up the rectum like barium studies or colonoscopy. The labs is going to be positive pianca. So we said that, remember, for our um, Crohn's, it's going to be your ANCA, A-N-C-A, positive, um, ASCA, I'm sorry, ASCA your ASCA is going to be positive for your um, um, <clears throat> Crohn's disease. P ANCA or ANCA is going to be positive for your ulcerative colitis. So some of the complications for these patients are going to be iron deficiency anemia, so very similar to ulcerative uh, Crohn's disease, hemorrhage, electrolyte disturbances, and dehydration secondary to diarrhea, strictures, col colon cancer is a big one. And actually, it's ulcerative colitis has a higher malignancy increase of colorectal cancer than in comparison to Crohn's. Other complications can be sclerosis and cholangitis, cholangiocarcinoma. Toxic megacolon is actually the leading cause of death in ulcerative colitis. Growth retardation, once again, narcotic abuse, right? And we want to make sure that with these patients, we tell them to stop smoking because smoking can decrease the risk of your ulcerative colitis. What's going to be the treatment? So the medical treatment is going to be systemic corticosteroids. This is going to be used once again for your acute exacerbations. But the mainstay of treatment is going to be sulfazalazine, whether it's topical application as a, as a suppository, or they can also take it orally. So <clears throat> the curative treatment for this is going to be surgery. So like I said, unlike Crohn's that occurs everywhere in the colon, with ulcerative colitis, it's usually just in the colon and the rectum, so that's why surgery is going to be very curative for these patients. All right, guys, so we've done with that. Let's go into irritable bowel syndrome, so IBS. So irritable bowel syndrome is defined as a chronic functional disorder of the GI tract that is characterized by chronic abdominal pain and altered bowel habits. Usually, we have no cause. We, we don't know what the causes of irritable bowel syndrome. So there is no organic cause for irritable bowel syndrome. And it's more commonly found in females. And the onset is usually common in young adulthood. And irritable bowel syndrome is associated with a lot of other conditions like fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, um, GERD, functional dyspepsia chest pain, non-cardiac chest pain, psychiatric disorders like major depression, anxiety, and somatization. So just make sure you know that also. So how is this patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with chronic abdominal pain. It's usually described as crampy and it varies in intensity. And also these patients tend to have periodic exacerbations. The location of the abdominal pain can vary. So sometimes it can just be all over. And also the character of how severe the pain is can also vary. And another thing to keep in mind is that usually emotional stress can exacerbate the pain. Also certain meals can exacerbate the pain. These patients also are going to be presenting with altered bowel habits. So they'll have diarrhea, constipation, and then alternating diarrhea and constipation. Or they can have normal bowel habits that alternate with either diarrhea and or constipation. So... Usually with these patients, um, how are we going to diagnose this? So IBS is usually suspected in patients with chronic abdominal pain and altered bowel habits, like we discussed, like diarrhea, diarrhea and constipation. 
The clinical diagnosis of IBS requires the fulfillment of symptom-based diagnostic criteria and a limited evaluation to exclude underlying organic disease. So like we said, these patients have no organic disease to the cause of their symptoms. So the most widely used criteria for IBS is going to be your Rome for Rome's criteria, right? So what is that? That's going to be recurrent abdominal pain on average at least one day per week in the last three months that is associated with two or more of the following. It's related to defecation. It's associated with a change in stool frequency. It's associated with a change in stool form or appearance. And the criteria has to be fulfilled for the last three months with symptom onset over six months prior to diagnosis. So they had to fulfill this Rome criteria to be diagnosed with IBS. So with these patients, we want to make sure that we get a thorough history, right? We want to pay attention for symptoms that are concerning for organic disease. And it's really important that we also ask about family history. Do they have a family history of irritable bowel disease? Do they have a family history of colorectal cancer and celiac disease? Because we're trying to find an organic cause, right? We want to make sure that we don't just dismiss this patient and say that they have um, IBS and that there's no cause for this. And usually with these patients, the physical exam is usually normal. They may have some like mild abdominal tenderness, but it's usually normal. And there's no definitive diagnostic laboratory test for IBS, unfortunately. So in patients that have IBS and they have constipation, we can do an abdominal x-ray um, just to see whether, you know, there's stool accumulation and to determine the severity. But usually there's not really definitive testing that we can do for these patients. And there's different subtypes of IBS, right? And it's usually based on the reported predominant bowel habit the patient has. So the subtypes include like irritable bowel syndrome, predominant constipation, so IBSC, um, irritable bowel syndrome, predominant diarrhea, irritable bowel syndrome with mixed bowel habits, or irritable bowel syndrome unclassified. We can use a Bristol stool chart that can help like to record stool consistency for the patient. So what are some of the red flags that we want to maybe investigate further in a patient that presents with IBS? So if the onset is after age 50, if they have rectal bleeding or melina, if they have nocturnal diarrhea, if they have progressive abdominal pain, weight loss, lab abnormalities like iron deficiency anemia, elevated CRP or fecal calprotectin, family history of IBD or colorectal cancer, personal history of IBD or celiac disease, um, persistent diarrhea that causes dehydration, severe constipation or fecal impaction. So these are some of the red flags that we want to further investigate and do further testing, not just dismiss and say the patient has IBS. So most patients with IBS that have chronic symptoms, um, that vary, vary, vary in time. So that's something just to know that most of these patients are going to have chronic symptoms. And we just want to make sure that we educate these patients on ABS, IBS. So it's really important that we establish a good clinician and patient relationship with these patients um, because we want to make sure, like I said, we educate them on what they have and to just tell them that unfortunately there's not organic cause of this. So for patients that have mild to moderate, mild intermittent symptoms that do not impair their quality of life, then we can just treat them conservatively, all right? Tell them to sleep and exercise, to avoid um, cruciferous vegetables. It's a very interesting choice of word. Avoid beverages that have sorbitol or fructose, like f fructose, sorry, like apples, raisins, um, smoking cessation. Recommend that they have lifestyle and dietary changes also. Now, what if they have mild to moderate symptoms that failed to respond to the initial management? Say that they changed their diet, right? They stopped smoking, they're exercising, and it's not helping them. Then we can do pharmacological therapy, right, as an adjunctive treatment for these patients. But usually dietary modification is going to be the best treatment for these patients. So tell them to avoid large meals, reduce their intake of fat, um, increase fiber intake, uh, decrease caffeine, right? So some of the adjunctive pharmacological therapy that we can do for these patients is if they, if they have the constipation type, right, of IBS, then we can do something like polyethylene glycol. 
Um, we can also do something like prokinetics, like bulk forming laxatives, like pycillium, right? Or osmotic laxatives. What if they have the diarrhea type of IBS? So we can do antidiarrheals like lopiramide or emodium. That's usually going to be the initial treatment. If they have abdominal pain and bloating, we can do antispasmodic as needed. So something like uh, disoclamine or hyososamine. And we can also do a trial of antidepressants like amitriptyline or SSRIs if they still have abdominal pain after we give them we have given them the antispasmodics. So that is going to be our um, IBS. So let's go into our next one, which is going to be acute pancreatitis. This is an inflammation of the pancreas due to prematurely activated pancreatic digestive enzymes that invoke pancreatic tissue auto digesting digestion so the pancreas is like auto digesting it's like eating itself so there's two forms there's mild and severe mild is going to be the most common and this tends to respond well to supportive treatment while severe also known as your necrotizing pancreatitis these patients have a very high morbidity and mortality rate so what are some of the causes i have the mnemonic of i get smashed that's like a really cool mnemonic so I is going to be idiopathic, gallstones is going to be G, E is going to be ethanol, T is going to be trauma, S is going to be steroids, M is going to be for mumps or malignancy, A is going to be autoimmune, S is going to be for scorpion stings, interesting, right? H is going to be for hypercalcemia and or hypertriglyceridemia, and E is going to be for ERCP, and D is going to be for drugs. So these are going to be also some of the common causes. Out of all these, which one are the most common causes? The most common one's gonna be gallstones and the second most common one is going to be ethanol. So what's the most common cause of pancreatitis? Gallstones with alcohol being the second one. This is something that's very highly tested. Other causes is like ERCP, right? Post ERCP can cause pancreatitis. So this is a type of procedure that's done. So let's all make sure to keep that in mind. How is a patient going to present? So they're going to be presenting with abdominal pain. Usually it's going to be epigastric, right? Epigastric pain that radiates to the back. It's often steady, dull, and severe. And it's worse whenever the patient is lying in a supine position, but it's relieved whenever the patient leans forward. This patient is going to be presenting with nausea and vomiting, anorexia, low-grade fever, tachycardia, hypotension, leukocytosis, epigastric tenderness, abdominal distension, Decreased or absent bowel sounds, um, tachycardia, sometimes it can be very severely dehydrated. And if we think about hemorrhagic pancreatitis, then we're thinking about these signs, right? These are commonly signs found in hemorrhagic pancreatitis, your gray turner sign. This is where there's bilateral flank ecchymosis, your colon sign. This is where you have periumbilical ecchymosis, and then you have the fox sign. This is going to be ecchymosis of the inguinal ligament. This is something that's very highly tested, so just make sure you know that. Diagnosis is usually based on a clinical presentation. We can also do a labs and CT that are going to further help us confirm the diagnosis. So for lab studies, right, we're going to measure their LFTs, um, their lipase, and their amylase. So what we need to know is that amylase levels are usually more than five times the upper limit of normal. And lipase is going to be the more specific one for pancreatitis. So that's something that they really like to test. So out of both of them, which one's going to be the most specific? Amylase or lipase? Lipase is going to be the most specific one. Why? Because amylase is increased in a lot of things. So we think about orchitis, right, due to mumps. Mumps in general is going to cause increased amylase. So it's not as specific. But in general, patients with pancreatitis will have a very high amylase level, more than five times higher than the upper limit but the lipase is going to be the most specific one. For LFTs also, we want to make sure that we get those because it's going to help us to identify the cause of it. If we're thinking about gallstones, since we said gallstones is the primary cause of pancreatitis, LFT levels are going to help us in diagnosing that. So usually if it's due to gallstones, the ALT level is going to be super high. It's going to be a three-fold increase, and, and this is usually going to be suggestive of gallstone pancreatitis. These patients can also present with hyperglycemia, hypoxemia, and leukocytosis, elevated bilirubin, and hypertriglyceridemia or hypocalcemia. So that's why it's really important, remember when we were discussing in our cardio section, that we get those triglyceride levels low in those patients that have very high triglyceride levels. Because when it starts getting in 600, like 700, 800, these patients are at very high risk for 
developing pancreatitis. So another thing we can do is that we can do an ultrasound. Um, this can sometimes also help us identify the cause for pancreatitis. We want to look for those gallstones, right? But the most accurate test for diagnosis and diagnostic test for choice for pancreatitis is going to be a CT scan, okay? Another thing we want to take into consideration is that we can do an ERCP. Uh, this is usually only done whenever we suspect gallstones, right? That there's some type of obstruction that is causing that pancreatitis. So what are some of the complications of pancreatitis? So you have pancreatic necrosis, um, which can either be sterile or infective. If it's, if it's sterile, infection can develop, but about half of these infections will resolve spontaneously. So <clears throat> that's a cause. Infected um, pancreatic necrosis is another one. This one has very high mortality rate. Um, these patients tend to develop about multiple organ failure in about 50% of cases. And usually with these patients, we want to make sure that we do surgical debridement and antibiotics. And to determine if the patient is either sterile or infected pancreatic necrosis, we do a CT guided percutaneous aspiration with gram state and culture of the aspirate, and that's going to tell us whether it's infected or not. Another cause is complication is going to be pancreatic pseudosis. Um, this is usually where the patient has an encapsulated fluid collection that appears two to three weeks after an acute attack. This is something that's very highly tested, so just make sure that you know these. Um, with pancreatic pseudic cysts, if they are not treated, they can rupture, they can cause infection, they can cause gastric outlet obstruction, fistulas, hemorrhages, and pancreatic ascites also. And CT scan is going to be usually the best study to diagnose a pancreatic pseudocyst. If the cyst is like small, if it's less than five centimeters, we just observe. But if it's greater than five centimeters, then we have to go in there and drain it either percutaneously or surgically. Another complication of pancreatitis is hemorrhagic pancreatitis. Remember, we discussed those signs, right? The colon sign, the Gray Turner sign, and the Fox sign. And we usually diagnose these with a CT scan with IV contrast. All right, guys, so what's going to be the treatment for pancreatitis in general? We want to make sure that we give these patients supportive care. Usually, most of these cases tend to respond to supportive care. So we want to make sure that we're giving these patients IV fluids, right? Give, putting them nothing by mouth, so MPO, and correcting any type of electrolyte abnormality with these patients. If it's severe pancreatitis, then we're going to admit these patients to the ICU, and usually with these patients, we do early enteral nutrition within the first 72 hours as recommended, usually th through uh, NG tubes, right? Nasal jejunal tubes. And if it's severe necrotizing pancreatitis, we want to make sure we use broad spectrum antibiotics like imipenem. And usually for prognosis, we usually tend to do the Ransom criteria to determine the prognosis and mortality rate. Usually if a patient has a score of more than three to four, of rancid criteria, they should be monitored in the ICU. All right, guys, let's go into our next one, peptic ulcer disease. This occurs secondary to an imbalance of decreased mucosal protective factors in the GU and increased damaging factors like acid, pepsin. And what are some of the causes? So the most common causes by far, right? Remember I said that H. pylori seems to be the culprit of everything, of GERD, of gastritis. H. pylori is a culprit and it's one of the most common causes of peptic ulcer disease. Other causes can be NSAIDs, right? Why NSAIDs? Because these inhibit prostaglandin production that can cause, that can impair mucosal defenses. Um, if the patient has some type of hypersecretory state like Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. Other causes can include smoking, um, alcohol and coffee can sometimes exacerbate symptoms. How is the patient going to present with peptic ulcer disease? So they're going to have dyspepsia. They're going to have that epigastric uh, pain that's aching or gnawing. They're going to have nocturnal symptoms, um, symptoms that are usually worse at night, like we discussed. They can have nausea and vomiting. And the thing about peptic ulcer disease, remember that these are very prone to perforating. So these can also cause an upper GI bleed, and it's actually the most common cause of upper GI bleeds. Make sure that you don't get confused by that. Because I remember I had a question and it asked me, what's the most common cause of upper GI bleed? And there were, there was um, esophageal varices on there. No, the most common cause of peptic of upper GI bleed are going to be peptic ulcer disease, okay? That's the most common cause in general. 
Now, in patients that are cirrhotic, the most common cause of an upper GI bleed in them is going to be your esophageal varices. But in general, for all upper GI bleeds, the most common cause is going to be peptic ulcer disease, those ulcers that perforated. So how is, else is this patient going to present? They're going to have early satiety, so they're going to feel full very quickly. Weight loss diagnosis. The most accurate test in diagnosing patients is usually going to be an endoscopy, right? It's going to show us whether the ulcer is in the gastric area or it's in the duodenal area, okay? So the thing about ulcers, another thing that it's very highly tested is which type of ulcer do you have? So we have our duodenal ulcers and we have our gastric ulcers. Now, which one's which? So duodenal ulcers are usually going to be better with food. So the patient's going to eat food, they feel better. Versus gastric ulcers, they're going to be feel worse with food. So it's something that you need to know. How I memorize it is that D for duodenal ulcers, dude, give me food, right? Dude, give me food. Dude, I get better with food. Gastric ulcers do not get better with food. Another thing that you need to keep in mind between the two is that whenever you see a gastric ulcer, it's very commonly found in your elderly patients, and these are usually associated with a malignancy. So whenever we're diagnosing a gastric ulcer and we see a gastric ulcer right on our endoscopy, we want to make sure that we do a biopsy also to rule out any type of malignancy. Versus our duodenal ulcers, these are usually not malignant and it's very commonly found in your younger patients. So gastric ulcers, remember we said that it's worse with food found in your older patients. You want to do an endoscopy with a biopsy because they're associated with malignancy. Do autonal ulcers, do give me food, they get better, usually found in your younger patients that are not very commonly associated with malignancies. So that's another thing to keep in mind with these patients. We can also do a barium swallow. And then also we want to make sure that we're testing for H. pylori, because remember I said that H. pylori is the most common cause of these ulcers in general. And usually the gold standard to diagnose H. pylori is going to be our EGD with biopsy. For these patients, we can also do a urea breath test. This is actually the most convenient test. It's not as invasive and it has a very high sensitivity and specificity rate of more than 95%. We can also do an H. pylori stool antigen, but it's not as specific. Um, we can also do a serology, but it's not as specific. So out of all of these, right, the gold standard is going to be our EGD with biopsy. Do we do that? No for H. pylori, no. The best one is going to be your urea breath test it has a very high increased rate of um, sensitivity and specificity. The only thing about your ureus test, the breath test, is that you have to make sure that the patient is not on any type of antacid or PPI because it can give you a false negative. So if a patient has been on an PPI or an antacid in the past week, we can't do that, then you're gonna do a fecal antigen test because it's gonna give you a false positive, false negative. So treatment for these patients for peptic ulcer disease, um, Usually with these patients, since H. pylori is the most common cause, usually if we treat the H. pylori, we're going to treat the peptic ulcer disease. So we're going to make sure that we treat the H. pylori. If the patient's taking NSAIDs, tell them to avoid NSAIDs, right, for these patients. So it's usually going to be supportive, right? Stop smoking, decrease your alcohol intake, avoid eating before you go to bed. So it's going to be the same ones for GERD, right? Sleep with the bed elevated, um, avoid like laying down right after you eat with these patients, so lose weight, decrease coffee intake, decrease spicy food intake, um, caffeine, coffee, spicy foods, uh, anything that is citric also. And then we can also do acid suppression, right? H2 blockers is what we start with, right? Although we don't do that in the clinic. And then we can do PPIs. So PPIs, what do they do? They block the um, hydrogen and potassium ATPase pump directly in the parietal cell membranes, and these are actually the most effective one, right? So if, it tell, if the question asks you what's the most effective treatment, it's going to be your PPIs. Now, what is the mode of action for H2 receptor blockers? They block histamine, right? They block histamine-based parietal cell acid secretion. The thing you need to know, though, about PPIs, protein pump inhibitors, is that they take a while to go into effect. So it's something that you need to tell the patient. It's going to take a few days before they start having feeling better. So maybe like four days, five days, six days versus like your H2 blockers, the patients usually feel relief pretty quickly. So that's something to keep in mind with these patients. Another thing that we can do is antacids, right? And then of course, eradicate the H. pylori, right? With either triple or quadruple therapy. 
So what is that triple or quadruple therapy? Because they really like to test you on this. So our triple therapy for H. pylori is going to be a protein pump inhibitor, amoxicillin, and clarithromycin for 10 to 14 days, okay? For retreatment or if for some reason, like there, there is a high rate of um, just uh, H. pylori being resistant to the triple therapy, then in these cases, we want to think about the quadruple therapy, which is going to be your PPI, your bismuth sesylate, uh, uh, metronidazole, and tetracycline. What if the patient, you're doing the triple therapy and the patient's allergic to clarithromycin, then you can su substitute it for metronidazole. Another thing we can do for cytoprotection, we can do sucrophate. sucrophate. Um, this is going to help facilitate the ulcer healing. And then we can also do misoprosol. So what it does, it kind of does like a little blanket over the ulcer. It's very soothing for the patient. And then the last thing is going to be surgery, right? It's rarely needed. It's only electively. And it's only if the patient has complications like perforation, right? Um, if they have any type of bleeding. All right, guys. So let's go into viral hepatitis. Yay, my least favorite. So viral hepatitis. So we have different types of hepatitis. We have A, B, C, D, and E, right? Now, how is each one transmitted? How I memorized it is that the vowels hit your bowels, right? So A and E are transmitted fecal oral. So bowels hit your vowels. So the vowels, A and E, fecal oral. So hepatitis A. The incubation period for this one tends to range between 15 to 45 days. This patient is going to be presenting with symptoms of nausea, vomiting, anorexia, and jaundice. They're going to have a low-grade fever, dark urine, and clay-colored stools. They're going to have right upper quadrant pain that is tender to palpation and hepatomegaly. They're going to be presenting with splenomegaly and cervical lymphadenopathy. They're going to have complete clinical and biochemical recovery, usually in one to two months. So usually you don't have to treat these patients because they get better in one to two months. On labs, what are you going to see? You're going to see your fecal um, hepatitis A virus is higher before symptoms and before ALT elevates. This means that the patient is infectious. And diagnosis, acute hepatitis, we're going to see an IgM to hepatitis A virus antibody. If they had a past exposure to hepatitis A, you're going to see IgG to hepatitis A virus antibody with a negative IgM. So, right, remember, IgM is going to be the first one that's going to pop up, and then IgG is the one that later pops up. So, managing with these patients, we really don't have to do anything. It's usually symptomatic treatment because it tends to go away by itself. Um, if a patient was exposed, we can do post-exposure prophylaxis for close contacts. We usually do hepatitis A virus uh, immunoglobulin. Pre-exposure prophylaxis is usually your hepatitis A vaccine, right, for patients at high risk. So these are like travelers and children that live in the endemic areas. And then usually routine vaccination for hepatitis A virus is usually given for all children, right? So hepatitis E virus, remember vowels hit your bowels. This has an incubation period of 14 to 80 to 60 days, uh, 14 to 60 days. And it's usually primarily found in India, Asia, Africa, and Central America. This one has animal reservoirs and both IgM and antigen to hepatitis e, e virus during early acute infection and IgG antigen to hepatitis E virus are going to predominate after the first three months that can be detected. So usually, like I said, this, this is going to be very, present very similar to hepatitis A. Diagnosis, we're going to do the IgM to antigen antigen to hepatitis E virus, and usually management is self-limiting. The only thing about this one is that it's very, it has a very high mortality rate during pregnancy, especially in the third trimester. How I memorize it is that E, hepatitis E for expecting mothers, um, it's very deadly. But everyone else usually with these patients, um, it tends to go away by itself. So let's go into hepatitis B. This one's going to be bloodborne pathogen. It can be transmitted by semen, saliva, perinatal, and other blood bodily fluids. So with this one, there's multiple antigens. Um, I'll try to go through each one. I know this is like something that's very painful. So hepatitis B E antigen appears usually concurrently with or shortly after hepatitis B surface antigen. 
Its appearance coincides with high levels of virus replication and acute infection and high levels of infectivity. Hepatitis E antibody indicates that there's waning of the viral replication and decreased infectivity. Hepatitis B surface antigen is a surface antigen, and this one's going to be the first one to rise, and it's going to be the first one that's going to give you evidence of infection. So how I memorize this one is that on the surface, right, it's on the surface, it's going to be the first one that's going to pop up. So that's how I memorize it. Now, hepatitis B surface antibody that suggests that there's some type of uh, resolved inf infection, whether it was through recovery or vaccination. So if you see a positive hepatitis B um, antibody in a person that has been infected, this usually indicates immunity. So it means that the patient is not infectious. Another thing that you need to know is IgM and IgG. So remember you said that IgM is the first one that's going to pop up. So IgM indicates acute infection versus IgG indicates usually a chronic infection or a distant resolved infection. Um, another thing is that usually hepatitis B virus DNA is usually going to be positive, and this usually tells you that there's active replication that's going on in the liver. So how is this patient going to present? In acute presentation, they're going to have constitutional symptoms, but usually fever is absent. So they're going to have nausea, vomiting, anorexia, hepatomegaly, jaundice, splenomegaly, and adenopathy also. Um, the ALT is usually going to be increased in these patients, especially if they're having an acute infection. But once the infection goes away and the patient is, has like inactive hepatitis B, then the ALT is going to go back to normal with these patients. So workout for these patients, right? We want to make sure that we get um, we get that virology done. Uh, we can also do a CBC. We're going to see leukopenia and lymphos lymphocytes also. And with these patients, uh, we usually do a vaccine, right? It's a universal infant vaccination that's given at zero months, so right when the baby's born, one and six months. And usually with these patients, what we need to know is that even if the woman, if a patient is pregnant, so if the woman's pregnant, that is not a contraindication for a vaccine. So next one is hepatitis B, I mean, hepatitis D. So the thing about hepatitis D is it's also transmitted through bloodborne pathogens, and it's also transmitted by other body fluids as well. But hepatitis D needs hepatitis B in order to replicate, okay? So D needs B. So in order to have D, you need B, okay? That's something that you need to know. They co-infect. And the thing is that hepatitis B is already bad, right? But if you have on top of that hepatitis D, then that's like a super, super, super bad infection. So it's really bad um, with these patients, and they have a very high increase of developing hepatocellular carcinoma. So that's something else to know. So hepatitis C. This one is bloodborne. It's also transmitted through sexual and perinatal transmission with these patients. Um, there's no vaccine, unfortunately, for this. And what it does is that it depresses the natural killer cells. It reduces the anti-apoptotic proteins. And it blocks type 1 interferon responses for these patients. The most sensitive indicator of hepatitis C viral infection is the presence of hepatitis C vRNA on a PCR. And how is this patient going to present? So for acute presentation, this patient is going to present with constitutional symptoms, nausea, vomiting, anorexia, jaundice, hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, and adenopathy. The ALT is usually going to be elevated also. And it's really important that we screen for hepatitis C virus in this specific age group. Uh, this is something that's very commonly tested, just, just make sure that we know this. It's like according to the USPSTF, patients are screened for, hep for hepatitis C who? So it's going to be usually your baby boomers, right? So patients who had blood transfusions before 1992 and IV drug abusers should be screened for hepatitis C. So in general, right, for our hepatitis, for acute viral hepatitis, now... The type of virus, whether they have A, B, C, D, or E, is going to depend on the history of the patient. Did they travel or not? Are they sexually active and do not use any type of protection? Um, are they coming from an endemic area, right? Uh, are they IV, IV drug abusers? Do they receive any type of blood transfusion, right? Before what year? 1992. Um, and how are they going to present? They're going to have the constitutional symptoms. Nausea, vomiting, anorexia, jaundice. They'll have a low-grade fever and... Usually this is very commonly found usually with your A and E and sometimes like your B, right? Your low-grade fever. They're going to have that dark urine and clay-colored stools. Why? 
because the liver is the one that's going to be infected. So bilirubin is the one that's responsible for giving your stool your brown color. And since it's not occurring, then because the liver is just not working, that's when you get those clay colored stools. Um, also, this patient's going to be presenting with right upper quadrant pain, right? Because we think about the anatomy located in the right upper quadrant area where the liver is. With tenderness to palpation and hepatomegaly, they'll have splenomegaly and cervical lymphadenopathy. On labs, you're going to see elevated ALT and AST. Usually, ALTs are going to be higher than AST. How I think about this is that L and ALT is liver, right? That's how I think about it. ALT is going to be higher than AST, elevated bilirubin. Elevated PT, so your prothrombin time is going to be elevated because remember we discussed in cirrhosis, the liver is really responsible for creating um, your, um, for it's responsible for your, for decreasing your coagulopathies, right? Elevated globulins and your confirmatory, te confirmatory test is usually going to do, going to be done with these four serolo serologic tests. So it's going to be your hepatitis B surface antigen, right? We said that's usually going to be the first one that's going to pop up. Why? Because it's on the surface, right? IgM to ant IgM to antibody to hepatitis A, a V virus, IgM to um, antibody to hepatitis B, and then antibody to hepatitis C virus. So treatment, usually we want to make sure that we tell these patients to avoid any type of hepatotoxic medications, right? Usually these patients will get better by themselves. Um, especially in your hepatitis A and E, and sometimes even in your hepatitis B. And usually antiviral therapy is recommended for severe hepatitis B, and it's usually dependent on the severity of the infection and the patient's immunity status. Uh, we can also do antiviral regimen for hepatitis C. That usually includes things like sofosbuvir, which is an approved NS5A inhibitor, usually for eight weeks. And what if the patient has fulminant hepatitis? So they've developed already like acute hepatic failure. This is usually a complication of hepatitis B, D, and E, but can also occur in hepatitis A, especially in your patients that are like immunocompromised, right? Or if they're like older. And what is fulminant hepatitis? So this is usually defined as a rapid liver failure plus hepatic encephalopathy, often associated with coagulopathy. So acute is going to be within eight weeks after onset of liver injury and a patient that was healthy prior to the onset of symptoms. And some of the causes of fulminant hepatitis is going to be things like your acetaminophen overuse or overdose. It's actually the most common cause. Other causes are going to be dry, drug reactions, like some of your medications for tuberculosis, like rifampin, isoniazide, perzinamide, some, some of your antiepileptics and some of your antibiotics. Um, viral hepatitis, liver ischemia, things like Rye syndrome, right? That's why we don't give aspirin to children. Uh, Bud Chiari syndrome, autoimmune hepatitis, fatty liver associated with pregnancy and mushroom poisoning. And usually what happens is that the patient starts having a shrink, a very small liver, so their liver starts to shrink. They'll have increased bilirubin levels. They start going up like super duper quick. They have a marked prolongation of the prothrombin time. They have clinical signs of confusion, disorientation, somnolence, ascites, and edema. They can also present with encephalopathy, coagulopathy, hepatomegaly, and jaundice, and this has a very high mortality rate. How do we diagnose this? We're going to do an ammonia level, which is going to be elevated. They're going to have an elevated PT and INR, elevated LFTs, and they're going to be hypoglycemic. Treatment is usually supportive. Right, we can give them oral lactulase for what? For that encephalopathy. Prophylactic, prophylactic antibiotics, we can also give to decrease the bacteria. Um, and we can also give it antiretroviral therapy if it's due to like one of our hepatitis, something like ribavirin also. But usually the definitive treatment is going to be our liver transplant. All right, guys. So... Now that we're done with that, I wanted to go into jaundice. So let's go into jaundice. So jaundice. There's different causes of jaundice. We have pre-hepatic jaundice, right? Intrahepatic jaundice and then post-hepatic jaundice and then extrahepatic jaundice. So it just depends what is causing the jaundice, right? So when we think about jaundice, we think about that yellow, right? 
um, coloration of the skin. We see, we think about like the sclera being just like yellow. Um, so jaundice. For prehepatic jaundice, some of the differential diagnosis that we want to think about and some of the, the cause of prehepatic jaundice is that it usually comes from breakdown of red blood, cell, red blood cells, so some type of hemolytic anemia where the blood, red blood cells are just breaking up and they're releasing all this blue ribbon, right? Or ineffective erythropoiesis. So you have unconjugated indirect blue ribbon in these patients. So remember when we think about unconjugated and conjugated blue ribbon, is that the liver is responsible for conjugating that blue ribbon. So anything that comes before it gets to the liver that occurs before is going to be unconjugated. Once it's gone through the liver and after it's gone to the liver, through the liver, it's going to be conjugated, right? Because the liver is going to conjugate that bilirubin. And that's another way that we can diagnose whether it's prehepatic, intrahepatic, or posthepatic. So prehepatic, that's going to be before it comes to the liver, right? And with these patients, the common causes are going to be, like I said, breakdown of red blood cells. So red blood cells that are just humalizing and they're releasing all that bilirubin. So some of the causes are going to be, you're going to have unconjugated uh, bilirubin, hemolysis, hereditary spherocytosis, G6PD deficiency, right? Um, hematomas also. Now, some of the causes of conjugate direct bilirubin that we're thinking about prehepatic jaundice, alcoholism, infectious hepatitis, drug, drug reactions, autoimmune disorder. So that's going to be prehepatic, right? Now, what about intrahepatic jaundice? So that's something that's going on within the liver. So liver is just not working. It's something that's attacking the liver. So we're thinking about intrahepatic jaundice. What if we have unconjugated bilirubin? So unconjugated bilirubin, we're thinking about Gilbert syndrome or Gilbert, Gilbert syndrome, right? If it's conjugated, which is usually our direct bilirubin, we're thinking about hepatocellular disease, hepatitis, chronic, al chronic alcohol use, autoimmune disorders, drugs like oral contraceptives, Tylenol, Tylenol, Thorazine, steroids, right? Pregnancy, uh, nutrition, parenteral nutrition, sarcoidosis, PBC, primary biliary cirrhosis, PSC, primary sclerosis and cholangitis. What about it's, if it's post-hepatic? So it's already gone through the, the liver. Now it just needs to keep going down. So with these cases for conjugated, which is the most common one, right? Because the liver is working right. It's conjugating that bilirubin. We're thinking about cholelithiasis. That's actually going to be the most common cause so gallstones, right, that are just obstructing somewhere in the bile duct um, that is just obstructing and it's causing this jaundice. Cholecystitis or cholangitis, pancreatitis, and a malignancy. Now, the differential diagnosis for extrahepatic jaundice is usually going to be um, conjugated. If it's intrinsic to the ductal system, we think about gallstones, surgical strictures, infections like CMV or cryptosporidium cholangiocarcinoma, and intrahepatic malignancy. If it's extrinsic to the ductal system, right, it's um, outside that duct, we want to think about pancreatitis, extrahepatic malignancies like pancreas and lymphoma. You know, that was a mouthful. Just make sure you know prehepatic before you get to the liver, intrahepatic within the liver, and posthepatic. Right, we think about unconjugated, prehepatic, red blood cells just bursting everywhere. They're releasing that bilirubin that is just so much that the liver just cannot keep up with it. So you're having this increased amount of unconjugated bilirubin, right? If it's conjugated bilirubin for prehepatic, we're thinking about alcohol, right? Drug reactions, autoimmune disorder, versus if it's happening within the liver, we're thinking about maybe some type of possibly damage to the liver, right? Drugs, hepatocellular disease like hepatitis, especially for a conjugated. And then post-hepatic, the liver's working fine, right? but now there's some type of obstruction going on. All right, guys, so in general, jaundice, it refers to the yellowish discoloration of the skin, sclera, and mucous membranes. It refers to deposition of bilirubin to the tissues, and it indicates that the serum bilirubin is likely three milligrams per deciliter or higher. So with these patients, right, how are we gonna diagnose them? We're gonna do a urinary bilirubin. It's gonna tell us whether it's conjugated or not, we can do a CBC, LFT, GGT, alkaline phosphatase, or hepatitis panel. That's going to help us narrow it, whether it's a prehepatic, intrahepatic, or posthepatic. Abdominal ultrasound, usually also what we're going to do is usually preferred over a CT scan. But the definitive one's going to be uh, your liver biopsy. And then the treatments usually, of course, want to treat whatever is the 
underlying cause for these patients. All right, guys, so the next one's going to be H. pylori. I know I discussed this like very briefly, but remember that we said that H. pylori is just the cause of so many things. It's like the culprit of everything. GERD, gastritis, peptic ulcer disease, H. pylori, helicobacter pylori. So this is a bacteria. It was something that just actually got discovered like years back. So it's pretty interesting. It's a pretty new discovery. Um, it's a bacteria that likes to live in the stomach and like the acidic very acidic uh, bacteria. It's a curved gram-negative rod. And what it does is that it synthesizes ureas, which produces ammonia that damages that gastric mucosa. So remember for this one, treatment for these patients is usually going to be with omeprazole, clarithromycin, and amoxicillin. So remember that triple therapy or the quadruple therapy that we discussed earlier. All right, guys, so that is it. We are done with GI. I know it was a, a lot of information, but I think we got through it. As always, if I'm any mistakes, just let me know. So let's go on to the next topic or the next organ system. So our next one that we're going to go over, body system is going to be H-E-N-T. So head, ears, H-E-N-T, head, ears, eyes, nose, and throat. So let's start with our acute sinusitis and chronic sinusitis. Um, just in general for a sinusitis, they often occur with concurrent rhinitis or they tend to follow an upper respiratory infection and dental infections. Usually an upper respiratory infection will lead to edema, which blocks drainage of the sinuses, it causes fluid buildup, and it causes bacterial colonization. Um, fever, these patients are present with fever, nasal drainage, congestion, facial pain impression, especially over the, the maxillary sinuses, right? They're going to be presenting with headache, upper uh, molar tooth pain. Sometimes these patients feel like they have a toothache, but they don't. Halitosis um, symptoms are usually going to present with for more than 10 days. So in order of frequency, right, the maxillary is going to be the most common area. They're going to have pain. The ethmoidal is going to be the next one, frontal, and then sphenoid. So if the patient has acute symptoms, they're going to be presenting with symptoms that are going to be going on for more than 10 days. They're going to have pain and pressure over the sinus, discolored, um, purulent nasal discharge or sputum, fever, malaise, headache, nasal congestion. And like I said, maxillary is going to be the most common one. So they're going to have cheek or pain pressure that radiates to the upper incisors, right? Um, and real quick for these patients, some of the etiologies for your acute sinusitis is that it's due to impaired mucociliary clearance and obstruction of the osteomyoidal complex. Usually these patients have an accumulation of mucus secretions and edema. And usually the symptoms last, last for less than four weeks. And like we said, maxillary is going to be the most common one. And usually the most common cause for sinusitis, like we said, for bronchitis is going to be viral, right? So viral, your viruses like rhinoviruses, parainfluenza, influenza and RSV. When we're thinking about bacterial causes, which are not as common like your viral causes, we're thinking about streptococcus pneumonia, Haemophilus influenza, and mycoplasma um, and M. cateralis, right? Sorry, Marxella cateralis. And fungal causes are also causes of sinusitis, so things like um, rhizopus, mucor, aspergillus, especially in your patients that are immunocompromised, right? Your diabetics, you want to think about these things. And the thing about fungal infections is that they invade the sinuses and they can also enter the central nervous system. And mucormycosis can also be associated with black escar on the palate and face. So that's also something to keep in mind and also very commonly found in your diabetics. So subacute, we said, we said acute, right, is usually going to be... Um, Patients are going to be presenting with symptoms lasting for more than 10 days. Subacute is usually going to be 4 to 12 weeks. And then chronic is going to be more than 12 weeks. And whenever we're thinking about chronic sinusitis, we want to think about bacterial causes, right? Staph aureus, anaerobes, haemophilus influenza, fungal infections, and also if the patient has any type of foreign body, right? So how are we going to diagnose these patients? Usually the test of choice is going to be a CT scan, right? Treatment is going to be with oral decongestions like pseudofedrin, um, we can also do nasal decongestions like oxymetazolin, analgesics. But usually the first line is going to be um, for like antibiotics that if we think it's a bacterial cause, we're going to use something like augmentin. So 
amoxicillin clavulanic or doxycycline. So once again, right, since the most common cause is a viral cause, it's usually going to be symptomatic treatment because we don't want to throw antibiotics. Most common cause of sinusitis, it's going to be a viral. So we don't throw antibiotics unless, right, we suspect it's a bacterial cause, like it's been going on more than those um, 10 days. Then we think about a bacterial cause. And with these patients, we're going to do uh, augmentin, right? Some of the complications and the reasons why we treat and are so aggressive about treating bacterial sinusitis is that it can cause osteomyelitis, right? Cavernosis, sinus thrombosis, and orbital cellulitis. So think about this also whenever you're reading your question stem. If it's a patient that has a history of untreated sinusitis or they had sinusitis and they were treated for some reason, the bacteria still stayed there. And now they're presenting with orbital cellulitis, you know, culprit can be sinusitis, right? Now, if it's a fungal infection of sinusitis, then the treatment of choice is going to be IV amphotericin B. That's usually going to be first line. All right, guys, the next one's going to be allergic rhinitis. This is the most common type of overall of rhinitis. It's usually IgE mediated that causes mast cell histamine release. These patients are usually going to have inflammation of the nasal mucosa, very commonly found with your atopic disease. Remember that triad, right, that we discussed and these patients usually have a family history. They're also going to be presenting with symptoms that are usually associated with allergies, right? Those itchy, watery eyes, sneezing, nasal congestion, dry cough, nasal discharge. It's usually associated with your nasal polyps, and it tends to be worse usually in the morning. Um, these patients can also have, like, those symptoms of just allergies in general, right? The salute sign, which is the, the sign over their, like, that fold over their nose just because they're, they're going like this all the time whenever, um, since they're just itchy and they're having to blow their nose so much because of the allergies. They're going to have the allerg allergic shiners, right? Um, which is going to be like those under eyes, um, rhinorrhea, pal boggy bluish mucosa is usually something that's pathognomonic for allergic rhinitis. Discharge is usually going to be clear and watery versus something that's bacterial, right? It's usually bacterial. We think about like gross looking, like yellow, purulent, green color. Um, with your allergic rhinitis, these patients can have hypertrophic mucosa, they'll have polyps with um, mucosa of the conjunctiva. And <clears throat> labs for these patients, we're going to see eosinophils in the nasal smear. Um, this is usually a treatment just done by uh, clinical diagnosis, so we really don't have to do anything diagnostic for these patients. And with these patients, of course, what's going to be the treatment? We want to make sure that we tell them to avoid whatever, whatever allergy is causing it, right? Immunotherapy, we can do antihistamines, um, things like maybe our second generation H1 blockers. Why? Because these are non-sedating. They're not as sedative as our first generation. So when we think about our second generation, we think about loratadine, right, claritin. We can also think about fex fexofenadine, also known as your Allegra, cetirizine, also known as your Zyrtec. And then you have your first-generation medications like uh, diphenhydramine, hydroxazine. You can also do sym sympathomimetics, especially if these patients have, like, very marked nasal congestion, so things like ephedrine or pseudoephedrine. You can do topical steroids also if the patient has persistent symptoms, um, especially for allergic rhinitis, and if patients have, like, those nasal polyps, right? All right, guys, so the next one's going to be our aptus ulcers. So aptus ulcers are these like painful ulcerations that usually occur like around the oral area, right? The patient's going to be presenting a burning, tingling, sensing of oral mucosa that happens two to 48 hours prior. It's usually worsened by moving, like just movement, not moving their tongue. I, I bet everyone has had these. I've had these multiple times of uh, foods, drinks. Um, it usually progresses to form a red spot or bump, and it's usually followed by an op open ulcer that's very, very painful. It's usually a round or ovoid ulceration generally that's less than 10 mil millimeters, and it's usually covered with a grayish-white pseudomembrane that's surrounded by an erythematous halo. It's usually found on the buccal mucosa, um, lip, tongue. It can be single or it can be multiple. It tends to get better by 7 to 10 days, but they can recur, especially if a patient has Bechet disease, right? The cause is unknown, but usually trauma is going to be the most common trigger, right? 
Sometimes it can be associated with herpes simplex virus. Treatment is usually going to be topical, so something like with your analgesics, anesthetic agents, antiseptics, anti-inflammatory agents also, things like uh, silver nitrate. You can also do topical oral steroids, and you can also do some metadine also if a patient has like recurrent ulcers. The next one's going to be blepharitis. This is going to be irritation, burning, pain, or itching sensation. The patient's going to have an eye discharge or crust along the eyelashes. That's usually how it's described. You're going to have erythema of the eyelid margins. They might have eyelash loss also. They're going to have the scaling red rimming of the eyelid and eyelash flaking. They may or may not present with like an entropion or ectropion, especially with if they have like posterior blepharitis. So usually the inflammation is going to start on the eyelid. And then these patients can have also eyelash last. So it's usually going to involve those eyelashes, right? So on exam, we just want to make sure that we're examining the head for possibly like seborrhea, right? For seborrheic dermatitis, um, for Laos infection or rosacea. Make sure that we're examining those eyelid margins. And on exam, you're going to see if it's anterior blepharitis, you're going to see this red rimmed. Um, you're going to see scales or granulation that is clinging to the lashes. If it's posterior, we're going to see lead margins that are hyperemic with telangiectasias. We're, we're going to see those inflamed meobian glands or orifices. And <clears throat> a thing that we need to know is that usually if it's inflammation of both, both eyelids, this is very commonly found in your patients have Down syndrome, um, eczema. And some of the infections that we want to think about is that staphylococcus is very commonly found in your anterior blepharitis um, versus your posterior blepharitis. Some of the common causes of this is usually going to be a dysfunction of the meiobian gland. Do we like to test this? So just make sure that you know that. So posterior is usually due to dysfunction of the meiobian gland. And treatment for this is just going to be supported, right? Those lid scrubs like baby shampoo, warm compresses. Um, antibiotics, you can also do like oral tetracycline or topical erythromycin or bacitracin. If it's anterior, right, eyelid, hy eyelid hygiene like we discussed. If it's posterior, eyelid hygiene. And you can also do regular massage or expression of the myobian gland, right, because it said that's the most common cause of your posterior blepharitis. So the next one's going to be our coleocytoma. This is going to be a mass of keratinizing squamous epithelium and cholesterol that's found in the middle ear. It's usually caused by chronic otitis media. It's very commonly due, most commonly due to chronic eustachian tube dysfunction, chronic, chronic negative pressure that inverts part of the tympanic membrane. It causes granulation tissue that erodes ossicles over time, and then it leads to conductive hearing loss. How is this patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with painless arteria, right? That discharge from the ear. It's usually going to be a brown or yellow discharge with a strong odor. They may or may not present with development of vertigo and dizziness. And usually if they do present with vertigo, it's usually going to be a peripheral vertigo, right? Um, they're going to have that conductive hearing loss that whenever you do that Weber and Renee test, on the Weber test, you're going to see lateralization to the effective ear. And on the Renee test, you're going to see bone condition that's more, that's greater than air conduction. And the thing about cholecytoma is that this one can erode into the inner ear and it can cause facial nerve. Um, it can damage the facial nerve and sometimes also it can damage the, it can spread intracranially. So treatment for cholecytoma is usually going to be surgical marsupialization of the sac or its complete removal, right? So let's go into conjunctivitis. So we have different types. We have bacterial, allergic, and we have viral. So it's really important that you know how to differentiate these and how to treat these, right? So viral cold compresses, usually with bacterial, it's usually your warm compresses, right? I always confuse those. So just make sure that you know which one's cold, which one's warm. So let's start with allergic conjunctivitis. This patient's going to be presenting with severe itching, which makes sense, right? Because you're releasing all that histamine, those mast cells. It's usually caused by wind, dry eye, smoke, hay fever, allergies, dander, and it's usually going to be bilateral. Versus bacterial, right, it's usually going to be um, unilateral. And viral usually starts unilateral and then can spread bilateral. With allergic conjunctivitis, conjunctivitis it's always going to be bilateral. And this patient's going to present with other symptoms of allergies like rhinorrhea, right? And the predominant physical exam finding is going to be that itchiness, right? It's very, very itchy. Um, they can have also 
Injected, injected conjunctiva, mucoid discharge, they'll have conjunctival or eyelid edema. It's really important that we look into these patients' turbinates because with allergies, remember that we discussed it's usually going to be pale and gray. We can see some nasal pops also, and this is going to help us to see whether it's viral or allergic, right? So with these patients, the treatment is just to avoid specific allergens, right? Whatever is causing it, just make sure that you avoid the culprit. You can also do topical vasoconstrictions like uh, bromodidine or antihistamines. You can also do topical cell mass stabilizers. So it's usually going to be the treatment for these patients. So what about bacterial conjunctivitis? So remember we said that's usually going to be unilateral. This patient is going to be presenting with a bright red perfused purulent discharge. It usually starts in one eye and then sometimes it can go to the second eye. Um, crossing is usually going to be something that the patient is going to be complaining of, especially they're going to be waking up right with that crossing in the eye, that eyelid that's shut, that they just cannot open it. Um, very common in your contacts, lens wearers. Um, the patient is going to feel like they have some type of foreign body sensation, but they will not have any photophobia or um, visual loss. They can present with mild pain also. On physical exam, you're going to see heavy mucopurulent discharge, right? It's really important also that we rule out STDs, especially like in your newborns. With, because with STDs, these patients can have corneal ulcerations and also uh, preauricular adenopathy. And just real quick to go into the STDs, since it's something that they really like to test, um, especially in your newborns, right? We think about chlamydia and then also we think about gonorrhea. So we think about when is one going to present, right? And that's usually the key on how you can differentiate between chlamydia and gonorrhea is depending how old the newborn is. So in a baby that is zero to five days, usually like old, and that's usually like the onset, you want to think about a nice year gonorrhea, right? And usually they're going to have very extensive inflammation of the eyelids and they're going to have corneal involvement. And it's really important that we treat these patients, right? Because they can have a complication of corneal rupture. Next one's going to be your chlamydia, right? So chlamydia trichomatis, the onset is usually five days to five weeks. These patients are usually going to present with minimal inflammation of the eyelid. They're going to have uh, very no to rare corneal involvement. And the complication of this one is going to be pneumonia, right? That um, staccato cough is very commonly associated in your newborns with um, chlamydial pneumonia. So going on to how are we going to treat these patients, right? And <clears throat> how are we going to treat them? So, well, just in general, right? What are the what are the common causes of this, of your bacterial conjunctivitis, aside from the STD that we just discussed? So streptococcus pneumonia is one of the most common causes of your bacterial conjunctivitis. There's other causes like staph aureus, haemophilus influenza. And then how are we gonna treat these patients or diagnose them? So we're gonna do usually a culture and gram stain of the eye. We're gonna do a fluorescent staining. This is usually gonna help us detect any type of corneal abrasion or keratitis to the eye. And treatment's usually going to be that warm compresses, right? So remember we said warm compresses for our bacteria versus cool compresses for our viral conjunctivitis. So bacteria is going to be our warm compresses. We can do antibiotics like trimethoprim and polymyxin. We can also do um, uh, old warm compresses. So what if it is like our newborns that we just discussed, right? Like if it's an STD related, then if it's gonorrhea, we want to make sure that um, we cover with IV ceftriaxone and topical erythromycin. If it's chlamydia, it's going to be oral tetracycline or doxycycline or azithromycin. Okay, so that is going to be it. And let let us go on to the next one, which is going to be our viral conjunctivitis. So in viral conjunctivitis, the patient's going to be presenting with profuse tearing copious watery discharge. It's very, very contagious, especially during the summer. You know, the swimming pools is gross, right? Um, the patient can start with one eye and then it's going to progress to the other eye. We want to think about also with viral conjunctivitis, like herpetic lesions, right? So make sure that we keep that in the back of our mind. And with these patients with viral conjunctivitis, they're going to be presenting with a discharge that's clear watery, palpable. They're going to have preauricular lymphadenopathy, right? Um, they're going to have this scanty mucoid discharge that's 
and usually it's going to be often bilateral, right? It's going to involve usually both eyes. It can start in one eye and then go to the next one. It's often bilateral versus bacterial, right? It's usually unilateral. It can go to the second eye, but it's usually unilateral. This patient can also have punctate staining on the slit lamp examination. And usually, you know, this is usually very commonly found during your midsummer to early fall, right? Those swimming pools. Um, and usually the most common cause is going to be adenovirus. It's very highly contagious and it's usually transmitted by direct contact. Swimming pool are usually the most common sources. And usually this is associated with other like upper respiratory infection, like symptoms like your sore throat, fever, malaise. And like I said, it starts unilateral, but it can become bilateral in between three to five days. This patient's getting presenting with copious watery discharge, erythema, preauricular lymphadenopathy, like we said. And treatment's going to be your cool compresses, right? You can also do artificial tears. You can do vasoconstrictors and antihistamines, especially if the patient has like very severe itching. But usually it's going to be those cool compresses for these patients. So it's really important that you differentiate between allergic, right, bacterial, and then your viral causes. So we said viral is usually unilateral. It can be bilateral. Bacterial is usually bacterial. It's usually going to be that copious discharge, right? Especially when you think about those STDs. Um, allergic, it's usually going to be very, very, very itching. It's usually going to be usually bilateral. We want to make sure that we check the nasal mucosa to differentiate from viral. So the next one's going to be corneal abrasions. So corneal abrasions, this patient's going to be presenting with pain, tearing, photophobia. They feel like they have this foreign body sensation in their eye, this gritty feeling, blurred vision, headache. And it's usually due because they have some due to some type of trauma um, to their eye or even contact lens wear. It's very commonly found in those individuals. How are you going to diagnose these patients? The first thing we want to do is we want to test their visual acuity. Make sure that you know that's very commonly tested. First thing we want to do is test their visual acuity. We can do a fluorescent staining also to evaluate epithelial defect in cornea. And usually um, what happens, this is usually caused by foreign bodies, right? Um, injury, like your welders, right? Some, they're welding something, something goes into their eye. Um, contact lenses, fingernails, right? Especially like your babies, they like just like scratch their eyes, like super hardcore. Uh, pieces of paper. Um, and usually for these patients, the treatment, right? We can do something like bacitracin, polymix, and ophthalmic ointment. Um, we can do mydriatics like cyclopentylate and then analgesics, either topical or oral um, NSAIDs also. Usually these corneal abrasions will heal, um, but it's interesting because if they're a smoker, it's going to heal a lot slower. So that was, I thought that was very interesting. Okay, guys, so the next one's going to be our corneal ulcers. So corneal ulcers, what happens is that they have some type of corneal stromal infiltrate, right? And these patients are usually going to be presenting with pain, corneal, uh, foreign body sensation, white spot on cornea, tearing photophobia. And the thing about this is that in your patients that are like immunocompromised, like your HIV patients, uh, your diabetics, your contact lens wear, lens, or lens wear that are not that, you know, immunocompromised, but we want to make sure that we look for um, corneal ulcers in these patients if they're complaining of that foreign body sensation. So on exam, we're going to see that corneal stromal infiltrates with conjunctival hyperemia and chemosis, fluorescent uptake. They're going to have this greenish mucopurulent exudate and ground glass edema around the ulcer. If they have that, we were thinking about pseudomonas, right? The first thing we want to do in these patients, we want to check for visual acuity. We can also do a red eye or fluorescent stain. Um, this is usually most commonly due to bacteria, viruses, fungi, or amoebas. And just in general, any patient that presents with an acute painful red eye and corneal abnormality, we want to make sure that we refer them emergently to an ophthalmologist. Op ophthalmologist. So what's going to be the treatment for these patients? It's usually going to be cyclopegics, right? We want to make sure that we delay the pupil and relieve the pain. We can do topical antibiotics like erythromycin. If we want to cover for pseudomonas, especially in those patients that are contact lens wearers, we can do something like tropomycin or fluoroquinolones. Okay, guys, so let's go into our next one, which is going to be dacroadenitis. So dacroadenitis is just severe pain and swelling over the temporal aspect of the eye. So make sure that you don't 
confuse decoronitis with decorocystitis, okay? So decoronitis, severe pain, swelling over the temporal aspect of the eye. So with decoronitis, um, usually it's very rare. Um, these patients usually have like unilateral severe pain, redness, and pressure. Like we said, it's usually going to be in the supratemporal region. And that's how I memorize it, right? A, right, starts at the beginning of the alphabet. So it's going to be above. Um, it's going to be in the supratemporal region versus decrocystitis, right? C, it's like A, B, C. It goes, goes after the A. So I'm thinking about this one more in like the the lower region, right? So with decrocystitis, right, it's usually going to be in the intramedial region. So with decoretinitis, um, with these patients, the treatment is usually depending on what the cause is, right? If it is viral, which is the most common cause, usually it's going to be supportive measures like warm compresses, right? We can also give them oral NSAIDs. If it's bacterial, then we can do something like broad spectrum antibiotics like cephalosporins, right? So Dacrocystitis, this is usually a pain or swelling, tenderness, redness in the tear sac area. Usually it's going to be unilateral. This patient can present with purulent discharge, and they're going to be presenting with uh, tearing, tenderness, edema, and redness to the medial canthal, so the nasal side of the lower lid, and they can also present with purulence, so with or without purulence. Okay? And with uh, dacrocystitis, you usually have acute or chronic. So if it's acute, you have an acute inflammation of a lid, you usually have erythema, edema, thickening, hyperkeratinization, notching, you have irregularities of the lid margin. If it's chronic, then you usually have lash loss, uh, trichiasis, which is misdirection of the lashes. You have tylosis, which is thickening and distortion of the lid margin. You can have, also have um, loss of lash pigmentation, punctal misdirection, and then also scarring. So in general, for our decrocystitis, right, you're going to have obstruction of and infection of the lacrimal sac. It's usually obstruction of the nasal lacrimal system. Some of the causes of acute decrocystitis is going to be staph aureus, right, beta hemolytic strep, haemophilus influenza, streptococcus pneumonia, very commonly found in your infants and then in adults that are older than 40 years old. And treatment for this is usually going to be lid hygiene. We can do antibiotics like topical bacitracin and erythromycin or systemic like oral tetracycline. Um, for acute, right, you want to think about antibiotics. Um, with chronic, we can do something like dacrocystorhinostomy. Sorry, dacrocystorhinostomy. Sorry, that was like a mouthful. So once again, the location, right, dacrodenitis is going to be inflammatory enlargement of the lacrimal gland. Dacrocystitis is going to be infectious obstruction of the nasal, nasal lacrimal duct, right? Supratemporal region for the dacroadenitis, right? We said A, beginning of the alphabet, it's going to be above. Versus intramedial region is going to be your dacrocystitis, right? Intramedial near the nasal area. All right, so next one's going to be your ectropian. So ectropian. So what happens with ectropion is that you have a rolling outward of the margin of part of the eyelid. It's usually due to relaxation of the orbicularis oculine muscle. So you have ectropion and entropion. So ectropion, right, it's going to be outer. Entropion is going to be inner. So ectropion, this patient is going to be presenting with tearing, irritation, sagging, and eversion of the lid. Ocular dryness, they're going to have very in, uh, increased sensitivity. Some of the causes of this is just the patient is old, right? So age, trauma, infection, or just even palsy of the facial nerve. But this is very commonly found in your patients that are elderly, right? And <clears throat> with these patients, the treatment is usually we give them lubricating eye drops for symptomatic relief. We can do surgery, especially if they have excessive tearing or if they have um, exposure keratitis, but usually lubricating eye drops is going to be the treatment for these patients. And then we have entropion, right? It's going to be the inversion or infolding or turning inward of part of the eyelid or margin. This can be because of spasms of the orbicularis oculi muscle. So what happens at the eyelashes, since they're turned inward, they start impending on the cornea and they can cause ulcerations. So it's the turning inward of that lower eyelid. This can also cause corneal abrasions, 
um, due to foreign body insult from the lashes, erythema, tearing, and increased sensitivity. Once again, this is most commonly found in your elderly patients. Treatment is usually, once again, lubricating eye drops for symptomatic relief. You can also do botulinum toxin for temporary correction, but usually surgery is going to be the one that's going to be last line, um, your definitive treatment for these patients. And then last line, right? So the next one we're going to go into is epistaxis. It's really important that you know the difference between your anterior and your posterior epistaxis, right? So for anterior epistaxis, and you also need to know like what are some of the causes and was, what is the anatomy? So what vessels are involved? So let's start with anterior epistaxis. Some of the most common causes of anterior epistaxis is going to be, right, that infection, trauma, like that nose picking, so those children that are using nose picking, um, blowing their nose forcefully, cocaine, hypertension, allergic rhinitis, atrophic rhinitis, coagulopathy, tumors, uh, low humidity, also in like very hot environments because what happens is that it dries that nasal mucosa, alcoholism, and what is the anatomy? Where do these originate from? So these are usually going to originate from the kiesel back plexus and are usually unilateral in these patients. On physical exam, we're going to see blood loss through one or both nostrils. We'll see bleeding that can directly be visualized. And we want to make sure that we're focusing on localizing the site that's causing the bleeding. The patient's usually going to be seated with their head forward to avoid blood flowing to the posterior pharynx. That's something that I thought was really interesting because, you know, as children, um, we were usually taught to put their head back, right? As a child, it was like, if you're bleeding, but no, it makes it worse. You actually want to tell the patient to go forward and apply pressure. And what happens is that usually, like I said, um, this usually happens because you have some type of di trauma, like digital trauma, like those kids or even hypertension, right? And of both the epistaxis, anterior epistaxis is going to be the most common one. So management for these patients, right? These are going to be the steps that we're going to do, okay? It's really important that you know these steps because this is something that's very highly tested that will usually say you did step one, it didn't work, what's the next step? Step two, didn't work, what's the next step, etc. So step one is going to be direct pressure and ice packs continuously for 15 minutes. So we're going to do direct pressure, right? Head down, direct pressure for 15 minutes. We're going to tell the patient to sit and lean forward. Second step is going to be a nasal decongestion for vasoconstriction, something like phenylephrine, oxymetazolin, uh, like uh, nasal afrin, cocaine. And then uh, the third thing we're going to do, say we've tried step one and two, we're going to do cauterization with silver nitrate. Okay. And also that's if we can only see the bleeding site. I saw, I did an ENT rotation and it was really interesting because I saw my preceptor do this. He put on his like fancy stuff and we had a patient that had like really bad uncontrolled hypertension and she was coming in for like this bleeding. And so she came in, he went in there and he just cauterizes. It was really interesting. Uh, next one. So say you've done cauterization, right? We told the patient to lean forward, apply pressure, didn't work. We did the nasal decongestions and then we did the cauterization. It's still not working. Then we're going to do the nasal packing for 24 hours if direct pressure and vasoconstrictors are unsuccessful or in severe bleeding. We can also consider an antibiotic, like cephalix or clindamycin, just to prevent toxic shock syndrome, right? Because we're having something stu uh, stuffed up there. And then the packing is usually going to be petroleum packing. So once again, right, anterior, like just um, what does it involve? It involves the kiesel black plexus, right? And it's usually unilateral. So posterior epistaxis is going to be the next one for these patients. So posterior epistaxis is usually similar to anterior epistaxis, very commonly found in your elderly patients, right? These patients are going to present with or have a history of arteriosclerosis and hypertension, and these are actually the most common risk factors for your posterior epistaxis. And posterior epistaxis, and compared to anterior epistaxis, is more severe. It's more bad. So these patients are going to have profuse bleeding, hematemesis, hemoptysis, and anatomy-wise, what does it involve? It involves a Woodruff's plexus, right? So just for repetition, Kesselblex plexus is going to be your um, anterior epistaxis, and your posterior is going to be your Woodruff's plexus or your and your palatine artery. Okay. So this patient, what are you going to see on physical exam? You're going to see large volumes of blood in the oropharynx, right? So in the back of the throat. 
and you won't be able to visualize an anterior source of bleeding. So you've done like all this packing, this patient's still bleeding, we're thinking about maybe a posterior bleed. So with these patients, bleeding tends to occur from both nares versus like usually when we think about our anterior, it's usually from one nare, right? Because they're like digital causing trauma to that area. And clinical features for these patients basically will, I'm sorry, how are we going to treat these patients? If it's posterior, we're going to do a sponge pack, right? Balloon tamponade. And it's really important that we also admit these patients because we want to make sure that we monitor them and stabilize them. Okay, so let's go into glaucoma, which is going to be our next one. So with glaucoma, what you need to know is that there's two types, right? So you have op open and closed angle glaucoma. You need to know which one's going to uh, present more acutely and which one's more chronically, okay? Or going to present more chronically. So let's go into describing each one. So let's start with open angle. So with open angle glaucoma, how is the patient going to present? It's going to be usually asymptomatic, right? It's going to be early. Usually the patient's going to be presenting with gradual peripheral vision loss. And that's how it's going to help you differentiate between the different types of vision problems like macular degeneration, etc. Is where is the vision loss occurring? So in open angle, it's going to be that peripheral vision loss, that, that tunnel vision that the patient's going to have. Uh, they're going to have halos also. They're going to see halos around lights, and that's going to be for open angle. Now, closed angle, this one is the one that's like sudden, right? And it's onset. So it's a sudden onset of eye pain. That's the one that you're going to be reading, that it's a patient that they're watching a movie and all of a sudden they had like this vision loss and this eye pain. So it's going to be the sudden onset of eye pain, headache, blurred vision, vision loss, and they may also see halos. Also, another thing that I've seen on question some is that they say that they have excessive watering of the eye. So that's also something else just to keep in mind. And then there's also congenital glaucoma uh, with these patients. So make sure that we are able to differentiate with congenital. This patient's going to have photophobia, blepharospasm, and epiphoria. So epiphoria is that excessive watering of the eye. So again, so make sure that you're able to differentiate between open, right, closed, and congenital. So we said open is usually that gradual peripheral vision loss versus closed angle, it's that sudden onset, right, of eye pain vision loss, so it's sudden. So what are you going to see on physical exam findings for each one? So just to go a little bit more, right, so open angle, you're going to see increased intraocular pressure, you're going to see defects in the peripheral vision, and they're going to have an increased cupped to disc ratio versus your closed angle glaucoma, you're going to see a steamy cornea. Sometimes it says that the, that the pupil is fixed. It's mid-dilated, so it'll be a fixed mid-dilated pupil for a closed angle. And they're going to have decreased visual acuity also. So what is kind of like the cause or the patho of glaucoma? So let's get into this because it's something that they really like to test also. So glaucoma in general is just due to an increased intraocular pressure that causes optic nerve damage and loss of vision. So the difference between each one with closure, right, open angle closure and close open angle and closed angle is that usually with primary angle closure, there's a narrow anterior chamber angle. So that's why this one's an emergency. That's why this patient's presenting with those acute some symptoms, right, that graduate onset of vision loss versus your open angle usually this patient's going to have a normal anterior chamber angle with these patients another thing that's really important is just screening so when do we screen for glaucoma so in patients that are between the ages of 20 to 29 we want to make sure that we at least screen them once during this period and patients that have risk factors right we want to make sure that we screen them every three to five years now patient between the ages of 30 to 39 Usually these patients get screened at least twice, and patients that have risk factors, then you screen them every four, two to four years. Patients that are between the age of 40 to 64, you're going to screen them every two to four years. And then pages, patients that are 65 and older, you're going to screen them every one to two years. So what are those risk factors? So those risk factors are if they are of African descent and if they have a positive family history for glaucoma. 
So let's get into a little bit more detail, right? So how are we going to treat these ones? How are we going to diagnose them? So for acute glaucoma, it's going to be that extreme pain, blurred, cloudy vision, halos around the lights. They're going to be presenting with nausea, vomiting. They're going to have that unilateral headache. And on physical exam, right, we're going to see that eye is red, the cornea is steamy, those pupils are going to be dilated, and they're going to be non-reactive to light. So you're going to do the exam with the lights, and they're going to be non-reactive. Uh, you're going to see that prominent ciliary flush. And usually for your narrow anterior chamber, the globe is going to be really, really hard. It's really important that we also check the visual fields for these patients. And the way to diagnose these patients, we do a tonometry, right? And we're going to see that they have an elevated intraocular pressure. So usually, now I know some textbooks tend to change, but according to the textbook that I'm getting the notes from, it's going to be normal intraocular pressures between 10 to 22 millimeters of mercury, right? Versus like anything that's increased, it's going to be greater than 20. So once again, normal is 10 to 22. Increase is going to be greater than 22, or I know some other textbooks say greater than 20. So <laughs> this one with acute glaucoma, commonly found in your patients that are older, right? There's usually triggers like pupillary dilation, pharmacological mydriasis, certain medications like your anticholinergic medications that can um, trigger acute glaucoma. And this is an ocular emergency. Like these patients need to be treated ASAP because they can lose their vision. They become blind. So this is an ocular emergency. So what's going to be the treatment for these patients? Of course, we want to refer them to an ophthalmologist, but the first thing we're going to do is we're going to give them IV azetosolamide. So this is going to help decrease that pressure. And once the pressure starts, then we can do something like a topical pilocarpine, like 2%. So once again, IV azetosolamide, right? We want to decrease that pressure and then once the pressure starts to drop, we can do topical pilocarpine. A secondary treatment is you can do systemic acetazolamide, right? And then also laser trabeculoplasty is something that we can do for these patients. So let's go into primary open angle glaucoma. So this is going to be that gradual loss, like we discussed, of peripheral vision over a period of years. So it's not as acute as your closed angle. This one's just going to be gradual. Usually these patients are going to have that tunnel vision that we discussed. So usually these patients on exam, they're asymptomatic sometimes. Um, so they don't always present with symptoms. They're, you're going to see slight cupping of the optic disc on your exam. Uh, they'll have elevated intraocular pressure. And usually the cause of this is because there's abnormal drainage of aqueous through the trabecular meshwork like we discussed, right? And it's very commonly seen in your patients that are older than 40, uh, patients that are African Americans, and then patients that have positive family history of glaucoma. And how do we treat these patients? So we're going to treat them with beta blockers like Timolor or bet Betaxel. So um, <clears throat> usually we treat these patients with these medications. We can also do prostaglandin analogs, and then we can also do carbonic anhydrase inhibitors like acetazolamide. And then usually the treatment, right, the definitive one is going to be your laser trabeculoplasty surgery. So let's go into congenital glaucoma. So with these patients, remember said we're, they're going to have that triad. It's going to be epiphora. So epiphora is going to be that excessive watering of the eye. Uh, they're going to have photophobia and then blepharospasm. So it's going to be those three, usually with these patients with congenital glaucoma. And usually the primary sign is going to be bupthalmus and corneal clouding. So bupthalmus and corneal clouding. And on exam, you'll see like these visible breaks in the decimates membrane. Um, these patients, if you haven't seen them, they look really scary with their eyes, um, congenital. They, it looks like the entire pupil is just like black, something that you would see in a horror movie. The entire eye is black. So that's going to be glaucoma. Once again, differentiate between your open and closed. They really like to test those, right? We said that open angle glaucoma is just something that's going to be more gradual. It's going to be that peripheral tunnel vision. And then versus your clothes, it's going to be more acute. The, the eye is going to be dilated. Um, and it's going to be very, very severe pain. It's these patients, it's really important that we treat them because they can lose their vision. So the next one's going to be hordulum. So hordulum. And I know when I was studying, I used to confuse these a lot, hordulum and chalazion. 
So we're going to go through each one, right? So how I memorize it is that Hordeolum has an HO, it's hot, so it's going to be painful. Versus a Shalazium, these are not painful. So these are usually like infections, right, um, that you'll see. So let's start with Hordeolum. This is usually a painful redness, swelling of an involved eyelid. Um, it's usually an infection of the eyelid glands. And usually the patient's going to have a painful nodule on the upper or lower eyelid. The thing about this one is it's that it's not contagious. And there's internal and external, right? If it's internal, it points towards the conjunct conjunctiva. It's external. Those are the ones that we know as styes, right? This one's always going to point towards the skin, and it's usually situated at the palpebral margin edge. And usually the most common cause of this is going to be a staph infection of the myobian gland. If it's an internal hordulum versus if it's an external one, then it usually involves the glands of Zeiss. So just make sure you're not. They really like to test that. And what's going to be the treatment? Usually the mainstay treatment is going to be your warm compresses, okay? So it's going to be just that warm compresses. You can do antibiotic ointment like erythromycin or bacitricin, but usually it's going to be those warm compresses for these patients. And say that this patient has done the warm compresses, who did the antibiotic treatment, and is still not going away, and they have no improvement in two days, then you may have to go there and do an IND. So... Uh, once again, right, hordulum, you have your internal and external. These are usually like your infection of the glands of the eyelids. So internal, it's going to involve what? The myobian gland versus external, which is known as your sty, that's going to involve the gland of Zeiss. And this one's going to be painful, right, red and tender. So what about your chalazion? So this is usually a sterile chronic inflammation that usually happens or results because there's a blocked myobian gland. This one... This one can sometimes develop from an internal hordulum, so an internal hordulum can develop into a chalazion. And with these, though, they're going to be hard and non-tender. So remember, we said hordulum, hot, right, painful, tender. Chalazion is not going to be tender whatsoever. All right, so the next one we're going to go into is going to be hyphema. So with hyphema, with these patients, um, usually what happens is that there's some type of hemorrhage in the anterior chamber. Um, it's very, patients that have sickle cell anemia are usually at high increased risk of getting um, hyphemas. And with these patients, also certain medications can cause hyphemas, like uh, aspirin and also your drugs that are inhibiting your coagulation, right? Because it, this increases the risk of secondary hemorrhage. And so what is a hyphema or how is the patient going to present? The patient's going to be presenting with pain photophobia, blurred visions, and it's usually going to be secondary to obstructing blood cells, right? Um, this patient can also present with nausea and vomiting, especially if they have um, increased ocular pressure signs. What are you going to see on exam? So <clears throat> you're going to make sure that on exam, you want to make sure that you check the intraocular pressure, right? Um, and what happens is that usually these traumatic forces, they tear the vessels and they cause bleeding into the aqueous humor and blood settling into the visible layer. So that's the one where you see kind of just like blood right over the eye, the entire eye. Treatment for this is usually going to make sure that we put the patient in a Fox shield, right? And place the patient at 45 degrees. This is going to help like the gravity, right? Help the red cells from um, staining or keep them from staining the cornea. It's really important that we avoid aspirin and NSAIDs in these patients. The next one's going to be labyrinthitis. So labyrinthitis. Now we're going to go into um, some of our <clears throat> ear and throat disorders. So labyrinthitis. Labyrinthitis is usually acute onset, right? This is usually a patient that's going to be presenting with your vertigo symptoms. It's really important that you know your vertigo, right? Um, so know how to differentiate routine, whether it's a peripheral cause or a central cause, okay? If you think about central, maybe stroke, like symptoms, right? Peripheral, more like your um, <clears throat> uh, Meniere's disease, right? Or labyrinthitis. So labyrinthitis, what is it? It's an acute onset of continuous, usually severe vertigo. And it's usually accompanied by hearing loss and tinnitus. So they're going to have that ringing in the ears, hearing loss, and also that vertigo, and it's going to be acute. And that's another way you can differentiate between these. Is it a gradual? Is it episodic, right? Or is it constant? And these, that vertigo that's coming. In these patients, it's going to be an acute onset, and it's going to be continuous, right? Continuous, severe vertigo. It's going to be accompanied by that hearing loss. It's going to be accompanied by that ring in the ears. 
and usually it follows an upper respiratory infection. So somewhere in the question stem, you have to see that the patient had a prior upper respiratory infection, and then they got better from this upper respiratory infection. So just make sure that you keep that in mind. Um, and that's how you can kind of differentiate from something like Meniere's, right? Meniere's, we think about like our older patients. So with these patients, once again, it's gonna be that acute onset. And what happens is that they have like this infection, the, the unilateral infection or inflammation of the vestibular system that is just causing that vertigo. And, <clears throat> and another thing with these patients, they're gonna have that rotational vertigo, right? They're gonna have nystagmus and they're gonna have those vestibular symptoms because this is usually gonna be due to peripheral vertigo, right? So they're gonna have that dizziness, gait disturbance, um, the nystagmus is going to be horizontal and rotary, right? So that means that it's going to go away from the affected side. And also, they're going to have a hearing loss like we discussed. Now, what's going to be the treatment? Usually, these, this will go away by itself, but you can give this patient like symptomatic treatment. So you can give them something like diazepam, meclizine, or diamond hydrant. But usually, the first line for these patients are going to be corticosteroids, Okay. And if they are still in symptomatic, then that's where we're going to consider things like meclizine and our benzodiazepines. But once again, first line is going to be your corticosteroids for labyrinthitis. So labyrinthitis, we said it's going to be acute onset. It's going to follow an upper respiratory infection. It's going to be saying somewhere in the question said that the patient suffered from an upper respiratory infection or some type of viral infection that we just recovered from it. And it's going to be acute onset. It's going to be vertigo. It's going to be the hearing loss, right? And then that vertigo is usually going to be continuous, hearing loss, and then tinnitus, so that ringing in the ears. Make sure that you look for that, okay? If the patient, for example, only has dizziness and doesn't have any other symptoms that we described, then you're thinking about something more like a vestibular neuritis. So this is where you can confuse all the other ones. So once again, this one has to have that the patient just recovered from an upper respiratory infection or some type of viral infection, they have to have that hearing loss, they have to have that ringing, and they have to have or tinnitus, that ringing in the ear, and they have to have that history of upper respiratory infection and that vertigo. If it's only like the dizziness symptoms, like the vertigo, and nothing else is there, like the ones that we just discussed, and you're thinking about vestibular neuritis. Okay, laryngitis. So with laryngitis, hoarseness is going to be the hall hallmark. Um, I had laryngitis like a few days ago when I was recording one of the YouTube videos because I recorded for like eight hours. So it was very, I was straining my voice a lot. So these patients are going to be complaining of dry cough. Uh, they might say that they feel like a tickle in their throat. They're going to have probable um, dysphonia, right? They have this constant urge to clear their throat. And they may present with symptoms of like fever, malaise, and cough, but um, usually it's going to be the symptoms that. I discussed. So usually that hoarseness is going to be the hallmark symptom. Some of these patients have a smoking history and usually the most common cause of laryngitis is usually infection or trauma. So those patients that are like singers, right? You went to a concert and you were like screaming your heart out. And then you, the next day you wake up and you have that hoarseness. You can't speak anymore. Uh, some of the causes though, if it is a viral infection, the most common viral infection is going to be your adenovirus, rhinovirus, influenza, RSV, and parainfluenza. And that's actually the most common cause, right? That one in trauma. You also have causes like bacterial, but not as common. And how is the patient going to present? So they're going to have that hot potato-like voice. Um, they're going to have a hoarseness like we discussed. The vo their voice is going to be strained. And they're going to have a phonia, so that's going to be an ability to produce voice sounds, so they won't be able to speak. Diagnosis for these patients, it's usually self-limiting, right? It tends to go away by itself. The patient's going to get better. You can tell them to make sure that they avoid the excessive use of their voice, including whispering. Um, make sure that they're drinking a lot of water, right? You can give them something like anesthetics and lozenges, but usually this doesn't really require treatment. Just make sure that they rest their voice. So the next one's going to be macular degeneration. Macular degeneration. The thing you need to know about macular degeneration is just like the physiology of the macula. What does it do? So the macula is responsible for central vision and it also helps with T-tail and color vision. So if you're having a degeneration of that macula, then of course you're going to lose all of this, right? You're going to lose that central vision. So with these patients, how are they going to present or what's usually the HPI with these patients, the history, right? 
So usually these patients are going to present with a gradual vision loss, and it's going to be that central vision loss. Remember we said that glaucoma is that peripheral vision loss? Well, this one for macular degeneration is going to be that gradual vision loss. Also, macular degeneration can occur from medications. So, for example, chloroquine or phenothiazine. Some of the risk factors for macular degeneration are going to be a patient that's older than 50, if they're Caucasian, if they're female, and if they're smokers. And there's two types of flavors, or two types of your macular degeneration, so that you have that umbrella, and then each one falls. There's two different types. So we have non-exudative, and then we have our exudative. So with non-exudative, we usually think about our drusen. So make sure that you know how that looks on a picture. It's going to be that round, yellow, white deposit, okay, versus our exudative, it's going to be that neovascularization and severe vision loss. So non-exudative is not as severe as exudative. Exudative is pretty severe. So exudative, neovascularization, um, and they're going to have that severe vision loss with these patients. They're also going to be presenting with the central vision loss, like we said, bilateral blurred or loss of central vision loss. They're going to say that they see these scotomas, so these blind spots or shadows. Um, also, they can say that they have metamorphic morphopsia, which is straight lines that appear like they're bent. And they can also have micropsia, which is where the object is seen by the affected eye looks smaller than the unaffected eye. So with these, with macular de degeneration, what we need to know is that it's a leading cause of permanent vision loss in the elderly. That's something that I've seen asked also. So just know that macular degeneration is a leading cause of permanent vision loss in the elderly. So like we said, right, there's two groups. We had the dry and the wet. Um, so with the dry, usually this patient is going to be presenting with the gradual progress progressive vision loss of moderate severity. They'll have those yellow deposits, right, like we discussed with drusen. And what is drusen? Drusen is just an accumulation of waste products from the retinal pigment epithelium. And then you have exudative, which is going to be wet. This one's going to be more severe, more rapid. Um, vision loss, hemorrhages, neovascularization. So how are we going to diagnose these patients? So we usually diagnose these patients with the Amsler grid chart that's going to help us see that the patient has loss in their central vision. And then to diagnose our wet or exudative macular degeneration, we can usually diagnose this with the fluorescent angiography, but usually it's going to be, your, in general, right, Amsler grid chart, and then after that, you can see whether they have their wet or the non-wet type. Treatment for this, the definitive treatment is going to be your laser photocoagulation. Now, the treatment's going to vary on whether it's dry or wet. If it's dry with these patients, we can usually monitor them at home. Uh, we can give them something like zinc, vitamin A, C, and E, because this will usually help slow the progression. Versus our wet, these are usually, since these are quick, right, this, can, this patient can lose their vision. It's really important that with these, vision, with these patients, we're given something like bevacizumab. Sorry, I apologize if I missaid that, but bevacizumab. And this is going to help reduce that neovascularization. So once again, it's going to be that bevacizumab and also laser photocoagulation. So with these, make sure you know the difference between our wet and our dry, right? We said that wet is going to be the more severe one. That's the one that's going to present with your neovascularization. And then dry, you're going to see those drusen, right? Usually a patient in general with macular degeneration, they're going to present with that gradual vision loss. And it's going to be what? It's going to be usually your uh, central vision loss versus glaucoma, which is usually going to be what peripheral. So central vision loss for macular degeneration. And with these patients, another thing that you need to know is that we're going to diagnose them with the Amsler grid chart, right? All right. So let's keep going. Let's go with Meniere's disease. So Meniere's disease, also known as endolymphatic hydrops. So with these patients, they're going to have recurrent attacks of hearing loss. They're going to have that ringing in the ears, and it's usually low tone. Make sure you know that because I've been tricked where... It says high tone, it's low tone, right? It's gonna be that low tone um, tinnitus. And these patients are going to have at least two episodes of vertigo that are lasting more than 20 minutes. So at least two episodes of vertigo lasting more than 20 minutes. And it's usually often unilateral 
initially, and then it can become bilateral. These patients are going to have sensations of like oral fullness or pressure, and they can also have hearing loss that fluctuates or is progressive. So what are you going to see on physical exam for these patients? So on physical exam, you're going to see um, the triad of episodic vertigo, right? So remember how we said that for our labyrinthitis, it's continuous? Well, well, for Meniere's disease, it's going to be the episodic, episodic. So it's going to come in episodes. It's not constant. The patient's going to have uh, usually also um, low frequency sensor, sensory neural hearing loss and tinnitus. So it's going to be that vertigo, that tinnitus, and that hearing loss. They're going to have nausea and vomiting, horizontal nystagmus, and also they're going to have ear fullness. So what are some of the causes of Meniere's disease? So some of the causes, it's usually due to distension of the endolymphatic compartment of the inner ear because there's excess fluid. So excess fluid causes the increased pressure within the inner ear, which causes this hearing imbalance disorders. Another thing that you need to differentiate is the difference between Meniere's syndrome and Meniere's disease. So Meniere's syndrome is because there's something that is causing it, right? Versus Meniere's disease, it's usually idiopathic. And the one we're discussing is Meniere's disease. So what's going to be our exam we're going to do? We're going to do caloric testing. And then um, we can also do an audiometry. This is where we're going to see low frequency sensor sensory neural loss. And then we can do an otoscope exam, which is usually going to be normal for these patients. So treatment for these patients, remember that how we discussed that NCPA always tells you, always likes the answer that that the conservative treatment is going to be the best treatment. Well, this is another case. So conservative treatment is going to be the best one. It's going to be a low salt diet, right? Um, you can give them treatment, like symptomatic treatment for that vertigo. So you can give them medications like meclizine once again, diamond hydramate, uh, benzodiazepines like diazepam. You can give them a scopolamine patch, right? And then preventative medications. So you can give them something like uh, diuretics. This is going to help reduce the endolymphatic pressure. And then finally, if the patient just is not getting better with all the medications that we're giving them and they've tried reducing that salt in their diet, then you can do surgical decompression. It's really important that we also tell these patients to avoid salt, right, caffeine, chocolate, and alcohol because this can actually increase the endolymphatic pressure. So another thing I wanted to go over is just like vertigo in general, because I know this is something that they really like to test and I know a lot of students struggle with. So what's the difference between central and peripheral vertigo? How is the patient going to present? So peripheral, we think about, right, something that has to do with the vestibular system itself versus central, it's more up here in the brain. So how is the patient going to present? If the patient has peripheral vertigo, usually the vertigo onset, it's going to be sudden, right? It's going to be they wake up one morning and then they're dizzy versus our central, usually these patients are gonna have gradual. Right? They're gonna be saying, you know what, I've been feeling dizzy and I feel like it's getting worse, but it's been going on for a while. It can also be sometimes sudden, but the majority of the time it's gradual. And that's when we think about a central cause of vertigo. Now, in regards to peripheral vertigo, the duration, like how long is it going to last? Usually the vertigo is usually gonna last seconds to minutes and it's usually intermittent. Versus central, it's a variable. It can be subacute, and then it can be um, brief and intermittent, so it's variable. It's all over the place. And the intensity for peripheral vertigo is going to be very severe. So these patients for peripheral vertigo, it's going to be so severe that these patients just cannot stand up because they're going to fall. And I've seen these patients um, come in into the clinic and they really like, they cannot even sit or stand because they feel like they're going to fall. It's really important that with these patients also, we tell them not to drive. Um, especially if they're truck drivers because they can crash their cars because they lose their balance. Now, in regards to intensity, intensity for central vertigo, usually it's mild, right? So the vertigo symptoms are not as intense as peripheral vertigo for central vertigo. And in regards to like the head position, like if you move the head position for peripheral vertigo, it's usually going to be worsened by position versus central vertigo. It's going to be very minimal change. And the direction of nystagmus is another one that's going to tell you whether it's peripheral or central. And peripheral vertigo, it's usually going to be uni unidirectional and it's never vertical. Okay, so it's always going to be usually horizontal. It'll be just unidirectional. It's not going to be vertical.
versus central vertigo, these patients will have horizontal vertical rotary and bidirectional uh, direction of that nystagmus. And usually in peripheral vertigo, there will not be any signs of neurological findings versus central vertigo, there's often a lot of signs of neurological findings. In regards to auditory findings, usually you will find them in peripheral vertigo, but you won't find them in central vertigo. And what are some of like the examples for peripheral vertigo? So some of the examples for peripheral vertigo are going to be uh, BPVV, right? So benign positional paroxysmal vertigo. We can also think about labyrinthitis, Meniere's disease, vestibular neuritis, and then trauma, right? Um, even otitis media can cause these symptoms of vertigo. When we're thinking about central vertigo, we're thinking about like those bad ones, like meningitis, encephalitis, tumors, um, temporal lobe epilepsy, cerebr cerebellar hemorrhage, vertebral basilar insufficiency, which is one of the big ones when we think about a central vertigo. So now that we're done, we're done with that, let's go into polyps in general. So nasal polyps. So nasal polyps, it's usually going to be these polyp polypoid masses that come from mucous membranes of the nose and paranasal sinuses. It's usually accompanied by patients or found in patients that have like allergic rhinitis. They're usually movable and they're non-tender. And there's a lot of conditions that are usually associated with polyps like asthma, um, aspirin intolerance, cystic fibrosis, chronic rhinosinusitis, and cartigener syndrome also. And then whenever we think about nasal polyps, we think about that triad, right? So remember we discussed this in, when we were discussing asthma, so we think about Sanders triad, so a patient that has asthma, nasal polyps, aspirin or NSAID sensitivity, and then also allergies. So how is the patient going to present with nasal polyps? They're going to have nasal blockage, discharge, congestion, loss of smell. Um, usually they are found bilaterally, and it's not very common in children. It's more common in women than men, and then more than 65% of these patients have asthma. So it's very common associated with asthma. On physical exam, you're going to see that pedunculated mass in the nasal cavity or within that paranasal sinus, and they can usually be pale and translucent. So I've actually seen these. I'm not sure if those of, those of you have seen them, but like they're really, really enlarged. I saw this a lot during my ENT rotation, and a lot of patients that had these, like they're, they're recurring. So sometimes the treatment for this is usually like steroids, right? but sometimes they will recur over and over again. And sometimes patients just don't want them to keep coming back. So uh, treatment for these is usually also surgery. So during my ENT, we did a lot of those surgeries for patients just had like multiple nasal polyps. And it's really, it's something that's very, for patients, it's really, um, it really affects their daily life. Like they can't breathe as well. They have these really bad allergies. They're always congested. Sometimes they say they can't even smell. So sometimes definitive treatments like surgery can be helpful for them. But once again, these are likely to occur like years later, though. So <clears throat> treatment for this, like we said, it's usually going to be your intranasal steroid. That's going to be the treatment of choice. It's going to decrease that size of those nasal polyps, but definitive ones are going to be surgery like we discussed. So otitis externa, externa. So the thing about otitis externa that you need to know is just a patho, right? It's usually where the patient has like excess water or some type of trauma that changes the acidic pH of the ear. And when that happens, that's when you have opportunistic infections. Like the big one we think about is pseudomonas. Like pseudomonas likes to live in those areas that are just like wet. It's like the perfect area for these, these bacteria. This is where pseudomonas starts overgrowing. So once again, it often occurs due to moist environment. You have bacterial fungal growth. Usually this patient is going to be presenting with that inflammation of the external auditory canal, right? Um, but you also have acute and chronic. So whenever we think about a chronic otitis externa, we usually think about malignant causes for these patients, right? Um, and it's really important that we treat these because it can cause osteomyelitis, especially at the school, board, school base. Um, school base. And this is one that's very commonly found, your malignant otitis externa in your patients that are immunocompromised, right? We think about our diabetics. And usually with these patients, we treat them with IV anti-pseudomonal antibiotics with malignant otitis externa. So we can do something like ceftazidime or piperacillin plus fluoroquinolones or even aminoglycosides. So how is the patient going to present? They're going to have that one to two days of ear pain, um, itching in the ear canal, right? Because this one's also known as your swimmer's ear. 
they're going to have that drainage. You probably saw a lot of this during your pediatric rotation. Uh, they're going to have pressure or fullness. And also, like on physical exam, whenever you move the oracle, they're going to have tender tenderness with the oracle movement. You'll see that discharge, it's going to be erythematous, right? Pain on traction of the ear canal and tragus with these patients. And also they can have pre-auricular lymphadenopathy. The patient can also present with conductive hearing loss. So it's also something to keep in mind for these patients. And usually a patient's going to have a history of water exposure, right? It's going to be a patient that just went to the pool, a child that just went to the pool. And the most common pathogen is going to be pseudomonas like we discussed. So in general, for otitis externa, the treatment is going to be your otic aminoglycosides, so something like neomycin sulfate, polymyxin B also. You can do fluoroquinolones like Cipro with or without corticosteroids, right? These are usually um, oral or otic. Uh, we can do corticosteroids. Earwick is another thing that we can do. And if it's a fungal infection that we're suspecting, then we can do amphotericin B. So once again, right, otitis externa, it's going to be infection of the external ear canal. The most common bacteria associated, it's going to be your pseudomonas. The patient's going to have pain usually with the movement of that uh, traction of the ear or pain on traction of the ear canal or tragus. And usually we treat this with uh, drops, right, otic drops like neomycin, polymyxid B. Um, you can also do some fluoroquinolones. So the next one's going to be otitis media. So we said otitis external inflammation of the external ear canal. Otitis media is going to be inflammation of the internal ear canal, right? So with these patients, right, um, it's going to be usually an infection of the middle ear between the eustachian tube and tympanic membrane. And this patient is usually going to present with irritability, crying, right, if it's a child, lethargy. We see a lot of this in our children just because of their anatomy, right, of just how their uh, eustachian tubes are in comparison to adults. So with these patients, you're going to present with fever, earache, um, conductive hearing loss, stuffiness also. We can also see the tympanic membrane perforated, and why? Because usually since you have so much pressure in that ear, it can perforate, and sometimes when it perforates, it's very relieving for the patient. So just to make sure that we keep that in mind, if that we see tympanic membrane perforation in these patients, usually no treatment is required for this because the tympanic membrane is going to start healing up and close up by itself. It may take several a while, but it's going to um, get better. It's just important that with patients that have a tympanic membrane perforation that we educate them to just make sure that they avoid any type of water or any liquid going into their ear. Um, also, uh, it's commonly associated with, with smoking, daycare, and bottle use. So any patients, any like babies or children um, want to think about these risk factors. And there's different types, right? We have our viral, bacterial, and also uh, just otitis media because there's eustachium 2 dysfunction. And this patient, what you're going to see on physical exam, you're going to see that erythematous tympanic membrane with effusion. The tympanic membrane is going to be bulging, retracted, or perforated. The patient is going to have decreased hearing loss, and they're going to have um, decreased hearing, sorry, and they're going to have decreased tympanic membrane mobility. That's usually what they really like to test. It's going to be that decreased tympanic mobility that is just not moving, and that's usually on pneumatic autoscopy. Do we do that? No, we don't. We're not going to go in there and blow ear because it's going to be even more painful. So once again, it's going to be decreased tympanic immobility. So it's going to say that tympanic memory is going to be immobile. It's going to be um, erythematous, bulging, retracted, right? And then another one, like another flavor of your otitis media is that if we see a tympanic membrane and we see bulla in the tympanic membrane, or they show you a photo of a tympanic membrane with bulla, we're thinking about mycoplasma pneumonia, right? So with these patients, right, what we need to know that usually the most common cause of otitis media in general, it's usually going to be a viral infection, right? So some type of viral upper respiratory infection. But the most common bacterial infection is going to be streptococcus pneumonia. There's other infections like Haemophilus influenza, Mycoplasma cateralis, and Streptococcus pyogenes, but the most common one by far is going to be Streptococcus um, pneumonia for these patients. So like we said, risk factors, this is something that they really like to test, whether it's for your pediatrics 
EOR or this one is what are some of the risk factors like we discussed daycare attendance if you if the patient has like a, a, a brother or sister that has acute otitis media if the parents smoke bottle drinking eustachian tube dysfunction is one of the big ones pacifier or bottle use and then not being breastfed is one of the um risk factors for acute otitis media. So how can it pre be prevented? So breastfeeding, right? And then pneumococcal vaccine. So what's gonna be the treatment for these patients? The first line is gonna be amoxicillin. That's gonna be usually the treatment of choice, right? So it's gonna be your amoxicillin. Second line is gonna be something like amoxicillin, clavulanic, cephalochlor, and cefexime, but usually it's gonna be your amoxicillin. So what if the patient comes and they're going to have recurrent otitis media? So with these patients, it's usually going to be a long-term antibiotic prophylaxis, usually with um, sulfamethoxazole or amoxicillin for about one to three months. If the patient is still having these recurrent otitis media infections, then we can do something like myringotomy, right? So we will, we're going to insert those ventilation tubes, ventilating tubes. So uh, during my ENT rotation, I saw a lot of this done. It was really, really cool. They go in there and just stick tubes into the ear. So we are done with that. And then I wanted to go into chronic otitis media real quick. With chronic otitis media, usually this patient is going to be presenting with a perforated tympanic membrane plus persistent or recurrent purulent otorrhea. So it's going to be that discharge, and they're also going to be presenting with pain. They can also have conductive hearing loss, especially since they had that destruction of the tympanic membrane. And then on physical exam findings, you can see a, possibly a cholesteatoma, or you'll see purulent oral discharge. And once again, this patient's gonna have that conductive hearing loss. And this is usually because of recurrent acute otitis media, right? And usually in these patients with chronic, chronic otitis media, you're gonna see that perforation of tympanic membrane. And whenever we think about bacterial infections that are commonly associated with chronic otitis media, we think about pseudomonas, right? Originasa, Proteus, Staph aureus, and treatment for these is usually going to be topical antibiotics, which is going to be first line, and then make sure that we tell these patients to avoid water, right, especially since they have a tympanic membrane rupture like we discussed. All right, papal edema is going to be the next one. So papal edema. So with papal edema, how is this patient going to present? So this patient is going to be presenting with headache. Uh, it's going to be worse with coughing. They're going to be presenting with nausea and vomiting. It's going to lead to loss of consciousness. They're going to be presenting with pupillary dilation, pulsatile tinnitus. And usually the visual symptoms are going to be absent. And usually this is due to increased intracranial pressure. So just make sure that we have that in mind. What are you going to see on physical exam? You're going to see those blurred disc margins and congested disc. You can also see flame hemorrhages or infarctions. And for this, we just want to make sure that we treat the underlying cause, right? If it's increased intracranial pressure, make sure that we're decreasing that intracranial pressure. So the next one we're going to go over is going to be peritidis. So peritidis, peritidis. What is peritidis? Or what are, you going to, what are some of the risk factors for peritidis? So some of the risk factors for peritidis, it's going to be your elderly patients, right? Um, post-operative patients also, if the patient's dehydrated, if they have poor oral hygiene, and also certain medications like anticholinergic medications can cause your peritidis. And the thing about peritidis is that we have acute and chronic peritidis. So acute is going to be a sudden onset of pain and swelling of cheek, it extending to and is obscuring the angle of the mandible. The patient is going to be presenting with trismus, painful chewing, uh, saliva production, and pain. And then we have our chronic peritidis. So for chronic peritidis, this is usually caused by viral or bacterial um, infections. It can also be caused by mechanical obstruction or even certain medications. And with chronic peritidis, it's going to be a sudden onset of pain, swelling on the cheek that extends once again um, to and obscures the mandible. And usually this patient are, is usually going to have like the skin that's overlying the area is usually going to be warm and erythematous. And the thing is that this one can also be bilateral. If it's bilateral, we think about viral infections. Why? Because viral infections are usually systemic, right? Remember when we were discussing conjunctivitis, it's usually, it can start unilateral, but it's usually bilateral. And that's why if it's bilateral peritidis, we're thinking about a viral infection because these are usually systemic. Versus like bacterial infections, um, we think about usually just unilateral. 
So how is this patient going to present? They're going to have swelling or enlargement of the parotid gland over the masseter muscle. They can have pus from, especially if they have some type of obstruction to the stensin duct, right? And then also they're going to be presenting with halitosis, so that like really bad breath. And bacterial infections, the most common bacterial infection is usually going to be staph aureus, especially like in those superior to peritidis, right? Superior peritidis was just like it's really, really inflamed and just like really tender and red. And then whenever we think about superior to peritidis um, for these patients, right, it's usually going to be that firm erythematous swelling of the pre and post auricular areas. And with these patients, uh, treatment is usually going to be antibiotics because, like we said, the most common cause of superior peritidis is going to be staph aureus. All right, so let's go into our next one, which is going to be peritonsal abscess, also known as, as Quincy, right? So peritonsal abscess, what is, what causes usually peritonsal abscess? So it's usually what happens is that you know, the patient has tonsillitis, and then it develops a cellulitis, and then you have that abscess formation with these patients. And it's an abscess formation between the anterior and posterior tonsil pillars and the superior pharyngeal constrictor muscles for these patients. It's very commonly found in your patients that are like less than 30 years old. And some of the common bacteria that we're going to see for peritonsillar abscesses are usually going to be polymicrobial, um, <clears throat> especially for... Uh, Dene, but usually polymicrobial and also another medication that we uh, medication bacterial infection we can see is going to be strep pyogenes, right? Group A beta hemolytic strep and then also strep staph. So, how is this patient going to present? They're going to have fever, sore throat, trouble swallowing, right? Dysphagia, pain whenever they open their mouth, hot potato muffled voice. That's usually like a like a buzzword for peritonsillar abscess. They're going to have unilateral neck pain, pharyngitis, difficulty handling oral secretions, trismus, and tonsillitis. And usually with these patients on physical exam, we're going to see that unilateral peritonsal fullness or bulging of the posterior superior soft palate. We're going to see that uvular deviation. It's usually going to go to the contralateral side, drooling, and then anterior cervical lymphadenopathy for these patients. And how are we going to diagnose these patients? So we're going to do a CT scan that's going to be first line. Um, we're going to see the abscess and edema. This is going to help us differentiate between cellulitis and whether it's an abscess. We can also aspirate the fluid and culture it in gram saying just to make sure that we um, isolate whatever is the bacterial cause of it. And treatment for this is going to be antibiotics plus aspiration um, or incision and drainage. And what antibiotics are we going to use? Something like penicillin. And if the patient is allergic to penicillin, then we can do metronidazole or, or clindamycin. So the next topic we're going to go over is going to be pharyngitis or tonsillitis. So let's go into acute pharyngitis. So acute pharyngitis. So acute, the thing we need to know about acute pharyngitis is that there's different types of pharyngitis, right? We have bacterial and viral. Viral is going to be the most common type overall of pharyngitis. And some of the common infections involved are going to be herpes simplex, Coxsackie, adenovirus, rhinovirus, enterovirus, RSV, and influenza, right, A and B. Um, now, in regards to bacterial causes, we're thinking about group A beta hemolytic strep, right, streptococcus pyogenes, and that's actually the most common cause of bacterial strep throat. This is something that they really like to test, so make sure that you know that. So, right, the most common cause overall for acute pharyngitis is going to be your viral causes. Now, the most common cause of bacterial pharyngitis, when we see those, um, the creaminess, right, those exudates, we're thinking about group A beta hemolytic strep, so it's going to be your strep pyogenes. So how are you going to differentiate between a viral cause? So a viral cause, usually it's more insidious, right? This patient's usually going to have the coryza. They will not have any exudates on exam. The patient's usually going to have a low-grade fever, and they're going to present you with sore throat pain or swelling with phonation. So with these patients, we just want to make sure that we test them for strep to rule out strep, right? And treatment is just supportive. So just tell them to make sure that they're drinking all their fluids, right? Um, NSAIDs, lozenges, anything that's going to soothe that throat. Another cause of strep of just pharyngitis in general, we think about Epstein-Barr virus, right? Epstein-Barr virus, it's going to be your kissing, kissing disease. 
So usually with these patients, they're going to have malaise, tender um, adenopathy, and usually they're going to have that posterior cervical adenopathy, and that's key, right? The difference between strep throat and your um, Epstein-Barr virus or your mono is usually going to be where is the cervical lymphadenopathy. So usually with, with strep, we think about anterior cervical lymphadenopathy versus our mono is usually going to be our posterior uh, cervical lymphadenopathy. So make sure that you know that because there's questions that you're going to get that sometimes it just says exudates, right? And you don't know if it's mono or strep, but in the question stem, they have to tell you where is the cervical lymphadenopathy? Is it anterior or posterior? If it's anterior cervical lymphadenopathy, like I said, we're thinking about strep. If it's posterior with exudates, then we're thinking about mono. And this patient's also going to be presenting with that enlarged spleen, right? That's why it's important that we tell these patients that they cannot play sports. For a while, they're going to be presenting with jaundice, exudative pharyngitis, like I said. Um, in labs, we're usually going to test for, we're going to do that mono spot, right? And treatment's usually supportive. Just make sure that we educate these patients that they just cannot go to, to sports. Why? Because if they play sports and they have any type of injury or just hit against that spleen, then it can rupture. And that's what we're trying to avoid. And it's really important that we avoid ampicillin in these patients because if we give them ampicillin, it's going to give a rash. And that's another thing that they like to test. And if it's a patient that comes in, right, they had exudates, you thought it was strep, you give them ampicillin, they come back and they have a rash, well, it was mono. Now, if it's strep pyogenes, right, we're going to see those exudates, like we discussed, sending these patients, and they're going to have what? That anterior cervical lymphadenopathy. We're going to give them penicillin, um, amoxicillin. Also, if they're allergic to penicillin, then we can do like erythromycin or clindamycin, so um, any of our macrolides. So let's go into strep throat. I know I had discussed that. So strep throat, the most common cause of strep throat is going to be group A beta hemolytic strep or strep pyogenes. And the thing about strep throat is that usually we use the center criteria, right, to diagnose this. It's really important that you know this because it's something that they really like to test and center criteria. So with center criteria, there's certain factors that the patient has to meet in order for the patient to be diagnosed and say, you know what, this for sure is strep pharyngitis or strep throat. So these are the factors. They have to have a fever greater than 38 degrees Celsius or greater than 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. They have to have pharyngeal tonsor exudates and they're gonna have what? Tender anterior cervical lymphadenopathy and they're not gonna have a cough, so absence of cough. Each one of these gets a point. So if the patient has zero to one points, usually we don't need to do an antibiotic or culture, right? If the patient has two to three points, then we're going to do a throat culture in this patient. And if the patient has four to five points, and then we give antibiotics for these patients because it's about a 56% chance that the patient has strep throat. Another thing to keep in mind is that there's a modified center, right? Criteria, modified center criteria. So if the patient's less than 15 years old, then you give them a point. If they're older than 44, then you subtract a point. So how are we going to diagnose strep throat in general? We're going to do a rapid antigen detection test, right? Um, it's specific, but it's not very sensitive. So just to keep that in mind. So the definitive diagnosis for this patient is going to be a throat culture. So that's a gold standard in the definitive diagnosis. Make sure that you know that. If it asks you what's a gold standard, it's going to be your throat culture and the definitive diagnosis um, throat culture. Treatment for this, usually like we discussed, right? Penicillin, like amoxicillin or augmentin and macrolides if the patient is allergic. And it's really important that we educate this patient to make sure that they take all their antibiotics because if they do not take their antibiotics, because they might start feeling better after the first or second day, but that doesn't mean that they stop taking their antibiotics. And it's something that you might get tested because this exam likes a lot of patient education. So if the patient has not finished their taking their medications or they just were not compliant, they are at risk for a lot of complications like rheumatic fever, right? glomerulonephritis, peritonsal abscess like we discussed, cellulitis. So it's really important that the patient finishes their antibiotics to avoid all of this. All right, so the next topic we're going to go over is going to be tonsillitis. So tonsillitis, this is very commonly found in your patients between the ages of 5 to 18. This patient is going to be presenting with fever, dysphagia, so that trouble swallowing, sore throat, bad breath, hoarseness, anorexia, chills, malaise. And... <clears throat> With these patients, you're going to see enlarged tonsils, right? You'll see tonsor exudates, 
even a peritonteal abscess if it's due to a bacterial cause or maybe like a um, Epstein-Barr virus like we discussed. They're going to have that cervical adenopathy. Um, they can have uh, pharyngeal erythema, pharyngeal ulcers. And labs for this, just make sure that we culture it right um, to rule out either strep, uh, rapid screw, strep screen tests also, and then treatment. If it's bacterial, it's going to be the penicillin like we discussed, right, for tonsillitis. So the next one is going to be pterygium. So pterygium, and the, you need to differentiate between pterygium and um, the other one, which looks very similar, which is going to be your pinguacula. So with pterygium, it's usually a fleshy triangular mass that extends to the cornea. So it's going to be that mass. And the difference between pterygium and pinguacula is that pterygium is actually going to extend to the cornea versus pinguacula, it does not. So pterygium is going to extend um, through the cornea. So for pterygium, it's going to be that slow-growing, elevated, fleshy triangular encroachment onto the cornea. It's usually bilateral, and it's usually found on the nasal side. It can also be unilateral. And some of the causes of this is usually if the patient lives in an area where they have a lot of sun exposure, right? Your tropical climates, um, usually involved with increased UV exposure, sand, also wind and dust exposure. And treatment for this is usually, we really don't need to do treatment for this, um, just observation if it doesn't affect their vision. But if it is affecting their vision, then we can ex excise it, right? Um, and usually what happens is that once we excise them, though, it's really likely that it's going to recur. And once the recurrence happens, it's usually going to be more aggressive than the first one that they had. So what about pinguacula? So with pinguacula, it's going to be that yellowish elevated bump or patch that does not cross the cornea. So we said, right, that our pterygium crosses the cornea. Um, pinguacula does not cross the cornea. And usually, once again, treatment for this is just observation. You usually don't need to do anything unless, you know, they want to get it removed cosmetically. So the next one we're going to go into is going to be retinal detachment. So with retinal detachment, it's usually a tear of the retina that is usually spontaneous. It can sometimes be associated with trauma. It's very commonly located in the superior temporal or area and very commonly in those patients that are older than 50. There's a lot of conditions that can predispose a patient to retinal detachment, like cataract extraction, myopia. And usually this patient's gonna say that they have monocular decreased vision of gradual or sudden onset. And usually the buzzword for this one's gonna be that shadow or curtain descending over the eye. They're going to have that cloudy or smoky vision, floaters, and this patient can present with either peripheral or central loss. So this one's the one that's kind of tricky, right? So whenever I read this question, I always look for that shadow or curtain descending over the eye, those floaters, and or uh, momentary flashes of light. On physical exam, you're going to see a fold of detached retina dropping in front of the posterior pole. It gives you this appearance of a 3D fundus. And treatment for this, we want to refer them to ophthalmology, right? Make sure that we put this patient in supine and position the head so the retina falls back with the help of gravity. And these, surgery, these patients are going to need surgery. So they're, they're going to need photocoagulation and cryosurgery. So the next one's going to be your retinal vascular occlusion or your um, central artery, central retinal artery occlusion. So with these patients, um, most of these patients are going to have a history of carotid artery disease. So just make sure that you read that somewhere in the question stem. And then most of these patients are going to be older. So they're going to be between ages of 50 to 70. They're going to be presented with sudden painless monocular loss of vision. It's either segmental or complete. And with these patients on physical exam, you're going to see that cherry red spot, right, of non edematous Phobia, you're going to see that vascular narrowing and then that boxcar appearance on venule. So just look for those, right? The retinal pallor, uh, the cherry red spot, that boxcar box car appearance of the venules. Treatment for this is usually going to be that digital global massage. You want to make sure that you're decreasing the patient's intraocular pressure and make sure that these patients get immediate referral. The next one's going to be our um, retinal retinopathy, whether it's diabetic retinopathy or hypertensive retinopathy. So another thing that we need to know is that just diabetic retinopathy in general is the leading cause of blindness in the U.S., which is really, really sad. And it's very commonly due to some type of maculopathy. 
So how is the patient going to present? Sometimes they're asymptomatic. They don't even know they have it until they go to their eye doctor. That's why it's really important that diabetics get screened by an ophthalmologist and they get screened <clears throat> because they can suffer from things like diabetic retinopathy, which can lead to their vision loss. So what happens just like the pathophysiology of diabetic retinopathy is that you have retinal blood vessel damage that causes retinal ischemia and edema. Basically what's happening is that you have glycosylation. So what does that mean is that you have excess sugar that attaches to the collagen of the blood vessels and this causes that capillary wall breakdown. And in regards to the pathophysiology of hypertensive retinopathy with these patients, you're going to have damage of retinal blood vessels just from like this increased high blood pressure, right? So remember when we discussed in cardio, blood pressure in general, you're having like this increased pressure just going through those pipes. And if it's occurring for a long time, it's going to start damaging those vessels. So what are we going to see on physical exam findings? We're going to see visual acuity. Um, we're going to see... Um, non-proliferative uh, diabetic retinopathy. We're gonna see for those patients, microaneurysm, intraretinal hemorrhage, macular edema, decreased central vision, and lipid deposits. If it's severe proliferative diabetic retinopathy, we're gonna see cotton wool spots. If it's non-proliferative, then these patients really have no vision loss. But if it's proliferative, right, it's gonna be that neovascularization, which means that they have like new abnormal blood vessel growth, uh, vitreous hemorrhage with these patients. And what's going to be usually um, what we're going to see on clinical features. So in diabetic, right, if it's non-proliferative, that means it's early. So with these patients, we're going to see dilation of veins, microaneurysms, retinal hemorrhages, and hard exudates. If it's proliferative, which is late, they have long-standing long diabetic, diabetic retinopathy, we're going to see neovascularization. So those new vessels that happen, right? We're going to see vitreous hemorrhage, cotton wool spots. And treatment for these patients, we just want to make sure that we're avoiding this, right? Because this is, whenever we diagnose a patient with diabetes, it's really important that we also refer them, like I said, to an eye doctor. So it's going to be preventative, like yearly eye exams, and just making sure that we control the patient's blood sugar. Um, but usually the treatment is going to be your panretinal laser photocoagulation. If the patient has proliferative Diabetic retinopathy, like we said, right, they have those neovascularizations, those new vessels, the cotton wool spots. Then the treatment for these are usually going to be things like bevacizumab, sorry, laser photo photocoagulation, and then make sure, once again, we're, we're controlling that glucose. Now, in regards to hypertensive retinopathy, this affects both retinal and choroidal circulation. What happens is that the retinal arter arterioles, they become tortuous and narrow, and the usually we'll see abnormal light reflexes on exam for these patients. So there's different grades of the, the hypertensive retinopathy. For grade one, we're gonna see that silver wiring or copper wiring. For, AV, for grade two, we're gonna see that AV nicking. So it's gonna be that venous compression at the arterial venous junction by increased arterial pressure. For grade three, we're going to see those cotton wool spots, right, or those soft exudates. And then grade four, which is going to be the worst one of hypertensive retinopathy, we're going to see papilledema. That's already like malignant hypertension. And then treatment for this, we just have to make sure that we control the hypertension, right? So let's go into our next one. It's going to be sialadenitis. Sialadenitis. That's going to be a sudden inflammation of the salivary glands. And it's usually due to a mucus plug with a secondary infection. Um, the common causes are going to be viruses like mumps, and then Staph aureus is the most common bacterial cause for this. So sialadenitis, it's also known as a superative sialadenitis, right? This patient has an inflammation and or infection involving one or more of the salivary glands, whether it's the parotid gland or the submandibular gland. They're going to have acute onset of pain and swelling over the affected gland, especially whenever they eat meals. They're going to have that dental pain, fever, xerostomia, trismus. Um, they can also fever. They can also have fever and chills. And this is very commonly found in your patients that are like in their fifties and sixties, but it can occur at any age. So just make sure that we keep that in mind, also. Usually on physical exam, you're going to see you're going to assess the symmetry. You're going to see tenderness and duration edema, and sometimes they can have presence of stones also. 
Um, they're going to have lymphadenopathy with these patients. And sometimes they'll also say that they have very bad taste. Why? Because they have all this pus that's coming in. Um, treatment for this or in diagnosis. So diagnosis, we can do a CT scan just to assess to see if there's any type of abscess or how much of the tissue is involved. Treatments for this is going to be your IV antibiotics, um, like uh, metronidazole or clindamycin if severe. But usually in regards to like treatment, what's going to be your, your steps, right? So the first line treatment, just make sure that we tell the patient to make sure that they're drinking a lot of water. They can do some type of glandular massage. This is going to help stimulate the salivary flow. And then if it's an infection, right, we're going to give them antibiotics, like the ones that I just mentioned. And then you can also give them medications just to stimulate that uh, saliva production. So things like sialogos, sialo so your lemon drops, tart head, tart hard candies to make sure that they're increasing that salivary flow. So the next one's going to be tinnitus. It's going to be the ringing in the ear, right? So with these patients, they're going to have a perceived sensation of sound in the absence of an external acoustic stimulus. It's usually described as ringing, hissing, buzzing, or whooshing. It can be either unilateral or bilateral. And on physical exam, right, that's when we're going to do the neuro, the, the neuro test, so just to make sure that it's not something central. And also just to make sure that it's either central or peripheral, we're going to do the Weber and Renee test. Um, there's several causes of tinnitus, but whenever we think about peripheral causes, we think about the cerebral imp impaction, especially in your older patients. Um, we're looking for cholecystomas, effusions. Um, also make sure that we're looking in the eyes to look for palpal edema. So tympanic membrane perforation. So I know we had discussed this um, earlier. So tympanic membrane perforation, it's usually due to some type of noise trauma or infection, right? Usually when we think about infections, we think about otitis media. It very, it most commonly occurs in part in the pars tensa. Usually these patients are asymptomatic. If they do have symptoms, they can have conductive hearing loss. But once again, tympanic membrane um, perforation, it usually heals by itself. So we really don't need to do anything. We just educate the patient to make sure that they are avoiding any water moisture to that area. Um, we can also give topical aminoglycosides if needed, but usually we don't do anything with these patients. We just follow up with them. So next one's going to be barotrauma. So this one, that's something that they really like to test. So I'm going to spend a little time on barotrauma. So barotrauma is usually what happens is that is the patient is unable to equalize the barometric stress that it is exerted on the middle ear by air travel, rapid altitudinal changes, or underwater diving, right? So what happens in underwater diving is that you have a lot of barometric stress to the ear, okay? A lot more than whenever you're flying. So it's really important that these patients, that we educate them that if they're going to go diving, that they avoid it if they have an upper respiratory infection or if they have any type of allergies because that's going to increase, right, that pressure, but in general, just for this patient, if they're going to go diving, it's really important that we educate them that they have to descend slowly, okay? Because it's going to help avoid the development of severe negative pressures in the tympanic membrane that is, may cause a hemorrhage or can also lead to perilymphatic fistula for these patients. So how is this patient going to present? So... Once again, it's usually an injury due to barometric, barometric pressure, right? Um, this patient on exam external, you're going to see pain. On, exter on the external exam, you're going to see pain with blood. And usually what happens is that if a patient is like diving, right? They're diving underwater and they're having pain and it keeps going within the first 15 feet, it's important that they make sure that they abort that, right? They abort and they go back up. So on physical exam, you're going to see hemorrhagic blebs or ruptured tympanic membrane. Um, if it involves the middle ear, you're going to see impaired eustachian tube for these patients. And treatment for this is just to make sure that we advise these patients in general for our barotrauma to swallow, yawn, you know, pinch their nose and blow and auto inflate, especially like whenever they're flying, right? Um, we can also give them oral decongestants. That's actually going to be our first line treatment. Things like pseudofedrin, right? 
And this has to be taken several hours before the patient anticipates um, arrival to be effective during descent. We can also give them oral antihistamines, right? Um, more extensive treatments, we can do something like meringotomy. Meringotomy. Okay, the last one for this is going to be dysfunction of the eustachian tube. So dysfunction of the eustachian tube. So it's very commonly associated with diseases with edema of the tubal lining. So something like viral upper respiratory infections and allergies. It's usually transient. So it lasts a few days to weeks and it follows an upper respiratory infection like we, dis we discussed. Um, usually with these patients, they're going to present with earfulness and autophony, which is an exaggerated ability to hear onset self breathe and speak. So sometimes they, uh, I saw a lot of these patients during my ENT rotation, they say that they feel like they have like fullness in their ear or they hear like muffled sounds with these patients. And sometimes patients can um, develop a eustachian tube defect, especially if they lose a lot of weight or sometimes it's just idiopathic. And so what happens is that, um, the, so the eustachian tube swelling inhibits eustachian tube's autoinsufflation ability, which causes negative pressure. And it can either be unilateral or bilateral. This patient's getting presenting with ear pain, fullness, plugging, like we discussed, right? They have that conductive hearing loss, the ringing, they feel like they're underwater, you know, whenever you go underwater and everything just sounds muffled, well, they feel like that all the time. They can also have ear pain. They'll feel like disequilibrium also. And they'll have a history usually of otitis media, uh, trauma to, to like their ear or just trauma in general, flying, diving. And on physical exam, we can do a pneumatic otoscopy. We're gonna see a retracting tympanic membrane. We're, we might see an effusion also. We're gonna do our Weber and Renee test, right? Usually the Weber is gonna be lateralized to the affected ear right, because it's a conductive hearing loss. The Renee is going to be louder on the bone than in the front. And for diagnosis, we're going to do otoscopic findings that are usually normal. So we do our otoscope, it's normal. Um, we may or may not see fluid behind the tympanic membrane. And it's actually something for like patients that have eustachian tube dysfunction, you, we would look into their ear and everything looked normal. There was no abnormalities for these patients. So treatment for this is usually going to be systemic and intranasal decongestions like pseudofedrin, oxymetazolin, um, combined with autoinflation, right? So autoinflation is going to be your swallowing, yawning, blowing against a slightly pinched nostril. And that was it, guys. Um, so we are done with HENT. Now I actually wanted to go into ob -GYN, So that's going to be our next topic. So let's go into ob -GYN. So ob -GYN, let's go into our breast disorders, right? Um, whenever we think about our breast disorders, we think about breast cancer and just breast masses in general and how to differentiate between something that's normal and abnormal. So whenever we're looking at a patient, right, um, and we're asking them questions, we want to make sure that we ask them to see whether this is something that's benign or something that's malignant. Is there any change in their appearance of their breasts, right? In their size and their symmetry, um, skin changes. Do they have nipple inversion, breast pain? And if the breast pain is there, is it constant? Does it come and go? Is it cyclic, right? Is it only present before they get their period or during their periods? How long does the pain last and where is it located? Is there breast mass? Where is the breast mass located, right? Um, does it change in size? Has you noticed it increase it? Where is it located? Um, is it only present whenever you are having your period or not? Nipple discharge also. Is it unilateral, right? Whenever we think about unilateral, that's something more malignant. Or is it bilateral? If it's bilateral, mm, nipple discharge, we're thinking about something else. What's a color? Um, is it a milky discharge, right? Um, amount, is it spontaneous or provoked? Medications, like are there any medications like antipsychotics, right? Some of our like antipsychotic medications can cause um, a patient to have prolacted, can, can affect the prolactin levels, right? So the patient can present with just um, having milky discharge. Um, antidepressants, also ask them for any risk factors for breast cancer. Does the patient have a family history of breast cancer? Are they positive for BRCA, et cetera? And when was their last menstrual period, right? 
So what are some of the risk factors in general for breast cancer and what are some of the protective factors? So the risk factors for breast cancer is going to be if the patient is BRCA1 or BRCA2 positive, if the patient has a first de uh, degree relative that has breast cancer, like their mother, their sister, do they have a personal history of any type of breast disease? Are they older, like older than 70? When did they have their menopause? Did they have their menopause greater than the age of 50? Um, have they had increased number of menstrual cycles? For example, if they're nulliparous, right? Um, if they had their baby after the age of 30? If they had their menarche before or their first period before the age of 12? Have they ever breastfed, right? The use of oral contraceptives, hormone replacement therapy, like estrogen and progesterone in postmenopausal patients is a risk factor for breast cancer. Radiation exposure, uh, obesity, chronic diseases like hypertension and diabetes, chronic stress, alcoholism. These are some of the risk factors for breast cancer. Now, what are some of the protective factors? Breastfeeding, parity, right? Have they had any babies? Recreational exercise, postmenopausal BMI less than 23 oophorectomy at the age of less than 35, and then aspirin. So on our exam, it's really important that we inspect the patient whenever they're relaxed, right? Make sure that they raise their, ar their arms and make sure that their hands are also raised. Their hands, so they raise their arms and their hands are placed on their hips. We're going to look at the breast symmetry and we want to look for any skin changes, right? Any dimpling, that pure derange, um, retraction, edema, ulcerations, the nipples, are they symmetrical? We're looking for any inversion, retraction, and discharge from the nipples. We want to make sure that we palpate the breast and the axilla and the entire chest wall, right? We're palpating all of that. And we want to make sure we assess for pain, masses, look for any lymph nodes that might be in, like enlarged or inflamed. We want to check the axillary lymph nodes and the supraclavicular lymph nodes. Now, how are we going to differentiate between a malignant and a benign? breast mass, right? So a benign mass usually is going to be rubbery. It's just going to be mobile and it's going to be well circumscribed and it's usually going to be multiple, okay? And versus a malignant characteristic of a breast mass, it's going to be usually a single lesion. It'll be hard, it'll be immovable, and the patient's going to have irregular borders. For nipple discharge, it's usually going to be unilateral. Um, for malignant, uniductal for malignant, right? Bloody, clear, or colored for malignant nipple discharge, spontaneous nipple discharge, and persistent nipple discharge for malignant characteristics. What about the benign characteristics of nipple discharge? Bilateral, multiductal, and milky. Skin changes that we think about malignant causes is going to be a retraction, that dimpling, and that thickening. So another thing is about we need to know is about imaging, right? Um, when do we start screening? So we want to make sure that we establish a baseline breast mammogram and re-evaluate patients yearly to diagnose a potentially curable breast cancer, right? So we want to make sure that we start screening at the age of 40 with these patients for mammographies. For ultrasounds now, ultrasounds we usually do, if we, if we find a breast mass, right, and we want to see whether it's malignant or... Um, malignant or just benign, we do an ultrasound usually in patients that are less than the year of age of 30, right? Because they have less breast mass, breast tissue versus you have a patient that comes in and they have a breast tissue, a breast mass, and you think it's malignant just to rule it out and they're older than 30, then you're going to do a mammography for these patients. But usually an ultrasound is going to be the best initial one for your woman that are going to be less than the age of 30 because they have less mass also less breast um, tissue, so you're able to see it a lot easier. Okay, guys, so let's go into each one. So now that we've kind of discussed in general, like the different types, why don't we go into each one? So fibrocystic breast disease or fibrocystic changes, right? This is the most common cause of cyclical breast pain. This patient is going to have breast tenderness and swelling, and the woman's usually going to be premenopausal, right? usually in the ages between uh, 30 to 50. And they're going to be presenting with painful, multiple, usually bilateral, mobile masses. And that's how you're going to differentiate. Remember that we said some of the red flags for cancer is going to be the immobility. Well, these are going to be 
mobile, right? They're going to be multiple painful mobile masses. And it's usually caused by hormonal imbalances, right? And these are usually going to be fluid filled breast cysts um, due to exaggerated response to hormones. So on findings, you're going to see cyclical breast pain or tenderness. Um, they may also have discharge. It's usually going to be non-bloody though, and it's going to be green or brown nipple discharge. They also are going to be complaining of breast tenderness that's going to be increased, especially before the patient gets their uh, period, also pain. And you're going to see multiple mobile masses throughout the breast that usually increase or decrease in size with, once again, menstrual hormones. And that's something that they really like to test is that with fibrocystic disease, these are very pertinent on, dependent on your hormones, right? Because they fluctuate size depend, according to your hormones. And so imaging for these patients, we can do an ultrasound, but usually the best diagnosis is gonna be by a biopsy, right? So we can do an ultrasound, but the best diagnosis is gonna be by a biopsy if we just wanna make sure that it's not, nothing malignant uh, with these patients. And Another thing that you need to know is that usually you can also aspirate the breast lesion, especially if the patient's having like persistent symptomatic cysts that we see on the ultrasound. And then once you do aspirate it, that's when you're gonna see that straw colored or green fluid right on your aspiration, but there's not gonna be any blood. And usually it's gonna be ultrasound guided for the aspiration. Treatment for this is just lifestyle, right? That's usually gonna be the first line. Make sure that they change their lifestyle, make sure that they avoid uh, caffeine, um, make sure that they're wearing like support bras and then they can take medication, something like NSAIDs. You can also give them vitamin E. Also, if the patient is having a lot of symptoms and you can give them something like Danazole and Tamoxifen. But a thing about this is that it's going to get better by um, menopause. So once the patient starts having those, the periods, right, those fluctuations in your hormones and the patient will not have fibrocystic disease. I actually had a question on this that asked me, what patient education did you want to tell them? And I think it the answer, which I chose the answer was to tell them that menopause, once they hit menopause, these symptoms are going to go away. And I've actually seen women, I did one of my rotations during my general surgery rotation that I had a woman with fibrocystic disease, and it was just so painful for her that she just decided to just get all the tissue removed. So she went to my doctor, my surgery doctor, and we just removed all her breast tissue because it was just so painful for her. She just didn't want to deal with it anymore. Um, and she was young. So this is how it can affect the woman. Sometimes we think about the mild cases, but they can have very severe cases where it's affecting their daily lives like her. All right, guys, so the next one that we're gonna go into is going to be mastitis. So mastitis is gonna be an inflammation of the breast. Um, it's an infection that's very commonly seen in your lactating woman because they're having that nipple trauma, right, from the baby. And it's very commonly found, especially in your women that are breastfeeding for the first time. And the thing that we need to know about like infection of like mastitis is that the most common bacteria that we're going to see is going to be Staph aureus, right? Where does that come from? It comes from the nasal pharynx of the infant whenever the baby is um, breastfeeding. So make sure that you know that. So with mastitis, right, we have two, we have, uh, two flavors. So in general, mastitis is going to be inflammation of the breast. We have the causes of infection, so infection can cause mastitis, and then also there's congestion, right, congestive mastitis. So make sure that you know the difference between each one. So we said infection, right, uh, usually this patient's going to have that unilateral breast enlargement, so make sure that you know that, versus our congestive mastitis, which is just usually due to like the milk production, it's usually going to be bilateral. So that's how you can differentiate between each one. Unilateral, we're thinking about infection. We say that we said that staph aureus is going to be the most common cause versus uh, congestive. It's usually going to be bilateral um, breast enlargement, and it tends to happen with congestive like two to three days after postpartum. So, how is this patient going to present? They can have fever, chills, malaise, and breast tenderness. Once again, if it's a bacterial one, we're going to see that unilateral wedge-shaped area of erythema. It's usually going to involve one quadrant. It's going to be warm, tender, and indurated, and the patient's going to have nipple discharge with cracking and crusting of the skin of the breast and nipple. And congestive mastitis is going to be bilateral pain, swelling, and the patient can also have a low-grade fever, 
and they're also going to have axillary lymphadenopathy. So what's going to be the treatment? If it's an infection, we said that we're covering for what? Staph aureus. I'm saying that because it's something that's highly tested. So if I keep repeating myself, it's because something that I've seen on questions. So staph aureus, right? We're treating for that. So supportive measures like warm compresses, breast pump, and then a well-fitted bra. And we're going to treat with dicloxacillin or cephalosporin also, okay? Dicloxacillin or cephalosporin. Another thing to keep in mind is that, can, that another cause of uh, back infection of mastitis is strep and candida. So if it's like a fungal infection, then we can do fluconazole, right? And it's really important that we educate this woman to continue breastfeeding and increase the fluid. So even if they have breast mastitis, it's okay if they keep breastfeeding. They really like to test this. I think I added this on my OB-GYN. So make sure that you know that even if they have breast mastitis, they can still continue to breastfeed. So once again, this common cause of bacterial infectious mastitis, right? It's going to be that unilateral redness, a crusting. It's going to be the most common bacteria. It's going to be staph aureus. We're also thinking about fungal like candida, but the most common cause is going to be staph aureus. The treatment is going to be dicloxacillin and the mother can keep breastfeeding. It's okay. Now, what about congestive mastitis? What's going to be the treatment? So if the woman like does not want to breastfeed, just make sure that we tell them to put some ice packs, some tight-fitting bras, analgesics, and then avoid breast stimulation. If the woman wants to continue breastfeeding, then make sure that to educate them that they're emptying their breasts completely after the baby is done breastfeeding. They can apply local heat, analgesics, and then continue nursing. So now we think now it's mastitis, right? It's developed to an abscess. So an abscess it's very commonly found, once again, in your lactating women's or breast abscess. And the bacteria we're thinking about is going to be what? Staph aureus. Okay? These are not very common. And a patient is going to be presenting with induration, with fluctuance due to pus. And that's how you can differentiate between each one. Because I know when I was saying, I kept getting this confused. So just in general, mastitis is not going to have any fluctuance, right? It's just going to be enlarged, red, and just like angry that crusting versus a breast abscess, you're going to see that fluctuation, right? Because it's an abscess. You're going to see pitting edema also. And treatment for this is going to be antibiotics. Once again, make sure that we continue, we, the mother can continue nursing also. Um, and then if it's like really enlarged, then we can drain it, right? We can do IND. So once again, for both breast abscess and breast infection, infective mastitis, the woman can continue breastfeeding. So the next thing we're going to go into is fibroadenoma. So we said the most common, just general benign cause of um, breast pain, right, was fibrocystic breast disease. Well, second most common benign breast disorder is going to be your fibroadenoma. This is very commonly found in your younger woman, especially within 20 years after puberty. It's usually composed of glandular and fibrous tissue. Um, collagen that's arranged in swirls and it's usually unilateral but it can also be bilateral but it's usually unilateral for these patients and um, with these patients they're going to be presenting with a mass that they feel and usually the size ranges from one to size five centimeters is usually slow growing and it can increase during pregnancy especially because they're having an increased amount of estrogen right so that's why it would makes sense. And it's usually a typically painless, well-circumscribed, round, mobile mass, right? So once again, it's usually a typically painless, well-circumscribed, round, mobile mass for these patients. So that's how you can differentiate it between fibrocystic, right, which is going to be multiple, painful, and fibroadenoma, which is going to be painless, and it's going to be a solid mass. And it's usually going to be a freely mobile, rubbery lump in the breast. And like we said, right, it grows over time gradually, gradually, and it can enlarge during pregnancy. But the thing about this one is that it does not wax and wane with menstruation. Versus fibrocystic disease, it does wax and wane with menstruation. Fibrodenoma does not wax and wane with menstruation. So with these patients, once again, how are we going to diagnose them? We said that we do an ultrasound for women that are less than 30 because the women that are less than 30 have less breast tissue, so you're able to use a ultrasound a lot easier. If a woman's greater than 30, then you're going to do a mammogram. But the definitive diagnosis is going to be your core needle biopsy. Once again, core needle biopsy because 
for fibrocystic disease, it's usually like a fine needle aspiration, right? This one's going to be like a core needle biopsy. Make sure you know it's something that they like to trick you on, on exams. And usually we excise them if the patient's older than 35 or if they have a family history of breast cancer, then we would excise them. If not, then we usually just observe them. And just for management for these, make sure that we repeat screen in 6 to 12 months. But usually most of these small tumors tend to go away with time. So that's why we're repeating these um, screening to just make sure that it's not still there and to see whether we have to remove it or not. Um, so once again, the treatment is going to be excision, right? So once again, fibroid and fibrocystic, most common one out of the two is going to be fibrocystic, right? Fibrocystic is going to be painful, it's going to be multiple, and they're going to fluctuate with menstruation. Versus fibroadenoma, it's going to be a single, it's going to be painless, and this one does not fluctuate with menstruation. Okay, and then once again, ultrasound, mammography, ultrasound less than 30, so women less than 30, and um, uh, mammography in women less than 40, um, greater than 30. All right, so let's go into phyloides tumor, phyloides tumor. So phyloides tumor. So the thing we need to know about phyloides tumor is that it is a fibroepithelial tumor that grows rapidly and continues to grow. The size is about five to six centimeters in length, and it can occur at any age, but it's very commonly found in your woman between the ages of 30 to 40. It's clinically large, sharply demarcated, smooth, and mobile with this one, and it's rarely malignant. It's usually benign, right? It's usually um, defined like as a low-grade tumor. And then also another thing is that phyloides, like that's like, uh, I, I believe it was like Latin or Greek for leaf-like because that's how it looks like whenever you look at it on um, under exam on your uh, on, on exam so that's why phyloides it looks leaf-like it's a stromal tumor and treatment's usually going to be wide local excision for these patients so the next topic we're going to go into is galactorrhea so galactorrhea is milk-like secretions in the absence of pregnancy or beyond six months postpartum in a non-breastfeeding non-breastfeeding woman. So it's going to be a woman that's presenting with um, saying that they have um, discharge and it's going to be milk-like secretions, right? So on exam with these patients, we want to make sure that we list that discharge and then identify what ducts are involved. And it's usually because of hyperprolactinemia. Uh, um, why? Because there's certain medications like we discussed, right, that can cause hyperprolactinemia, that can increase that prolactin level. So medications like phenothiazine, there's also endocrine tumors like lactotroph adenomas or endocrine abnormalities like hypothyroidism and pituitary or hypothalamic disease that can cause galactorrhea. This patient's going to be presenting with bilateral multiductal nipple discharge. And how are we going to diagnose these patients? We're going to do, we're going to do a sonogram, right? Once again, if um, the patient is less than 30, if they're older than 30, we're going to do a mammogram. We're going to do a BHCG just to make sure that the woman is now pregnant. We're going to do a prolactin level and then a TSH level also. And management for these patients is that we want to make sure that we're correcting whatever is the underlying cause, right? If it's medications, just make sure we stop those medications. We think about our antipsychotics, right? Especially like our first generation antipsychotics. If it's due to a pathology, right? then we want to make sure that we refer them to a surgeon or oncologist. And um, differential diagnosis for this, right, it's going to be lactation. If it's physiological, we're thinking about hyperprolactinemia, hypothyroidism, certain medications like uh, phenothiazine, neurogenic stimulation. So is someone purpose purposely like stimulating like the nipple that is causing that discharge, the, the milkiness discharge? Pathological, like intraductal papilloma, ductal carcinoma in situ, right? We're thinking about our cancers, like our red flags. And also another thing I want to go to, go over, is just medications that can cause galactorrhea. So we think about phenothiazines, right? Methodopa, amphetamines, metoclopamide, um, oral contraceptive agents also. So just make sure that you have that in the back of your mind also. So let's go to our next one. It's going to be an intraductal papilloma. This is a benign tumor that's involving the lining of the lactiferous ducts. It's very commonly found in your premenopausal woman, and it's the most common cause of spontaneous unilateral bloody nipple, nipple discharge. 
And usually with these patients, there's an absence of a breast mass on exam. And what you're going to see with these patients is that um, you're going to see you're going to express fluid on exam for cytology just to make sure that you rule out any type of carcinoma of the breast, which can present very very similar for these patients. And um, mammogram, mammogram is usually going to be the study of choice or ultrasound once again if the patient's less than the age of 30, right? Treatment for this is going to be surgical excision of the ducts and mass, and we want to make sure that we send it to pathology just to rule out any type of um, malignancy for these patients. So the next topic we're going to go into is going to be breast cancer. And there's different types of breast cancer. So this topic might take me a while to go through, OK? So let's go into just breast cancer um, in general. And I know we had discussed literally earlier what were the protective factors, right, or what was a sign of a benign tumor versus a malignant one. So breast cancer, it's a malignancy primary of the milk ducts, ductal, or of the lobules, which produce milk. It's the most common skin malignancy in women, and the risk tends to increase with age. On exam, the patient's getting presenting with a lump in the breast or underarm area that's painless, right, like we, just, we, we described earlier. It's going to be hard with ill-defined margins. It's going to be fixed, so it's going to be non-mobile, and it's most commonly found in the upper outer quadrant. The patient's going to be saying that they have discharge or bleeding from the nipple. It's usually going to be unilateral, and they may or may not present with a bloody, purulent, or green discharge also. You're going to see skin changes on the breast skin or areola. It's going to be asymmetric, redness. You're going to see discoloration, ulceration, skin retraction, dimpling, especially if the Cooper's ligament is involved, skin thickening. You're going to see a change in size and shape of the breast. You'll see nipple inversion and nipple crusting. And diagnosis for this is usually going to be a mammogram, right? You're going to see microcalcifications and spiculated masses. And this is usually highly suggested for malignancy. And once again, ultrasound, right? If the woman's going to be less than the age of 30, um, you can do this with a guided fine needle aspiration with biopsy. And then a biopsy is going to help us also diagnose what type of cancer it is, either a fine needle with biopsy or a large needle core biopsy or an open excisional biopsy. And then we're going to stage this cancer based on the tumor size, the presence or absence of nodes, and metastasis. So stage zero is going to be precancerous. It's going to be your ductal carcinoma in situ. Anything that's going to be in situ, like your lobular carcinoma in situ, that means it's in place and it has not expanded anywhere else. Stage one through three, it's going to be within the breast and regional lymph nodes. So it's already expanded to the lymph nodes. Stage four, it's going to be full-blown metastatic breast cancer. So treatment for this is always for breast cancer, cancer in general. So what we're doing right now is I'm just trying to go over an overview of breast cancer in general. So for breast cancer in general, the treatment's always going to be the most conservative that we can. We try to save as much breast as we can, right? We don't want to go full out and just remove both breasts or an entire breast where we can do something like a lumpectomy, right? Because this is something that's going to be very, it's going to affect the woman's, how the woman feels about themselves and how their physical appearance. So it's really important that we save as much breast as we can. So keep that in mind for this exam and for your OB-GYN exam. So we can do a lumpectomy. So remember, we're trying to save as much breast as we can, followed by radiation therapy, because this is going to help and allow for that breast conservation. So we do mastectomies usually only for like diffuse large tumors if they're like really enlarged. And we wanna make sure that whenever we do this, we always remove um, lymph nodes. So removal of regional axillary lymph nodes because it's gonna help us determine whether there's metastasis, okay? So whenever we do whether a lumpectomy or a mastectomy, we're also doing those lymph nodes to make sure that we rule out any type of metastasis for these patients. There's also adjunctive therapy, like radiation therapy and chemo. So usually radiation is going to be done after a lumpectomy, and it can be done post-mastectomy to just make sure that we destroy any like residual tumor cells that we just did not see there or remove on uh, surgery. We can also do chemotherapy. This is usually used in cancers that are staged between 2 and 4, 
and inoperable diseases, especially like if they have ER negative disease. So what is ER negative? They're negative to like your estrogen receptors, right? So that's why chemotherapy would be the best. So there's certain medications we can use like for chemotherapy, floral, uracil, docetaxel, cyclophosphamide, doxorubicin. Um, we can also do neoadjuvant endocrine therapy. This is going to be hormone therapy. But the thing about this one is that we only use this if the cancer is hormone, hormonal positive. So remember we said if it's estrogen receptor negative, then that's when we would do something like radiation therapy and chemo because it's not going to respond to hormones because it's negative. Versus if it's something like ER positive, right, then in these cases we can do um, like hormone therapy. So breast cancer tumors that can be estrogen ER positive like we discussed, um, or even if they're progesterone or PR positive, and also HER2 positive, then we can do something like hormonal therapy. So certain medications that we can use is going to be like, for example, anti-estrogen, tamoxifen. Tamoxifen is very useful in tumors that are ER positive, right? Tamoxifen, ER positive. What it does it is that it binds and blocks estrogen receptors in the breast tissue. And then we have aromatase inhibitors. These are useful in postmenopausal ER positive patients with breast cancer. It reduces the production of estrogen. So these are medications like anastrozole and letrozole. And then we have monoclonal antibody treatment. This is useful in patients with HER2 positive. So human epidermal growth factor receptor. Um, these are medications like trastuzumab. But the thing about trastuzumab that we need to know is that it has a side effect of tox uh, cardiotoxicity. So what I've seen that they like to ask this and make sure that you know that is whether your cancer is ER positive or just hormonal positive or not, right? If it's negative, like we discussed, it's usually going to be chemotherapy and radiation because it's not going to respond to hormonal treatment, right? So your ER negative, HER2 negative, those. But if it is HER2 positive, ER positive, PR positive, right? They're, they're hormonal, then we can do hormonal therapy. And then we said that tamoxifen, we usually use that for ER positive. And the one that we use for HER2 positive is going to be your trastuzumab. Make sure that you know that because they're going to trick you. So trastuzumab, HER2 positive, um, we said that your tamoxifen is going to be for ER positive cancers. And then screening is another thing that they like to test. So when do we start screening? So, and what is the best test for screening? So a mammogram is going to be the best screening test. It detects breast cancer as early as two years before a mass can be palpated clinically. And according to the ACS screening guidelines, they say to screen annually at the age of 45 to 54, and then every two years after the age of 55. Versus the ACOG, they say to screen annually at the age of greater than 40. Now, the USPSTF guidelines, they say to get a baseline mammogram every two years, um, starting at age between 50 to 74 years. And then every two years at the age of 40, if they have an increased risk factors or 10 years prior to the age of the first degree relative was diagnosed with breast cancer. I know this is a mouthful and it's really annoying because they change, but I, out of these, I would know the USPSTF guideline, which says baseline mammogram every two years starting at the age of 50 to 74. And then every two years at the age of 40, if they have increased risk factors or 10 years prior to the age of the first degree relative was diagnosed with breast cancer. Also, in regards to breast exams in the clinic, it's going to be clinical breast exams at least every three years in women between the age 20 to 39 and then annually after the age of 40. Now, breast self-exam, this is very controversial because I know I've read some papers and I've, lit, I've heard some podcasts with um, OBGYN doctors where they actually say it's not very helpful, but according just like textbook wise and according to this textbook, uh, breast self-exam should be done monthly um, after the age of 20, immediately after menstruation, or on days 5 to 7 of menstrual cycles. So once again, this is a very controversial topic, but just I wanted to include it because of just exam, just to make sure for completion. So <clears throat> breast cancer prevention in high-risk patients. What can we do to prevent cancer in patients that are BRCA1 positive, BRCA2 positive, or if they have a family history of breast cancer. So we can use medications like tamoxifen or raloxifen. This one can be used in postmenopausal women or women that are greater than the age of 35 that are at high risk for cancer. Usually treatment is done for five years and tamoxifen is actually preferred, preferred over raloxifen. The reason why it's because it's more effective, but it does have an increased risk of TBTs and endometrial cancer. 
Um, so just make sure that we know that. You can also do aromatase inhibitors. That's actually another alternative, like the ones that we discussed, right? Anastrozole or letrozole. But usually tamoxifen is going to be the preferred one for these patients that have an increased risk of breast cancer. So now we go into each type of breast cancer that exists. So I know we just discussed kind of like broad, now let's go into each one. So we have inflammatory breast cancer. This one's very, very aggressive. Just the name of it, that's how I memorize it, inflammatory breast cancer, inflammatory. It's the most aggressive one, but it's very, very rare. This patient's gonna be presenting with pure de ronde, right? We said that dimpling of the skin, why? Because the cancer has already involved um, the, the lymphatic area, right? And it's causing obstruction. That's why they have that pure orange. And if you see that pure orange in exam, it means that it's already like a very poor prognosis. Usually these patients will have diffuse erythema uh, without a palpable mass. It's usually gonna be red, swollen, warm, and an itchy breast. And also you'll see erythema like we discussed, right? Uh, management is going to be the biopsy, and it's usually going to help us confirm the diagnosis. And treatment is going to be radical modified mastectomy and chemotherapy. The next cancer is going to be ductal carcinoma in situ. This is going to be a carcinoma that's only confined to the ductal tissue. Like it sounds, right? In situ, it's in place. So this one's only confined to the ductal tissue and does not invade the basement membrane. So that's how I memorize it. Anything that says in situ, it's confined to that area, right? If it says ductal, it's confined to the ductal tissue. If it says lobular, it's confined to the lobular tissue. So ductal carcinoma in situ is gonna be confined to that ductal tissue without invasion of the basement membrane. Treatment's usually gonna be with a lumpectomy or modified radical mastectomy. And another one that we wanna talk about is gonna be lobular carcinoma in situ. So in situ, we said, right, in place, this carcinoma is confined only to the lobular tissue without invasion of the basement membrane. It's exactly like ductal carcinoma, right? These cancers do not have involvement of the basement membrane. Usually these cancers are found incidentally, like you're doing a biopsy for something else and then you find this cancer. Um, uh, with these patients, <clears throat> it's rarely palpable and Usually they have an increased risk of reoccurrence either in the same or contralateral breast and it can actually progress to invasive cancer. So something to just know. Treatment for this is gonna be a lumpectomy or modified radical mastectomy and then radiation also. Okay, next one's gonna be invasive ductal carcinoma. This is when cancer has spread to the surrounding tissues, the basement membrane and even the lymph nodes. It's about 70% of all breast cancer and the patients are gonna present with a palpable mass Palpable lymph nodes, skin dimpling, nipple retraction. They can also have systemic symptoms like weight loss, right? And the thing we need to know is that infiltrative ductal carcinoma is the most common type of like malignant cancer. It's associated with lymphatic metastasis, especially the axillary lymph nodes. Diagnosis is usually going to be done by a biopsy of the mass and the sentinel lymph nodes. Once again, we always want to make sure that we get the lymph nodes, right? We can also do a chest x-ray, CT, um, LFTs, beta HCG, and bone scan since this cancer metastasizes very quickly. Treatment is going to be modified rad radical or radical mastectomy with radiation or chemotherapy as well as hormone replacement therapy if, like we discussed, if it's um, hormone positive. The next one is going to be invasive lobular carcinoma. This is going to be a carcinoma that breaks through the lobular cells. It has a strong tendency to occur bilateral. Workup for this is going to be a biopsy and lymph node biopsy. Once again, we can do a chest x-ray, LFTs, beta HCG, CT of the liver and bone scan just to rule out metastasis. Treatment for this is going to be modified radical mastectomy with radiation, or you can do chemo and estrogen inhibitor therapy like tamoxifen or trastuzumab, right, if it is positive for the hormones that we discussed earlier. And then we have Paget's disease. This is going to be an eczematous eruption and ulceration that arises from the nipple and can spread to the areola. That's going to be the keyword for this one. It's going to be that eczematomous eruption and ulceration, right? That comes from the nipple. Um, you may or may not see a mass on exam, and the patient is going to be complaining of this itching and or burning to the breast, okay? So once again, that's those are the keywords, right? That eczematous eruption, ulceration, that itchiness, that burning of the breast. And 95% of these patients have invasive cancer because it's usually an infiltrative ductal um, cancer. 
tumor phase is going to be mastectomy or lumpectomy with radiation. So now we're done with all the breast cancers, let's go into menopause. And the thing about menopause is that you have perimenopause, full-blown menopause, and then you have postmenopause. So just make sure that you know the difference between these. So in general, for menopause, a woman has to have no menses for 12 months. And that's what is the definition for menopause. Okay? So now that we know that, let's go into perimenopause. This is a period of transition. So the woman's transitioning of going into full-blown menopause. It can last for several years. It's characterized by menstrual cycle changes, hot flashes, decreased cognition, and decreased libido. So they start having all these symptoms, but they still have not had that full-blown menopause. So sometimes in the question stem, it says that they have their period is like very abnormal or they're bleeding in between periods, etc. So like their their periods are just like super abnormal. You're thinking about a woman that maybe it's premenopausal, like they're 45, 46, 47, right? Menopause, like we said, is going to be no menses for 12 months due to loss of ovarian functioning. That's another thing that they really like to test is that what is the most common cause of menopause? Well, the ovaries are just not working anymore. They have loss of ovarian functioning. So make sure you know that's something that's very highly tested. The average age is 51 years old, but about 95% of the population, women, women population, it occurs between the ages of 45 to 55 years old. Okay. So another thing you need to know about menopause is that there's premature menopauses. Uh, that's usually menopause that occurs before the age of 40. So make sure you have that in the back of your mind. It's a woman that's 38 or 39, and they're presenting with symptoms that you're like, mm, you know what, they might be menopausal. They can be. They can be premenopausal, premature menopause. So usually with premature menopause, this can occur sooner in patients that have uh, diabetes, smokers, vegetarians, and then malnourished patients. So postmenopause, postmenopause is going to be no menses for three years, and um, <clears throat> that is usually postmenopause. So make sure you know the difference between premenopause, uh, perimenopause, menopause, and then just postmenopause in general. And then whenever a woman that comes in right with menopause, and we want to make sure that the patient is not having menopause, we want to make sure that we measure their FSH levels. That's actually going to be one of the best ones, their FSH and LH levels. That's going to tell us whether the patient is ovulating anymore or not. So that's another thing that they can ask also. And then there are also their estrogen or estradiol levels also. All right, guys, the next one's going to be premature ovarian failure. This tends to occur before the age of 40, right? It can be to toxins like chemotherapy or radiation that are affecting the pelvis. Smoking can also cause this. Uh, premature ovarian failure can be due to chromosomal defects like Turner syndrome and fragile X syndrome. Um, but most of these cases are idiopathic. If a patient has a history of some type of ovarian surgery, they can, it, this can actually increase the risk of premature ovarian failure. Also, if they have a positive family history, this can increase the risk of premature ovarian failure. So with premature ovarian failure, um, with these patients, the symptoms are going to depend on the length of time without estrogen because we want to keep in mind, right, that there, there are estrogen receptors throughout the body. So there's going to be a lot of organs that are going to be effective in um, premature ovarian failure. So you have like the brain, right, can be affected. So the patient can present with hot flashes, insomnia, irritability, mood disturbances, dementia. The breasts are also affected. The eyes affected. So the patient can present with macular degeneration. The GU tract is affected. So the patients are going to be presenting with vaginal atrophy, right? Because um, estrogen usually helps with those vaginal secretions. Um, they can have stress incontinence, dyspareunia, which means that the patient has painful sexual intercourse. They can present with, it can affect their heart and blood vessels. So the patient can develop cardiovascular disease, their liver, um, ovaries. So they're going to deplete all their follicles or skeleton, right? Osteoporosis, because usually estrogen is protective. That's why it's important in women that are menopausal is that to look out for osteoporosis because we usually also screen them because these women are not producing that estrogen anymore that they used to or don't have that estrogen so that prone to getting osteoporosis. The patient can also develop skin atrophy because these are all the estrogen receptors that are found in the body. If you're not having those estrogen receptors then or you're not just having estrogen then your patient's going to have start having all these symptoms. So on exam, you're going to see that breast atrophy, right? Like we discussed skin and hair dryness. So the skin has very decreased elasticity. That vaginal atrophy, it'll say that the patient has decreased vaginal rugae, vaginal secretions are decreased. 
osteoporosis because they have decreased bone density. And usually the workup for this patient is going to be um, <clears throat> make sure that this patient has a history of amenorrhea for 12 months and an age-appropriate female is usually enough for the diagnosis. We can do an FSH for these patients, right? If the lever is greater than 40, then we're thinking about menopause. This is actually the best initial test. It's going to be your FSH. Um, usually, these patients in general are going to have an increased FSH, which makes sense, right? Because that the, the, the follicle is trying to stimulate it, but nothing's answering. It's like they're trying to call, but no one's answering the phone. So you're going to have increased FSH. You're going to have decreased estrogen. You're going to have increased LH because there's depletion of those ovarian follicles. Like they're working hard, like telling the follicles, so ovarian follicles, hey, pick up, pick up, but they're not working. Like they're depleted. So of course they're not answering, which makes sense, right? Increased LH, increased serum FSH, but decreased estrogen. Estrone is usually going to be predominant estrogen after menopause. Um, for these patients, we want to make sure that we screen them for their weight, blood pressure, and waist circumference, so cardiovascular screening, because we said these patients are at risk for cardiovascular disease, right? Because we have estrogen receptors in the heart. Cancer screening for breast, cervical, and colon. Also, osteoporosis screening starting at the age of 65 for these patients. Management for this is going to be uh, if the patient has moderate to severe symptoms, then in these patients, we can give hormonal replacement therapy for these patients. Um, we can also use estrogen alone or with progesterone. Estrogen only, only is actually going to be the most effective symptomatic treatment. So we can do something like um, topical, like vaginal preferred. Actually, it's actually preferred over oral. But the thing about why we're very careful with estrogen and why we prefer topical than oral is because if a woman is having only estrogen, right, they're at increased risk of endometrial cancer, especially if they have, if they're menopausal, right, or if they have premature ovarian failure, they're at an increased risk of endometrial cancer because why? Because it's unopposed, right? They're not having, the, they're not producing the hormones that they used to, right? So they're going to have this increased amount of estrogen that is just you have the endometrium is just building that endometrium, but then you don't have progesterone that's going to come and just kind of like make sure that endometrium is nice and there's nothing overbuilding. Um, it's not going to oppose the estrogen. So you're going to have unopposed estrogen that's just building that tissue on the estrogen. And what happens when you're building a bunch of tissue, you start getting like atypia, right? Atypical. And that's when it can increase your risk for cancer. Uh, you can also do estrogen and progesterone, but the thing about this one is that the patient can have risk of venous thromboembolism. Also, their risk of breast cancer can increase, but um, another thing we can do is clonidine, SSRIs, or gabapentin if the patient's complaining about all these things that we discussed, right, those hot flashes. But usually what we want to do is um, make sure that we do something topical, right? We can do topical estrogen like vaginal, uh, SSRIs if they're having like hot flashes, so once again, we want to make sure that we do not give unopposed estrogen to a woman with a uterus. All right, so non-hormonal, we can do antidepressants, like I said, SSRIs, SNRIs. Like the best one, like the best SNRI for hot flashes is going to be venlafaxine. So make sure that you know that. You can also do gabapentin, clonidine uh, for behavioral modifications. Tell them to re do relaxation techniques like yoga, meditation, right? Make sure that they have a good diet, regular exercise. Avoid any type of trigger that is triggering these symptoms, like caffeine, alcohol, spicy foods. Make sure that they're keeping cool. And reduce sexual t discomfort if they're complaining of dyspareunia with moisturizers or lubricants. All right, guys, so that was premature ovarian failure. Let's